The year before, he had resolved to dispose of Adolf Hitler and had begun work on a time bomb controlled by two clock mechanisms. After 30 nights of arduous chiseling at the pillar behind the paneling, he had installed the preset clocks, soundproofed in cork to prevent the ticking from being heard. Elsa's simple pride in his craftsmanship was evident from the records of his interrogations. He probably was telling the truth, and there is no doubt that one watchmaker acting alone had nearly accomplished what after years of debate, planning, and self-indulgent conspiracy a battalion of officers and intellectuals were to fail to do five years later. In private Hitler assured his staff that one day he would publish the whole story but not yet as he also wanted to round up those who had pulled the strings. General Rommel wrote on November 9, My only hope is that now in the Führer's headquarters too the security precautions will be better organized with everything in one person's hands, mine. Because if anybody is going to take this responsibility, he cannot share it with anybody else. And on the 15th, referring to Operation Yellow, Rommel wrote, the assassination attempt in Munich has only made, the Führer's, resolution stronger. It is a marvel to witness all this. On the day after the Munich explosion Hitler again postponed yellow, on November 13 he further instructed that the offensive would not begin before the 22nd. There is some reason to believe that Hitler himself did not intend these deadlines to be serious that they were designed to keep the army at maximum readiness in case the western powers should themselves suddenly invade the Low Countries. Hitler did not doubt that the West had economic means enough to pressure the Low Countries into appealing for help at a propitious moment. Let us not credit the enemy with a lack of logic, Hitler said later in November. If we respect their, the Low Countries, neutrality, the western powers will just march in during the spring. Hitler was also under pressure from Göring and the Luftwaffe's chief of staff, Hans Jess Konjak, to occupy the whole of Holland, possession of Holland would be vital for the future air war between Britain and Germany. So the time had come to compromise the Dutch, German army officers supplied by Heydrich appeared on the 9th at Venlo, just inside the Dutch frontier. British agents drove up for a pre-arranged meeting with them, there was a rapid exchange of gunfire and they were dragged across the border into Germany together with the driver and another officer, mortally wounded, this latter turned out to be a Dutch intelligence officer accompanying them. Hitler said this was proof that the ostensibly neutral Dutch were working hand in glove with the British. When the time comes I shall use all this to justify my attack, he told his generals. The violation of Belgian and Dutch neutrality is unimportant. Nobody asks about such things after we have won. On November 13, General Jodl instructed the War Department that a new Führer directive was on its way, the army must be prepared to occupy as much of Holland as possible to improve Germany's air defense position. On November 20 Hitler issued a directive which finally ranked the attack on Holland equal to those on Belgium and France. In variation of the earlier directive, all measures planned against Holland are authorized to commence simultaneously with the beginning of the general offensive, without special orders to that effect. Where no opposition is encountered, the invasion is to be given the character of a peaceful occupation. In the East, meanwhile, the devil's work was well in hand. Gruesome reports of massacres began to filter up through army channels. Consciences had to be salved and the reports were dutifully shuttled about between the adjutants. Thus, soon after the Munich plot, Captain Engel received from Braukic's adjutant a grisly set of eyewitness accounts of executions by the SS at Schwitz. An outspoken medical officer addressed to Hitler in person a report summarizing the eyewitness evidence of three of his men. Together with about 150 fellow soldiers they witnessed the summary execution of about 20 or 30 Poles at the Jewish cemetery at Schwitz at about 9.30 am on Sunday, October 8. The execution was carried out by a detachment consisting of an SS man, two men in old blue police uniforms, and a man in plain clothes. An SS major was in command. Among those executed were also five or six children aged from two to eight years old. 
Whether Engel showed this document and its attached eyewitness accounts to Hitler is uncertain. He returned it to Braukic's adjutant almost immediately with a note, the appropriate action to be taken at this end will be discussed orally. In the Reich Chancellery, the large table in the old cabinet room was now dominated by a relief map of the Ardennes, the mountainous, difficult region of Belgium and Luxembourg that was twice to be the scene of Hitler's unorthodox military strategy. Many an hour he stood alone in the evenings, tracing the narrow mountain roads and asking himself whether his tanks and mechanized divisions would be able to get through them. By now he had been provided with the original construction plans of the bridges across the Albert Canal, previously he had only aerial photographs and picture postcards of these important targets. From other sources he had similar details on the fortress at Ebenemal. A scale model of the fortress had been built, and intensive training of the glider crews had begun under top security conditions. The bridges presented the most intractable problem, the more so since the Dutch had evidently been warned by anti-Nazi agents in Berlin. On November 12 extensive security precautions had suddenly been introduced at the Maastricht bridges. Hitler discussed the operations with Gunneries and Colonel Erwin Lehausen on November 16, he did not believe they would capture the bridges over the Albert Canal by surprise alone, and he began casting around for other means of preventing the bridges' destruction. He ordered a full-scale secret conference on the bridges' plan on November 20. General von Reichenau made it clear that since the invasion of Holland had already been compromised once, he had no faith in the Abwes Trojan horse plan. Since the Dutch authorities were now expecting police uniforms to be used, as was shown by the fact that they had issued special armbands to their police, there was little prospect of the Abwehr getting away with it. Hitler replied, then the entire operation as at present planned is pointless. Kenries did what he could to salvage the plan. Hitler was unconvinced, none of the plans is bound to succeed. But after all the other possibilities had been scrutinized, including attacking the bridges with light bombs to destroy the demolition cables, and rushing them with tanks and 88mm guns dash he had to fall back on the Trojan horse. There must be some means of getting these bridges into our hands, he complained. We have managed to solve even bigger problems before. When the conference ended four hours later, Hitler had provisionally adopted the sequence proposed by Goring, at X hour proper, 15 minutes before dawn, the gliders would land silently on the fortress at Ebenimal and the bridge at Cannes, five minutes later dive bombers would attack the other Albert Canal bridges to disrupt the demolition charges, the bombers would be followed five minutes later by the arrival of more glider-borne troops just east of the bridges themselves. At the same time the Abwes disguised advanced party would seize the Maastricht bridges, for this they would have to cross the frontier in Dutch uniforms 45 minutes before Rex Sauer. The weather was still against yellow. Every morning, Berlin was in the grip of icy frost and fog, which lifted in the afternoons to let a weak sun filter through. On November 21st the Führer issued orders for his leading generals and admirals to hear an exposure of his views two days later. To the large audience that packed the Great Hall of the Chancellery, Hitler depicted the coming battle as the operation that would finally bring down the curtain on the world war that Germany had been fighting ever since 1914. He recited the many occasions when, aided only by providence, he had ignored the grim prophecies of others to exploit the brief opportunities that opened to him. He, Adolf Hitler, had now provided the generals with a strategic situation unparalleled since 1871. For the first time in history we have only to fight on one front. The other is at present open. His own indispensability had been forcefully impressed on him by the recent assassination attempt, that there would be other attempts was probable. Thus there was no time to be lost. The defensive strategy his cowardly army generals were calling for was short-sighted, Moltke had clearly shown that only through offensives could wars be decided. Germany's present enemies were weak and unready, here, he illustrated his point by listing in turn the number of French tanks and guns, and British ships. His speech bristled with concealed barbs against the army generals. 
Rommel wrote the next day, apostrophe. But that seems quite necessary, too, because the more I speak with my comrades the fewer I find with their heart and conviction in what they are doing. It is all very depressing, while Hitler praised the aggressive spirit of the Navy and Luftwaffe, he sneered, if our commanders in chief are going to have nervous breakdowns as in 1914, what can we ask of our simple riflemen? He had been deeply wounded by suggestions that the officers had had to proceed their men into battle, with consequently disproportionately high officer losses, that is what the officers are there for. He recalled how in 1914 after months of training the infantry attack on Liege had broken up in panic and disaster. I will not hear of complaints that the army is not in shape. Give the German soldier proper leadership and I can do anything with him. It was not as though Germany had a real choice between armistice and war. People will accuse me, war and yet more war. But I regard fighting as the fate of all the species. Nobody can opt out of the struggle, unless he wants to succumb. A few minutes later he said, victory or defeat. And it is not a matter of the future of National Socialist Germany, but of who will dominate Europe in years to come. For this it is worth making a supreme effort. He believed the present favorable strategic situation would last perhaps six more months, but then the British troops, a tenacious enemy, would vastly strengthen their foothold in France, and yellow would be a different proposition altogether. The speech lasted two hours. General von Braukic reappeared in the evening and stiffly informed the Führer that if he had no confidence in him he ought to replace him. Hitler retorted that the general must do his duty like every other soldier, he was not oblivious to the spirit of Zossen prevailing in the army, and he would stamp it out. Zossen was the headquarters of the general staff and seat of the conservative and conspiratorial elements of the German army. Himmler confers with Reinhard Heydrich in Gestapo Chief Heinrich Muller, right, on the hunt for the Burger Bra Assassin, November 1939, Keystone. Hitler with his henchman Martin Bormann, left, and Julius Schaub, wall the Huell. Clearing the decks. Hitler knew that his pact with Stalin was misunderstood. In his speech to the generals, he had laid bare his own suspicions. Russia is at present harmless, he assured them. Pacts were respected only until they no longer served a purpose. Russia, he added, will abide by the pact only as long as she considers it to her advantage. Stalin had far-reaching goals, and among them were the strengthening of Russia's position in the Baltic, which Germany could only oppose once she was unencumbered in the West, the expansion of Russian influence in the Balkans, and a drive toward the Persian Gulf. It was the aim of German foreign policy that Russia should be deflected toward the Persian Gulf, as this would bring her into conflict with Britain, but she must be kept out of the Balkans. Hitler hoped that the present situation between Germany and Russia would prevail for two or three more years, but if Stalin were to die, there might be a rapid and ugly volt face in the Kremlin. There was clear evidence of a Russian military build-up. Blaskowitz reported from Poland that four military airfields were being built, and two to three hundred Russian bombers had been counted around Białystok. In addition, wrote Blaskowitz, Russian propaganda was making plain that this was nothing less than a war against fascism, Germany is said, in the USSR, to be planning an attack on Russia as soon as she is victorious in the West. Therefore Russia must be on guard and exploit Germany's weakness at the right moment. The General's Command had clearly identified Russian espionage and communist subversive activity behind German lines in Poland. In short, Hitler must conclude that war with Russia was inevitable, and that victory would go to the side which was ready first. To strengthen her position in the Baltic, Russia now made demands of Finland. When Finland snubbed the Russians, the Red Army attacked on the last day of November 1939. Hitler had abandoned Finland to Soviet influence in the secret codicil to the August Pact with Stalin, and he instructed his foreign missions to adhere to an anti-Finnish line, for the integrity of his brittle pact with Stalin was to be his most powerful weapon in the attack on France.
the Führer even agreed to a Russian request for the transfer of fuel and provisions from German steamships to Soviet submarines blockading Finland. Under the economic treaty signed between the two powers on August 19, Russia was to supply Germany with raw materials, it was also to act as a safe channel to Germany for goods exported by Japan, Manchuria, Afghanistan, Iran, and Romania but subject to British naval blockade. Hitler also needed the oil produced in Russia and Soviet-occupied Poland, and he knew that Stalin could exert pressure to control the supply of Romanian oil to Germany. It thus behoved him to behave like a proverbial friend in need, and throughout the winter he was a friend indeed as he instructed his military and economic authorities to do their utmost to meet the Russian demands. Russia's list of requirements was not easy to fulfill. The Russians wanted the half-built Gruzer Lutsau and the aircraft carrier Graf Zeppelin, they also wanted the blueprints of these and even more up-to-date German warships including the Bismarck and the Tirpitz. They asked for sets of the heaviest ships armament, and for the 57,000 blueprints prepared for the new Krupp 406mm triple turret guns, the fire control sets, and the ammunition that went with them. The Soviet Navy wanted samples of accumulators and periscopes for submarines, they wanted a supply of top-grade German armor plate for a cruiser to be built in Russia, and they wanted hydroacoustical gear, torpedoes, and mines as well. Hitler told Reda that his only anxiety in handing over the blueprints of the battleship Bismarck to the Russians was that these revealed that the vessel had been planned on a far larger scale than was permitted by the international agreements binding on Germany at the time. Reda assured him it would take the Russians six years to copy the Bismarck, however, he conceded that it would be unfortunate if the blueprints fell into British hands. Hitler had assigned to his navy a largely passive role in the war. He initially forbade his submarines to attack even Anglo-French naval forces. During the first year of the war, the German navy had on average only a dozen submarines with which to blockade the British Isles. Since the Luftwaffe was given priority in raw materials, the navy's steadily reduced steel allocation further limited its expansion. In one respect, however, Reda had an advantage over Braukic and Goring, to Hitler the sea was an unwholesome element, an area of uncertainty he did not understand, and he was relieved to trust Grand Admiral Reda to act as he saw fit. Thus, German destroyers executed bold sorties into the very jaws of the enemy, laying magnetic minefields in the estuaries of the principal British rivers. A U-boat sank the aircraft carrier Courageous, another U-boat penetrated Scarpa Flow and torpedoed the battleship Royal Oak. In the South Atlantic the Graf Spee had now begun raiding enemy convoys, but the Luftwaffe, and Goring particularly, wanted to bring the war closer to Britain's shores, when on November 28, in reprisal for the German mining of the coastal waters, Britain issued an order in council blockading Germany's export shipments, Goring and Milch hurried to Hitler with proposals for a crushing Luftwaffe offensive against British shipyards, docks, and ports. Hitler turned down the Luftwaffe's idea, but he did issue a new directive specifying that the best way to defeat Britain would be to paralyze her trade. The German Navy and the Luftwaffe were to turn to this task as soon as Yellow had been successfully completed. Since Hitler would then control the Channel coast, the Luftwaffe really could attack on the lines Goring had proposed. In October 1939, Reda had left Hitler in no doubt as to Germany's grim strategic position should the British occupy Norway, in winter all Germany's iron ore requirements passed through the ice-free port at Narvik, German merchant ships and warships would no longer be able to traverse the neutral Norwegian waters, the British Air Force could dominate northern Germany and the Royal Navy would command the Baltic. Though he had realistically advised Hitler that a Norwegian campaign might end in a massacre of the German fleet, Reda saw no alternative to such a campaign if the strategic dangers inherent in the British occupation of Norway were to be obviated. Reda's view took Hitler by surprise. Neither his political nor his naval advisers gave him respite once the Russo-Finnish war broke out. At noon on December 11th, 
Alfred Rosenberg briefed Hitler on a similar idea that had originated with one of his Norwegian contacts, Major Vidkun Quisling. Rosenberg told Hitler that Quisling's idea was that Germany should invade Norway at the request of a government he would himself set up. Ribbentrop and Weizsäcker warned Hitler against even agreeing to see this Norwegian. Hitler told Rosenberg he was willing to meet Quisling. In this conversation, Rosenberg's office recorded, the Führer repeatedly emphasized that what he most preferred politically would be for Norway and, for that matter, all Scandinavia to remain absolutely neutral. He had no intention of enlarging the theaters of war by dragging still more countries into the conflict. If however the other side was planning such an enlargement of the war, then he must obviously feel compelled to take steps against the move. In an effort to offset the increasing enemy propaganda activity, the Führer then promised Quisling financial aid for his pan-Germanic movement. Quisling said he had 200,000 followers, many in key positions in Norway. Hitler asked the OKW to draft two alternative operations, one following Quisling's suggestions, the other projecting an occupation of Norway by force. Hitler initiated inquiries into Quisling's background and decided not to rely on him for any assistance beyond subversive operations. A number of hand picked Norwegians would undergo secret guerrilla warfare training in Germany, when Norway was invaded, they were to seize key buildings in Oslo and elsewhere, and thus present the king with a fait accompli. No date for the operation was set. The general staff continued their open hostility to Hitler. After his unequivocal speech on November 23, General Guderian privately taxed Hitler with his astonishing attitude toward the leaders of an army that had just won such a victory for him in Poland. Hitler retorted that it was the army's commander-in-chief himself who displeased him, adding that there was unfortunately no suitable replacement. Braukic's chief of intelligence noted, there is as little contact between BR and the Führer as ever. A changeover is planned. Hitler suspected the hand of the general staff against him everywhere. When the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung published a sensational and sloppy article on the great headquarters, Hitler was furious at an implicit suggestion that history was being made by the general staff and not himself. The Führer was however hard to please. For when at Christmas the Essener National Zetung ventured a seasonal comparison between Adolf Hitler and the Messiah, Goebbels confidentially informed the entire German press that the Führer would prefer them to abstain from such comparisons in the future. In moments of military crisis, Hitler was to display an indecisiveness and lack of precision that was otherwise wholly out of character. On December 13 the pocket battleship, Graf Spee, fell foul of three British cruisers off the coast of neutral Uruguay. It was not until the small hours of the 14th that the first details reached the Berlin Admiralty. I have taken 15 hits, food stores and galleys destroyed, I am making for Montevideo. To those familiar with the political stance of Uruguay it was clear the battleship's fighting days were probably over. It would take many days for the damage to be repaired. The government at Montevideo granted only three days. Meanwhile British naval forces began to mass an uncertain strength at the mouth of the Plate River. On the 16th, Reda arrived at the Chancellery with the latest cable from the battleship. Captain Hans Langsdorff had signalled. 1. Military situation off Montevideo, apart from cruisers and destroyers, there are also, Arc Royal and Renown tightly blocked at night. No prospect of breakout into open sea or reaching home. 2. Propose emerging as far as neutral waters limit. Should it be possible to fight through to Buenos Aires using remaining ammunition, this will be attempted. 3. In event that breakout would result in certain destruction of spee with no chance of damaging enemy, I request decision whether to scuttle despite inadequate depth of water? Estuary of the plate? or internment? Hitler met Admiral Redder at the door of his study with a demand that Graf Spee must attempt to break through to the open sea, if she must go down, at least she could take some of the enemy with her. He put a hand on the Admiral's shoulder. Believe me, the fate of this ship and her crew is as painful to me as to you.
but this is war, and when the need is there, one must know how to be harsh. But he followed this firm speech with an inexplicable act. Redda showed him the Admiralty's draft reply to Captain Langsdorff, Graf Spee was to stay at Montevideo as long as the authorities would allow, a breakout to Buenos Aires would be approved. If scuttling, thoroughly destroy everything first. This reply was wholly out of keeping with Hitler's heroic demand, but he said nothing. Hitler eagerly awaited the news of Graf Spee's last battle. During the 17th, the stunning news arrived that the battleship had sailed out of Montevideo, discharged her crew onto a waiting steamer, and then gently settled down onto the shallow bed of the river's estuary. In a savage mood, that evening Hitler pondered the damage Langsdorff had done to Germany's fighting image. At three in the morning he ordered the official announcement altered to read, under these circumstances the Führer ordered Captain Langsdorff to destroy the ship by blowing her up. Langsdorff had been an officer on Jodl's staff, he had been given the Graf Spee, it transpired, as a cure for his chair-bound attitudes. But the cure had apparently not worked. He shot himself on reaching Buenos Aires. His supple ship Almark, laden with prisoners plucked from the decks of the battleship's victims, was ordered to return home to Germany. Hitler left Berlin for a brief respite at the Berghof. Passing through Munich, he paid his annual Christmas visit to his friends and patrons, the Bruckmans. He chatted about his plans to conquer Britain by using magnetic mines and other fabulous weaponry. In his entry in the Bruckmans guest book he wrote, in the year of the fight for the creation of the great German Teutonic Reich. For three days he toured the Western Front, joining the Christmas celebrations of Luftwaffe squadrons, anti-aircraft batteries infantry, and SS regiments. On his return to Berlin, Hitler again postponed yellow, this time to mid-January, failing a period of cold, clear wintry weather then, the Führer resolved, he would call off yellow until the spring. He retreated to the Berghof to await the new year. The photographs in Eva Braun's albums show that even when the Führer sat faintly smiling at the delight of the offspring of Speer, Goebbels, and Martin Bormann at a Berghof children's party, he still wore the field grey army tunic, with its solitary iron cross, that he had emotionally donned on the day his troops attacked Poland. In one photograph, however, Hitler is shown in sombre evening dress, spooning molten lead into a bowl of water, a New Year's Eve tradition. Some believe that a man's future can be predicted from the contorted shapes the solidifying metal assumes. Hitler's face betrayed a certain lack of confidence in this procedure. At the Berghof he received a long, angry, and indeed frightened letter from Benito Mussolini. It broke months of silence, and marked the lowest point in Axis relations, which had been soured by Hitler's continued flirting with Moscow. As recently as December 21, Hitler had on the eve of Stalin's 60th birthday cabled him greetings coupled with his best wishes for the Soviet peoples, Stalin had cordially replied. In Mussolini's eyes Hitler was a traitor to the fascist revolution, he had sacrificed the principles of that revolution to the tactical requirements of one given moment. You cannot abandon the anti-Semitic and anti-Bolshevist banners which you have flown for twenty years, Mussolini admonished him and for which so many of your comrades died. The solution for your Lebensraum is in Russia and nowhere else. In this letter, which Hitler deliberately left unanswered for two more months, Mussolini also proposed that Hitler should take steps to restore some kind of Polish state. Hitler's policy in Poland had undergone a radical change in the autumn of 1939. Early in October he had indicated to Governor General Frank that the general government was to be a kind of Polish reservation, but in November he bluntly told Frank, we are going to keep the general government. We will never give it back. Hitler saw no great urgency about the matter and had himself told Himmler in the autumn of 1939, I don't want these Eastern Gauleiters in a frantic race to be the first to report to me after two or three years. Mein Führer, my go is fully Germanized. I want the population to be racially flawless, and I'll be quite satisfied if a Gauleiter can report that in ten years. Himmler, 
however, wanted greater urgency. Acting on a cruel directive which he had issued at the end of October, the two Gauleiters concerned, Forster and Grey Iser, and SS Generals Kruger and Odilo Globochnik, police commanders based in Krakow and Lublin, respectively, began the ruthless midwinter expulsion from their domains of the 550,000 Jews and the principal anti German and intellectual elements, they used Frank's general government as a dumping ground. In some respects, Hitler did act as a break. From Himmler's scrawled notes we know that he was obliged to report to Hitler in person on the shooting of 380 Jews at Ostero on November 19, and that when at the end of November the Archbishop and Suffragan Bishop of Lublin were condemned to death along with 13 priests for the possession of firearms and subversive literature, Hitler ordered their reprieve and deportation to Germany instead. Events in Poland still disturbed the army. A ripple of protest disturbed the German armies poised in the West to unleash yellow. Hitler learned that on January 22 Major General Friedrich Mayeth, chief of staff of the First Army, had told his assembled officers about atrocities in Poland, the SS has carried out mass executions without proper trials. There have been disturbances. Mayeth was dismissed. Soon after, the army's commander-in-chief East. General Johannes Blaskowitz, sent to Berlin a formal list of specific SS atrocities in Poland, including murder and looting, the view that the Polish people can be intimidated and kept down by terrorism will definitely be proven wrong, he warned, and added, they are far too resilient a people for that. Blaskowitz added that the atrocities would provide the enemy with powerful ammunition throughout the world. Hitler does appear to have issued orders to Hans Frank for regular prophylactic massacres of the Polish intelligentsia. How else can Frank's confidential remarks at the end of May 1940 to his police authorities in Poland be interpreted? The Führer has said to me, the problem of dealing with and safeguarding German interests in the general government is a matter for the men in charge of the general government and for them alone. And he used these words. The ruling class that we have already unearthed in Poland is to be exterminated. We must keep close watch on whatever grows up in its place, and dispose of that too after a suitable time has elapsed. And Frank hastened to recommend to his minions, there's no need for us to cut off all these elements to concentration camps in the Rye first. That'll just result in a lot of bother and unnecessary correspondence with next of kin. No we'll liquidate this business here, on the spot. The directive issued by the 18th Army, on its transfer to Poland in August 1940, is an eloquent statement of the army's surrender to the party, for centuries an ethnological struggle has raged along our eastern frontier. To put an end to it once and for all has called for a short, sharp solution. Specific party and government agencies have been put in charge of waging this ethnological war in the East. This is why our soldiers must keep their noses out of what these units are doing. In the East, Hitler too turned a blind eye on the excesses. An army major procured the arrest of eight Polish whores and put four of them clumsily to death in prison that evening. Hitler commuted the major's death sentence to a prison term. In another case, one of the innumerable young Tsar officers appointed magistrate in Poland shot 55 Polish prisoners in a drunken orgy. Here too the local Gauleiter, Grey Iser, begged the Ministry of Justice not to blight the young officer's promising career, and Hitler granted him a reprieve. Within Germany itself, Himmler's police agencies were now acting as a law unto themselves. At the end of September 1939, the Minister of Justice submitted to Hitler a file on summary executions of Germans, Hitler replied that he had not given Himmler any general instruction but that he had ordered certain executions himself. This is why he has now ordered the Teltow bank robbers to be put before a firing squad, his staff explained. But the files also show that Hitler drew much of his information on civilian crime from casual references in the newspapers. A thoughtless editor had only to headline a story man swindled soldiers' wives for the Führer to send Schaub scurrying to a telephone with instructions that the Führer had ordered the man shot. 
Hitler's attitude to the party's own courts was even more ambivalent, as his reaction to the trial of Julius Streicher showed. Streicher's enemies were legion, but Hitler still saw in him an idealist and true revolutionary. Four days after Hitler's secret speech to the Gauleiters in October, Streicher had revealed Hitler's military plans to local party members in a speech, and he had repeated this imprudent step in a larger assembly a few days later. Speaking of Hitler's decision to invade neutral Belgium, Streicher had explained, we need the coast for our attack on Britain. His recent speeches had included blasphemous attacks on the clergy, libelous references to the generals of the Great War, and an address to a young female audience in November in which he exhorted them to find nothing improper in the desire to seduce married men. Any woman or lady who gets worked up about this is in my eyes just a pig. The party's Supreme Court, six Gauleiters and three party judges, met in February 1940, and on the 16th they ruled against Streicher. Hitler suspended him from office and forbade him to make further public speeches, but he was not ejected from the party, as Hess had demanded, and he was allowed to continue publishing his newspapers, including the despicable Sturmer. Characteristically, Hitler was unhappy with even this mild verdict. He told other party leaders likely that he felt an injustice had been done to Streicher. The legalists, he said, had paid too little attention to Streicher's party record. Heinrich Nies' Heroic Painting of Hitler, 1938, Author's Collection We must destroy them too. An icy winter descended on Germany. The canals froze, the railways were clogged with military movements population and industry alike were starved for coal and the most elementary daily requisites. Day and night Hitler talked and dreamed of yellow. By Christmas 1939 he had already decided where the big hole was to be punched through the French defences, at Sedan, and it was indeed at Sedan that the foundations of the Nazi triumph over France were laid. It was now January 1940, and the Führer was back at his chancellery in Berlin. The frightened letter Mussolini had written proved how little Hitler could rely on Italy. It was indeed a curious alliance, for the Verschungsamt now intercepted a coded telegram in which the Belgian ambassador in Rome reported to his foreign ministry in Brussels that Count Cheno had betrayed to him Germany's firm intention of attacking Belgium and had revealed the date currently set for that adventure. The Italians are strange people, wrote we Isaka. Loyal glances toward us so as to share in any success we may achieve. And gifts and minor acts of treachery for the West, so as to keep in their good books too. Not surprisingly, Belgium had shifted her main defensive effort to her frontier with Germany. A secret report submitted by German Army Intelligence in January 1940 revealed that since mid-October, over two-thirds of all Belgium's forces were massed in the East. With the exception of one division, Every single mechanized infantry, armored, and cavalry division is standing on the Belgian frontier. The Belgian gendarmerie had received instructions to speed any French invasion of the country, and while signposts in western Belgium had been replenished and improved to that end, those in the east had been wholly removed to hamper a German invasion. Mayors of Arden villages were ordered to prepare billets for French troops. Mufti dressed French soldiers were observed on the Belgian transport systems. The fortifications at Legion on the Albert Canal were far beyond the Belgian military capacity to defend, they had clearly been designed to accommodate French and British troops as well. British bombers regularly trampled through Belgian airspace. In short, Hitler saw no reason to have compunctions about attacking this little neutral. He still frowned on the notion that he had unleashed a world war. For more general consumption, he decided that the best overall title was the Great German War of Liberation. On January 10 he discussed Operation Yellow with his commanders in chief. The weather report was excellent, he decided Yellow would begin on the 17th. As January 10 ended, Germany was closer to launching Yellow than ever before. Two million men waited, confronting the armies of France. Belgium, and Holland. Shortly before noon the next day, however, infuriating news reached the Chancellery. 
a Luftwaffe major hits trade in a light aircraft across the Belgian frontier. Hitler stormed into Jodl's room and demanded a complete list of all the documents the major had been carrying. It is things like this that can lose us the war. He exclaimed, an outburst of startling frankness when spoken by the Fuhrer. Even now Hitler did not waver on his decision to launch Yellow on the 17th, at 3.15 pm he confirmed this. One Belgian newspaper reported that the German major had hurled the documents into a stove in the room where he was being interrogated, but a Belgian officer had thrust his hand into the stove and retrieved the smoldering fragments. On January 12, the attaché in Brussels cabled that the major and his pilot had assured him they had burned all the papers apart from an unimportant residue, and he repeated this in person to Hitler at the Chancellery at 11 a.m. on the 13th. The incident was not enough to deter Hitler from launching Yellow. But shortly afterward a bad weather report unsettled him, and at about one o'clock that afternoon he ordered all movements stopped. Yellow was provisionally postponed by three days. The weather picture worsened. Hitler told his staff, if we cannot count on at least eight days of fine and clear weather, then we will call it off until the spring and on the afternoon of the 16th he directed that the whole offensive was to be dismantled until then, Hitler left Goring in no uncertainty about his anger at the Luftwaffe's loose security regulations, for two more incidents had occurred. Goring reacted characteristically, he dismissed both General Helmut Felmy, the Major's superior, and Felmy's chief of staff, and he then calmly informed Hitler that he had consulted a clairvoyant, who had also reassured him that the most important papers had been destroyed? The intelligence reports from Belgium gave this the lie. The Belgian general staff ordered military units in southern Belgium to offer no resistance whatsoever to any French and British troops that might march in. Thanks to the Fischhungsamt, Hitler had by now also read the telegram sent by the Belgian military attaché in Berlin, Colonel Go Ethels. On the evening of January 13, warning that the German invasion was due next day, according to what an informate to Ursincere had told him. Goethals's source was his Dutch colleague, Major G. J. Saz. Saz's source was the German traitor Colonel Hans Oster. By the morning of the 17th, it was clear from the official demarches of the Belgian government that the documents had in fact betrayed most of Yellow in its original form. In a sense Hitler must have been relieved that this betise had forced a major decision on him. Besides, the enemy would now surely concentrate his best forces in the north. The prospects of an encirclement operation beginning at Sedan and ending at the Channel Coast were much enhanced. Everything depended on keeping this, his real intent, concealed from the enemy and in a series of conferences at the end of January 1940 Hitler impressed this on his army commanders. As he said on the 20th, he was convinced that Germany would win the war, but we are bound to lose it if we cannot learn how to keep our mouths shut. When Yellow began, a foreign ministry official would be sent secretly to The Hague to invite the Dutch monarchy to accept the Wehrmacht's armed defense of Dutch neutrality. Meanwhile, a constant state of alert was to be maintained in the West on the assumption that Yellow might start at any moment. At the end of January 1940, the Fuhrer had sent his chief military adjutant on a flying tour of the Western Front. On his return to Berlin on February 1, Colonel Schmund returned, bursting to report what he had found at General von Rundstedt's Army Group headquarters at Koblenz. Rundstedt's former chief of staff, General Erich von Manstein, was as adamantly opposed to the current War Department, OKH, offensive plan in the West as was Hitler, moreover, he was advocating a radical alternative almost identical to what Hitler had been debating with his closest staff ever since October. This convinced Hitler of its soundness, and that the OKH bureaucrats had removed Manstein from his posts with Rundstedt and given him command of a corps in the rear impressed him even more. On February 13, Hitler told Jodl of his decision to commit the mass of his armor to the breakthrough at Sedan, where the enemy would now least expect it. Jodl urged caution, the gods of war might yet catch them napping there, for the French might launch a powerful flank attack. But now Hitler was deaf to criticism. 
On the 17th he buttonholed Manstein in person when the general attended a chancellery dinner party for the new corps commanders. Manstein assured him that the new plan was the only means by which to obtain a total victory on land. The next day Hitler sent for General von Braukitsch and his chief of staff and dictated the new operational plan to them. On February 24, the War Department issued the new directive for yellow. The subsequent outstanding success of the new strategy convinced Hitler of his own military genius. Henceforth he readily mistook his astounding intuitive grasp for the sound, logical planning ability of a real warlord. His reluctance to heed his professional advisers was ever after magnified. To undermine the French soldiers' morale Hitler ordered German propaganda to hint that the real quarrel was with the British. But Hitler's true attitude toward Britain was a maudlin, unrequited affection that caused him to pull his punches throughout 1940. As Holder explained Hitler's program to the Chief of Army Intelligence late in January, the Führer wants to defeat France, then a granite gesture to Britain. He recognizes the need for the empire. During lunch at the Chancellery in these weeks of early 1940, Rudolf Hess once inquired, Mein Führer, are your views about the British still the same? Hitler gloomily sighed, if only the British knew how little I ask of them. How he liked to leaf through the society pages of the Tatler, studying the British aristocracy in their natural habitat. Once he was overheard to say, those are valuable specimens, those are the ones I am going to make peace with. The Chancellery dinner attended by Manstein and the other corps commanders fell on the day after the Almark incident, in which the Royal Navy had violated Norwegian neutral waters under circumstances to be explained below. Hitler expounded loudly on the inherent properness of such actions, whatever the international lawyers might subsequently proclaim. History, he once more explained, judged only between success and failure, that was all that really counted, nobody asked the victor whether he was in the right or wrong. Since the action off the Uruguayan coast, the supple Lishap Almark had lain low, her holds packed with 300 British seamen captured from Graf Spee's victims. Until mid-February 1940, the worried German Admiralty had heard no sound from her, but on the 14th she signalled that she was about to enter northern Norwegian waters. Under the Hague rules she was entitled to passage through them, for she was not a man of war but a naval auxiliary flying the flag of the German merchant marine. The Norwegian picket boats interrogated her and undertook to escort her, but in Berlin late on the 16th the Admiralty began intercepting British naval signals which left no doubt but that an attempt was afoot to capture the Almark even if it meant violating Norwegian neutral waters. By 6am next morning a radio signal of the British commander to the Admiralty in London had been decoded in Berlin, the British destroyer Cossack had been alongside the Almark and he and his group were returning to Rosyth. At midday a full report was in Hitler's hands, telephoned through by the legation in Oslo. Seeing the British force, a cruiser and six destroyers, closing in, the Almark's captain had sought refuge in Jossing Fjord. Two Norwegian vessels had held the British ships at bay until dusk, when the Cossack had forced her way past them and ordered the German ship to heave to. The Almark's report described how a boarding party had seized the ship's bridge and began firing blindly like maniacs into the German crew, who of course did not have a gun between them. The 300 prisoners were liberated, the ship and its crew were looted. London had signalled the captain that the destroyers were to open fire on the Norwegian patrol boats if the latter resisted the British approach. The German naval staff war diary concluded, from the orders of the Admiralty. It is clear beyond peradventure that the operation against the supple vessel Almark was planned with the deliberate object of capturing the Almark by whatever means available, or of releasing the prisoners, if necessary by violating Norway's territorial waters. Hitler thoughtfully ordered that, in the ensuing operation to recover the damaged Almark, Norway's neutrality was to be respected to the utmost.
more than a strategic need to occupy the Norwegian coast before the Allies could do so, the began to weigh with Hitler the belated consideration that since the Scandinavian peoples were also of Germanic stock they naturally belonged within the German fold. It is important to recall that in none of his secret speeches to his generals had Hitler adumbrated the occupation of Scandinavia. Only after Quisling's visits had the Führer ordered Jodl's staff to study such a possibility. The OKW study recommended that a special working staff under a Luftwaffe general should devise a suitable operational plan, under the code name Oyster. This staff began work under General Erhard Milch a week later. Almost immediately however Hitler ordered the unit dissolved. He was not convinced that the Luftwaffe knew how to safeguard the secrecy of such planning. Instead, a top secret unit was established under Hitler's personal supervision, its senior officer was a Navy captain, Theodor Krank. He proposed simultaneous amphibious landings at seven Norwegian ports, Oslo, Kristiansand, Arendel, Stavanger, Bergen, Trondheim, and Narvik, the troops being carried northward by a fleet of fast warships, paratroops of the 7th Air Division would support the invasion. Diplomatic pressure on the Oslo government would do the rest. Characteristically, Hitler consulted neither Braukic nor Goring at this stage. Piqued by this, Goring refused to attach a Luftwaffe officer to Krank's staff. Hitler meanwhile put the campaign preparations in the hands of an infantry general, Nikolaus von Falkenhorst. Falkenhorst accepted the mission with alacrity and returned to the Chancellery on the 29th with a complete operational plan which now embraced Denmark as well. On March 1, Hitler signed the directive, Weserubung. The army at once protested at this introduction of a new theatre. Goring stormed into the Chancellery and refused to subordinate his squadrons to Falkenhorst's command. Only the navy committed itself body and soul to the campaign. Hitler wanted the campaign launched soon, before the British and French could beat him to it. Huell brought him telegram after telegram from Helsinki, Trondheim, and Oslo hinting at the Allied preparations to land in Scandinavia on the pretext of helping Finland, which had in the meantime been attacked by the Soviet Union. Hitler orally ordered the service commands to speed up their planning. Goring was still discontented, and when Falkenhorst reported progress on March 5, he expressed loud contempt for all the army's joint planning work so far. The risk of an Allied intervention in Scandinavia was too great. Through Rosenberg, Hitler received from Quisling's men in Oslo urgent proof that the British and French invasion plans were far advanced. At lunch on the 6th, Hitler leaned over to Rosenberg and said, I read your note. Things are looking bad. The crisis reached its blackest point on March 12. A torrent of dispatches from Moscow and Helsinki revealed that armistice talks had begun. London began frantic attempts to keep the Finnish war alive a few more days. Winston Churchill flew in person to Paris on the 11th to inform the French government that his expeditionary force was to sail for Narvik on March 15. At 3.30 p.m. on the 12th Hitler's Forschung Samt intercepted an urgent telephone call from the Finnish envoy in Paris to his foreign ministry in Helsinki, reporting that Churchill and Daladier had promised him that if the Finns would appeal for help at once, British and French troops would land in Norway. That really put the fat in the fire. Hitler ordered all German invasion plans accelerated, and the forces to stand by for the so-called immediate op. Emergency. By next morning, however, the Russians had signed an armistice with Finland, and this immediate crisis was over. The German Admiralty's intercepts of coded British radio messages clearly indicated to Hitler that the British and French had been on the brink of landing in Norway. The fact that their troop transports were still on extended sailing alert proved however that the Allies had only postponed their invasion. German invasion preparations returned to a more leisurely pace. For the time being, Hitler withheld the executive order for the operation. He is still searching for a sufficient reason, Jodl wrote in his diary. We have seen how Hitler concerned himself however not only with grand strategy but with the most minute interlocking elements of each operation.
the position of the demolition charges on canal bridges, the thickness of the concrete in his fortifications, the caliber of the guns commanding the Norwegian fjords. In this he was aided by a phenomenal memory and technical insight into weapons design. On his bedside table lay the latest edition of Weyer's Tashken which der Kriegsflotten, a naval handbook like Jane's fighting ships, for the Führer to commit to memory as though he were preparing for some astounding music hall act. It was he who first demanded that 75mm long barrel guns be installed in German tanks, and it was he who pinpointed one common error in German warship design building the forecastle so low that in heavy seas it tended to cut beneath the waves. On his birthday in 1937, the proud navy had presented him with a model of the Schkarnhorst, late that evening he had sent for his adjutant Putkama, and invited him to crouch and squint along the model's decks with him. He was right, of course, and even at that late stage the forecastle had to be redesigned. When the Red Book of Arms production reached him each month, he would take a scrap of paper and, using a colored pencil, scribble down a few random figures as he ran his eyes over the columns. He would throw away the paper, but the figures remained indelibly in his memory, column by column, year after year, to confound his more fallible aides with the proof of their own shortcomings. Once, late in 1940, Key Eitel presented the figures on the total ammunition expended in the recent French campaign but Hitler responded that in 1916 the German armies had consumed far more 210mm and 150mm ammunition each month, and he stated the precise quantities from memory. Afterward Key Eitel wearily instructed his adjutant to forward those new figures to the OKW's munitions procurement office. That is the new program. If the Führer says it's, you can take it that it's right. Although the OKW maintained its own munitions procurement office under General Georg Thomas, Key Eitel readily echoed Hitler's mounting criticism of the arms production effort during the winter. In vain Key Eitel warned that huge production figures could not be attained if the high quality of modern ammunition was not to be jeopardized. Hitler himself drew up a new production program in which priority was given to mine production for the naval and Luftwaffe blockade of Britain and to huge monthly outputs of artillery ammunition. Key Eitel issued the program to the Army Ordnance Office, headed by a 60-year-old professor, General Karl Becker. By mid-January 1940, the latter had objected that Hitler's program could not be met to the remotest extent. Hitler was already toying with the idea, first put to him by Goring, who lost no opportunity to criticize the army's feeble ordnance office, of appointing a civilian munitions minister to take arms and munitions production out of the hands of the bureaucratic army staff officers. When in February the army ordnance office reported the previous month's production figures, Hitler found this the last straw. Production of the most important weapons had actually declined. In the two main calibers of shell the Führer's program figures would not be reached even by April. At the end of February, Goring appointed Dr. Fritz Tott as a special troubleshooter to locate the bottlenecks in the munitions industry and recommend ways of stepping up production. Tott convinced Hitler that if the industry was given the system of self-responsibility that had functioned so well in the construction of the Autobahns and of the West Wall, Hitler's impossible production figures could be achieved. In March, Hitler appointed Tott his munitions minister. It was as much rebuff to Key Eitel as to General Becker, who sensed his disgrace keenly and committed suicide not long after the first of a sorry band of such German generals whose only common denominator was a failure to come up to Hitler's expectations. On March 1, 1940 Hitler had secretly summoned the party's Gauleiters to the Chancellery and blamed the weather for their lack of action in the West. He assured them the war would be over in six months, his new weapons would force the enemy to their knees. Without doubt he was alluding to the mass mine-laying operations the Luftwaffe was shortly to begin using the magnetic mine against which he believed the Allies had no defense. The Führer is a genius, recorded Goebbels afterwards. He's going to build the first Germanic people's empire. Italy's uncertain stance continued to trouble Hitler. 
Roosevelt had sent his Undersecretary of State, Sumner Wells, to sound the engaged European capitals on the prospects of peace. Hitler studied the Italian communiques on Wells's Rome talks and compared them with the Fischhung Samt intercepts of the secret Italian dispatches. In his own talks with the American he adhered rigidly to his argument that since this was Britain's war, it was up to Britain to end it. On March 4, Hitler repeated that to a General Motors vice president, James D. Mooney, the current war can only be brought to an end by the other countries giving up their war aims, meaning the annihilation of Germany, Germany, he said, had no war aims. Britain's heavy-handed dealings with Mussolini reinforced Hitler's Axis position. To force Mussolini to take his trade negotiations with Britain seriously, the British imposed a naval blockade on Italy's coal supplies at the beginning of March. Hitler stepped in with an immediate offer of a million tons of coal a month. He instructed Jodl's staff to provide him with a folder of charts, including one grossly faking Germany's actual military strength crediting her with 207 divisions instead of her actual 157, and met Mussolini at the Brenner Pass on March 18. It was their first encounter since Munich. Mussolini arrived with the air of a schoolboy who had not done his homework, as Hitler later put it. The Führer impressed upon him that the Duce could decide the best moment to declare war, but that he, Hitler, would recommend doing so only after the first big German offensive. The Duce promised to lose no time, but admitted that he would prefer Yellow to be delayed for three or four months until Italy was properly prepared. Hitler hugely exaggerated Germany's prospects. Her armies were more powerful than in 1914, she had more ammunition than she could use, production of Junkers 88 aircraft and submarines was surging forward. As for the British, once France had been subdued, Britain would come to terms with Hitler. The British are extraordinarily determined in defence, he said, but quite hopeless at attacking, and their leadership is poor. Despite all his protestations however Hitler still mistrusted the Italians, for he imparted to Mussolini neither the impressive operational plan that he and Manstein had evolved for victory in the West, nor even the barest hint at his intentions in Scandinavia. In the directive he soon after issued to Key Eitel, instructing the way Mac to resume staff talks with Italy, he stated explicitly that any Italian forces must be assigned a task as independent from the main German operations as possible, to minimize the problems inevitable in a coalition war. Hitler attempted in his private talk with Mussolini to convince him that Russia was changed though how far these words were intended for Soviet consumption is a matter of speculation. He reminded Mussolini that he had always wanted to march side by side with the British. But Britain, he said, prefers war. There were less abstract reasons for his insistence that German industry deliver the goods to Stalin. So long as their pact was in force, it released 60 high-grade divisions for Hitler to employ in the attack on France. His innermost intentions, the Black Nugget, lay never far beneath the surface. Perhaps the Russians could have guessed at them, for in 1940 a new reprint of Mein Kampf went on sale, in which Chapter 14, with its clear statement of his plan to invade the East, remained unexpunged. In conversation with Mussolini Hitler touched on the enforced evacuation of the German-speaking population from the South Tyrol. He cryptically explained that he planned to resettle these people in a beautiful region that I do not yet have but will certainly be procuring, he must have already been looking ahead to the day when his armies would be standing astride the Crimea. On March 22, 1940, Adolf Hitler again headed south, flying to the Berghof for the Easter weekend. Captain Engel took the opportunity of this long flight to hand him a report General Guderian had compiled on the training standards of the Soviet troops in Finland. Hitler returned it with the laconic commentary, Och die müssen wir vernichten. Dash we must destroy them too. Hors d'oeuvre. On Easter Monday, March 25, 1940, Hitler returned to the Chancellery in Berlin. The next time he was to see the Obersalzberg mountain it would be high summer, 
and he would be master of all northern Europe from North Cape in Norway to the Spanish Pyrenees. At noon on the day after Hitler's return to Berlin, Admiral Redder put it to him that although a British invasion of Norway now seemed less imminent than it had two weeks earlier, the Germans would do well to seize the initiative and now. It would be best to occupy Norway on April 7, by the 15th the nights would already be too short. Hitler agreed. Redder also asked Hitler to authorize an immediate resumption of Luftwaffe mine laying operations, as it seemed that the secret of the magnetic mine was now out, although both Key Eitel and Goring wanted the mine laying campaign delayed until yellow began. The Fuhrer directed that it must begin immediately. Against Goring's advice, Hitler also allowed himself to be persuaded by Redder on another issue. The Führer had originally wanted the dozen destroyers that were to carry troops to Narvik and Trondheim to remain as a source of artillery support and to boost the morale of the troops they had landed, as he put it to Jodl one evening in his map room, he could not tolerate the navy promptly scuttling out. What would the landing troops make of that? But Redder dug his heels in. The most perilous phase of the whole invasion campaign, he insisted would be the withdrawal of the warships from northern Norway to the safety of German waters under the nose of the most powerful navy in the world. Redder was prepared to risk his fleet for Norway, but he would not stand by and see it frittered away. Intelligence on Britain's intentions in Scandinavia hardened. Far more important was that Hitler now learned of an allied Supreme War Council decision in London on March 28 to develop a two-stage Scandinavian operation early in April. The cynical Allied master plan was to provoke Hitler into an over-hasty occupation of southern Norway by laying mines in Norway's neutral waters, Hitler's move would then justify a full-scale Allied landing at Narvik in the north to seize the railroad to the Swedish shore fields. This first stage would later be coupled with several operations farther south. On March 30 German intelligence intercepted a Paris diplomat's report on a conversation with Paul Renaud. France's new premier. Renaud had assured this unidentified diplomat that in the next few days the Allies would be launching all important operations in Northern Europe. On the same day, Churchill broadcast on the BBC a warning to Norway that the Allies would continue the fight wherever it might lead them. Churchill's designs on Norway were known to German intelligence from a series of incautious hints he dropped in a secret press conference with neutral press attaches in London on February 2, small wonder that Hitler later referred more than once to the indiscretions committed by Renaud and Churchill as providing the final urgent stimulus for his own adventure. An intercepted Swiss legation report from Stockholm claimed that British and German invasions of the Norwegian coast were imminent. After spending two days investigating every detail of the operation with all the commanders involved, Hitler decided that the first assault on Norway's coastline was to take place at 5.15 am on the 9th. The nervous strain on Hitler would have overwhelmed most men. Perhaps the very idea was too audacious to succeed. When on April 1st he personally addressed the hand-picked commanders, one report noted, the Führer describes the operation as one of the cheekiest operations in recent military history. But in this he sees the basis for its success. At 2 a.m. on April 3, the operation passed the point of no return. The first three transports camouflaged as coal vessels sailed from Germany, bound with the tanker Kattegat for Narvik, a thousand miles to the north. Four more coal ships dash three for Trondheim and one for Stavanger, were ready in German ports. All carried heavy equipment, artillery, ammunition, and provisions concealed beneath the coal. The initial assault troops would be carried on fast warships, some entering the Norwegian ports under cover of the British flag. Ten destroyers would carry 2,000 troops to Narvik, escorted by the battleships Skarnhorst and Nisnau. Another 1,700 troops would be landed at Trondheim by the cruiser Hipper and four destroyers. Thousands of assault troops would be landed at five other ports by virtually the rest of the German Navy, a fleet of cruisers, torpedo boats, whalers, mine sweepers, submarine chasers, tugs, and picket boats. Troop reinforcements would arrive during the day in 15 merchant ships bound for Oslo, Kristiansand, Bergen, and Stavanger. 
if anything prematurely befell even one of these ships laden with troops in field gray, the whole operation would be betrayed. That afternoon the War Department notified him that the railroad movement of invasion troops from their assembly areas in the heart of Germany to the Baltic dockyards had begun on schedule. From Helsinki came fresh word of an imminent British operation against Narvik, Swedish and Norwegian officers tried to assure Berlin that the Allies were just trying to provoke Germany into an ill-considered preventive campaign, but Hitler remained unconvinced. He already felt that the Swedes knew more than was good for them. Equally ominous were the telephone conversations the Fischhung Samt now intercepted between the Danish military attaché and the Danish and Norwegian ministers in Berlin, in which the attaché urgently asked for immediate interviews with them as he had something of the utmost political significance to tell them. During the night of April 7, the German fleet operation began. The warships sailed. A further stiffening in the Norwegian attitude to Germany was detected. Norwegian coastal defences were on the alert, lighthouses were extinguished. Norwegian pilots for the coal ships waiting to pass northward through the leads to Narvik and Trondheim were only slowly forthcoming, was this deliberate Norwegian obstructionism? Soon the entire German invasion fleet was at sea. Hitler was committed to either a catastrophic defeat, with the certain annihilation of his navy, or to a spectacular victory. Early on April 8, the German legation in Oslo telephoned Berlin with the news that British warships had just begun laying minefields in Norwegian waters. This violation of Norway's neutrality could hardly have been more opportune for Hitler's cause. In Oslo, there was uproar and anger, the redoubled Norwegian determination to defend their neutrality caused Reda to order his warships to abandon their original intention of entering the Norwegian ports under the British flag. The elation in Berlin was shattered by a second telephone call from the Oslo legation in the early evening. The Rio de Janeiro, a slow-moving merchant ship headed for Bergen with horses and a hundred troops, had been torpedoed a few hours earlier off the Norwegian coast. But Hitler's luck still held. In Berlin the naval staff was confident that the British would wrongly conclude that these warship movements were an attempted breakout into the Atlantic. Reda had insisted on attaching battleships to the first group, and this was now vindicated, for the British were indeed deceived, and deployed their forces far to the north of the true seat of operations. Only now did Hitler send for Dr. Goebbels and inform him, during a stroll in the Chancellery Garden, of what was afoot. The minister ventured to inquire what reaction he anticipated from Washington. Material aid from them can't come into play for about eight months, responded Hitler, and manpower not for about a year and a half. In the small hours of April 9, Berlin picked up a Norwegian radio signal reporting strange warships entering the Oslo Fjord. Hitler knew that the toughest part of the operation had begun. But shortly before 6 a.m. German signals from the forces were monitored. They called for U-boats to stand guard over the port entrances. Access to Norway had now been forced. General von Falkenhorst reported at 5.30, Norway and Denmark occupied. As instructed. Hitler himself drafted the German news agency report announcing that the Danish government had submitted, grumbling, and almost without a shot having been fired, to German force measure. Grinning from ear to ear. He congratulated Rosenberg, now Quisling can set up his government in Oslo. In southern Norway the strategically well-placed airfield at Stavanger had been captured by German paratroops, assuring Hitler of immediate air superiority, at Oslo itself five companies of paratroops and airborne infantry landed on Fornbu airfield. A small party of infantry marched with band playing into the Norwegian capital and Oslo fell. When the gold embossed supper menu was laid before Hitler that evening, the main course of macaroni, ham, and green salad was appropriately prefaced by smorbrød, a Scandinavian hors d'oeuvre, smorbrød. Hitler confided to his adjutants that if his navy were to do naught else in this war, it had justified its existence by winning Norway for Germany. Its losses had been heavy. In the final approach to Oslo along the 50-mile-long Oslo Fjord, Germany's newest heavy cruiser, 
the Blutcher, was disabled by the ancient Krupp guns of a Norwegian coastal battery and finished off by torpedoes with heavy loss of life. Off Bergen the cruiser Konigsberg was also hit by a coastal battery, and was sunk the next day by British aircraft. South of Kristiansand, the cruiser Karlsruhe was sunk by a British submarine. Three more cruisers were damaged and many of the supple vessels sunk. In one incident, however, the cruiser Hipper and four destroyers bearing 1700 troops to Trondheim were challenged by the coastal batteries guarding the fjord. The Hipper's commander, Captain Hay, signaled ambiguously in English, I come on government instructions. By the time the puzzled gunners opened fire, the ships were already passed. Over lunch that day, April 9, Hitler again began boasting to Dr. Goebbels of a coming new Germanic Empire. At Narvik however a real crisis was beginning. Ten destroyers had landed General Eduard Dietl's 2,000 German and Austrian mountain troops virtually unopposed, for the local Norwegian commander was a quisling sympathizer. Only the tanker Jan Wellem arrived punctually from the naval base provided by Stalin at Murmansk, the ten destroyers could refuel only slowly from this one tanker, they could not be ready to return before late on the 10th. Earlier that day however five British destroyers penetrated the fjord, in the ensuing gunplay and the battle fought the three days later, the aging British battleship Warspight and a whole flotilla of destroyers sank all ten German destroyers, though not before they had taken a toll from the British. Thus half of Redder's total destroyer force had been wiped out. When over the next two days news arrived of British troops landing at Harstad, not far north of Narvik, and at Namsos, to the north of Trondheim, the military crisis brought Hitler to the verge of a nervous breakdown. Had the diplomatic offensive in Oslo been prepared with the same thoroughness as the military invasion, the Norwegian government could have been effectively neutralized. When the Blutcher sank in Oslo Fjord, the assault party detailed to arrest the Norwegian government had founded with her. As a result, the king and government had had time to escape the capital, and the local German envoy, Kurt Breyer, was not equal to the situation. On April 10, both king and government had been amenable to negotiation, but Breyer wanted them to recognize Major Quisling's new government and left the talks without awaiting the outcome of his proposals. The king refused, and a confused but still undeclared war between Norway and Germany began. Had Breyer not insisted on Quisling but dealt with the existing government instead, this situation would not have arisen. On April 14, the foreign ministry flew Theo Habeck to Oslo to make a last attempt to secure agreement with the king. But the British operations in Narvik stiffened the Norwegian resolve. Ribbentrop's representatives scraped together an administrative council of leading Oslo citizens but progress was slow and quite the opposite of what Hitler had wanted. He was apoplectic with rage at Breyer and Habicht for allowing these Norwegian lawyers to dupe them, he had wanted to see Quisling at the head of an ostensibly legal Norwegian government, not some lawyer's junta. The military crisis paralleled the diplomatic one. Neither Luftwaffe nor submarines could carry munitions, or reinforcements to General Dietl in any quantity. With his own 2,000 troops now augmented by the 2,000 shipless sailors of the destroyer force, he could not hold Narvik once the main British assault on the port began. It worried Hitler that they were mostly Austrians, for he had not yet wanted to place such a burden on the Ans class. By April 14, he was already talking to Braukic of abandoning Narvik and concentrating all effort on the defense of Trondheim, threatened by the British beachhead at Namsos and Andalsens. He planned to expand Trondheim into a strategic German naval base that would make Britain's Singapore seem child's play. Over the next few days, after repeated conferences with Goring, Milch, and Jess Cognac, he ordered the total destruction of Namsos and Andalsens and of any other town or village in which British troops set foot, without regard for the civilian population. He frowned at his adjutants and said, I know the British. I came up against them in the Great War. Where they once get a toehold there is no throwing them out again. On the 14th, he had somehow gained the impression that the British had already landed at Narvik. 
he knew of no other solution than that Dietl should fight his way southward to Trondheim. Hitler announced Dietl's promotion to lieutenant general and at the same time dictated to Key Eitel a message ordering Dietl to evacuate Narvik forthwith. The British would now take Narvik unopposed. Jodl wrote in his diary, The hysteria is frightful. Jodl's staff was scandalized by the Führer's lack of comportment in these days. Hitler's message to Dietl was never issued, however. Jodl's army staff officer, Colonel Bernhard von Losburg, refused to send out such a message, it was the product of a nervous crisis unparalleled since the darkest days of the Battle of the Marne in 1914. The whole point of the Norwegian campaign had been to safeguard Germany's iron ore supplies. Was Narvik now to be relinquished to the British without a fight? Jodl quietly advised him that this was the personal desire of the Führer. The colonel craftily persuaded Braukic to sign another message to Dietl, one congratulating him on his promotion and ending, I am sure you will defend your position, which is so vital to Germany, to the last man. Losberg handed this text to Jodl and tore up Key Eitel's handwritten Führer order before their eyes. Thus ended one day of the Narvik crisis. As each day passed, Jodl's voice was raised with more assurance. Eventually the Allies had landed some 12,000 British, French, and Polish troops to confront Dietl's lesser force. Jodl remained unimpressed, and when Hitler again began talking of abandoning Narvik, he lost his temper and stalked out of the cabinet room, slamming the door behind him with a noise that echoed around the Chancellery building. Throughout the 17th the argument raged back and forth between them. Hitler had again drafted a radio message ordering Dietl to withdraw. We cannot just abandon those troops, he exclaimed. Jodl retorted in his earthy Bavarian accent, Mein Führer, in every war there are times when the supreme commander must keep his nerve. Between each word, he rapped his knuckles on the chart table so loudly that they were white afterward. Hitler composed himself and replied, What would you advise? That evening Hitler signed a standfast order submitted by Jodl, but he made it abundantly clear in a preamble that he thought the whole northern position was bound to be overwhelmed by the Allies eventually. It was not one of his more felicitously worded messages. His 51st birthday passed without noticeable public enthusiasm. When Alfred Rosenberg presented him with a large porcelain bust of Frederick the Great, tears welled up in the Führer's eyes. When you see him, he said, you realize how puny are the decisions we have to make compared with those confronting him. Goring mentioned during an audience with Hitler that a mass resistance movement in Norway was growing. At the next conference Hitler announced his intention of transferring executive authority to Falkenhorst, the tough young Gorlick Trevesen, Joseph Turboven, would be appointed Reich Commissioner, answerable only to the Führer himself. Key Eitel, rightly fearing that Norway was now to suffer as Poland was already suffering, raised immediate objections. When Hitler's only reply was to snub the OKW chief, Key Eitel took a leaf from Jodl's book and stormed out of the conference chamber. On April 21, Turboven and his staff were en route for Oslo, ready to introduce a reign of terror to the Norwegian people. Again Hitler was plagued by sleepless nights. If the Luftwaffe generals were to be believed, Falkenhorst was in despair and already giving up Trondheim as lost. Hitler sent one officer after another to Norway to report to him on the progress of his two divisions of infantry struggling to bridge the 300 miles between Oslo and Trondheim. On April 22, he sent Schmunt by plane to Oslo with Colonel von Losberg. Losberg reported back to Hitler the next evening after a hazardous flight. So struck was he by the air of dejection in the Chancellery that he apparently forgot himself, when the Führer asked in what strength the British had now landed at Namsos and Andalsons, he exclaimed. Five thousand men, mein Führer. This, to Hitler, was a disaster, but the Colonel briskly interrupted him, Jorwell, mein Führer, only five thousand men. Falkenhorst controls all the key points so he could finish off the enemy even if they were far stronger. 
we must rejoice over every Englishman sent to Norway rather than to meet us in the West on the Meuse. Losberg was curtly dismissed from the conference chamber, and for weeks afterward he was not allowed into the Führer's presence. On the chart table, Losberg had left behind him a small sheaf of recently captured British military documents which he had brought with him from Oslo. A British infantry brigade fighting south of Andalsens had been put to flight and important files captured. The immense political importance of the find sank in overnight, the British brigade commander had previously been briefed on the plan to capture Stavanger, long before the German invasion of Norway. The British orders were dated April 2nd, 6th, and 7th. Other British landing operations had been planned at Bergen, Trondheim, and Narvik. The German operation had cut right across the British scheme. That is a gift from the gods, wrote a gleeful Dr. Goebbels. We missed disaster by hours. Churchill was waiting for reports of the English invasion, and the accursed Germans had got the first. Hitler was overjoyed. He personally mapped out the propaganda campaign to exploit them, until the small hours of the morning, he, Schmunt, and Jodl checked over the white book the foreign ministry was preparing. The hasty publication contained document facsimiles, translations, and statements of British officers as to the document's authenticity. Hitler himself met and talked to the British prisoners brought to Berlin from Norway. One of Holder's staff wrote at this time, the first British prisoners were flown to Berlin, shown to the Führer, wined and dined, and driven around Berlin for four hours. They just could not understand how things can look so normal here. Above all they were in perpetual fear of being shot, that's what they had been tricked into believing. Hearing a few days later that Polish prisoners had attacked the new British arrivals, Hitler asked that the next time photographers should be present to capture the scene of supposed allies at one another's throats. There was no denying the impact that Ribbentrop's White Book had on world opinion. Well might Hitler ask, who now dares condemn me if the Allies care so little for small states' neutrality themselves? At all events, on the very day the captured documents were released to the world, April 27, 1940. Hitler secretly announced to his staff the decision to launch Yellow in the first week of May. In the West, Hitler had marshaled 137 divisions, yet even so he was facing a numerically superior enemy. His intelligence agencies had pinpointed the position of 100 French divisions and 11 more divisions from the British Expeditionary Force, the Belgians had raised 23 divisions, and the Dutch 13. Added to this total of 147 divisions were 20 more holding the frontier fortifications. Hitler did not doubt the outcome of the forthcoming passage of arms. Jodl was years later to write, only the Führer could sweep aside the hackneyed military notions of the general staff and conceive a grand plan in all its elements, a people's inner willingness to fight, the uses of propaganda, and the like. It was this that revealed not the analytic mind of the staff officer or military expert in Hitler, but the grand strategist. On the eve of the assault on France and the Low Countries, Hitler was to proclaim to his assembled staff, Gentlemen, you are about to witness the most famous victory in history. Few viewed the immediate future as sanguinely as he. Now the real pressure was on. On April 30th, Hitler ordered the entire Wehrmacht to be ready to launch Yellow at 24 hours notice from the 5th. That day, General Jodl had confirmed to him that in Norway the German forces that had set out weeks before from Trondheim and Oslo had now linked, the Führer was delirious with joy. That is more than a battle won, it is an entire campaign. He exclaimed. Before his eyes he could already see the autobahn he would build to Trondheim, the Norwegian people deserved it. How utterly they differed from the Poles. Norwegian doctors and nurses had tended the injured until they dropped with exhaustion, the Polish subhumans had jabbed their eyes out. Moved by this comparison, on May 9, Hitler was to give his military commander in Norway an order which began as follows. The Norwegian soldiers burned all the cowardly and deceitful methods common to the Poles. He fought with open visor and honorably. 
and he tended our prisoners and injured properly and to the best of his ability. The civilian population acted similarly. Nowhere did they join in the fighting, and they did all they could for the welfare of our casualties. I have therefore decided in appreciation for this to authorize the liberation of the Norwegian soldiers we took prisoner. Hitler assembled his staff for a last run of secret conferences on the details of yellow, everybody was now standing by. The glider and parachute troops, the disguised Dutch policemen, the emissary, and two million men. The Luftwaffe's chief meteorologist sweated blood under the burden of responsibility that he alone now bore. On May 3, Hitler postponed yellow on his advice by one day, to Monday. On the 4th he again postponed it. On Sunday the 5th the forecast was still uncertain, so yellow was set down for Wednesday the 8th. On this deadline Hitler was determined, he ordered a special timetable printed for his headquarters staff as part of the elaborate camouflage of his real intentions. The timetable showed his train departing from a little station near Berlin late on May 7 and arriving next day in Hamburg en route for an official visit to Oslo. On May 7 however the Luftwaffe's meteorologist was adamant that there was still a strong risk of morning fog, so Hitler again postponed yellow by one day. On that day too the Fischhungsamt showed him two coded telegrams which the Belgian ambassador to the Vatican had just sent to his government. A German citizen who had arrived in Rome on April 29 had warned that Hitler was about to attack Belgium and Holland. The Abwehr was ordered to search out the informant, a supreme irony as the SS was to realize four years later, for the culprit was a minor member of Canaries' Abwehr network. In any case, the cat had been let out of the bag. Early on the 8th Holland was in a state of siege. Telephone links with foreign countries were cut. The government district of The Hague was cordoned off, and the guard on important bridges was increased. Hitler wanted to wait no longer, but Goring kept his nerve, the weather was improving daily, May 10 would be ideal. Hitler was torn between the counsels of his experts and the whispering voice of his intuition. Against all his instincts he reluctantly agreed to postpone yellow to May 10, but not one day after that. Early on the 9th Putkama, the duty adjutant, telephoned one of the westernmost corps headquarters, at Aachen, the chief of staff that told him there was some mist, but the sun was already breaking through. When the naval adjutant repeated this to Hitler, he announced, good. Then we can begin. The service commands were informed that the final orders to attack or postpone, code words Danzig and Augsburg, respectively would be issued by 9.30 p.m. at the latest. Extraordinary security precautions were taken, even within Hitler's own staff. Martin Bormann was left in the belief that they were to visit Oslo, even Julius Schaub, Hitler's longtime intimate, did not know the truth. During the afternoon Hitler and his staff drove out of Berlin to the railroad station at Finkenkrug, a popular excursion spot. Here Hitler's special train was waiting for them. It left at 4.38 p.m., heading north toward Hamburg, but after dusk fell, it pulled into the little country station of Hagino. When it set off again, even the uninitiated could tell it was no longer heading north, but south and west. Hitler retired early to his sleeping quarters, but the movement of the train and his apprehensions kept him from sleeping. Hour after hour he gazed out of the carriage window, watching for the first telltale signs of fog shrouds forming. An hour before dawn the train glided into a small station from which all the name indications had been removed. A column of three-axle off-road limousines was awaiting him in the semi-darkness. For half an hour he and his entourage were driven through the little Eiffel villages. He broke the silence only once. Turning to the Luftwaffe adjutant sitting next to Schaub on the jump seats of his car, he asked, has the Luftwaffe taken into account that here in the west the sun rises several minutes later than in Berlin? Von Below set his mind at rest. When his limousine stopped, Hitler clambered stiffly out. A former anti-aircraft position on the side of a hill had been converted to serve as his field headquarters. The nearest village had been completely evacuated and would serve for his lesser staff. 
it was already daylight. The air was filled with the sound of birds heralding the arrival of another dawn. From the two main roads on each side of this hill they could hear the heavy rumble of convoys of trucks heading westward. An adjutant pointed wordlessly to his watch, it was 5.35 a.m. far away they could hear the growing clamor of heavy artillery begin, and from behind them swelled a thunder of aircraft engines as the Luftwaffe fighter and bomber squadrons approached. Part 4, War of Liberation Renzi, Doc Horty der Trompetriffen Lange Holten im Klang Ertonen Dan Washeoff, Eilert All Herbei Frihiat Verkund de Kremerson. Doc Werdig, on Reis Rui. Zig Jedda, Das Aromas. Willkommen Nenit so den Tag. Erash you kund Jurishmark. Richard Wagner's opera Renzi. Hitler discusses fortifications with Field Marshal Wilhelm Kiitel, left, and General Franz Holder, Walter Frentz. The warlord at the Western Front. On May 10, 1940, the Volkisabbukta, chief organ of the Nazi party, rolled off the presses in Berlin, Munich, and Vienna with red banner headlines, Germany's decisive struggle has begun. And the Führer at the Western Front. After half an hour's tough arguing, Ki Eitel had persuaded Hitler to allow the OKW communique to end with the announcement that he himself had gone to the Western Front to take command. Hitler was loath to steal his general's thunder. His prestige was high. General Erwin Rommel, now commanding a panzer division in the West, had written in a letter on April 21, Ah, if we didn't have the Führer. Who knows whether any other German exists with such a genius for military leadership and such a commensurate mastery of political leadership too. As a military commander, Adolf Hitler remained an enigma even to his closest associates. Alfred Jodl, perhaps his most able strategic advisor, was to write from a prison cell that he still asked himself whether he had really known the man at whose side he had led a such a thorny and self-denying existence. I keep making the same mistake, I blame his humble origins. But then I remember how many peasant sons were blessed by history with the name the Great. General Zietzler also grappled with this phenomenon, though more analytically. I witnessed Hitler in every conceivable circumstance, in times of fortune and misfortune, of victory and defeat, in good cheer and in angry outburst, during speeches and conferences, surrounded by thousands, by a mere handful, or quite alone, speaking on the telephone, sitting in his bunker, in his car, in his plane, in brief on every conceivable occasion. Even so, I can't claim to have seen into his soul or perceived what he was after. Zietzler saw him as an actor, with every word, gesture, and grimace under control. His penetrating stare practiced for hours before some private mirror. He won over newcomers from the first handshake and piercing look, and paradoxically appeared the very embodiment of the strong and fearless leader, of honesty and open heart. He cultivated the impression that he cared deeply for his subordinate's well-being. He would telephone a departing general at midnight, please don't fly. It's such foul weather and I'm worried about your safety. Or he would look a minor official in the eye and explain, now I'm telling you this privately, and you must keep it strictly under your hat. The surviving records are full of examples of the congenial impression Hitler made on others. Rommel proudly wrote on June 3, the Führer's visit was fabulous. He greeted me with the words, Rommel. We were all so worried about you during the attack. Milch wrote down Hitler's words to him on April 21, 1941, after a particularly hazardous return flight from North Africa, thank goodness you got back. In June 1941 Albert Speer's office chronicle noted, the Führer sent a telephone message from the Oberst Salzburg begging Herr Speer to drop the proposed visit to Norway, as things are too uncertain up there and Herr Speer is indispensable to him. In February 1943 Field Marshal Wolfram von Richthofen wrote in his diary, Finally the Führer inquired very anxiously about my health. In mid-war Hitler would halt urgent conferences with hungry generals for half an hour to allow his stenographers to eat. One wrote in his diary on February 20, 1943, 
At the noon conference the heater promised by the Führer is indeed there, a small china stove. In the afternoon, before a brief reception of seven officers hand-picked for special missions for which the Führer briefs them in a short speech, he inquired in General Schmunt's presence whether the stove was warm enough for us. When we said it was, he was hugely pleased and laughed out loud. His assessment of character was instant and deadly. A member of Jodl's staff, Captain Ivo Thilo von Trother, wrote in 1946, My impression was that the Führer clearly recognized the human weaknesses of his colleagues and stood aloof from them. Once he snatched a document from Key Eitel's hands and threw it on the floor. Key Eitel meekly gathered it up. Hitler judged newcomers after only a glance. Of one army commander he sourly commented, he looks like a school teacher. Dash and since for him every teacher was a stistrummeler, or buttock thrasher, that general's career was clearly at an end. Holder was to refer to his unusual intellect and grasp, his imaginativeness and willpower. Jodl wrote that in the French campaign Hitler's leadership was clear, consistent, and capable. Jodl considered that in drafting the terms of the armistice with fallen France, Hitler showed a generosity that gave cause to hope that of the two warring impulses within him it was the better that was gaining ground. In later campaigns he asserted himself to the other extreme. The classical early Führer directive, in which his commanders were given a broad mission and left to their own discretion in carrying it out, was increasingly supplemented and supplanted by Führer orders, in which Hitler intervened in the tactical operations at every level. Hitler's headquarters for Yellow were at Munstriffel. He found the underground command post here very cramped. Alone in his room, with its folding bed, table, and chair, he could hear every sound made by Key Eitel and Jodl next door. He preferred to hold his war conferences in the open air. He privately suggested to his staff that when the war was over they should all return each year to Munsteriffel, my bird paradise. The site remained unchanged until 1944, it had been intended as a permanent memorial to Hitler's war of liberation. As the Luftwaffe had predicted, May 10, 1940, dawn fine. Soon messengers brought him the exhilarating news that the British and French armies had begun pouring into Belgium. In October 1941, his armies now before Moscow, Hitler still remembered the thrill of that moment. I could have wept for joy. They'd fallen right into my trap. It was a crafty move on our part to strike toward Liege, we had to make them believe we were remaining faithful to the old Schlieffen plan. How exciting it will be later to go over all those operations once again. Several times during the night I used to go to the operations room to pore over those relief maps. The Belgians and Dutch were not unprepared. As one of Jodl's staff noted, our troops were storming an enemy who was ready and waiting for our attack to begin early on May 10. Ironically it was Kenrizes Abwehr that was appointed to find out how the enemy suspicions had been aroused, the Abwehr adroitly diverted suspicion to a senior foreign ministry official. Extreme anxiety reigned at Hitler's headquarters. One of Jodl's officers was accompanying the first wave of tanks invading Holland and Belgium with a radio truck, instructed to report direct to Hitler on the state of the bridges over the Meuse and the Albert Canal. The Dutch had evidently managed to blow up both bridges across the Meuse north and south of Maastricht. The Abwehr's Special Battalion 100, the Trojan Horse, had suffered fearful casualties. But the Belgian bridges across the Albert Canal, where a hundred troops had silently landed in gliders as dawn broke, were intact, except for one at Cannes. By 4.30 p.m., Hitler learned that the 4th Panzer Division had actually forded the Meuse. At Ebenim a band of intrepid German engineer troops armed with hollow charge explosives had landed by glider and immobilized the entire fortress, the underground gun crews were sealed in. Their artillery was knocked out. By early next morning, May 11, a temporary bridge had been thrown across the Meuse at Maastricht, and an armored brigade had crossed. Ebenemal capitulated at midday, and with this, Belgium's fate was effectively sealed.
in the north a four-day battle raged as the Dutch tried to wipe out the paratroops and glider-borne infantry landed at Rotterdam and the Hague, bombers squadrons had already taken off to relieve the pressure on the paratroops at Rotterdam on May 14 when word arrived that the Dutch were capitulating. Only half the bombers could be recalled, the rest dropped nearly a hundred tons of bombs on the town, 900 people died in the subsequent inferno. The next day Holland formally surrendered. It was now time for Hitler's masterstroke. His main offensive was to start far to the south, at Sedan, where General von Klist Sama had just crossed the Meuse. On May 14, Hitler directed that all available panzer and mechanized divisions were to assemble for a rapid push from this bridgehead westward and then northwestward to the English Channel. The course of the operation so far shows that the enemy has not perceived the basic idea of our own operation, the eventual breakthrough by Army Group A, Rundstedt. They are still moving up powerful forces to a line extending from Antwerp to Namur and apparently neglecting the sector confronting Army Group A. From this moment on, only a resolute commander supported by outstanding military intelligence could have saved France. General Gerd von Rundstedt is said to have remarked that he would have found it much more interesting to fight the rest of the campaign in the shoes of France's Army Chief of Staff, General Maurice Gamelin. Again, as in the Norwegian campaign, Hitler's nerve briefly left him. When Braukic made his regular twice daily telephone call, Hitler bombarded him about minutiae of which the army's thorough preparations had long taken care. As Klist Sama swept onward toward the Channel coast, on May 17 Hitler intervened to order that they halt to allow the slower infantry divisions time to catch up. Holder's intelligence branch, Foreign Armies West, had consistently estimated that half the Anglo-French forces were in the north, waiting to be cut off. Victory euphoria gripped Berlin. Goebbels wrote privately on the 19th, since 1938 we have conquered seven European countries. Hitler however was fearful of overreaching himself. He drove to Rundstedt's headquarters, nervously studied the tactical maps, and on his return to his own headquarters spread a wholly unnecessary gloom about the danger from the south. When Halder and Braukic saw him the next day, he was raging that the army was needlessly running the risk of defeat. Not until May 20 was this crisis over. The army reported that there were at least 20 enemy divisions trapped north of the Somme, in the evening, when Braukic telephoned Hitler with the news that the tanks had reached the Channel coast, Hitler was ecstatic with praise for the army and its commanders. His health mirrored these euphoric victories. Personal physician Morrill wrote on May 26, asked the Führer a few days back if he's got any complaints. He said he feels fine apart from one thing, he still has an appetite that's far too large. He really is getting along famously. According to Jodl, the Führer spoke of the peace treaty he would now make with France, he would demand the return of all the territories and properties robbed from the German people these last 400 years, and he would repay the French for the ignominious terms inflicted on Germany in 1918 by conducting the first peace negotiations at the same spot in the forest of Kampen. Hitler jubilantly predicted that this victory would right the wrongs done by the Peace of Westphalia which had concluded the Thirty Years' War and established France as the dominant power in Europe. It was this victory psychosis, prematurely sprung upon his military staff, that was to prove his undoing at Dunkirk. For a while Hitler turned his attention to long-range planning. He was not keen to fight the British Empire, not because he feared the outcome, but because he liked the English. While freely defaming Churchill and his ministers as war criminals, he often spoke to his private staff and to Dr. Goebbels, certainly no Anglophile himself, of this fondness for the British. The Führer's intention, Goebbels had recorded on April 21 is to administer one knockout punch. Even so, he would be ready to make peace today, on condition that Britain stay out of Europe and give us back our colonies. He does not want at all to crush Britain or to destroy her empire. They, the British, could have had peace on the most agreeable of terms, the Führer side a few days later to Goebbels. Instead they are fighting a war and shattering their empire to the core.
and he added some days after that, on May 7th, we are neither able nor willing to take over their empire. There are some people whom you can talk sense into oh, only after you've knocked out their front teeth. The second phase of the campaign faced him therefore with something of a dilemma. On May 20th he already conferred about this with Braukic and Halder. His earlier eagerness for Italian divisions to join in an offensive on the Upper Rhine front had evaporated. He wrote to Mussolini with word of his latest victories, but Mussolini's replies were an uninspiring amalgam of polite applause and qualified promises of later belligerency. Indeed, an awkward disparity of aims was now emerging, for Italy the main enemy was now Britain, while Hitler hoped and believed that he could oblige Britain to come to terms with him. When Jodl a few days later suggested that an immediate invasion of England be prepared, the few roundly rejected the idea without explaining why. We must conclude that he believed that the blockade by submarine and bomber operations would force Britain to submit, for he indicated that after France's defeat he would concentrate on the production of submarines and Junkers 88 bombers. The ever-present Russian threat to Germany was still a distant one. From the slow rate at which airfield construction was progressing in the Russian-occupied border regions, it seemed clear that Germany still had a breathing space during which the Kremlin would continue to appease Hitler. Molotov had expressed Russia's genuine relief that Germany had managed to invade Norway before the Allies had, and he had received word of yellow with equal sympathy, but this honeymoon would not last any longer than served the Russian purpose. How else is one to interpret the Führer's cryptic remark to Halder on April 24, 1940, we have an interest in seeing to it that their, Romanian, oil fields keep supplying us until next spring at the least, after that we shall be freer. Romania was now exporting over 130,000 tons of oil a month to Germany, nothing must endanger these oil fields. A Balkan quagmire, Hitler's nightmare. At the end of May the risk became acute as rumors multiplied of Italian plans to attack Yugoslavia, this would free Hungary to attack Romania and Russia would use this as a pretext to invade Romania as well. On May 20 the German military attaché in Moscow quoted to Berlin reliable details of Soviet troop concentrations on the Romanian frontier. Molotov denied them, but the facts spoke for themselves. Braukic urged Hitler on the 22nd to do something to curb these Russian ambitions, Hitler responded that he hoped to limit the Russian expansion to Bessarabia. Weiz Sacker wrote a curious passage in his private diary on May 23, assuming there is a crushing victory in the West, the obvious next move would be to create order in the East as well, that will give breathing space and river frontiers, an order that will endure. Whether Britain submits at once or has to be bombed into her senses, the fact is there will probably have to be one more squaring of accounts in the East. Nothing yet indicated that London might already have decided to evacuate northern France. On the contrary, Hitler was convinced that the British would fight to the last round. On May 21 there was a minor crisis when British and French tanks sprang an unexpected attack on the inner flank of the German 4th Army at Arras. Both Hitler and Rundstedt took this as a warning that the armoured spearhead of Army Group A had advanced too fast, and Rundstedt ordered the 4th Army and Kliss's armoured group to delay their advance on the Channel ports until the crisis was resolved. Braukic and Halder regretted Rundstedt's overcautious conduct of the operations of Army Group A, bearing up on the Channel ports from the southwest and without informing Hitler they ordered control of the 4th Army transferred to General von Bock's Army Group B, which was advancing on the ports from the east. Bock was to command the last act of the encirclement. Hitler learned of this when he visited Rundstedt's headquarters at Charleville the next morning, May 24. The 4th Army was ordered for the time being to stay where it was. It was tactically foolhardy, claimed Hitler to commit tanks in the swampy Flanders lowlands to which the War Department would have sent them. The previous day the 4th Army's General Gunter Hans von Kludge had himself persuaded Rundstedt it would be better to allow Kleist's arm a time to regroup for a more methodical assault on the 25th. Rundstedt's proposal, stated to Hitler on May 24, went one stage further, 
his armor should remain where it was and give an appropriate welcome to the enemy forces swept westward by Box Army Group B, this pause would give the tanks a valuable respite. There was a political element too in this controversial decision. Hitler desired to spare Belgium's relatively friendly Flemish population the destruction of property this closing act of yellow would entail. At all events, Hitler did not hesitate to lend his authority to Rundstedt's decision to rein in the tanks. At 12.30 the Führer's headquarters telephoned the halt order, the tanks were to stand fast west of the canal line, there could be no talk of his going soft on the British, because that same day, in a directive giving guidelines for the further campaign against Britain, Hitler merely indicated in passing that the Luftwaffe's present job in the north was to break all resistance of the encircled enemy and prevent any British forces from escaping across the channel. Thus the tanks remained rooted to the spot, as Halder bitterly commented in his diary. Hitler refused to set the tanks in motion. One more factor had arisen. On the evening of the 25th he explained to his adjutants that he particularly wanted the SS elite brigade under Septi Trick to join in this crucial action at Dunkirk. His intention was to show the world that he had troops equal to the best that even such a racially advanced nation as Britain could field against him. By May 26, Septi Trick's Lubstandarte Adolf Hitler was in position. On that morning, too, Rundstedt's staff changed their attitude since radio monitoring suggested that their appreciation of enemy intentions was wrong. The British seemed to be pulling out. Halder's Foreign Army's West Branch had certainly reported as early as May 21 that the unusual number of troops transports seen in Dunkirk and Boulogne might indicate that British troops were about to be evacuated, and the permanent radio link between the War Office in London and the BEF in France, first monitored the next day also suggested that events were being removed from French control. On May 26 at 1.30 pm Hitler told Braukic that the tanks might resume their eastward drive at once. They were to get within artillery range of Dunkirk, and the army's heavy artillery and the Luftwaffe would do the rest. From the air, the Luftwaffe could see that the British were embarking only their troops, abandoning all their equipment as they fled. The beaches were thick with waiting Englishmen, the roads were choked with truck columns 15 miles long. Goring boasted of the carnage his bombers were wreaking in Dunkirk Harbour. Only fishing boats are getting through. Let's hope the Tommies can swim. The reality, however, was different, the Luftwaffe bombers were largely based on airfields back in Germany, and either their bombs were ineffective against small ships or they exploded harmlessly in the sand dunes. More ominously, the German bombers proved no match for the short-range British fighters. The Germans found that for the first time the enemy had local air superiority, and their troubles were added to by the fact that at the end of May the Luftwaffe's 8th Air Corps was grounded by fog for three days. While these momentous events were transpiring in the West, in Germany's new eastern domains a ruthless program of subjugation and pacification had begun. On Sunday, May 25, the Reichsführer SS outlined to Hitler and the head of his chancellery, Hans Slammers, proposals for dealing with the various racial strains in Poland. Himmler handed the Führer his six-page plan for screening the population of these new dominions for adults and children of sufficiently pure blood to allow their assimilation into Germany. He proposed that all other children should be taught only the necessary rudiments simple counting up to 500, how to write their names, and lessons on the divine commandment to obey the Germans and be honest, industrious, and well behaved. Racially acceptable children could be evacuated to the right to receive a proper education. As Himmler pointed out, however cruel and tragic each individual case may be, this method is still the mildest and best if we are to reject as unhumanic, impossible and incompatible with our convictions the Bolshevik method of physically exterminating a race. After a few years of this racial sifting, he said, a low-grade potpourri of races would remain in the East. This population will be available to Germany as a leaderless labor force. They themselves will eat and live better than under Polish rule. And, given their own lack of culture, they will be well appointed to work under the strict, 
forthright, and just leadership of the German nation on its eternal cultural mission. As for the Jews, Himmler's plan disclosed, I hope to effect the complete disappearance of the Jew, from Europe, by means of a mass emigration of all Jews to Africa or some other such colony. Afterward, Himmler scribbled in his notebook, Memorandum on Poland. Führer warmly approves. A month later, Himmler took the opportunity of a train journey with Hitler to show him an eight-page plan for settling these eastern provinces with strong German stock. Himmler proposed that young unmarried German soldiers be induced to settle and work the land in the eastern provinces for up to eight years before marrying and taking over a farmstead or estate. The foreign laborers were to be kept in serfdom, attempts at sexual relations with their German overlords would be punishable by death. He afterward noted on the document, the Führer said that every point I made was right. By June 2, 1940 the British evacuation of Dunkirk was over. German army intelligence estimated that half the enemy forces had been swept from the battlefield, Braukic telephoned this information to Hitler that evening. The German army, with 136 divisions, was virtually intact. It would embark on the final defeat of France with a 2 to 1 superiority. Hitler's blueprint for this operation was largely determined by short term political factors Verdun must be captured as rapidly as possible. Overland contact must be made with Spain. Paris itself would be bypassed to the east and west for Hitler feared nothing more than that an 1871 style communist uprising in the capital might bring his forces into armed conflict with Soviet backed communists. The Maginot line would be taken from the rear. This second phase would begin at 5 a.m. on June 5th. Meanwhile, surrounded by party officials and personal bodyguards, Hitler toured the battlefields in northern France and Flanders. Moral who accompanied him, reported, we were on the road for two days. Brussels, the Flanders battlefields, Ypres, Loreto, Vimy Ridge, Bensheim, Courtrai, and Lille. As these areas were about the most densely populated on earth you can just imagine the devastation. A big square inches Lille, piled high with charred tree trunks and automobiles, was littered with dead horses, burned out tanks, and buildings. On the roads along which the British and French retreated there was a higgledy-piggledy tangle of cast-off clothing, abandoned guns, and broken down tanks, with stragglers streaming back home on both sides of the road, mostly on bicycles, laden with whatever they can carry. At Brussels, where Bock had assembled his senior generals, Hitler explained, Gentlemen, you will have wondered why I stopped the armored divisions outside Dunkirk. The fact was I could not afford to waste military effort. I was anxious lest the enemy launch an offensive from the Somme and wipe out the 4th Army's weak armored force, perhaps even going so far as Dunkirk. Such a military rebuff, as he put it, might have had intolerable effects in foreign policy. At Charleville the next day, June 2nd, he addressed Rundstedt and his generals. He outlined the new operation to them and informed them that Italy would shortly join in. He spoke of the reparations he proposed to exact from France. Once again he extolled Britain and her mission for the white race. It was not, he said, a matter of inconsequence to him which power ruled India. One general wrote in his diary, he points out that without a navy the equal of Britain's we could not hold on to her colonies for long. Thus we can easily find a basis for peace agreement with Britain. France on the other hand must be stamped into the ground, she must pay the bill. As he left the villa, crowds of cheering soldiers thronged his car. Hitler, every inch the warlord, acknowledged their acclaim. To Hitler the war seemed already won. He said as much to Admiral Canaries on June 3 when the intelligence chief came to report on the Abwehr agents who had been killed in the campaign so far and he repeated it to Admiral Redder the next day. Hitler's occupation policy in Holland and Belgium was to establish these Germanic states as border dependencies around a mighty German core. As early as November he had drafted a decree on the administration of the countries which were to be occupied in yellow. 
in the version he had signed on May 9 he had deleted the words there is to be no exploitation of the occupied regions in a selfish German interest. In Holland as in Norway he appointed a Reich Commissar to fill the vacuum left by the fleeing monarchy. He chose an Austrian, Arthur Sassinquart, evidently on Himmler's recommendation. Since Belgium had fought honorably and capitulated unconditionally, Hitler was inclined to leniency. He agreed to Goring's heartfelt request that King Leopold be chivalrously treated. A senior statesman, Otto Meissner, was sent to tell the king that if Belgium now acted sensibly his kingdom might yet survive, otherwise Hitler would create a new Gehor, Flanders. A telegram in German army files indicates that King Leopold was furious at the looting and willful destruction of his country by the withdrawing French and British troops, so Hitler's political wisdom in ordering his armies to spare the cities of Flanders from unnecessary visitations undoubtedly paid dividends. Here too Hitler appointed a German military governor, General Alexander von Falkenhorsen was a liberal commander and maintained liaison with the king. There was in consequence little resistance to the Nazi presence in Belgium. Hitler retrieved for Germany the former German areas of Uppen, Marmidi, and Moresnet which had been annexed by Belgium in 1918, he ordered Braukic to separate the Belgian prisoners of war into Flemings and Walloons. The former, 200,000 men of trusty Germanic stock, were to be released forthwith, while the latter, 150,000 less friendly prisoners, were to be held in continued pawn. For the second half of the French campaign, Hitler's staff had found a new headquarters site in southern Belgium, in the deserted village of Brulidbesch in a forest clearing. The whole headquarters, codenamed Forest Meadow, was ready with its anti-aircraft batteries and barbed wire entanglements by the time Hitler arrived on June 6. He never felt as secure here as he did at Munstriffel. Perhaps it was the swarms of mosquitoes that rose from the dense undergrowth to plague him, or perhaps it was a general impatience to end the war. Braukic often visited in person. Hitler had mellowed toward him, and seems to have taken him more into his confidence about his future military plans. For a while Hitler abandoned his idea of discarding Braukic. He could hardly do this to the commander-in-chief of a victorious army, as he mentioned to one adjutant. A member of the headquarters staff wrote of these weeks of waiting for the French collapse, every evening the Führerett privately with ten or twelve others. I remember we all debated the reason why the cuckoo makes a point of laying its eggs in other birds' nests. One of Hitler's secretaries wrote on June 13, for a week now we have been out front again in a deserted village. Every night we get the same performance, at precisely twenty past twelve, enemy aircraft come and circle over the village. If they don't come then, the chief dash meaning Hitler dash inquires, where's our airman on duty today then? At any rate every night finds us standing until half past three or four in the morning with the chief and other members of his staff in the open air watching the nocturnal aerial maneuvers until the reconnaissance planes vanish with the onset of dawn. The landscape at that hour of the morning reminds me of a painting by Caspar David Friedrich. On June 10, 1940, Italy formally declared war on Britain and France. Hitler made no attempt to disguise his contempt and forbade staff talks with the Italian forces. A member of Key Eitel's staff noted, the Führer's view is that since Italy left us in the lurch last autumn we are under no obligation to her now. In the foreign ministry sardonic comparisons were drawn between Mussolini and the traditional circus clown who rolled up the mats after the acrobats completed their performance and demanded that the audience applaud him, or again. The Italians were dubbed the Harvest Hands. The survives among the papers of Walla Hule the German government's communique announcing Italy's inauspicious action, with eloquent amendments written in Hitler's own hand. When the original text proclaimed, German and Italian soldiers will now march shoulder to shoulder and not rest until Britain and France have been beaten, Hitler irritably crossed out Britain and then redrafted the latter part to read apostrophe and will fight on until those in power in Britain and France are prepared to respect the rights of our two peoples to exist.
at the last meeting of the Supreme War Council held in France, Winston Churchill, the new British Prime Minister, begged the French to tie down the German forces by defending Paris. His appeal for yet more French blood to be spilled in Britain's cause may have rung cynically in his allies' ears, the French commanders left him in no doubt that for them the war was lost. The next day, June 13, one of Hitler's secretaries wrote, I personally cannot believe the war will go on after June. Yesterday there was a war council in Paris, Wagand declared the battle for Paris lost and suggested a separate peace, in which Pétain supported him, but Trenord and some other members thundered their protests against him. The French cabinet resigned and the aged Marshal Henri Philippe Pétain, veteran and hero of World War I, took over, Pétain desired an armistice and wanted to know the German terms. One of Jodl's staff later wrote, when he heard this news Hitler was so delighted that he made a little hop. I had never seen him unbend like that before. He decided to meet Mussolini to discuss the terms at once. Meanwhile, the Wehrmacht was ordered to take Cherbourg and Brest as a matter of honor, and to occupy the Alsace and particularly Strasbourg as a matter of political geography. For many days Hitler deliberated on the nature of the armistice itself he would invite the French to undergo the same indignities as they had visited on the defeated German generals in 1918 at Kampkne, it had been raining in 1918, and the Germans had been kept waiting in the downpour to humiliate them. Then however he softened. Hitler wanted to show the British how magnanimous he could be in victory. At Munich, he persuaded Mussolini to shelve Italian territorial claims until a final peace treaty. Only northern France and the Atlantic coast down to the Spanish frontier would be occupied by the Germans. The rest would remain under Pétain's control. When Admiral Reder asked him on the 20th if Germany could claim the fleet, Hitler replied that the German navy had no entitlement to the ships as the French fleet was unbeaten. The armistice therefore formally renounced all claim to the French fleet, the French might retain part to preserve their colonial interests the rest was to be taken out of commission. Otherwise the ships would be left unmolested, in fact Hitler wished for nothing better than that they might be scuttled by their crews. At noon on June 21, Hitler drove through the fog-shrouded roads of northern France to the forest of Compton. The old wooden dining car in which Marshal Foch had dictated his terms to the Germans on November 11, 1918, had been retrieved from its permanent display at Rethons and set up in the same spot in the forest. Forty minutes later the French arrived. Hitler sat at the long table in the dining car, while General Keitel read out the preamble. Hitler himself had composed these words, after a heroic resistance, France has been vanquished. Therefore Germany does not intend to give the armistice terms or negotiations the character of an abuse of such a gallant enemy. After this 12-minute introduction Hitler left while Keitel continued to dictate the terms. The railway coach would afterward be shipped to Berlin as an exhibit, the French memorial at Kempken was demolished with explosives, only the statue of Marshal Foch himself remained untouched, on Hitler's instructions. He could now fulfill a lifelong dream to visit Paris and see its architecture. He sent for his three favorite intellectuals, the architects Speer and Giesler and the sculptor Arno Brecker, and they arrived at Brûlée de Pêche that evening, June 22. At 4 a.m. the next morning they flew secretly to Le Bugat Airport. Here at last were the monuments so familiar to him from his encyclopedias. He was actually inside the Baroque Opera asking the grey-haired usher to show him long-forgotten chambers of whose existence he was aware from the architectural plans. For three hours shortly after dawn he wandered around the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, and lay in Valides, where he doffed his cap in awe of Napoleon's sarcophagus. When it was light enough he gazed out across the city from the forecourt of Sacre-Cœur and Montmartre. At ten that morning he flew back to Belgium. That evening he commanded Speer to draft a decree for the reconstruction of Berlin, it must outshine everything he had seen in Paris. An hour after midnight on June 25, 1940, a bugler of the First Guards Company took up station at each corner of the Führer's village headquarters. 
Seated at the bare wooden table in his requisitioned cottage, Hitler waited with Speer, his adjutants, and his secretaries. Throughout Europe millions of radios were tuned into this quiet forest acre. He ordered the lights in the dining room switched off, and the window opened. A radio turned low whispered a commentary. At 1.35 a.m., the moment prescribed for the armistice to take effect, the buglers sounded the ceasefire. It was the most moving moment of his life. For four years he had once fought as an anonymous infantryman, and now as supreme commander it had been granted to him to lead his people to a unique victory. After a while he broke the silence. The burden of responsibility, he began, but he could not go on, and asked for the lights to be turned on again. The Big Decision while a never-ending stream of congratulations reached the Chancellery in Berlin, from the exiled Kaiser in Holland, from the Crown Prince, from Hindenburg's daughter, and even from Hitler's old schoolmaster in Austria, the Führer contentedly toured the Flanders battlefield of the First World War with his old comrades Amann and Schmidt. At one point he darted off and clambered up an overgrown slope, looking for a concrete slab behind which he had once taken cover. His memory had not deceived him, for the same nondescript slab was still there, and for all we know it lies there to this day. Colonel Schmunt had prepared an interim headquarters, Dannenberg, high up in the Black Forest. Hitler did not want to return to Berlin until he had some unofficial response to the peace feelers he had extended to the British through Sweden. He would then stage a triumphal return to the capital on July 6 and make his formal offer in a Reichstag speech two days later. After that he would be free to attend to Russia in 1941. Stalin was a national leader of whose strategic capability Hitler was in no doubt, he knew how to think in terms of centuries, he set himself distant goals which he then pursued with a single-mindedness and ruthlessness that the Führer could only admire. As early as June 2, 1940 Hitler had mentioned to Rundstedt at Charleville, now that Britain will presumably be willing to make peace, I shall begin the final settlement of scores with Bolshevism. He obviously regarded the August 1939 pact with Stalin with increasing cynicism. It was a life insurance policy to which he had steadfastly contributed but which he now felt had served its purpose, his victory in France had given him a feeling of immortality. There is an abundance of contemporary evidence that Hitler was still well disposed toward the British Empire. The archives of the High Command and the Navy provide ample examples. This was why Keitel rejected a proposal that Britain's food supplies be sabotaged, and on June 3 Hitler explicitly forbade canneries to introduce bacterial warfare against Britain. On June 17, Jodl's principal assistant confirmed to the naval staff that, the Führer has anything but the intention of completely destroying the British Empire, as England's downfall would be to the detriment of the white race. Hence the possibility of making peace with Britain after France's defeat and at the latter's expense, on condition that our colonies are returned and Britain renounces her influence in Europe. With regard to an invasion, the Führer has not so far uttered any such intention, as he is fully aware of the extreme difficulties inherent in such an operation. That is also why the High Command has as yet undertaken no studies or preparations. The Commander-in-Chief, Luftwaffe, has put certain things in hand. For example, the activation of a parachute division. Together with Goring, Hitler hatched a plan to offer Britain 12 divisions for overseas purposes dash the defense of her empire against aggression. More realistically, Admiral Redder urged him to launch immediate air raids on the main British naval bases and to prepare a seaborne invasion, Hitler however believed an invasion quite superfluous. One way or another, he said, the British will give in. On June 25th Christa Schroeder, one of his private secretaries, wrote, the chief plans to speak to the Reichstag shortly. It will probably be his last appeal to Britain. If they don't come around even then, he will proceed without pity. I believe it still hurts him even now to have to tackle the British. It would obviously be far easier for him if they would see reason themselves. If only they knew that the chief wants nothing more from them than the return of our own former colonies, 
perhaps they might be more approachable. On the same day General Hans Jess Konjak, the chief of air staff, refused to participate in the invasion planning by the high command, OKW, since in his, Jess Konjak's, view the Führer has no intention of mounting an invasion. When the air member of Jodl's staff nonetheless pressed Jess Konjak to help, the general bitingly replied, that's the OKW's affair. There won't be any invasion, and I have no time to waste on planning one. Hitler felt that the British public was being deliberately misled as to his war aims. Naturally, it matters a lot what the Britons expect the Führer's purpose to be in fighting their country, wrote Wall the Hule to a contact in Switzerland on June 30. They were cajoled into this catastrophe by emigres and liberal thinking people. Now it is up to them to find some way out of this mess. The point is, can the British grasp the genius and greatness of the Führer, not only as a benefit to Germany but to the whole of Europe too? Can they swallow their envy and pride enough to see in him not the conqueror but the creator of the new Europe? If they can they will automatically come to the conclusion that the Führer does not want to destroy the empire, as claimed by the emigres who are duping them. A few days later Baron Ernst von Weizsäcker summed up the situation thus in his diary, perhaps we automatically shy from taking over the immense task of inheriting both Europe and the British Empire. Conquer Britain, but what then, and what for? Dash this question of the Führers is countered by others, like Herr von Ribbentrop, with a comparison to two great trees that cannot prosper if they grow up close together. In we eyes, Sacker's view Britain would not give in unless clubbed to the ground, and only after Winston Churchill had been disposed of. Deep in the Black Forest, the Führer planned the Reich's new frontiers. Now that victory was his, he saw no reason not to gather the spoils of war. He would throw France back to the frontiers of 1540. He personally instructed the two Western Gauleters, Joseph Berkel and Robert Wagner, to re-annex Alsace and Lorraine by stealth, any formal German announcement that they were doing so might prompt Mussolini to enforce Italy's territorial claims against France, or even provoke Marshal Pitain to transfer his fleets and African colonies to the enemy. Hitler warned his legal experts to put as little down on paper as possible, for the new Germany would have a western frontier not enjoyed since the late Middle Ages. The line he envisaged ran from the Somme estuary southward, it gave Germany the channel ports of Boulogne, Calais, and Dunkirk, much of Flanders, all of Lorraine, the French Comte and part of Burgundy, as far as Lake Geneva. Under the peace settlement Hitler also intended to oblige his former enemies, as well as the pro-Axis countries, to agree on a uniform solution of the Jewish problem. France would be required to make available Madagascar to accommodate Europe's Jews. Hitler revealed this decision to Admiral Reder on June 20 and evidently to Ribbentrop and Himmler soon after, for experts in the foreign ministry worked eagerly on the Madagascar plan throughout the summer. Himmler told a relieved Governor General Hans Frank that the Führer had ordered an end to the dumping of Jews in the general government of Poland after all, as they were all going to be deported overseas including those now in Poland. At a Krakow conference the city's police chief SS General Bruno Streckenberg quoted Himmler, when and how the deportation begins, depends on the peace settlement. It is difficult to relate the political and military developments of the summer of 1940 to the industrial, and hence longer range, decisions that Hitler took. In the second week of June he ordered the arms industry to convert to the special needs of the war against Britain, all effort must be applied to the mass production of Junkers 88 bombers and of submarines. But though the ammunition dumps were to be replenished, the peacetime consumer goods industry was restarted. The field army was to be reduced in strength immediately by 35 divisions, which would provide industry with the manpower it now lacked. The Soviet Union loomed ever larger on Hitler's horizon. As envisaged under the Nazi Soviet Pact, on June 12, Moscow issued an ultimatum to the Baltic state of Lithuania, followed by similar demands on Estonia and Latvia. Soviet Army and NKVD police troops invaded these countries, 
and from the concentrations on Romania's frontier it was clear that further moves were intended there too. Army intelligence even recorded a flood of reports that the Russians were going to invade Germany. The rapidity with which Hitler defeated France must have taken Stalin by surprise, for on the 23rd Molotov informed Germany that despite an earlier promise to avoid war with Romania over the Bessarabian region, the Soviet Union would brook no further delay and was resolved to use force if the Romanian government refuses a peaceful settlement. To Hitler's evident consternation, the Russians also laid claim to Bkovina, a region formerly owned by the Austrian crown and never by Imperial Russia, Bkovina was densely populated by ethnic Germans. Hitler was determined to avoid the Balkan quagmire at all costs, and under German pressure the Romanian government bowed to force majeure on the 28th. To his adjutants Hitler expressed all the private anger about these two Russian moves, into the Baltic states and eastern Romania, that he was unable to vent in public. He termed them the first Russian attacks on Western Europe. Since the autumn of 1939 Stalin had now annexed over 286,000 square miles, with populations of over 20 million people. During the last days of June, Hitler had a number of private talks with Bragic, some of which General Halder also attended. Holder was concerned by Russia's steady military build-up along the September 1939 demarcation line in Poland, and by her colossal armaments program. On June 23, Hitler ruled that the army was to be reduced from 155 to 120 divisions, although 20 of the 35 divisions to be disbanded could be reactivated on short notice if necessary, but he directed that the armored and mechanized divisions were to be doubled and that no fewer than 17 divisions were to be stationed in the east, together with the headquarters of General Georg von Kutschler's 18th Army. Two days later, Holder was to be found briefing his staff on the new element in all this, which was Germany's striking power in the east. In an order to the three army group commanders on June 25th, General von Braukic mentioned that the various organizational changes would be effected partly in occupied areas partly in Germany, and partly in the East. On the last day of June, Holder explained to Baron von Weizsäcker that Germany must keep a weather eye on the East. Britain will probably need a display of military force before she gives in and allows us a free hand for the East. On July 3 General Holder was even more explicit, it has to be examined from the angle of how best to deliver a military blow to Russia to extort from her a recognition of Germany's dominant role in Europe. Today, Saturday morning, Morel had written on June 29, 1940, I spent about half an hour alone with the Führer. He's in magnificent health. This aromatic air does wonders for him too. He says he slept longer and better last night than almost ever before. Tannenberg was not one of his most attractively cited headquarters. The tall pine trees sighed in the wind, and it rained heavily. There were only a few days of sunshine in the week that he stayed here, beginning on June 28. The Italian ambassador called on him here, Hitler hinted that Germany was on the threshold of great new tasks, without being more specific. In truth, he had not yet made up his own mind which way to turn. He mentioned to Schmunt that he was turning over in his mind whether or not to fight Russia. The Jagir Weimacht adjutant told below of this portentous remark afterward, as they walked gloomily through the dripping forest. The scene of this exchange remained indelibly in the Luftwaffe adjutant's memory and helps to fix the timing of Hitler's decisions in the rush of history that summer. Hitler also seems to have discussed this possibility with his foreign minister, and one of Jodl's staff whether on Hitler's direct command cannot now be discerned, privately began drafting an OKW operational plan for an attack on Russia. By late June of 1940, Hitler suspected that the British had no intention of submitting, by the end of the first week in July, this suspicion had hardened to a certainty. That the British planned to fight on, relying on their air force for the defense of their isles and a strategic attack on Germany's rear was an unwelcome revelation for Hitler and the OKW operations staff. 
Hitler ordered his service commanders to start invasion preparations since under certain circumstances the need might arise, but the mere thought of committing upward of 30 good divisions to an opposed operation overseas must have smitten the Führer with grave apprehension. His heart was not in it. The Führer does not really want to press on, against Britain, Dr. Goebbels had noted as early as June 27. But he may well have to. If Churchill stays on, assuredly. Hitler kept putting off Goring's plans for a mass air attack on Britain, even though the British bombers continued with their forays into Germany. Churchill, wrote Goebbels on the 29th, is just trying to provoke us. But the Führer doesn't intend to respond, yet. This did not mean that Hitler would not continue to threaten an invasion for the purposes of strategic deception. An OKW directive signed on June 28 by Losburg, who certainly knew that a Russian campaign was now on the cards, ordered the intelligence services to use all available channels to dupe the British into believing that Germany is preparing war against the British mainland and overseas possessions with all dispatch in the event that Britain desires to continue the fight. A German air offensive would start once the Luftwaffe had recovered its breath, moreover, so the deception plan was to suggest, Germany, Italy, and Russia would soon open a campaign against the British position in the Middle East, this was the real explanation for the five panzer divisions and the infantry divisions being withdrawn from France to the Reich. These were the divisions being moved up against Russia. Hitler however had drawn up no plans whatever to attack Britain. Sending for Dr. Goebbels on July 2, he made this quite plain. He would instead offer them one last chance, in a speech to the Reichstag. If they did not accept, he would defeat them in four weeks. The Fuhrer does not want to destroy the empire, recorded Goebbels after their private meeting, because everything it loses will accrue to foreign powers and not to us. The very next day, Mr. Churchill displayed the extent of his determination to fight on. On July 3 he ordered his navy to open fire on the remnants of the French fleet anchored at Merzel Keba, North Africa, an act of brigandry which killed 1,297 French sailors who had until few days previously been his allies, and wounding 351 more. This was Hitler's own language, and the message reached him loud and clear. Moreover, Documents captured in France demonstrated unmistakably the kind of war that Britain was preparing. Among the records of the Supreme War Council was one of a November 1939 meeting at which Chamberlain had disclosed that the British air staff had developed a plan to use its new long range bombers for the destruction of the Ruhr, site of an estimated 60% of German industry. Hitler's agents had also discovered notes written by Daladier during a visit to Paris by Churchill and British air marshals on May 16. The French Prime Minister wrote of a long technical argument with his generals, who declare to me that the German advance into France can be slowed down by bombing the Ruhr. I retort it is absurd to believe that. Shocked by Mers el Keba, Hitler scrapped the conciliatory speech he had drafted for delivery to the Reichstag on July 6, 1940, and postponed the session altogether. That day he returned to Berlin, two months after he had sallied forth to fight the French. A public holiday had been declared in the capital, a million swastika flags had been distributed free to the people lining the streets to the chancellery and roses were scattered in the streets for Hitler's motor cavalcade to crush. Dr. Goebbels himself broadcast the running commentary over the radio network as at 3 p.m. Hitler's special train pulled into Anhalt station. The choice between attacking Britain or Russia was one that would now occupy him continuously until the end of July and to a lesser degree until autumn. Unexpectedly he was now confronted by two enemies, an ugly prospect at any time but he had only one bullet left in the breach, as he himself later graphically put it. That the rough might bomb his industry concerned Hitler less than the mischief Britain might create in the Balkans, the source of his oil. The planning documents recently captured in France had been an eye-opener, betraying, as they did, the sympathetic attitude shown by Turkey, Greece, and particularly Yugoslavia toward the various moves contemplated by the Allies. In short, the Balkans could prove Hitler's undoing, 
and he told Italy's foreign minister as much on the day after his return to Berlin. The Italians wished to invade Yugoslavia now, but Hitler urged them not to, because if they did, Hungary could invade Romania and the entire Balkans would go up in flames. The Russians would therefore certainly advance toward their ancient Byzantine goal, the Dardanelles and Constantinople, said Hitler. Things might go so far that Britain and Russia, under the pressure of events, could discover a community of interest. By now both General von Braukitsch and Colonel von Losburg, a member of Jodl's staff, had already realized that Hitler proposed a Russian campaign. On July 1, 1940 Braukic had asked the War Department, OKH, to do some operational thinking about this, and Halder had asked General Hans von Griffenberg to start planning accordingly in the operations branch of the general staff. Simultaneously, Losberg completed an OKW study of a Russian campaign, codenamed Fritz after his son, it was some 30 pages long. Early in July, during the sojourn of the OKW command train Atlas on a siding at Grunewald Station in Berlin, he directed Captain von Trother to obtain maps of Russia. He was undoubtedly right when he later suggested that there was a psychological factor in Hitler's decision to deal with Russia first. The Fuhrer realized that victory in France had produced both in his command staffs and in the German people a smugness and a self-satisfaction and a savoring of the peace to come that threatened to undermine all hope of launching a superhuman crusade against the Bolsheviks. In April 1941 he was to say, the people must always be led by the nose to paradise. Today we are more powerfully armed than ever before. That is why we have to use the arms we have now for the real battle, the one that counts, because one day the Russians, the countless millions of Slavs, are going to come. In spite of all this, Hitler allowed the phony invasion preparations against Britain to continue in the hope that this threat would bring the British people to their senses. Admiral Ridder argued that the British would not make peace without, figuratively speaking, a taste of the whip first. He urged Hitler to order heavy air raids on some big city like Liverpool, an invasion must be regarded only as a last resort. Hitler refused to unleash the Luftwaffe against Britain. The signs were in fact conflicting. He learned that the expatriate Duke of Windsor, who had served with the French military mission near Paris but had now escaped through Spain to Portugal, was bitterly attacking Churchill's needless prolongation of the war and predicting that protracted heavy bombardment would make Britain ready for peace. Hitler was perplexed by England's continued intransigence. He told Goebbels on July 6 that he had had his Reichstag speech, with the peace offer, ready to deliver when Churchill's bombardment of the French fleet at Meurs el Kebo had upset the apple cart. He assumed that Churchill had deliberately misinformed his colleagues about Germany's armistice demands on France, for Ambassador Stafford Cripps was heard to explain in Moscow that Britain could not make peace because Germany would without doubt demand the entire British fleet to be handed over to her. Repeating the now familiar arguments he had heard, Halder wrote on the 13th, the Führer, accepts that he may have to force Britain to make peace, but he is reluctant to do so because if we do defeat the British in the field, the British Empire will fall apart. Germany will not profit therefrom. We should be paying with German blood for something from which only Japan, America, and others would draw benefit. Having formally postponed the planned Reichstag session Hitler left Berlin on July 8, announcing to his private staff that he wanted to think things over. For the next ten days he drifted purposelessly about Bavaria and Austria, and then retired to the Obersalzburg for a week of quiet reflection. The Hungarian Premier, Count Paul Teleki, brought him a letter from his regent, Admiral Nicholas Horthy, on July 10. The letter is lost, but Horthy's handwritten draft hinted that Germany was the only power that could prevent Stalin and the Red Army from devouring the whole world like an artichoke, leaf by leaf. With Hitler's acquiescence, Joachim von Ribbentrop began an extended maneuver to win the support of the Duke of Windsor, who was now staying at the Lisbon mansion of one of Portugal's leading bankers prior to taking up a new post at Bermuda. Hitler's respect for the Duke, 
whom he had met in 1937, was increased by fresh reports of the latter's unconcealed loathing of Churchill and the war, and by word of his willingness to accept high office in a Britain humbled by armistice. For the moment, German policy was limited to trying to procure the Duke's arrival in an area within Germany's sphere of influence, for example southern Spain. Ribbentrop genuinely feared the British Secret Service had evil designs on the Duke, for he sent Walter Selenberg to Lisbon with instructions to ensure that no harm came to him. Selenberg was also to arrange for the Duke and his Duchess to cross back into Spain if they wished. On July 11 Ribbentrop confidentially cabled his ambassador in Madrid that if the Duke so desired Germany was willing to smooth the path for the Duke and Duchess to occupy the British throne. By the last week of July it seemed that Ribbentrop might succeed, the Spanish emissary quoted the Duke as saying that he would break with his brother King George and with Britain's present policies and retire to a life of peace in southern Spain, but the Lisbon embassy had impounded his passports. When the Duke had been told the time might come when he would again play an important part in English public life, and perhaps even return to the throne, he had replied in astonishment that the British constitution made this impossible for a king who had once abdicated. Ribbentrop's ambassador reported, when the emissary then suggested that the course of the war might bring about changes even in the British constitution, the Duchess in particular became very thoughtful. Small wonder that Mr. Churchill's government would make strenuous attempts, after the war, to locate and destroy these compromising secret telegrams. Hitler's suspicion of collusion between Russia and Britain was powerfully reinforced by reports of conversations of Russian diplomats in Moscow, these reports were intercepted by the German intelligence service. Thus on July 5 the Turkish ambassador reported to Ankara on a Moscow conversation with British Ambassador Sir Stafford Cripps, Mikhail Ivanovich Kalinin, the president of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, had assured the Britain that Britain and Russia had many interests in common, it was necessary for them to arrive at an understanding. Similarly, a decoded Greek telegram, sent to Athens by the Greek legation in Moscow, reported on a two-hour interview with Cripps on July 6. The Englishman had emphasized that the Russians were feverishly making war preparations, which is quite correct, noted the Greek telegram. Significantly the Greek envoy had retorted that it appears dubious to me that if Germany believes the Kremlin definitely intends to attack she will not take action immediately. Cripps had claimed in his reply that because Germany could not be ready to attack Russia before autumn, and even then could not endure a winter campaign, she will be forced to postpone the war against Russia until next spring, by which time the Russians will be ready to. Until then both parties would avoid any disruption of their mutual relations. Speaking to the Turkish ambassador on July 16 Cripps admitted, I fully understand how delicate this matter is, but faced by imminent German attack. We are forced to come to some arrangement with the Russians whatever the cost. These intercepted dispatches were placed in Hitler's hands on his return to Berlin. Defeating Russia was therefore vital, defeating Britain was not. On July 16 Hitler, without noticeable enthusiasm, accepted Jodl's draft order to the Wehrmacht to prepare an invasion of Britain and if need be carry it out. But the navy was more circumspect. The consequent withdrawal of a thousand heavy barges from the German inland waterways would paralyze large sections of industry, in addition, adequate local air superiority was a sign qua non for any invasion operation. On the 15th the OKW had orally asked the commanders in chief whether everything could theoretically be ready by August 15th, on his arrival now in Berlin Hitler learned from Reda that this would be quite impossible. Nonetheless the Führer ordered the stage to be set. The transport ships and crews were to be marshalled along the Channel coast in full view of the British. His aim was transparent for the Luftwaffe meanwhile operated with a decorum and restraint hardly compatible with the strategic objective of fighting for air supremacy. He returned to Berlin on July 19, 1940, and outlined to Dr. Goebbels and the others around his lunch table the long-delayed speech that he now proposed to make to the Reichstag. It would contain a short, 
truncated peace offer to the British people with the clear connotation that this was his last word on the matter. The flower bedecked Crowell Opera House, the chosen setting for the speech, was that afternoon packed to overflowing. His delivery was as effective as ever, now narrating, now mocking, now ranting, now appealing. Its burden was an appeal to Britain's common sense. What was unorthodox was that he announced an avalanche of promotions for all his principal commanders on the Western Front. Hermann Goring must have learned that he was to be created a Reichsmarschall, one rung higher even than Field Marshal, for he had already ordered a gaudy new uniform. The peace offer fell on deaf ears. That same evening the British journalist Sefton Delmer broadcast over the BBC a coarsely phrased rebuff, and Churchill even ordered a fresh air aid that night. Hitler still hoped reason would prevail. For the moment, Goebbels advised his diary, the Führer does not want to accept that it is indeed Britain's response. He is still minded to wait a while. After all, he appealed to the British people and not to Churchill. Before the day was over Hitler confidentially assured the 65-year-old von Rundstedt, now a field marshal, that he had not the slightest real intention of launching a cross-channel invasion. He also evidently repeated to Braukic his demand that the general staff properly explore a Russian campaign. The strategic objective that Hitler outlined echoed Losberg's draft, codenamed Fritz to defeat the Russian army or at least to take over as much Russian territory as is necessary to protect Berlin and the Silesian industrial region from enemy air aids. It would be desirable to advance so far into Russia that we could devastate the most important areas though with our own Luftwaffe. Before leaving Berlin on July 21, Hitler collected Reda, Braukic, and Goring's chief of staff, Jess Konyak in the Chancellery and explained to them the need to take the necessary political and military steps to safeguard the crucial oil imports should, as was highly unlikely dash the Romanian and Russian supplies threatened to dry up. On the question of an invasion of England Hitler concluded, if the preparations cannot definitely be completed by the beginning of September, it will prove necessary to ponder other plans. By this he meant that he would postpone the decision on England until May of 1941, and attack Russia this very autumn. While awaiting Reda's report on the prospects for an invasion of Britain, Hitler toured Weimar and Bayreuth. There were now air raid wardens in the famous theatre and the printed programme in his hands included a full-page announcement on what to do if the sirens sounded. On the 25th Hitler was back in the capital. Reder again tried to dissuade him from an invasion of Britain. Hitler asked him to report again on the position in a few days' time. His final decision may however have been triggered by a fresh intercepted telegram that was shown him before he left Berlin for the Berghof in Bavaria late that evening. In it, the Yugoslav ambassador in Moscow, Milan Gavrilovic, quoted Sir Stafford Cripps's view that France's collapse had put the Soviet government in great fear of Germany. The Soviet government is afraid that the Germans will launch a sudden and unexpected attack. They are trying to gain time. Gavrilovic had also discussed the growing Russian military strength with his Turkish colleague. The Turkish ambassador considered war between Germany and Russia a foregone conclusion. Hitler arrived at the Berghof in time for lunch on July 26. Here over the next few days he held a series of meetings with Balkan potentates. One morning after the regular war conference in the Berghof's Great Hall, Hitler asked General Jodl to stay behind and questioned him on the possibility of launching a lightning attack on Russia before winter set in. This question was unquestionably an echo of the mocking tone adopted by Soviet leaders in their conversations with Balkan diplomats. Hitler himself referred to intercepted conversations in this connection on July 31st. He explained that he was perfectly aware that Stalin had only signed his 1939 pact with Germany to open the floodgates of war in Europe, what Stalin had not bargained for was that Hitler would finish off France so soon, this explained Russia's headlong occupation of the Baltic states and the Romanian provinces in the latter part of June. It was clear from the increasing Soviet military strength along the eastern frontier, on which Germany still had only five divisions stationed, that Russia had further acquisitions in mind. 
Hitler feared that Stalin planned to bomb or invade the Romanian oil fields that autumn. Russia's aims, he said, had not changed since Peter the Great, she wanted the whole of Poland and the political absorption of Bulgaria, then Finland, and finally the Dardanelles. War with Russia was inevitable, argued Hitler, such being the case, it was better to attack now, this autumn. He would make one last political attempt to explore Stalin's intentions before finally making up his mind. When the Fuhrer called his OKW, Army, and Navy chiefs to the Berghof on July 31, 1940, his reluctance to reach a firm decision on an invasion of Britain contrasted strongly with his powerful arguments in favor of attacking Russia. Admiral Ridder sedulously gave the impression that the Navy would be ready for the invasion of England by mid-September 1940, but having done so he also advanced formidable technical reasons why they should wait until May 1941. In the coming autumn only two moon and tide periods were attractive, from August 20 to 26, and from September 19 to 26, the first was too early, the second fell in a traditional foul weather period. If Hitler waited until May 1941, on the other hand, the Navy's fleet of battleships would be brought up to four by the new Tirpitz and Bismarck, that said, the Admiral returned to Berlin. After he had gone, Hitler commented to Braukitsch and Halder that he doubted the technical practicability of an invasion. He was impressed by Britain's naval supremacy and saw no real reason to take such a risk for so little. The war was already all but won. With more marked enthusiasm the Fuhrer turned to the other means of dashing Britain's hopes. Submarine and air war would take up to two years to defeat Britain. Britain still had high hopes of the United States, and she was clutching at Russia like a drowning man, if Russia were to drop out of the picture, then the United States must too, because with the USSR eliminated Japan would be released as a threatening force in the Far East. That was the beauty of attacking Russia. If Russia is laid low, then Britain's last help is wiped out, and Germany will be master of Europe and the Balkans. There was, alas, no time after all to commence a Russian campaign that autumn, as winter would set in before the operation could be concluded, but if it were started in the spring, May 1941, the army would have five clear months in which to defeat the Soviet Union. The army he had so recently ordered cut back to 120 divisions would now be expanded to a record 180 divisions, whereas on June 23 he and Braukic had agreed to allocate 17 infantry divisions to the east, he now proposed that by spring his strength would be built up to 120 divisions. Neither Field Marshal von Braukic nor General Holder, Chief of the General Staff, offered any objections. The Dilemma. For twenty years Adolf Hitler had dreamed of an alliance with Britain. Until far into the war he clung to the dream with all the vain, slightly ridiculous tenacity of a lover unwilling to admit that his feelings are unrequited. Goebbels watched this undignified scene with disquiet, revealing to his diary on the first day of August 1940, feel us from here to Britain without result. Via Spain as well. London is looking for a catastrophe. As Hitler told Major Quisling on the 18th, after making one proposal after another to the British on the reorganization of Europe, I now find myself forced against my will to fight this war against Britain. I find myself in the same position as Martin Luther, who had just as little desire to fight Rome but was left with no alternative. This was the dilemma confronting Hitler that summer. He hesitated to crush the British. Accordingly, he could not put his heart into the invasion planning. More faithfully, Hitler stayed the hand of the Luftwaffe and forbade any attack on London under pain of court-martial, the all-out saturation bombing of London, which his strategic advisers Redder, Jodl, and Jess Connick all urged upon him, was vetoed for one implausible reason after another. Though his staffs were instructed to examine every peripheral British position, Gibraltar, Egypt, the Suez Canal, for its vulnerability to attack, the heart of the British Empire was allowed to beat on, unmolested until it was too late. In these months an adjutant overheard Hitler heatedly shouting into a chancellery telephone, 
we have no business to be destroying Britain. We are quite incapable of taking up her legacy, meaning the empire, and he spoke of the devastating consequences of the collapse of that empire. The views of the Duke of Windsor may have colored Hitler's view of the British mentality. It was reported from Lisbon that the Duke had described the war as a crime, Lord Halifax's speech repudiating Hitler's peace offer as shocking, and the British hope for a revolution in Germany as childish. The Duke delayed his departure for the Bahamas as long as he could. Undiminished though his support for the Führer's policies are, reported the Lisbon ambassador, he thinks it would be premature for him to come right out into the open at present. Ribbentrop cabled his Madrid ambassador to send confidential word to the Duke's Portuguese host, a banker, that Germany was determined to use as much force as was necessary to bring Britain to the peace table. It would be good if the Duke could stand by to await further developments. Firmly escorted by armed Scotland Yard detectives, the Duke left however for the Bahamas on August 1. In his last conversation with his host he replied to Ribbentrop's message. He praised Hitler's desire for peace and reiterated that had he still been king there would have been no war, but he explained that given an official instruction by his government to leave Europe for the Bahamas he had no choice but to obey. To disobey would be to show his hand too soon. He prearranged a code word with the banker for his immediate return to Lisbon. From an agent in the State Department in Washington, Hitler obtained copies of the current dispatches of the American ambassador in London, Joseph P. Kennedy. Kennedy was predicting in these that the Germans had only to continue the blockade, Britain's east coast harbors were already paralyzed, the rest badly damaged. This was Hitler's view too. To Goring it was one more reason not to sacrifice his Luftwaffe in preparations for an invasion which he believed would never take place. If the losses we sustain are within reason, recorded Goebbels after conferring with Hitler on the 6th, then their, bombing, operation will proceed. If they are not, then we shall try new ways. Invasion not planned, but we shall hint at it subliminally in our propaganda to confuse the enemy. Hitler, it seems was transfixed by his own foolish amour for England. On August 6 the army's chief of staff complained in his diary, we now have a peculiar situation in which the navy is tongue-tied with inhibitions, the Luftwaffe is unwilling to tackle the task which they first have to accomplish, and the OKW, which really does have some way macht commanding to do here, lies lifeless. We are the only people pressing ahead. To his Berlin lunch guests on the 8th, Hitler airily explained that the weather was still not good enough for bombing London. He then returned to the Berghof, where he awarded Frau Bormann the Mother's Cross in gold for her considerable procreative accomplishments, and he inspected the new beehives Bormann had laid out, as though there were no more pressing problems at this hour in Germany's history. At the Berghof, the tapestry was drawn aside at one end of the Great Hall and a cinema screen was set up at the other. Every available Russian and Finnish newsreel film of their recent war with one another was run and rerun, while Hitler and his staff studied the Russians' weapons and the tactics that the films revealed. The intelligence reports now reaching Hitler were unmistakable and disconcerting. A gigantic rearmament effort had begun in Russia, in addition, According to Reinhard Heydrich's organization, the Soviet trade missions were spreading communist propaganda and organizing cells in German factories. One day at the Brown House, the Nazi party headquarters in Munich, Hitler told Ribbentrop that he did not intend to stand idly by and allow the Soviet Union to steamroll Germany, Ribbentrop begged him not to contemplate war with Russia and he quoted Bismarck's dictum about the unwillingness of the gods to allow mere mortals a peek at the cards of fate. When Key Eitel submitted a handwritten memorandum against waging war with Russia if it could possibly be avoided, Hitler summoned him to a private interview and scalingly reduced the field marshal's arguments one by one, Stalin had as little intention of adhering to their treaty as he did, moreover, he pointed out, Stalin was alarmed by Hitler's military successes. Key Eitel was hurt. Without a word he turned on his heel and left the room. Hitler retained the memorandum. Presumably it vanished into his safe along with his collection of other incriminating documents.
Kiitel had already, on August 2, instructed his staff at the OKW that the Führer now recognized that Britain might not collapse that year. In 1941 the United States might intervene and our relationship to Russia might undergo a change. The OKW's Admiral Canaries was also briefed in August on Hitler's intention of attacking Russia in the spring. The OKW issued an order camouflaging the build-up of German strength in the East, and transparently, or perhaps super cunningly, codenamed it Eastern Build-Up. Admiral Reda however was informed by Hitler during August in the opposite sense, that these growing troop movements to the Eastern Front were just an outsize camouflage to distract from the imminent invasion of Britain. In fact, the truth was the reverse. The OKW's war diary stated explicitly on the 8th, Eastern build-up is our camouflage order for preparations against Russia. Hitler's mind was on the shape of the greater German Reich to come, and above all on how Germany was to police the more turbulent and dissident peoples that would come within the Reich's frontiers. This, he declared to Colonel Schmunt on August 6, must be the peacetime task of his Waffen SS. There would never be any need to call on the regular forces to take up arms against their fellow countrymen. These police troopers, noted Schmunt, must be unconditional champions of the Nazi ideology, a body of men who would never make common cause with the seditious proletariat, to increase their authority in the eyes of the people. The Waffen SS must prove their value on the coming battlefields. They must be an elite. The Wehrmacht objected bitterly to this further entrenchment of Himmler's private army, but Kiitel agreed with Hitler's arguments and ordered them given the widest circulation within the army. Goring told Hitler he needed three days of good weather to begin the air attack on the British fighter defences. On August 12, he announced that the attack would begin the next day. Hitler left for Berlin. When Reda warned on the 13th that the invasion was a last resort, not to be undertaken lightly, Hitler reassured him that he would first see what results the Luftwaffe obtained. But those who knew him realized the invasion would never take place. Whatever his final decision, the Führer wants the threat of invasion of Britain to persist, the naval staff swore diary noted on August 14. That is why the preparations, whatever the final decision, must continue. The newly created field marshals assembled in the Chancellery on August 14 to receive their bejeweled batons from Hitler's hands. There are two surviving records written by field marshals. Hitler referred to Germany's greatest strength as her national unity. Since Britain had rejected Hitler's offer, a conflict was inevitable but would be initially restricted to Luftwaffe operations. Whether the army will have to be employed can't be predicted. In any case it would only be used if we were absolutely forced to. Lieb's account is important enough to quote at length. Probably two reasons why Britain won't make peace. Firstly, she hopes for US aid, but the US can't start major arms deliveries until 1941. Secondly, she hopes to play Russia off against Germany. But Germany is militarily far superior to Russia. The film of Russian warfare in Finland contains quite ludicrous scenes. The loss of gasoline, imports from Russia, can easily be made up by Romania. There are two danger areas which could set off a clash with Russia, number one, Russia pockets Finland, this would cost Germany her dominance of the Baltic and impede a German attack on Russia. Number two, further encroachment by Russia on Romania. We cannot permit this because of Romania's gasoline supplies to Germany. Therefore Germany must keep fully armed. By the spring there will be 180 divisions. As a for Europe, there is no justification for the existence of small nations, and they particularly have no right to big colonial possessions. In the age of air forces and armored divisions small nations are lost. What matters today is a unified Europe against America. Japan will have to seek contact with Germany, because Germany's victory will tilt the situation in the Far East against Britain, in Japan's favor. But Germany is not striving to smash Britain because the beneficiaries will not be Germany, but Japan in the East, Russia in India, Italy in the Mediterranean, 
and America in world trade? This is why peace is possible with Britain, but not so long as Churchill is Prime Minister. Thus we must see what the Luftwaffe can do, and await a possible general election. The first two days of the Luftwaffe attack on England were a disappointment. The unpredictable English summer foiled every effort to coordinate the operations of Goring's three air forces, Luftflotten. A total blockade of the British Isles was declared, but even this was a half measure, for it was shortly followed by an OKW compendium of practices forbidden to the German forces. Hitler called attention to his strict ongoing embargo on air raids on London and he forbade any kind of terror attack without his permission. On the evening of the 16th, Hitler again left Berlin for the Obersalzburg, such hopes as he may have reposed in the Luftwaffe's campaign were temporarily disappointed. At the Berghof Hitler busied himself less with plans for invading Britain than with other ways of crushing her will. He studied an earlier Braukitsch proposal that an expeditionary force should be sent to Libya to support an Italian attack on the British position in Egypt, he also asked Ribbentrop to explore ways of bringing Spain into the war. General Franco however was reluctant to declare war, for his country's economy had not yet recovered from three years of civil war. Shortly Hitler had renewed cause for anxiety about the Balkans. After a week of talks between Hungary and Romania on the disputed Transylvania region, war between those two countries became imminent on August 23. Romania appealed to Germany to arbitrate the dispute and, without consulting Moscow, as he was bound to under the pact with Stalin, Hitler agreed. Meanwhile he ordered the German army to stand by to occupy the vital Romanian oil region to prevent third parties dash meaning Russia from getting there first should the arbitration talks break down. Canaries already had several hundred counter-sabotage troops in the region. When Field Marshal von Braukic visited the Berghof on the 26th, Hitler explained to him the need to safeguard Romania without as yet provoking the Russians too much, he asked the army to move ten good divisions eastward to the general government and East Prussia at once. The next day Colonel Schmann flew to East Prussia with Dr. Fritz Tott armed with instructions to search for a suitable site for the Führer's headquarters during the coming Russian campaign. One night late in August 1940 British aircraft appeared over Berlin for the first time and dropped a few scattered incendiary bombs. In the early hours of the 29th word was telephoned to the Berghof that the bombers had again struck Berlin and that this time ten civilians had been killed. Evidently the Reich capital now faced an ordeal of fire by night. That same afternoon Hitler flew back to Berlin. He did not like this new development at all. Rudolf Hess, his deputy Führer, had nightmares, as he told a British cabinet minister a few months later, of coffins, rows upon rows of them, filled with dead children, with their weeping mothers standing behind them. Suspecting that his peace feelers were not getting through to the ordinary English people, Hitler asked Hess to establish contact secretly with his friends in Britain. On the last day of August Hess discussed this extraordinary mission with his old professor, Karl Haushofer, and three days later the professor wrote to his son Albrecht, as you know everything has been prepared for a very drastic attack on the island concerned and the boss man only has to press the button. Hess asked Hausho for whether he could see any way of setting up peace talks at some other location, perhaps with the Duke of Hamilton, a Scottish nobleman whom he had met briefly at the Berlin Olympics in 1936. Hess's nightmares of children's coffins gave way to heroic daydreams, of flying single-handedly to England, he was an accomplished pilot, and of ending the war. He took his mission very seriously and flew to Messerschmitt's Augsburg factory on November 8 to inspect the new Mi-110 long-range fighter plane, by the end of 1940 he was flying one solo. In October or November Hess sent his driver to Munich's local airport to fetch a map of England, and then his valet to Lanai's bookstore to buy two maps of northwestern Europe. Once, entering Hess's study which was normally a forbidden sanctum, his valet had found it strewn with charts. Hess asked the factory to fit auxiliary fuel tanks to his Mi-110. Once, 
Messerschmitt's instructor inquired why he was asking whether it could still carry a bomb or torpedo as well as the drop tanks, was he planning to fly to England with the plane then? No, no, Hess had responded with a smile, then he hinted to his staff that he was thinking of trying out for himself a new method of mining British ports. In January, he ordered from the Munich sports outfitters Schuster's a leather flying suit and fur-lined boots. He had previously borrowed them from Messerschmitt's. Hess's adjutant Karl Unspein should tell a fellow adjutant over a glass of beer on April 20 that their chief was worried, because he knew how reluctant the Führer was to destroy England, and because he saw war looming with the United States and the Soviet Union, he was planning to make personal contact with peace-loving circles in Britain, said Peinsch, and had been working on a memorandum to be handed to Hitler after his departure. In April, Hess would obtain several books on the British Constitution, and visit Schwartz the tailors in Munich's Prielmeisterus to order a blue-gray Luftwaffe captain's uniform. Not relying on Rudolf Hess alone, in August 1940 Hitler had simultaneously sent the Berlin attorney Dr. Ludwig Weisseyer to Stockholm with the task of briefing the British envoy orally on his peace offers. These included political independence for all the European countries occupied by Germany, including a future Polish state but excluding Czechoslovakia, an end to the economic division of Europe, and no German claims on the Empire or British colonies. This was, the attorney was to make plain, Britain's last chance of avoiding an intensification of the hostilities. On Churchill's instructions Wysayer was not even received in the Stockholm legation, and the private letter from Hershow for which Hess caused to be sent to the Duke of Hamilton, via a female acquaintance in Lisbon, was intercepted by Churchill's secret service in London. The Prime Minister's response was to order the heart of the German capital to be bombed again. On the following day Hitler lifted the embargo on bombing the centre of London, but still withheld the actual order. Those coffins of which Hess had dreamed would soon start filling. On September 4, 1940 Hitler delivered one of his most forceful public orations. He mocked the thesaurus of reassuring predictions used by British officialdom to hint at his ever-imminent downfall. For example they say, we learn that, or as we understand from well-informed circles, or as we hear from well-placed authorities, or in the view of the experts, in fact they once went as far as announcing, it is believed that there may be reason to believe. He mocked that after Germany had thrown the Allies out of Norway they had changed their tune, we only wanted to lure the Germans up there. What a unique triumph that was for us. After France's defeat Britain had rejoiced that now she need only defend herself. And if Britain is now consumed with curiosity and asks, well, why doesn't he invade? I answer, calm down, he's coming. As for the night bombardment of Germany's Ruhr cities that Churchill had begun three months before, Hitler now announced he would reply measure for measure and more. If they proclaim they will attack our cities on a grand scale, we shall wipe their cities out. On the 5th however Churchill's bombers came again to the Rye capital, killing 15 more Berliners. Over lunch on September 6, it was plain that Hitler's patience was at Lerb. The Führer, noted Goebbels, is fed up. He clears London for bombing. It is to begin tonight. Whether Goring had formally been advised that Hitler proposed to fulfill his cherished ambition of attacking Russia is uncertain. Jodl's staff certainly noticed on the 5th that the Reichsmarschall showed no interest in preparing for the invasion of England, as he does not believe it will be carried out. Goring established a headquarters on the Channel Coast and personally directed the new air offensive, which opened that night with a bombardment of London, though still only the docks and oil refineries. Hitler's naval adjutant had privately informed Admiral Redder that a Führer headquarters was already being built for the Russian campaign. On September 6 the naval chief, whom Hitler had inherited from the outgoing Weimar Republic, arrived at the Chancellery with a series of powerful new arguments as to why Germany ought to concentrate her attack on Britain's Mediterranean positions and on a sea and air blockade of the British Isles. Red warned Hitler that it would be impossible to launch both the attack on the Soviet Union, which the Admiral discreetly referred to as the S-problem, 
and the invasion of Britain simultaneously, the Navy preferred the latter attack to be undertaken when the ice in the Baltic was melting, as this would tilt the balance against the Russian Navy. Hitler assured the Admiral that if he did drop the invasion, he would eject the British from the Mediterranean that coming winter, and for the first time he mentioned that Germany and Italy must secure footholds in the Azores, the Canaries, and the Cape Verde Islands. As Reda summarized it to the naval staff, the Führer's decision to invade Britain is by no means definite. Hitler again postponed the fateful invasion decision for three more days, the Navy tactfully termed the current weather wholly abnormal. The bombing of London had now begun in earnest. It was the blitz that Churchill desired and Hitler did not. Discussing the new campaign with his lunch guests on the 10th, Hitler again vacillated. Would Britain now give in, he asked. The military share my viewpoint, wrote Goebbels privately. A city of 8 million cannot stand this for long. We have wiped the smirk off their lordships' faces. We shall thrash them until they whimper for mercy. When Hitler assembled his commanders on the 14th, with Field Marshal Milch deputized to represent Goring, who was still posturing on the Channel coast, he began with a political survey. Milch wrote a detailed note in his diary, Moscow is dissatisfied with the way things have gone, they were hoping we would bleed to death. He was giving military aid to Romania because Germany needed the oil, and to Finland because of the balance of power in the Baltic. While it was difficult to see into the future, anything might happen. New conflicts are quite possible. He did not expect America's modest rearmament to take effect before 1944, and he certainly did not want the war to last that long. We have attained our objectives, so we have no interest in prolonging it. From now on it would be a war of nerves, with the bomber attacks and the threat of invasion gradually wearing the British people down. If 8 million inhabitants, of London, go crazy, that can lead to catastrophe. If we get good weather and can neutralize the enemy air force, then even a small-scale invasion can work wonders. He proposed, therefore, to wait a few more days before finally cancelling the operation. If it were dismantled altogether, it would come to the ears of the enemy and the nervous strain would be that much less. He would still not permit the Luftwaffe to carry out saturation bombing raids on London's residential districts, as Goring's chief of staff Jess Connick had requested. That is our ultimate reprisal. Three days later Hitler postponed the invasion until further notice. His commanders knew what that meant, from now on only the threat of invasion was to be maintained. In reality, Hitler's mind was elsewhere. During September 1940, foreign diplomats in Moscow reported mounting Soviet bitterness toward Hitler over the controversial Vienna Award and his guarantee to Romania, a guarantee which could only be interpreted as directed against Russia. There were caricatures of Hitler, Goring, the Nazi Hydra, and the omnivorous fascist shark in Red Army barracks. German intelligence learned of a meeting of the Supreme Soviet on August 2 in which they were warned against trusting Germany because certain information indicated that after her victory in the West she, Germany, would start a war against Russia. Indeed, the officials had continued, we must get in our attack before our thieving neighbor in the West can get in hers. Under the now familiar rubric of dispersing the forces tightly concentrated in the West. Braukic personally signed an order for additional divisions to move east on September 6, two more armies were to join the 18th Army there, the 4th and the 2nd. This would bring up to 35 the number of divisions on the eastern frontier. On that same day, General Jod ordered the Abwehr to feed to Russian agents false information indicating that the bulk of Germany's strength was at the southern end of the front, the Russians were to draw the conclusion that we are able to protect our interests in the Balkans from Russian clutches at any time with powerful forces. In fact for strategic reasons Jodl's staff recommended that the main military effort at the start of the attack on Russia should be in the north. Here, explained Colonel Losberg in his draft campaign plan, Fritz, submitted to Jodl later in September. There were better road and rail facilities, and the Russian influence in the Baltic region could be quickly extinguished. 
above all, an attack in the north would rapidly bring Leningrad and Moscow under the German guns. Tactically, they must prevent the Russians from withdrawing in strength into their vast hinterland, as they had before Napoleon's Grand Army in 1812. Fritz undoubtedly formed the basis of Hitler's later strategy against Russia. The main thrust north of the Pripyat marshes was proposed by the colonel as follows, an attack by two army groups from the general line east of Warsaw to Konigsberg, with the southern group the more powerful, the group assembling around Warsaw and southern East Prussia, and being allocated the bulk of the armored and mechanized units. Lossberg predicted that resistance south of the Pripyat marshes would be feebler, plagued by internal unrest in the Ukraine fermented by the Abwe's advanced subversive operations. The further strategy of the campaign must depend on whether and when Russia caved in under the force of the initial German onslaught. Only one possibility remained open to Moscow, to take the offensive first in order to disrupt the half-completed German invasion preparations or to invade the Romanian oil fields, perhaps using airborne troops alone. It would be the job of a future German military mission in Romania to forestall such a Soviet move. In Losberg's view, however, the Russians would be forced for political reasons to try to thwart the German attack close to the frontier, otherwise they would be abandoning the flanking positions they had so recently secured on the Baltic and Black Sea coasts. In Romania the king had abdicated in the crisis that had been triggered by the Vienna Award, and the ruthless but incorruptible general Ian Antonescu had been appointed the national leader and dictator. Antonescu secretly asked Hitler to modernize the Romanian army with German tanks and artillery and to lend him German staff officers. In return, he promised to deploy his forces exclusively on the Russian frontier and away from the Hungarian. On September 19 the OKW issued a document stating that the real jobs dash which were not to be made apparent to either the Romanian or the German missions members, were as follows. 1. To protect the oil fields from the clutches of a third power, and from destruction. 2. To enable the Romanian forces to fulfill specific tasks to a rigid plan aligned with German interests, and. 3. To prepare the operations of German and Romanian forces from Romanian soil in the event we are forced into war with Soviet Russia. The reader should be reminded however that even at this stage no irrevocable order for an attack on Russia had been given, Hitler was still only preparing the military machine. Treading on the shadows of arms raised in salute, Himmler leaves headquarters in Munich, followed by his chief lieutenant Heydrich, author's collection. Molotov. The six weeks preceding the doom-charged visit of Vyacheslav Molotov to Berlin in November 1940 are a period when Hitler's foreign policy becomes almost impossible to disentangle. He took counsel with the Spanish and Italians on ways of striking the British Empire at the periphery. He brought Japan into the Axis in a tripartite pact, and he even pored over the possibility of an alliance with France. This much is clear. But what are we to make of his more determined attempts to lure the Soviet Union into joining the tripartite pact as well? The impulse toward a peripheral solution was provided by Admiral Redder. Early in September Redder had examined with Hitler the strategic options open to Germany, by the 26th, when he came for a long private talk on the subject, he was convinced there were ways of pacifying Russia more elegant than brute force. Germany should throw the British out of the Mediterranean, it should provide assistance to Italy for the capture of the Suez Canal, and then advance through Palestine to Syria. Turkey would then be at Germany's mercy. Then the Russian problem would assume a very different aspect. Russia is basically frightened of Germany – a point on which Hitler agreed. It is unlikely that any attack on Russia in the north would then be necessary. Hitler appeared to like this plan. They could then invite Russia to turn toward Persia and India, again on the British periphery, which were far more important to her than the Baltic. After the Admiral left, the Fuhrer mentioned to his naval adjutant, Putkama, that the interview had been enlightening, as it had checked with his own views.
The most intractable barrier to Franco-German cooperation was the interest that both Italy and Spain were declaring in substantial portions of France's African territories. Hitler postponed reaching a final decision on their claims until he could meet their leaders and Mussolini. Small wonder that the high command's exasperated war diarist lamented, our command policy of late seems to be dictated only by regard for the feelings of the Reichsmarschall and the Italians. Of one thing Hitler was certain by late September 1940. If Spain were to join the war and seize Gibraltar, and if France were also to be encouraged to join the Grand Coalition, he must resort to fraud on a grand scale, as he disarmingly put it to Ribbentrop, each aspirant would have to be left in the happy belief that his wishes would be largely fulfilled. The first claimant to be deceived was Benito Mussolini, whom he met on the Brenner frontier between Italy and Germany on October 4. Hitler cunningly suggested that they lure Spain into the war by promising to deal with her colonial demands in the final peace treaty with France, Mussolini was promised Nice, Corsica, and Tunis. There would be something for everybody in the coalition. For three days at the Berghof Hitler idled in the autumn sunshine, reflecting on his new political strategy. His timetable was clearly mapped out. He would first like to see the former French ambassador, André François Ponset, whom he had always liked, in Berlin, then he would embark on a grand tour, seeing Marshal Pétain in France and next General Franco in Spain, before returning to France to settle with Pétain the terms of their future collaboration. First, however, he would write to Stalin to tempt him with a share of Britain's legacy in return for Russia's participation in the coalition. If we manage that, Braukic was told, we can go all out for Britain. Hitler instructed Goring to ensure that all the Russian contracts with German industry were punctiliously fulfilled so that Stalin would have no cause for complaint, but he also authorized the Luftwaffe to start extensive high altitude photographic reconnaissance missions far into Russia. On October 9, Hitler was back in the Chancellery in Berlin. Ribbentrop suggested a summit meeting between Stalin and the Führer, but Hitler pointed out that Stalin would not leave his country. Hitler himself dictated a lengthy letter to Stalin on the 13th inviting Molotov to visit them very shortly in Berlin. If Molotov came to Berlin, the letter concluded, Hitler would be able to put to him the joint aims they could pursue. On October 12th, Hitler had issued a secret message to the services formally cancelling all invasion preparations against Britain. As Hitler gloated to a visiting Italian minister on the 14th, let the British announce what they will, the situation in London must be horrific. Let's wait and see what London looks like two or three months from now. If I cannot invade them, at least I can destroy the whole of their industry. The aerial photographs which his bomber crews brought back proved the extent of the damage done to Britain night after night. What perplexed Hitler was the total lack of plan and purpose behind the British bombing offensive. Germany had feared a ceaseless onslaught on her oil refineries, yet Churchill was making the fundamental error of attacking Germany's civilians and inflicting only negligible damage on her war effort in the process. The uncomfortable realization that as yet there was no defense against the enemy night bomber confronted Hitler with a host of new problems. If only one aircraft approached Berlin, should the entire city be sent scurrying for the air raid shelters by sirens? On the night of October 14 the typical episode angered Hitler, there was an all clear followed by a fresh alert as more enemy bombers were spotted approaching over Magdeburg. The population of Berlin's hospitals was twice forced to trek down into the shelters, this was not a burden he had planned to inflict on the German population at all. He sent for Milch the next day and ordered him to sort the matter out. Hitler was glad he was leaving Berlin for the tranquility of the Berghof that night. Back in Berchtesgaden, his only engagement of consequence was a private visit from the Italian Crown Princess Maria Jose, the elegant spouse of Crown Prince Umberto and sister of King Leopold of Belgium. Hitler entertained her at afternoon tea on the 17th in the mountain top Eagle's Nest. The princess haltingly begged Hitler to release the Belgian prisoners. When Hitler refused, she steadfastly repeated her request. 
Hitler was impressed by her plucky manner. After the princess left his mountain, he joked, she is the only real man in the house of Savoy. In the special train America, Hitler left Bavaria toward midnight on October 20, 1940, on the first leg of a rail journey that was to cover over 4,000 miles within the next week. The French leaders were still unaware that Hitler was coming to them. Hitler's train pulled into the little railroad station at Monto Ire at 6.30 p.m. on October 22. The station area had been freshly graveled and a thick red carpet had been rolled out. At 7, the short, stocky Pierre Level arrived by automobile. In the dining car Hitler briefly indicated his wish to speak with Badain in person about the lines that France's future collaboration with Germany might take. Lavelle earnestly assured him that he too desired Britain's defeat. Britain, said Lavelle, had dragged France into an unwanted war, abandoned her, and then besmirched her honor at Mers el Kebran more recently at Dakar. Lavelle promised to return with Badain in two days' time. Upon General Franco's willingness to enter the war would depend the tenor of the main approach to Badain. By 4 p.m. on the 23rd, Hitler's train had reached the frontier town of Hende. Franco's train drew alongside on another platform, where the Spanish gauge railway ended. The argument that followed was to haunt Hitler to the end of his life. He later told Mussolini, I would rather have three or four teeth extracted than go through that again. In vain he tried to persuade the Spanish dictator to enter into an immediate alliance and allow German troops to capture Gibraltar. Franco refused to rise to Hitler's bait. It was clear he doubted the likelihood of an Axis victory. Hitler barely controlled his fury when Franco's foreign minister several times interrupted in a tactless way, usually at the precise moment when Hitler believed Franco was on the point of accepting the German terms. Once he stood up abruptly and said there was little point in talking any longer, but talk on he did until dinner was served in his dining car. Hitler tackled Franco again arguing with him about Spain's requirements of guns, gasoline, and foodstuffs until far into the night. When at 2.15 a.m. the Spanish leader's train left the little frontier station to the strains of the Spanish national anthem, General Franco was no nearer to joining the Axis. It was clear to all who crossed Hitler's path in these hours of his jolting journey back to Monto Aya that he was furious. He mouthed phrases about Jesuits' wine and the Spaniards' misplaced sense of pride. Over the next weeks, his anger at having been cold-shouldered turned to contempt. With me, Franco would not even have become a minor party official, he scoffed to Jodl's staff. At 3.30 the next afternoon, October 24, Hitler arrived back at Monto Aya. He nervously left his train after lunch to make sure that a proper guard of honor was waiting to greet the victor of Verdun. Badain stepped out of his car wearing a long French military greatcoat and a general's red cap, beneath which gleamed silver hair. Laval followed. Badain was evidently gratified at the dignity of the German welcome, but he would go no further than to confirm in principle his country's readiness to collaborate with Germany. Badain's military bearing had enhanced Hitler's admiration for him. He afterwards said, France should be proud to have such a leader, a man who wants only the best for his own country. He believed the Monto Aya conferences had accomplished all he had set out to achieve, and this was echoed in the first paragraph of the next directive he issued to the armed forces. It is the aim of my policy toward France to collaborate with that country in the most effective possible way to fight Britain in the future. For the time being there will fall to France the role of a non-belligerent obliged to tolerate military steps taken by the German war command in her territories, and particularly in the African colonies, and to support those steps when necessary by operations of her own defensive forces. Hitler's special train remained overnight at the Monto Aya station. He had planned to return to Berlin, but now something unexpected occurred. Huell brought him along, jealous letter from Mussolini which had just arrived via the OKW's coded teleprinter service. The letter, dated five days before, contained an impassioned appeal by the Duce to the Führer to abandon his dangerous flirtation with the French. As for his own plans, 
Mussolini mentioned that the British menace looming over Greece was comparable with that which Hitler had so successfully forestalled in Norway. As far as Greece is concerned, Mussolini noted, I am determined to act without hesitation, in fact to act very rapidly indeed. Hitler took fright and instructed Ribbentrop to arrange a meeting with Mussolini in a few days' time in Upper Italy. Surely the Italians would not attack Greece now, with the autumn rains and winter snows almost upon them. That would be downright madness dash it would be an open invitation to the British to occupy Crete and other Greek islands well within bomber range of the Romanian oil fields. The Balkan Quagmire During his Brenner meeting with Mussolini, on October 4, Hitler had probably given theoretical support for an Italian occupation of Greece if, and only if, necessary to forestall the British invasion. Admittedly the Abwehr had reported rumors of an Italian attack on Greece some days earlier, during Friday October 25 the German military attaché in Rome cabled that Marshal Badoglio himself had informed him that they now had information that the British intended to occupy Greek territory and that the Italians had for their part taken all necessary precautions to intervene the moment the first Britain set foot on Greek soil. But Badoglio had reassured him, I will inform you if it comes to that. Hitler's train eventually reached Munich late on Saturday. The two key dispatches from Rome that Sunday evening, the military attaché's discovery that Italy was going to attack Greece next morning, and the ambassador's report on Chano's communication to the same effect at 9 p.m. were not deciphered by their Berlin recipients until Monday morning and had certainly not reached Hitler when his train left Munich punctually at 6 a.m. for Florence. Mussolini's troops had invaded Greece at 5.30 that morning. The stunning news reached Hitler's train at Bologna, 50 miles north of Florence. Hitler's purpose until now had been to persuade the Duce not to attack Greece, Hitler also wanted to be in a position to give his friend his expert advice on the best thrust direction for the offensive, and to mount a German airborne assault on the island of Crete by division's first move to North African soil. Possession of Crete was after all the key to the command of the Eastern Mediterranean. By the time Hitler's train steamed into Florence an hour later, 11 a.m., however, he had pocketed his intense disappointment at his allies' rash move, though he was hard put to control his anger when Mussolini strutted up to him and announced in German, Führer, we're marching. We are on the march. All Hitler's fears proved only too well founded. Italy had not committed nearly enough strength to the campaign. On the day after the Florence meeting, British forces landed on Crete. On November 3 the first British army units landed on the Greek mainland. Within a week Hitler had been forced to order the Wehrmacht to prepare an offensive against Greece to take the pressure off his harassed and headstrong ally. The schedule for spring 1941, already crowded with possible major operations in east and west, was finally thrown out of joint. Nevertheless, the signs had been there to see. Had Hitler not been so afflicted with blind trust in Mussolini, nor can Ribbentrop escape his share of the blame. Hitler's naval adjutant, Putkamer, has stated that his chief refused to take the warning signals seriously. On October 18 Jodl's staff had first heard rumors. On the 17th a colonel on the Italian general staff had confidentially told a German liaison officer in Rome that the Italian attack would begin eight or nine days later. A senior official of the foreign ministry had then drafted a telegram to the German ambassador in Rome directing him to deliver a stern demarker to the Italian government, but Ribbentrop had prevented the dispatch of this telegram, saying that the ambassador should merely direct a friendly inquiry to Count Chino. Hitler saw a full report by the ambassador on a conversation with Chino. In this exchange, the Italian foreign minister pointed out, Italy has complete freedom of action over Greece. The Führer has conceded this to the Duce dash words which caused Ribbentrop to telephone his ministry and stop even the telegram about the friendly inquiry. Hitler's decision was that Italy must be trusted, and that no inquiry was to be sent to Rome. For the next two weeks, ending with Molotov's arrival from Moscow, Hitler lost the initiative, thanks to Mussolini. He unenthusiastically examined one peripheral project after another. Now he began to regret that he had not invaded Britain. 
During this period of indecision, only the Luftwaffe bombing, which had now killed 14,000 people in Britain, and the U-boat blockade continued. Some time before, on returning through France from his meeting with Franco, he had cabled Admiral Karl Dönitz, the wiry commander of the German U-boat fleet, to join his train. He ordered him to build huge concrete shelters in the new submarine bases in western France, to protect the U-boats from enemy air attacks. The Axis alliance such as it was had again reached Loeb. Throughout the summer the German army had encouraged Hitler to offer Italy armoured units to ensure victory in Egypt, at the Breno meeting early in October the Duce had hinted that he could use German tanks and Hitler had prepared to send his 3rd Panzer Division to help the Italians capture Marsa Matriu, the army had sent a Panzer General to carry out an on-the-spot investigation in North Africa. By the time the General reported to Hitler at the beginning of November, the Führer had determined to let the Italians stew in their own juice all winter. The Panzer General's report from North Africa was the last straw. Hitler wrote off all idea of sending troops to North Africa, he ordered planning to continue on a caretaker basis only. Ironically, it was to General Rommel that the Führer now bluntly proclaimed, not one man and not one Fennig will I send to North Africa. A few days later the disgrace of the Italians was complete. They had kept their battle fleet in harbour rather than risk it in an assault on Crete. Now a handful of British torpedo planes attacked Taranto Harbour and crippled three battleships, including Mussolini's most modern battleship. Hitler's lack of strategic purpose was most clearly expressed in his rambling discussion with his supreme commanders on November 4 and in the resulting Wehmack directive issued a week later. He now told his commanders that he wanted to speed up Spain's entry into the war and tackle Gibraltar as soon as the political negotiations were out of the way. In the Balkans, an operation for the occupation of northern Greece, Macedonia and Thrace, was to be planned should need arise. That Hitler desired the Dardanelles to come under German control is also evident. On November 4 however he commented to General Halder, we cannot go on down to the Dardanelles until we have defeated Russia. Russia remained the one great area where Hitler could take a bold initiative, and it still came higher in his list of priorities than invading Britain. At the end of October, a member of Jodl's staff had noted, no orders of any kind have been issued for Case East, nor are any as yet to be expected. In the Admiralty it was optimistically believed that Case East is no longer considered likely, as things are going at present. On November 4, however, Hitler remarked to General Holder that Russia remained the nub of Europe's problems, everything must be done so that we are ready for the final showdown. What triggered Hitler's remark? The Nazi party seems to have reminded Hitler where his real mission lay. On the last day of October Arthur Greiser complained at the way the eyes of the German people were currently turned west, Lebensraum could only be assured by conquests in the east. The Führer agreed that this opinion was a correct one, noted Bormann, and emphasized that when peace is concluded absolutely every young and capable civil servant aspiring to promotion will have to serve a number of years in the Eastern Territories. On the eve of Molotov's arrival in Berlin, Hitler visited Field Marshal von Bock, his formidable new commander-in-chief in the East. Field Marshal Fedor von Bock, convalescing in hospital, wrote, the Führer called, sat half an hour at my bedside, and was very friendly and concerned. The overall situation was covered in detail. He is furious at Italy's escapade in Greece. The ultimate, and highly undesirable, outcome is that the Romanian oil fields will be threatened by the British Air Force units from Salonika. This danger is so great that it may oblige us to take countermeasures. What will transpire in the East is still an open question, circumstances may force us to step in to forestall any more dangerous developments. Much would depend on the outcome of Molotov's visit. In the secret directive which he circulated to his commanders on November 12, Hitler approved this wording, Russia. Political discussions have been initiated with the aim of establishing what Russia's posture will be over the coming period. Irrespective of the outcome of these discussions, all the preparations orally ordered for the East are to continue.
The Soviet foreign minister arrived at Anhalt station with a big bodyguard. We Isaacer described them as good gangster types for a film dash he found it depressing that 130 million Russians were being represented by such a shabby bunch. Molotov was accompanied by a young official, ostensibly an interpreter, though he spoke not one word to the Germans. We Isaacer wrote in his diary, all are obviously afraid of us. Many of them quote Bismarck and his concept of a German-Russian collaboration. And some days later, so long as the country is ruled by officials like those we have seen here, it's less to be feared than when their czars were in power. Not since his talks with the British before Munich, in 1938, had Adolf Hitler heard such tough language as Molotov used on November 12th and 13th. As Ribbentrop had done before him, Hitler harangued the Russian minister as though he were at a party rally. If Russia wanted to share in the booty as the British Empire fell apart, then now was the time to declare Soviet solidarity with the tripartite pact powers. He sympathized, he said, with Russia's desire for an outlet to the high seas, and suggested that she should expand southward from Batum and Baku toward the Persian Gulf and India, Germany would expand into Africa. As for Russia's interest in the Dardanelles, Hitler restated his willingness to call for the renegotiation of the 1936 Montreux Convention, which governed the Straits, to bring it into line with Moscow's defensive interests. The demands which Molotov stated were shockers. Russia wanted another stab at Finland, she intended to occupy and annex the whole country, which had, after all, been assigned her by the 1939 pact which he had signed with Ribbentrop in Moscow. Hitler, however, needed Finland's nickel and timber supplies. When Molotov announced Russia's intention of inviting Bulgaria to sign a non-aggression pact which would permit the establishment of a Soviet base near the Dardanelles, Hitler ironically inquired whether Bulgaria had asked for such assistance, pressed later by Molotov for a reply to Soviet terms, Hitler evasively answered that he must consult Mussolini. Each of Molotov's conferences with Hitler was terminated by the warning of approaching British aircraft, and his dinner at the Soviet embassy on the 13th ended abruptly for the same reason. Ribbentrop invited Molotov to the concrete shelter at his home, here the Soviet foreign minister revealed that Moscow could never entirely forego an interest in the western approaches to the Baltic either, the Katigat and Skagerrak. When Ribbentrop told his Führer of this, Hitler was stunned. He demanded that we give him military bases on Danish soil on the outlets to the North Sea, Hitler was to recall in the last week of his life. He had already staked a claim to them. He demanded Constantinople, Romania, Bulgaria, and Finland, and we were supposed to be the victors. While the public was deliberately fed the impression that the formal Nazi-Soviet discussions had been harmonious and successful, within the Chancellery there was no doubt that they had reached the parting of the ways. Irrevocable and terrible in its finality, the decision which Adolf Hitler now took was one he never regretted, even in the abyss of ultimate defeat. In happier times, Hitler visits Italy. He was afflicted with blind trust in Mussolini, and this eventually proved his undoing, author's collection. The Barbarous A Directive Opinion among Hitler's principal advisers was divided about the Russian campaign. Ribbentrop had been convinced there was no alternative. Braukic certainly did not oppose it. Key Eitel's opposition had been stilled. Jodl unquestionably regarded the Russian campaign as inevitable. Goebbels, upon whom would fall the task of preparing the German people, had not been informed. Only Goring and Reda voiced pertinent objections. Heinrich Himmler probably echoed Hitler's views most closely in a November 1940 speech to party officials. Up to now, by means of this, Russo-German friendship, Pact Russia has subjugated entire countries and nations, apart from Finland, without drawing her sword from its scabbard, she has annexed large territories on her western and southern frontiers. Her appetite threatened to grow gigantically so it became necessary for us to map out our mutual interests to each other afresh. During his long overdue visit to Berlin, Molotov has been given the necessary instructions. 
if what I have heard is true, then Stalin is not permitted to start any wars for the moment, or any fighting, as otherwise he will be dealt a sharp rebuke by our own guns. This order holds good both for her, the Soviet Union's, evil designs on Finland and for any she may have in the south or southeast. She is permitted to launch military operations only with the Führer's express permission. To put muscle into our orders, we have based enough troops along our eastern frontier for the Red Tsar in Moscow to take them seriously. Russia is militarily quite harmless. Her officer corps is so poor that they do not even bear comparison with our NCOs, her army is as badly equipped as trained. They cannot possibly be any danger to us. Before ten days had passed, it became even more evident that the Russians' aims were irreconcilable with Hitler's. Ribbentrop had submitted to Moscow a draft treaty embodying the substance of Hitler's oral offer to Molotov, Germany's territorial expansion would take place in Central Africa, Italy's in North and Northeast Africa, Japan's in the Far Fast, and the Soviet Union's toward the Indian Ocean. On November 25, Molotov submitted the four conditions on which Russia would sign. The first two, a demand that Hitler evacuate from Finland the troops sent in August 1940, and that Bulgaria conclude a pact with Russia granting her military bases within range of the Bosphorus, were wholly unacceptable to Hitler. He instructed Ribbentrop to make no reply at all. Hitler had retreated from these traumatic events in Berlin on November 16, and spent the next few days at the Berghof. He privately notified King Boris of Bulgaria of the proposals that Molotov had outlined for Soviet protection of his country. The short, swarthy Bulgarian monarch spoke fluent German and had an easy-going manner which tended to win over the Führer. He liked to stroll through Munich's Bohemian Quarter and the English Gardens. He was a shrewd businessman, and provided that Hitler did not compromise him too early he expressed himself willing to let German divisions cross Bulgarian territory when the time came to attack northern Greece. Hitler offered him Western Thrace as an outlet to the Aegean if Bulgarian troops would participate, but in the king's view this was going too far. Bulgaria was also reluctant to join the tripartite pact at present. She joined on March 1, 1941 simultaneously with the entry of the first German divisions. By the end of the following week, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia had all joined the tripartite pact. In Vienna, the Hungarian Prime Minister agreed to allow German troops to cross into Romania. Yugoslavia would have to be cajoled into refraining from molesting the German movements toward the Greek frontier. Hitler insisted on luring Yugoslavia toward the Axis by offering her part of northern Greece, Salonika, and guaranteeing her possessions. Italy's disgrace in the Balkans made it easier to reshuffle Spanish and Italian claims on African territory, all the more necessary now that the Gibraltar operation's importance had been enhanced by the British foothold in Greece. When General Franco's foreign minister, Serrano Suna, visited the Berghof on the 18th, Hitler gave him the friendly advice to declare war on Britain as soon as possible. He promised to supply all the wheat and oil that Spain would need. He could offer however no real answer to the minister's argument that the Spanish people were not psychologically ready for a new war, and he could make no concrete moves to replace the vague assurances he had tendered both at Hende and in a secret agreement that Spain had since signed with Italy and Germany concerning the African territories it was to receive. Hitler was well aware that if he made public the inroads that were to be made in Morocco, the French there would immediately declare for de Gaulle. There were already signs that Badain was treating with the enemy. The Spanish foreign minister advised Hitler that Pierre Laval was one of the most hated men in France for collaborating with Germany, and that this fact indicated the true sentiments of the French people. When Washington announced the appointment of an admiral as ambassador to Vichy in place of its present lowly charged affair, Hitler's suspicions of the old foggy dash pertain, intensified. The Fischhung Samt had reported on November 11 that secret talks were going on in New York between emissaries of Pertain and Churchill. A number of untidy residual problems remained. King Leopold of Belgium had been brought to the Berghof on November 19. 
where he had hinted that if Hitler would broadcast an explicit guarantee of Belgium's future independence, as the British were doing, the Belgians might be open to military and political agreements. Hitler did not rise to the bait, he saw no need. The second area that attracted Hitler's attention was Southern Ireland. The Irish Republic had remained neutral, though with pronounced pro-German sympathies. In mid-November, the OKW had examined the possibility of soliciting an appeal from Dublin for German aid, but it was not until the 22nd that German army intelligence picked up a British radio message and deduced that a British invasion of Southern Ireland was imminent. On the 27th Hitler asked his high command to analyse the pros and cons of invading Ireland. If the Republic fell into German hands it would surely spell the end of Britain. The answer he received was that a prolonged German occupation of Ireland in the face of Britain's huge naval superiority was quite out of the question. Perhaps no episode illustrates so vividly the whims which inspired Hitler's ad hoc military strategy. Despite the remarkable resilience of the British people under heavier attacks, all of his advisers saw the continued bombing of British industry and dockyards, coupled with the submarine campaign as the most likely way to bring Britain to her knees. Coventry and Birmingham were devastated by night attacks before worsening weather once again forced a halt to German raids. Hitler still lacked the ruthlessness to use the strategic bomber force to maximum effect. On the morning after the Luftwaffe's first raid on Birmingham he told a Hungarian visitor that he was sorry about the fine cities and the people being destroyed in Britain it was all the fault of incompetent British politicians. Himmler also explained to party officials, the Führer has no desire to destroy the British people or their empire. The British are a race related to our own and in their bones they are as unbowed as ever. This is displayed by the unheard of toughness with which the British people has taken its beating from the Luftwaffe, month after month. On November 25th, Hitler explored with Milch and Jess Connick ways of attacking the British position in the eastern Mediterranean. The most important target would be the British fleet at Alexandria, but this could not be tackled until the Italians had taken Marsa Matriu. Meanwhile the Luftwaffe was to help the Italians out of their predicament by attacking military targets in Greece. The Italian squadrons which had briefly assisted in the attack on Britain were to be transferred to Albania. Hitler complained to the two air force generals that the Italians were frittering their forces away, and had brought the British bomber squadrons so close that Germany must now supply sorely needed anti-aircraft batteries to Romania, to protect her royal interests, and to southern Germany. On December 4, Milch brought Hitler details of Göring's proposals, by basing the 10th Air Corps in southern Italy. Germany could effectively block the narrows between Sicily and North Africa. Jess Connick's deputy wrote after this conference, discussion between Führer and Milch on possibilities of battering British position in Mediterranean. This is necessary as the Italian disaster in Greece is having psychological effects quite apart from many military disadvantages, Africa and Spain are beginning to waver in their attitude toward us. Hitler handed Milch a letter to carry immediately to Mussolini. In it he warned the Duce that he must have these squadrons back by early February for use elsewhere. By the 7th, Milch and the deputy chief of air staff were back from Rome, reporting to Hitler on Mussolini's optimism about the situation in Greece. Midday, back in Berlin, wrote Jess Connick's deputy. Conference with Führer who is considerably upset by the unpleasant consequences of the situation in the Mediterranean. He fears this may have an effect on Spain's attitude. That this was no idle fear was shown a few days later. On November 28, Ribbentrop's ambassador in Madrid had reported that General Franco was willing to proceed with the preparations for Spain's proposed entry into the war, Hitler assumed that this meant proceed immediately and on December 4 he sent Admiral Canaries to Franco with a personal letter proposing that German troops formally cross the Spanish frontier on January 10, which would mean starting the assault on Gibraltar, 600 miles from the frontier, in the first week of February. In a long audience on the evening of the 7th, Franco bluntly educated Canaries that for economic reasons Spain could not be ready by January 10, 
Spain could only join in the war if Britain was on the brink of collapse. The alacrity with which Hitler now abandoned Felix suggests that his instinct was screaming warnings against accepting any obligations whatsoever toward a second Latin nation. Molotov's negative reply to Hitler's proposals at the end of November 1940 dispelled whatever hesitations he still had about attacking Russia. Visiting the sick Fedor von Bock again briefly on December 3, the Field Marshal's 60th birthday, Hitler warned that the Eastern problem was now coming to a head. This in turn made a joint Anglo-Russian enterprise more likely, if the Russians are eliminated, he amplified. Britain will have no hope whatever of defeating us on the continent. To Braukic, two days later, Hitler announced, the hegemony of Europe will be decided in the fight with Russia. Thus his strategic timetable took shape. He would execute the attack on Greece, codenamed Marito after one of Jodl's daughters, early in March 1941. Of course, if the Greeks saw the light and showed their British guests the door, he would call off Marita altogether, he had no interest whatever in occupying Greece. Then he would attack Russia during May. In three weeks we shall be in Leningrad. Schmund heard him say. Virtually nothing was known all about the Red Army, a complete search of archives in France, Russia's own ally, had yielded nothing. Hitler was confident that the German Mark III tank with its 50mm gun provided clear superiority over the obsolete Red Army equipment, they would have 1,500 of these tanks by spring. The Russian himself is inferior. His army has no leaders, he assured his generals. Once the Russian army has been beaten, the disaster will take its inevitable course. At 3 p.m. on December 5, Hitler's military advisers came to the Chancellery to mull over each phase of these coming operations. Now for the first time the two varying concepts of the Russian campaign were brought into informal synthesis. Halter's general staff proposal was distinguished by a particularly powerful main drive toward Moscow. Losberg's OKW study Fritz attached more weight to the northernmost army group and the occupation of the Baltic coast. In his reply to Holder the Führer now drew heavily on Losberg's arguments. Both Holder's plan and Losberg's assumed that the Russians must of necessity defend the western areas of the Soviet Union and the Ukraine, and both stated that the Russians must be prevented from staging an orderly retreat as in 1812. The Army and OKW were also agreed that they must occupy as much Soviet territory as necessary. This would prevent the Russian Air Force from reaching Reich territory. Holder proposed that the offensive end along a line from the Volga River to Archangel. Where Hitler took exception was to Holder's insistence that nothing detract from the main assault on Moscow. Hitler wanted the Russian forces in the Baltic countries to be encircled first, a similar huge encirclement action by army group south, south of the Pripyat marshes would liquidate the Russian armies in the Ukraine. Only after that should it be decided whether to advance on Moscow or to bypass the Soviet capital in the rear. Moscow is not all that important, he explained. When the first draft directive for the Russian campaign was brought to Hitler by Jodl, it still conformed with Holder's recommendation of a main thrust toward Moscow, in conformity with the plans submitted to me. Hitler however ordered the documentary drafted in the form he had emphasized, the principal task of the two army groups operating north of the Pripyat marshes was to drive the Russians out of the Baltic countries. His motives were clear. The Baltic was the Navy's training ground and the route which Germany's ore supplies from Scandinavia had to take. Besides, when the Russians had been destroyed in the Baltic countries, great forces would be released for other operations. The Russian campaign must be settled before 1941 was over, for from 1942 onward the United States would be capable of intervening. Toward the United States Hitler was to display unwanted patience despite extreme provocations for one long year. American nationals were fighting in the ranks of the Royal Air Force, and United States warships were shadowing Axis merchant ships plying their trade in transatlantic waters. The Admiralty in Berlin knew from its radio reconnaissance that the Americans were passing on to the British the information about these blockade runners. 
In vain Admiral Reda protested to Hitler about this glaring proof of the United States' non-neutrality. He asked whether to ignore this was compatible with the honor of the German Reich. Nothing would alter Hitler's determined refusal to take up the American gauntlet. Nor would he be sidetracked into invading England. In a secret speech to the Gauleiters on December 11 he declared the war as good as won, and assured them that invasion, is, not planned for the time being. Air supremacy necessary first, concluded Dr. Goebbels afterwards in his diary, and added his own one-word comment on Hitler's psychosis, hydrophobia – Hitler had an aversion to carrying any military operation across the seas, he had also shrewdly refrained from revealing to Dr. Goebbels his plan to attack the Soviet Union. He's frightened of the water, Goebbels recorded after again speaking to Hitler on the 22nd about invading England, to which he added, he says he would undertake it only if he was in the direst straits. Unbeknownst to the propaganda minister, Hitler's eyes were fastened upon Russia. On December 18, Jodl brought him the final version of the campaign directive, retyped on the large Führer typewriter. It had been renamed Barbarossa. Partly the handiwork of Jodl, whose spoken German was very clear and simple, and partly the product of Hitler's pen. The 11 page document instructed the Wehrmacht to be prepared to overthrow Soviet Russia in a rapid campaign even before the war with Britain is over. All preparations were to be complete by mid-May 1941. From now on his intention of disposing of the Soviet menace was the one constant in Hitler's grand strategy. His goals in Africa and his policies toward Spain and France had been reduced to a shambles by Italy's military humiliation. Mussolini's advisers had promised him it would take little more than a military two-step to invade Greece but now the Greek army, counter-attacking, was deep inside Albania, outnumbering the Italian divisions by more than two to one. On December 9 a further disaster began for Italy as the British army in Egypt opened a counteroffensive which was to throw back the Italian forces into Libya and result within a matter of days in the capture of 38,000 Italian troops and four of Mussolini's generals. British casualties were a little over a hundred men. Not that Italy's disgrace was wholly a disadvantage, as Hitler explained to General Halder, he could now promise France everything if she would collaborate with the Axis. This honeymoon was to last less than a week, however. In the early hours of December 14 the text of a letter from Marshal Bedain reached Hitler. He thanked the Führer for his honorable intentions in transferring to lay invalides in Paris the mortal remains of Napoleon's beloved son, the Duke of Reichstadt, which had since 1832 reposed in Vienna but he also advised Hitler that he had dismissed Pierre Laval and replaced him by Admiral Jean-François Darlin, in whom Vichy had greater confidence. In vain Ribbentrop tried to secure Laval's restoration, the luckless minister was held in communicado on Bataine's orders. Even greater was the further affront to Hitler of Bataine's refusal to attend the ceremony at Les Invalides. The marshal initiated the rumor that this was just a German trick to lure him to Paris and kidnap him, a canard which enraged Hitler. So now a new harpy tapped at his door, the possibility of signing a peace treaty with Britain, but this time at France's expense. Something distantly resembling the spirit of Christmas overcame Hitler. Instructing Goring's Luftwaffe to suspend all bombing missions against Britain until the Christian festival was over. He set out with his personal staff on a Christmas tour of the Western Front. He planned to inspect the big gun batteries, and he wanted to celebrate the holiday with the air crews of Goring's fighter and bomber squadrons. Goring himself was spending a comfortable Christmas and New Year at his Romington hunting estate, some twenty miles from the Russian frontier in East Prussia. A frosty interview with Darlin, Badain's crown prince, chilled the atmosphere of Hitler's special train, Darlin recounted how his family had always hated the British and had been fighting them now for three hundred years, a perhaps inappropriate confidence, given Hitler's present mood. Christ Schroeder wrote to a friend, we have not stopped moving since December 21. Christmas on the French coast, Calais and Dunkirk. As we were eating dinner in our special train on the 23rd at Boulogne, the British came and started bombing, 
and our anti-aircraft roared back at them. Even though we were shunted into a safe tunnel I couldn't help feeling a bit queer. On New Year's Eve the mood was more than painful. Hitler returned to the Berghof. Dr. Goebbels would be making the traditional New Year's Eve broadcast. Hitler had already approved the script, and marked it up with his spidery black ink amendments. They were of a trivial nature, except perhaps for one, where Goebbels had wanted to proclaim never shall we capitulate, never shall we tire, and never shall we be despondent, Hitler had expunged the first four words. Let Europe hold its breath. Hitler entered the new year, 1941, with two distantly related ambitions, to knock out Soviet Russia and thus force Britain to submit with no injury to her empire and to rescue fascism in Italy from threatened oblivion. Through Admiral Canaries he had offered, using obscure diplomatic channels, to mediate between Greece and Italy, but in vain. The fact is, for better or for worse, Germany is tied to the Duce, explained Hitler on January 4. In the long run you can only make history through loyalty, he mused virtuously. In the Balkans a dangerous situation had developed since Italy's ill-timed attack on Greece in October. Over Hitler's broad desks at the Berghof flowed the dispatches from Ribbentrop's experts. Familiar and unfamiliar Balkan potentates and diplomats were ushered past. In January the Prime Minister of Bulgaria arrived, followed a week later by King Boris again still promising to join the tripartite pact but genuinely fearing that the Russians would invade the moment the Germans set foot in Bulgaria. Here too was Antonescu, reaffirming the Romanian willingness to fight for Hitler but asking now for mines and for big guns to defend his Black Sea port of Constanta, where 700,000 tons of German oil was stockpiled, against Russian attack. No terrain could be less promising for modern armies than the Balkans. Before Hitler's troops could even get into Bulgaria, they would have to throw pontoon bridges across the swirling Danube River, nearly a mile wide. The roads were virtually impassable in winter and became morasses when the snow thawed. The crumbling bridges crossing the countless Balkan streams and dikes would never support the loads an army would impose on them. Nevertheless, the way Macht overcame all these obstacles, in the remaining weeks before married to German staff officers in plain clothes and Volkswagens were sent throughout Bulgaria to supervise the strengthening of the bridges and the resurfacing of the roads. To Hitler, early in 1941, the Balkans meant two things, the Ploesti oil field in Romania, now well within the reach of the RAF bombers even if the Athens government still refused them the necessary overflight permission and Salonika, in northern Greece, from which the Allies had launched their deadly assault on Austria-Hungary in World War I. He called together his leading military advisers and Ribbentrop for a council of war at the Berghof. It began on January 7 and ended on the 9th with a major secret speech in which he outlined the reasoning underlying his grand strategy, at a length and level of frankness unfamiliar since his harangues of 1939. People had overconfidently predicted, he remarked, that Britain would cave in under the pressure of the Luftwaffe bombing offensive. Now, not even Hitler accepted that. The British people's toughness was a wholly unexpected factor, he admitted. Terror raids by the Luftwaffe have little point or prospect of success, he explained. The Luftwaffe must concentrate on reinforcing the naval blockade and on attacking bottlenecks in the arms industry. Britain was already admitting a 10% loss in arms output. Rumours of Britain's growing military strength could easily be discounted by the simplest analysis of the raw materials position, at present Germany was producing 24 million tonnes of iron a year compared with less than 8 million in Britain. Germany could marshal far greater reserves of manpower, in Britain the number of jobless was actually increasing, a sure measure of her industrial problems. The German naval blockade was only just beginning. The destruction of the English mother country is inevitable in time, Hitler concluded. Britain is propped up by her faith in the United States and Russia. Her wooing of Stalin was betrayed by many clues, from intercepts Hitler was aware of the diplomatic overtures Britain was preparing in Moscow, Britain had disclaimed any interest in the Dardanelles, 
and Russia's chorus of increased demands since the summer of 1940 was unlikely to be coincidence. Stalin was infinitely clever, he must be seen as an ice-cold blackmailer who would not hesitate to tear up every written treaty if it served his purposes. Apart from Russia, Germany's position was now impregnable, at least for the coming year, Hitler added. Norway was safe from invasion. Occupied France wanted an end to the war, the unoccupied half still dreamed of a reverse in its fortunes, but he had prepared Operation Atla to occupy this sector should General Wagand, that German hater, declare North Africa for the Allies. He was still undecided about Spain, Franke had more than once broken his promise concerning Gibraltar, and he would still go no further than agree to enter the war once Britain was down and almost out. In the Balkans, only Romania was unreservedly friendly, and Tonsky had made the best impression imaginable on Hitler. Bulgaria was loyal, had feared Russian intervention until recently, but would join the tripartite pact in good time. Hungary was usable at present. Yugoslavia was cool. Therefore Russia must be Britain's last hope. They will only give up when we have smashed this last hope on the continent to smithereens. The British were no fools, said Hitler. They must realize that if they lost this war they would no longer have the moral authority to hold their empire together. On the other hand, if they can pull through and raise 40 or 50 divisions, and if the United States and Russia help them, then Germany will be in a precarious situation. He had always believed, he said, in destroying the enemy's most powerful positions first. That is why Russia must now be defeated. True, the Russian forces are a clay colossus with no head, but who knows how they will develop in the future. The defeat of the Soviet Union must be swift and final, under no circumstances must the Russians be allowed to regroup after the first, brutal breakthrough. Again he called for the rapid occupation of the Baltic coast first of all. The general's strategic targets were the annihilation of the Russian army and the occupation of the oil fields at Baku, on the Caspian Sea. Though immense and new, this latter demand should not, however, daunt them. Their armies had also covered immense distances in the few weeks of the French campaign, Hitler reminded them. He concluded, when we fight this campaign, let Europe hold its breath. From now until June 1941, Hitler made no mention whatsoever of Russia in his public speeches. On January 5, 1941 a small British force had captured the Italian fortress of Bardia in Libya, taking 45,000 Italians prisoner. There were now only five Italian divisions left in Cyrenaica and five more in Tripolitania. Meanwhile the Luftwaffe Corps which Hitler had transferred to the Mediterranean had opened its attack on January 6, sinking a British cruiser and damaging an aircraft carrier. Hitler sought for other ways of helping the Italians out of their self-created mess, like sending a mountain division to Albania, and a small blocking force of German tanks and engineers to help the Italians hold on to Tripoli. His ambassador in Rome accompanied Ribbentrop to the Berghof on the 9th and urged that Germany exert a greater influence on Italian strategy, but Hitler characteristically refused to do anything that would damage the Duce. Two days later he signed the directive ordering the army and Luftwaffe to prepare to support the Italian defense of Albania and Tripolitania. Mussolini finally agreed to come to a meeting but stipulated that there must be no fuss and no photographers. Hitler collected him from a small railroad station near Salzburg at 10 a.m. on January 19. Two days of conferences and strolls about the snow-clad Ober Salzburg followed. Hitler had one 90-minute talk privately with the Duce, but from the record of the other conferences it is clear he revealed nothing he had not already stated to his own generals on the 9th, except that he made no mention of his plan to attack Russia soon. Indeed, he again averred that so long as the wise and prudent Stalin was alive Russia would adhere to her treaties. This meeting brought to an end Mussolini's dream of fighting an independent war parallel to Hitler's, in the Mediterranean. He accepted the offer of a blocking force for Tripoli but could not accept the mountain division for Albania, as he needed the Albanian port space for his own reinforcements. His humiliations continued. 
On January 22, Tobruk fell into British hands with 25,000 Italians. The whole of Tripolitania was now in peril. The Panzer Specialist General Hans von Funk, sent to North Africa in mid-January, reported to Hitler on February 1 in the most pessimistic terms at the Chancellery in Berlin, the Italians had no will to resist the British onslaught in North Africa. The crazy feature is, said Hitler afterward to his staff, that on the one hand the Italians are shrieking for help but on the other hand they are so jealous and childish that they won't stand for being helped by German soldiers. Mussolini would probably like it best if our troops could fight in Italian uniforms there. In conference with his army in Luftwaffe chiefs two days later, Hitler again declared that militarily the loss of Italian North Africa would mean little, however, its political and psychological effects could be devastating, Hitler decided to send more than just a blocking force to North Africa, he would send a light infantry and a panzer division to Libya, with a German corps staff. He chose Erwin Rommel to command this Africa Corps. In August 1942 he explained to Italy's ambassador Dino Alfieri, I chose Rommel because he's like Dietl, he knows how to carry his troops forward with him, and this is absolutely vital for the commander of an army fighting under extremes of climate, be it in North Africa or in the far north. On February 6 he briefed Rommel and General Inno von Rintelen, the military attaché in Rome in Berlin. He instructed Rintelen to ask Mussolini to put all the Italian mechanized units in Libya under Rommel's command. Rommel was to hold Tripolitania for the Axis powers, tying down the British and preventing them from breaking through to the French in Tunisia. Saw so Army's commander-in-chief, Braukic, first, wrote Rommel to his wife. Then the Führer. There's no time to be lost. My luggage is being sent on afterward. My head reels to think of all that can still go wrong. It will be months before things take effect. His first troops began disembarking at Tripoli, in North Africa, on the 12th. Spurred on by the ambiguous attitude of Vichy during January 1941, Hitler put renewed pressure on General Franco to revise his views on Gibraltar. The British were certain, he argued, to let Spain down in the end. Franco, of course, had no inkling of the strict timetable Hitler had already drawn up, this explains the increasing irritability of Ribbentrop's telegrams to Madrid over the next two weeks. On the 20th the ambassador cabled from Madrid that the Cordillo, Franco, had cleverly skirted around the central issue dash as to whether Spain would enter the war there is no question. It is only a question of when. The German ambassador was instructed to read out to Franco six points which would do little for the dictator's vanity. The first point read, without the help of the Führer and the Duce there would not be any nationalist Spain today. Nor any Cordillo. If Franco did not abandon his vacillating attitude, then the end of nationalist Spain was only a matter of time. Franco angrily denounced this as unjust, he had never vacillated. The ambassador cabled Ribbentrop that the Cordillo seemed more hesitant than before. Ribbentrop cabled him to see Franco and read out a message beginning, only the immediate entry by Spain into the war is of any strategic value to the Axis. This was the harsh truth, given the necessary promise Germany would at once release 100,000 tons of grain from Lisbon. On January 28, Jodl pointed out to Hitler that it would be impossible to launch the actual assault on Gibraltar before mid-April, which meant that the hundreds of artillery pieces and troops involved could not be released for Barbarossa in mid-May. Hitler evidently still pinned some hopes on Mussolini's talks with the Cordillo on February 12. A few days beforehand he wrote the Cordillo a personal letter suggesting that in times of crisis nations could be saved less by prudent foresight than by a bold heart. On the 14th Ribbentrop telephoned to the Berghof a message from the Duce. Franke had made it abundantly clear that Spain would not join the war. Spain was to be granted the whole of French Morocco, and the assault on Gibraltar was to be executed by Spanish forces, perhaps with German support. Walther Huell wrote in his diary that day, the Führer is going to drop Spain. They will just go under.
In the evening, we sat for a long time with the Führer around the fireside, continued Huell's diary. The Führer talked about his pension, that of a middle grade civil servant. He is going to write books, a third volume of Mein Kampf. Earlier that afternoon he had spent two and a half hours nervously trying to persuade the Yugoslav Prime Minister to join the Tripartite Pact. Hitler suggested that it was illusory to expect the British to evacuate their foothold in Greece now. Only when our dive bombers and armoured corps appear will they get out of Greece as hastily as they have on every other occasion that we employed these means. Germany has no demands whatever against Greece. Here as elsewhere Britain is the root cause of all the difficulties. When the Yugoslavs left the Berg off they said they would report to the Prince Regent in Belgrade and let Hitler know. On the outcome would depend Marita, and Hitler had reason to be nervous. The first wave of divisions was now moving toward the frontier with Russia, only a slow procession as yet, not until mid-March 1941 would the second wave begin. As Losberg had pointed out, the German railway network was so superior to the Russian system that when the real race began, Germany could muster seven divisions a day and the Russians only five. The farther west the barbarous divisions waited the better dash the bigger will be the Russian surprise when the German troop concentration begins. When Field Marshal von Bock reported to Hitler on February 1, their conversation ranged across the attack on Russia. Bock agreed that if the Russians stood their ground and fought, they would be defeated, and he wondered whether they could be forced into an armistice. This might be one consequence of the German capture of the Ukraine, Moscow, and Leningrad, replied Hitler, otherwise the way Mack must advance toward Yekaterinburg. Anyway, he concluded, I am glad that we carried on with arms manufacture so that we are now strong enough to be a match for anybody. We have more than enough material and we already have to begin thinking about converting parts of our industry. Our way Mack manpower position is better than when war broke out. Our economy is absolutely firm. The Führer rejected out of hand any idea of yielding, not that Bock had hinted at it. I am going to fight, he said, and I am convinced that our attack will flatten them like a hailstorm. Two days later Field Marshal von Braukic brought Chief of General Staff Franz Holder to the Chancellery to outline the Army's operational directive on Barbarossa. Although Army intelligence believed the Russians might have as many as 10,000 tanks, compared with their own 3,500, the Russian armored vehicles were a motley collection of obsolete design. Even so, surprises cannot be ruled out altogether, warned Holder. As for the Russian soldier, Holder believed the Germans were superior in experience, training, equipment, organization, command, national character, and ideology. Hitler naturally agreed. As for Soviet armament, he was something of an expert on arms production, he said, and from memory he recited a 10-minute statistical lecture on Russian tank production since 1928. Hitler approved the army's directive but once again he emphasized the capture of the Baltic coast and of Leningrad. The latter was particularly important if the Russians were falling back elsewhere, as this northern stronghold would provide the best possible supply base for the second phase of the campaign. Hitler knew that Holder had just had a first round of talks with his Finnish counterpart, General Erich Heinrichs, in Berlin. He was convinced the Finns would make ideal allies although Finland's political strategy would be problematical as she wished to avoid a complete rupture with the United States and Britain. As he said to his staff, they are a plucky people, and at least I will have a good flank defense there. Quite apart from which, it is always good to have comrades in arms who are thirsting for revenge. With the third wave in mid-April, continued Holder, the maximum capacity transport plan would begin and the troop concentrations could no longer be concealed except as a vast decoy operation to distract from an invasion of Britain, but when the fourth and final wave of panzer divisions that had been re-equipping and resting in central Germany started rolling eastward from April 25 onward, an invasion of Britain would become an obviously impossible cover story. Hitler admiringly agreed with all that Holder had said. When Barbarossa gets going, 
the whole world will hold its breath, it won't move a muscle. Probably no major campaign has ever been launched upon scantier intelligence. The services had furnished their lower commands with only the most inadequate information on the Russians. Maps were non-existent. The Russian aircraft industry was an unknown quantity on which the veil was only gradually being lifted. Recent indications were that it was being expanded at a disconcerting speed. Goring was apprehensive that the Russian Air Force might prove more formidable than the Army intelligence figures indicated. While Halder had confidently advised the Führer on February 3 that they would face only a small Red Army superiority in numbers, 155 divisions, by early April that figure had been raised to 247 divisions, four months later, when it was too late to retreat. The army admitted it has now identified 360 Soviet divisions in combat with them. The whole of Hitler's strategy was based on the assumption that Russia would be laid low in a blitzkrieg of only a few months. Now, on February 8, Kiita learned from his staff that while the Luftwaffe and Navy would have enough fuel to last until the coming autumn, gasoline and diesel fuel for the army's tanks and motor transport would not hold out beyond mid-August, unless of course the oil fields of the Caucasus could be reached in time. The rubber supply situation allowed for even less leeway. Much of Germany's rubber supplies had reached her from the Far East along the Trans-Siberian Railroad. War with Russia would cut that link, leaving only an uncertain trickle supplied by blockade-running ships. Later in February the OKW submitted to Hitler and Goring a survey of the economic side effects of Barbarossa. Key tells economics expert General Thomas noted after meeting Goring on February 26, he shares the Führer's opinion that when German troops march into Russia the entire Bolshevik state will collapse, and that for this reason we need not fear the destruction of the stores and railway system on a large scale, as I do. The main thing is to get rid of the Bolshevik leaders rapidly first of all. Goring's anxiety was about the weakness of the German supply lines. He recalled that supply failures proved Napoleon's undoing. For this reason he has kept urging the Führer to concentrate more on the supply organization and less on activating fresh divisions, some of which would not come under fire. Found in a Pennsylvania dumpster in 2001. After lawyer Robert Kempner died, his family threw out files he had filched from Nuremberg, among them the priceless war diary of Task Force Soldenberg, set up in November 1940 to plan the exploitation of the Soviet Union after its defeat, author's collection. Hitler however was already thinking beyond Barbarossa. On the 17th, Jodl instructed his staff that the Führer wished them to study the problems of assembling troops in Afghanistan for an assault on India. On Sunday February 16, Hitler's chief Wehrmacht adjutant, Rudolf Schmundt, who had flown to North Africa with Rommel the week before, reported back to the Berghof with photographs of Rommel's arrival and a first analysis of the position. Not surprisingly, Hitler awaited Rommel's operations feverishly as Schmundt wrote a few days later. Colonel Schmundt described to him the enthusiasm with which Rommel had thrown himself into his task. Hitler sanctioned all his requests, for anti-tank guns, mines, and Luftwaffe reconnaissance and close support aircraft. Rommel's first troops had covered the 350 miles to the Italian front west of El Aigle in 26 hours. Before he left Tripoli he set in train the rapid manufacture of scores of dummy tanks mounted on Volkswagen chassis to dupe the British into thinking he had a powerful armoured force. The letters Rommel sent to Schmund exuded optimism from every line. Hitler decided to send out the 15th Panzer Division as soon as he could. In mid-March Rommel reported to Hitler in person, and then returned to Africa. Without waiting for the new armoured division to arrive and against the explicit instructions of the Italian Supreme Commander, Italo Garibaldi, this German general launched a bold assault in early April, he did not halt until he had reached the Egyptian frontier and taken 3,000 British prisoners, including five generals. 
By the end of February 1941 the last major crisis before Barbarossa had been overcome, or so Hitler believed. At 7 am on February 28, since Greece still proudly refused to offer peace terms to Italy, the German Wehrmacht began throwing three big army bridges across the mile-wide, fast-flowing Danube from Romania into Bulgaria. After several false starts, Hitler dictated to Fräulein Wolf an important letter assuring Turkey's President Ismit Inonu that he saw no reason, either now or in the future, why Germany and Turkey should ever be enemies. Inonu replied calmly, and Hitler was well pleased. On March 1 we find Hitler in Vienna, where King Boris had authorized his Prime Minister to sign Bulgaria's formal entry into the Tripartite Pact. Within one week the first German soldiers would be standing on the Greek frontier, facing British and Greek troops just as they had in 1918. This time things would surely be different, neither Turkey nor Russia would move in muscle against them. Behind the door. A few days after Hitler's combined armies invaded Russia, Sweden as the protecting power gave Germany discreet permission for the Soviet embassy in Paris to be searched. The building was forcibly entered by a major general of the German police and a squad of forensic experts of Heydrich's security service. Heydrich's report to Ribbentrop related, there were 26 Soviet Russians in the building. Five of them, four men and a woman, had locked themselves into strong rooms specially shielded by heavy armor plate steel doors. They were busy destroying documents and other materials in four furnaces specially constructed and installed in there. They could not be prevented from doing this, as even using special technical gear it would still have taken hours to force the rooms open. Heydrich's officers were less impressed by the haul of radio gear, time fuses, detonators, and explosives than by the furnaces found in the special wing of the building used by the GPU the Soviet secret police. Investigation indicated that they had been used for cremating bodies. Ribbentrop brought this report to Hitler, but Hitler had already heard the details firsthand from Admiral Canaries, one of whose department heads had himself inspected the Paris building. He had recorded, the completely isolated wing of the embassy in which the GPU's offices and execution chambers were located can only be described as a criminals and murderers workshop of the most outstanding technical perfection, soundproof walls, heavy, electrically operated steel doors, hidden spy holes and slots for guns to be fired from one room into another, an electrical furnace, and a bathtub in which the corpses were cut up completed the macabre inventory of these rooms, in addition to housebreaking implements, poison capsules, and the like. Thus there is every probability that many an awkward white Russian emigre or opponent of the Soviets in France vanished in this way, they literally went up in smoke. Hitler ordered the Soviet embassy buildings in Berlin searched. In the Soviet trade mission headquarters at 11 Litzenberg Asteres, the same armored strong rooms with the same furnaces were found, and again there were stocks of guns and ammunition. In a cynical diary entry Goebbels wrote, these Soviet embassies are in fact the refuges of criminals. If a criminal gang comes to power, then they will use criminal means to conduct their policies. It is a good thing that Bolshevism is being got rid of once and for all in our eastern campaign. There was, after all, no room for the two of us in Europe in the long run. Hitler expected the war in the Soviet Union to be merciless. Bolshevik methods were familiar to him. The brutality of the Bolsheviks in the Spanish Civil War, in Stalin's half of Poland, and most recently in the hapless Baltic states, indicated that this was a permanent trait. In the Baltic countries Stalin had appointed commissars, usually Jewish who had supervised the deportation and liquidation of the entire intelligentsia within a matter of weeks, these commissars had then been replaced by Russians who had disposed of their predecessors. In the Western campaigns Hitler had instructed the Wehrmacht to fight with discipline. In the armistice that followed he had explicitly ordered all troops in the occupied territories to perform their duties flawlessly and with proper reserve, any drunkenness or violence was to be severely punished if necessary by death and dishonor.
In the Eastern Campaign, however, no holds would be barred on either side. A member of Jodl's staff later wrote, For Hitler, Bolshevism is not an enemy with whom one chivalrously crosses swords. In his view we must expect all manner of knavery and cruelty. So Hitler proposes to meet him with the same fighting methods from the start. Heydrich ordered that where the native Baltic populations initiated pogroms against their Jewish oppressors they were to be actively encouraged. To some extent the Bolshevik leaders by having refused to sign the Geneva Convention of 1929 on the treatment of prisoners of war had paved the way. They could do what they liked with German prisoners in their hands, but they could expect no quarter from Hitler either. He issued these orders to Jodl in March 1941 as a guideline for the way Macht for Barbarossa. The coming campaign is more than just a clash of arms. It will result in a conflict of two ideologies. Given the vastness of the country, it will not be enough to defeat the enemy armed forces if the war is to be ended. Wishful thinking alone will not rid modern Russia of the socialist idea, so this idea alone can function as the domestic political basis for the creation of these new states and governments. The Jewish Bolshevik intelligentsia as the present subjugators of the people must be got rid of. The former bourgeois aristocracy, insofar as it survives abroad, is also useless, they are rejected by the Russian people and are anti-German in any case. In addition we must do everything to avoid allowing a nationalist Russia to supplant the Bolshevik one, as history shows it will always be anti-German. Our job is to set up as soon as possible, with a minimum of military effort, socialist mini-states dependent on us. These tasks will be so difficult that they cannot be entrusted to the army. The army's actual zone of operations was to be a belt as shallow as practicable while in the rear Himmler's SS and various Reich commissioners would see to the founding of the new state governments. The High Command, OKW, records speak obscurely of the need to put all Bolshevik headmen and commissars out of harm's way, Himmler had been ordered by Hitler to carry out on his own responsibility certain special duties of a kind to be expected in a fight between two diametrically opposed political systems. The army's records portray Hitler's purpose more bluntly. Holder recorded the Führer as telling him, we have to set up to Stalinized republics. The intelligentsia appointed by Stalin must be destroyed. In the whole of Russia it will be necessary to employ the most naked brute force. The ideological bonds are not yet strong enough to hold the Russian people together. Once the officials are disposed of, the nation will burst apart. Holder's quartermaster general, traditionally responsible for army occupation policy, attended that conference, after discussing police matters with Heydrich, a few days later he drafted an army order giving the SS task forces a free hand to execute certain grim assignments within the army's zone of operations. In a speech to his army in Luftwaffe generals at the end of this month, March 1941, Hitler prepared them too for the different character of the coming fight in Russia. He compared the communist ideology with legalized criminality. We must put the arguments of soldierly comradeship right out of our minds, he told his generals. The communist is no comrade and never will be. He suggested that commissars and GPU officials are criminals and must be treated as such. In conclusion, Hitler noted, I do not expect my generals to understand my orders to this effect. But I demand that they obey them. Early in March 1941 the British Navy executed a lightning raid on the Lofoten Isles in Norway. Hitler regarded it as an unacceptable blow to German prestige and issued orders for the execution of all Norwegians who had aided the enemy. Admiral Hermann Bohm, the admiral commanding Norway, was summoned to the Berghof. At this conference Hitler decided it would no longer be possible to release 40% of the military strength in Norway for Barbarossa. For the next three years the fear that the British would mount an invasion of Norway never left him. As the ice thawed in Central Europe, the Wehrmacht's timetable began to unfold. Hitler's secretary, Christa Schroeder, wrote at the Berghof on March 7. It will soon be time to return to Berlin, we have been down here long enough. We shall probably be back in Berlin in the middle of the month. 
we have to be injected again against cholera and typhus, and that happened before all our big journeys. Goring had now returned from his extended leave, and on March 6 he secured a long interview with Hitler in which he repaired the fences that had been broken in his absence. At this time Goring's prestige was low following his defeat in the Battle of Britain. He was also embarrassed by the exaggerated claims of his pilots when destroyed enemy aircraft, battleships, and aircraft carriers turned up intact. It is significant that although Goring referred to himself in February 1941 as the second man in the state, Hitler was privately explaining to Key Eitel and Jodl that one reason why a powerful OKW would become necessary in the future was that a man might later step into his shoes who might well be the best statesman but might not have as much military knowledge and ability at his fingertips as he did. This could hardly refer to Goring. Admiral Redder had become bolder in his attacks on the absent Reichsmarschall, producing air photographs of Portsmouth, Plymouth, and Cardiff to show the ineffectiveness of the Luftwaffe bombing and pointing out that the crescendo of RAF attacks on Germany was proof that the enemy air force was anything but defeated. Only in bombing the enemy's sea lanes could the Luftwaffe be used to best advantage. These arguments were accepted by Hitler in his Directive for Economic Warfare against Britain on February 6. He identified the loss of British merchant shipping as the most potent factor in the destruction of her war economy. Hitler emphasized, no decisive effect is to be expected from systematic terror raids. The facts bore this out. A French diplomat who had left Britain in December reported to the German authorities that although the night bombing of London and Coventry had affected public morale to some extent, Newcastle, where he had been stationed, had hardly suffered. Hitler personally underlined with blue pencil the man's remarks that massive attacks on Newcastle had not taken place up to his departure. The diplomat had expressed puzzlement at this, as at present the Vickers Armstrong shipyards at Newcastle were building an aircraft carrier, two battle cruisers, a light cruiser, six or seven destroyers, and three or four submarines. Hitler ordered this brought to the Luftwaffe's attention but he refused to injure Goring's pride by giving the Navy direct control of the Air Force units that it needed. In Albania, the Italian minor offensive, launched on March 14, had fizzled out. Hitler was secretly pleased that the Duce had again burned his fingers. The Greek general commanding the Northern Army secretly let the Germans know that he would agree to an immediate armistice in Albania if the Italian troops there were replaced by Germans, they would also talk about territorial claims, provided that there were no Italians at the conference table. Hitler however told both Braukic and Redder that even if Greece would now agree to evict the British, Germany would still have to occupy the whole country so that the Luftwaffe could command the eastern Mediterranean. By March 24, when Hitler departed for Vienna to attend Yugoslavia's signing of the Tripartite Pact, the British were believed to have disembarked up to 40,000 troops in Greece. The OKW instructed the German military attaché in Washington to see to it that the size of the British force in Greece was given maximum publicity. The bigger the British talk, the better will be the propaganda effect of their defeat. Arriving in Vienna, Hitler was in high spirits as his train pulled into the station. He stayed at the Imperial Hotel redolent with memories of March 1938. Once, his adjutants allowed a Frau Wolf in to see Hitler, his younger sister, Paula, working incognito as a secretary in a military hospital. For a while they chatted about family affairs. Paula said, sometimes when I am in the mountains and I see a little chapel I go in and pray for you. Hitler was deeply stirred, and after a time replied, do you know it is my absolute conviction that the Lord is holding his protecting hand above me? Paula had been eleven when their mother died, and Adolf eighteen. He had not seen her for thirteen years after that, she remained of the opinion that it was a pity he had not become an architect as he had always wanted. IT had taken all of March to persuade the ambivalent Yugoslavs to sign the Tripartite Pact but the psychological blow to Britain was well worth the time invested, in addition, Hitler's armies fighting in Greece would depend on a line of communications extending for some 250 miles along, 
and only 12 miles away from the Yugoslav border. Once, the Yugoslav regent Prince Paul visited him unofficially at the Berghof. He laid down harsh terms for his country's compliance with Hitler's plans, Yugoslav territory was not to be crossed by Axis troops, she was to make no military contribution herself, but was to receive Salonika as a reward. It was not until Germany agreed to these terms that the Yugoslav Privy Council agreed to sign the pact, however, anti-Italian feeling was running so high in Belgrade that several ministers resigned over the issue. After the pact was signed, Hitler sent for key Eitel and expressed his pleasure that there would now be no further unpleasant surprises for them in the Balkans. The Quagmire, the Quagmire. Seldom was a pact shorter lived than this one with Yugoslavia. Early on March 27, Kuhl brought Hitler the stunning news that there had been a coup d'etat in Belgrade. Prince Paul had been overthrown. Crowds were demonstrating outside the German legation, the German tourist office had been destroyed, the Swedish envoy had been mistaken for a German and beaten unconscious, and British flags, distributed by the British legation, were appearing everywhere. Crowds were singing the red flag in the streets. The coup had been engineered by Yugoslavia's Air Force commander, General Dusan Simovic, a Serb known to be hostile to Germany. His revolutionary cabinet did not ratify the entry into the tripartite pact, but mouthed protestations of loyalty toward Germany. Hitler set little store by them, he had mouthed enough such protestations of his own in the past. Storming that this revolution was as though somebody had smacked his fist into a basin full of water, he sent for Key Eitel and Jodl. As a result of his Austrian upbringing he had always been uneasy about the chauvinistic Serbs in Belgrade. He could hardly credit his good fortune that all this had happened now, and not later. In mid-May Barbarossa was scheduled to begin, had the overthrow of Prince Paul occurred only then, it would have enormously complicated Hitler's plans. Luckily the enemy unmasked themselves now, he crowed, while our hands are still free. Kuhl wrote in his diary, Goring, Braukic, and Ribbentrop are sent for immediately. Decisions are rapidly taken. The mood is exhilarating. The Hungarian and Bulgarian envoys are summoned forthwith. Shortly, the fish hung Sam tapped into a revealing telephone conversation going on between Simovic and his ambassador in Washington, Foltik, the former on his real plans, the latter on his talk with President Roosevelt. Hitler told the Hungarian envoy Domstoj that his message for the regent of Hungary, Horthy, was this, the hour had struck for Hungary's revenge, the Führer would support her territorial claims against Yugoslavia to the hilt. March back into the Banat. He advised, referring to territories which Hungary had lost at Trianon, and he offered to Hungary the port of Fium as an outlet into the Adriatic, which Admiral Horthy must surely desire. Shortly afterward Hitler received the Bulgarian envoy, Draganov, and offered to him what was to have been Yugoslavia's share of Greece, Macedonia. The eternal uncertainty down there is over, he rejoiced. The tornado is going to burst upon Yugoslavia with breathtaking suddenness. In a brief war conference with Halder, Braukic, and Ribbentrop, Hitler settled the broad plan of attack in the Balkans. Politically it is vital for the blow to fall on Yugoslavia without mercy. Goring would open the campaign with waves of bombers against Belgrade. By the small hours of the morning following the war conference, the formal directive was in Hitler's hands, Yugoslavia is to be regarded as an enemy and is therefore to be destroyed as rapidly as possible, whatever protestations of loyalty she may momentarily utter. The attack on Russia would now have to be postponed for up to four weeks. Even here fate was on Hitler's side, the spring of 1941 had brought unusually heavy rains to Central Europe, and the ground would have been too marshy for the panzer divisions, the rivers and dikes were flooded throughout western Russia. The divisions Hitler now committed to the Balkans would have remained idle until June anyway. Punctually at 4 p.m. on March 27, outwardly unruffled by the breathtaking events of the past few hours, Hitler received the Japanese Foreign Minister, Yosuke Matsoka, at the Chancellery. 
Hitler saw in Japan's territorial aspirations in the Far East a further powerful means of bringing about Britain's submission. It was Admiral Redder who had first brought Hitler's attention to Singapore, the key to British supremacy in the Far East. Late in December, Redder had shown him a letter from his naval attaché in Tokyo, reporting that certain Japanese naval circles were seriously in favor of capturing Singapore as soon as possible, Reda suggested to Hitler that it would be very much in Germany's interest if Japan became embroiled with Britain, however lengthy and profitless her campaign. Hitler had hinted obscurely to the departing Japanese ambassador, Saburo Kuresu, in early February that mutual friends could one day become our mutual enemies dash meaning Germany and Russia but this message left no visible impression on Tokyo. Hitler instructed the OKW to draft a plan for wide-ranging joint consultation between Germany and Japan. The way Macht and German industry must give their ally generous insight into all their most up-to-date secret weapons and designs, in the tacit hope that Japan would take active steps in the Far East as soon as possible. Later in February Hitler and Ribbentrop had urged the new Japanese ambassador, General Hiroshi Oshima, to recommend a Japanese attack on Singapore. Oshima said that Japan now felt it must prepare for war not only with Britain but with the United States and that this would take time, the preparations for attacking Singapore would be concluded by the end of May. On February 27, Ribbentrop cabled his ambassador in Tokyo, please use every means at your disposal to get Japan to take Singapore as soon as possible. Hitler still refused to play his trump card, revealing to the Japanese his firm plan to attack Russia. In a directive issued early in March, the OKW pointed out that this attack on Russia would provide Japan with an opportunity to launch her own campaigns, but warned that no hint whatsoever is to be given to the Japanese about Operation Barbarossa. In response to General Halder's urging on March 17 Hitler merely agreed to drop a hint as to the possibility when Matsoka saw him. Hitler observed how KG Matsoka was about Singapore, the visitor stressed in painful detail how little weight his voice carried on this issue in Tokyo, and made his own most direct reference to Barbara Su in an aside to General Oshimu at the luncheon given for Matsoka on the 28th. He noted. If the Soviet Union were to attack Japan, then Germany would not hesitate to launch an armed attack on the Soviet Union. When a few days later Matsoka passed through Berlin Hitler offered him a similar guarantee in the event that Japan should find herself at war with the United States. On April 10, Ribbentrop was to be even more explicit, stating that Germany might yet start a war against the Soviet Union before the year is out, it depends on how she behaves. But the Japanese response was disappointing, indeed, while passing through Moscow on his return to Tokyo, Matsoka signed an agreement of neutrality between Japan and Moscow. Hitler had left several of his key ministers in the dark about Barbarossa. He had not informed even Dr. Goebbels until shortly before Matsoka's visit, because it was not until the propaganda chief attended Hitler's banquet for the Japanese minister on March 28, 1941 that he jotted these telling words in his diary, after Yugoslavia, the biggest operation will then follow, against our it is being meticulously concealed, only a very few are in the know. It will be initiated with massive westbound troop movements. We divert attention every which way, except to the east. A faint invasion operation is to be prepared against England, then, like lightning, everything goes back, east and up and at M. It would call for a masterpiece of propaganda, he admitted, but, great victories lie in store. Once more, on March 30, Hitler's generals and admirals were summoned from all over Nazi-occupied Europe to hear a secret speech in Berlin. He explained at some length his decision to attack Russia, starting significantly with Britain's refusal to make peace in June 1940. He spoke scalingly of Italy's misfortunes, charitably distinguishing between the plucky but poorly led Italian soldiers and their bumbling and devious political and military commanders. Why has Britain fought on? He asked. He identified two primary reasons, the influence of the Jews and of Britain's international financial entanglements, 
and the dominant influence of the Churchill clique. The RAF's night bombing of Germany boosted British domestic morale far more than it damaged German industry. Now Britain was hitching her fortunes to the United States and Russia, declared Hitler. Of the United States he was not afraid. But Russia must be defeated now. We have the chance to smash Russia while our own rear is free. That chance will not recur so soon. I would be betraying the future of the German people if I did not seize it now. Hitler urged his generals to have no compunctions about violating their treaty with Russia. Stalin had only cynically signed it, but he also urged them not to underestimate the Russian tanks or air force, or to rely too heavily on Germany's allies in this fight. He drilled into his generals that this would be a war between great ideologies, and as such very different from the war in the West. In the East cruelty now will be kindness for the future. The Russian commissars and GPU officials were criminals, and were to be treated as such. It is not our job to see that these criminals survive. In a masterpiece of rapid general staff work, the entire Balkan campaign plan was dismantled and remounted within nine days to make provision for the invasion of Yugoslavia by German forces. The rich and fertile Banat region would be returned to Hungary, the Dalmatian coast and Montenegro assigned to Italy, and Serbia itself placed under German military rule. Croatia was to become an autonomous state. It all seemed a very satisfactory end to the Balkan nightmare before it had really begun. Russia's stance in the Balkans remained uncertain. Rumors multiplied. Was Stalin offering Yugoslavia's new regime a non-aggression pact? Had he secretly offered them arms and supplies? Was Stalin preparing to seize Romania? On April 5 the Romanian general staff reported to Hitler that the Russians were stepping up photographic reconnaissance sorties over Romania, and that a new paratroop school had just opened at Kiev. The die was cast. Hitler instructed Ribbentrop to ignore any fresh protestations of loyalty from Belgrade. When Count Chenov phoned after dinner on March 31 with news that the deputy premier of Yugoslavia was asking to see Mussolini, Hitler advised, keep him away for the next few days. On April 5 the political clouds began to clear, Huell brought to Hitler a disturbing Verschung samt intercept proving that Stalin was on the point of signing a pact with the new anti-German regime in Belgrade. It was, therefore, now or never. An hour after midnight, it was now April 6, 1941, he sent for Dr. Goebbels. He needed company. He told Goebbels that he was going to prosecute this war against the Serbs without pity. Hitler sipped tea until 5.20, the appointed zero hour for his attack, then retired to bed as German armored and infantry divisions began storming the frontiers of Greece and Yugoslavia. 300 German bombers were in the air, heading for Belgrade. A bit of victory. Hitler had fully taken into account the susceptibilities of his new allies, in a directive issued at the beginning of April 1941, he stated that he would himself assign the necessary campaign objectives for the Italian and Hungarian forces. Horthy was no problem, but the Duce, his amour proper injured by a succession of defeats obliged Hitler to adopt public postures and contortions on Italy's behalf that for once united the OKW, the foreign ministry, the army, and the navy in a seething, uncomprehending anger at their Führer's indulgence of his inept ally. Within twelve days of Hitler's attack, Yugoslavia was defeated. The British expeditionary force found itself fighting a hopeless rearguard action against the German armoured and mountain corps which had comfortably sidestepped the formidable Metaxas line to pour into Yugoslavia and Greece. The British had committed a real blunder in purchasing the coup d'etat in Belgrade. Hitler had ordered the attack to begin with the saturation bombing of Belgrade, with an eye to the deterrent effect on other powers, notably Turkey and the Soviet Union. As many as 17,000 civilians were killed in the air raid, robbed of their nerve center, the Yugoslav armies caved in. Over 340,000 Yugoslav soldiers were taken prisoner, the Germans lost only 151 dead although they bore the brunt of the fighting. Throughout the campaign, 
the Italians and the Hungarians displayed a marked reluctance to attack until the enemy had first been soundly beaten by the German troops. Horthy expressed the pious hope that in the coming fighting the Hungarian armies would not be led too far astray from Hungary. At that time he had no knowledge of Hitler's plans to launch a coalition war against Russia within three months. On the afternoon of April 9, German radio broadcast the first string of six special bulletins on the victories in the southeast. Tuell noted the magnificent mood at Hitler's chancellery. The mood was dimmed briefly when 50 British bombers arrived over Berlin. Hitler took refuge in his air raid shelter and, after the raid was over, sent Huell to a blitzed area. Bellevue Castle, the Crown Prince's Palace, the State Library, and the University had been badly damaged, in the State Opera House under Denland and the fires were out of control. Churchill claimed he had killed 3,000 in Berlin wanting to play off the casualties in Berlin against those in Belgrade, Goebbels suppressed the real figure, just 15. In revenge, a week later Hitler sent the Luftwaffe to raid London continuously for 10 hours with a thousand tons of bombs. Late on April 10 his train left Berlin for Munich, and on the 11th he continued through Vienna toward Graz. Here a tunnel took the single-track railway through the Alps. The OKW command train, Atlas, halted on the far side of the ice-cold, 3,000-yard-long tunnel, Hitler's America stopped before entering it, near the little station of Monichgurchen. This heavily guarded area was to be his headquarters for the next two weeks. His only contacts with the outside world were the OKW's communications system, the showing of rough-cut newsreels at the nearby Monichgurchenhof Hotel and the visits of his generals and ministers. On April 12, the Nazi banner was already flying over the ruins of Belgrade. On the 14th the Greeks began evacuating Albania. On the 15th the OKW learned that the British expeditionary force was in full flight toward its ports of embarkation. Broadcasting to the Yugoslav nation, Churchill offered deceptive comfort. The British were still standing right behind them an unfortunately ambiguous statement which Goebbels instructed his press media to exploit to the full. Hitler's instructions to the OKW were that if Greece surrendered, all Greek prisoners were to be released, as a mark of his admiration for the valor with which they had defended their frontiers. Hitler laid down the principle that surrender offers were always to be accepted by German commanders, however small the enemy unit involved. Field Marshal List formally accepted the Greek army's surrender on April 21 even though the Greek commander, General Tsolokilou, made it plain that he was not surrendering to the Italians, whom his forces had soundly defeated, and, indeed, had not seen for some days. Mussolini was livid. Italy, blustered the Duce, had been fighting with 500,000 men and lost 63,000 dead in her six months of war with Greece. Then suddenly the SS lifeguards had advanced so far that they held a bridge which actively blocked the Italian pursuit of the Greeks. Hitler reluctantly backtracked and told Jodl that List was wrong to have accepted the surrender and that the fight must go on until the Greeks surrendered to the Italians too. Ribbentrop visited Hitler that afternoon. April 21. Huell noted, surrender talks are in progress with the Greek army. Obstacle. The Italians. Everybody is furious, even the Führer. He is always torn between soldier and politician. Not only had the Greek army surrendered to the Germans and laid down its arms, but the greater part of it was already in captivity. How were the Greeks now to continue fighting for Italy's benefit? Hitler sent word to the Duce's headquarters that perhaps the Italians would like to send a representative to assist Jodl in settling the surrender terms with the Greeks the next morning, April 22. Mussolini's forces had however opened a bedraggled offensive on the Epirus front as soon as word of the Greek surrender to list reached him. The Greeks were not only still fighting there, they were inflicting heavy casualties on the Italians. The OKW rushed a draft of the surrender terms to Rome. When Mussolini read in the draft that the Führer wanted to allow the Greek officers to retain their swords and daggers, he protested. Here however the Germans were adamant, 
the whole world had marveled at the Greek army's prolonged resistance, and Hitler considered it proper to recognize their bravery. That apart, Hitler blindly accepted the Italian demands. To the fury of Admiral Reder he announced that the Yugoslav and Greek navies were to be handed over to the Italians when they arrived, to the fury of both the OKW and army, Hitler also bowed to Mussolini's demand that the Axis troops stage a ceremonial entry into Athens, with Italians and Germans, side by side. The nearest Italians were still a week's march away from Athens, which did not make things easier. At Salonika, the surrender document was signed by all three parties on the afternoon of April 23, after Mussolini had played his final trick on Hitler. The Führer had forbidden premature release of the surrender news, but at 10 a.m. the Italians had already suddenly broadcast it to the world. The enemy armies of Epirus and Macedonia have laid down their arms. The surrender was tendered by a Greek military delegation yesterday at 9.04 p.m. to the commander of the Italian 11th Army on the Epirus front. Huell summed it up in his diary, the Italians are acting like crazy idiots. In Croatia a breakaway movement had been fermented by Canaries' underground forces. General Sladko Kvaternik, an officer of the old Austro-Hungarian army, had seized power in Zagreb, aided by the Abwes Jupiter organization, and with Hitler's blessing he had set up an independent state with Dr. Anti Pavlik, who had spent long years exiled in Italy, as its Poklavnik, or chief. Hitler's decision to transfer the Dalmatian coastal region to Italy caused intense resentment in Zagreb. However, the Führer closed his eyes to the hatred Germany would reap from the Croats by this action. On April 24, Canaries's lieutenant, Colonel Lehausen, interviewed General Kveternik, the new Croat war minister in Zagreb. Lehausen found that this ancient, upright nationalist's admiration for Germany and her Führer was boundless, but so was his hatred of the Italians, who were now wreaking their revenge on Dalmatia. The Croats are a people of honor, with a long military tradition, complained Kveternik, and it is bitter beyond words to be trodden down and humiliated now by an army that has not been able to pin one victory to its colors. Kveternik feared that this completely irrational political attitude of the Italians would sow the seeds of serious future danger. On April 24, 1941 the Hungarian regent, Admiral Horthy, visited Hitler's train. Hitler had received from the Admiral many letters, written in a quaint, archaic German style. The most recent had come in mid-April, in it, Horthy had once more suggested a German attack on Russia and hinted that Hungary would participate if the whole of Transylvania, at present partly under Romanian rule, were promised to him. Nobody else knows I have written this letter, and I shall never mention it, even in any memoirs I may write. On April 19, Hitler had acknowledged to the Hungarian envoy J that Horthy obviously felt deeply, as this letter showed, about the Russian menace. He nevertheless inwardly rejected making any commitment to Hungary at Romania's expense. According to Huell's diary the Hungarian talked and talked during the luncheon, and even argued, using one of Hitler's favorite phrases, that Greece had been defeated because she was a democracy, where the votes of two idiots count for more than that of one wise man. Kiita lured Horthy into plying Hitler with hunting anecdotes, knowing that Hitler abominated huntsmen. Those who knew Hitler well were familiar with his loathing of horses. When three years later, SS General Hermann Feglin, Himmler's new liaison officer, clanked in wearing riding spurs, Hitler sardonically invited him to gallop next door to fetch a certain document. But nothing could now darken Hitler's mood. The British were in full flight, Hitler had killed or captured another 22,000 elite troops. At Jess Connick's suggestion Hitler ordered an airborne assault on Crete prepared as well. Hitler's OWN mind was made up on the Russian campaign, but he still wanted to convince Ribbentrop of its necessity. He knew he would not win over the foreign ministry as such. Since its failure to give him advance warning of the Belgrade putsch, the ministry's stock had sunk still further in his estimation. He had decided to appoint the party's chief thinker, the Baltic-born Alfred Rosenberg, 
to manage the new eastern dominions, impressed, apparently, by Rosenberg's early writings on the Bolshevik menace. Small wonder that Huell's diary shows Ribbentrop off sick for most of April 1941, malingering, furious at this fresh erosion of his powers. On about April 25 Hitler telephoned Ribbentrop in Vienna, summoned him to his special train headquarters, and told him he had decided finally to attack Russia. Ribbentrop later recalled. He said that all the military intelligence reaching him confirmed that the Soviet Union was preparing in a big way along the entire front from the Baltic to the Black Sea. He was not willing to be taken by surprise once he had recognized a danger. Moscow's pact with the Serbian Putschist government was a downright provocation to Germany and a clear departure from the German-Russian Treaty of Friendship. In this conversation I recommended that he listen first to our, Moscow, Ambassador, Count, Werner von der Schulenberg. I wanted to try a diplomatic settlement with Moscow first. But Hitler refused any such attempt and forbade me to discuss the matter with anybody. No amount of diplomacy could change the Russian attitude, as he now recognized it, but it might cheat him of the important tactical element of surprise when he attacked. On April 26 Hitler's train left Monichkirchen for the former Yugoslav frontier. He motored to Maribor, newly renamed Marburg, and toured the German-speaking provinces which his second army had regained for the Reich. Everywhere there was a huge and fervent welcome especially at Marburg's town hall. Then by train back to Graz, recorded Huell. An enormous reception there. The Führer is very happy, a fanatical welcome. Wonderful singing. The museum. Lunch at Hotel Wiesler, then left for Klagenf in the evening. Coffee at the castle, with infinitely ugly maidens provided from the Gore's leadership school. But they could sing very nicely. Here in Klagenf, Hitler the next day met his old history teacher, Professor Leopold Boetsch, he had written in Mein Kampf that it had perhaps altered the whole course of his life that fate gave him such a history teacher, able to bring the subject alive. By April 28 Adolf Hitler was back in his chancellery in Berlin. That evening, Ribbentrop's ambassador in Moscow was ushered in. Hitler granted to Count Schulenberg just 30 minutes of his time. Schulenberg had not been officially informed of Barbarossa, Hans Krebs, his military attaché, had been forbidden to tell him. But Schulenberg was no simpleton. The rumors sweeping Central Europe told him all he needed. To the ambassador it seemed that the Führer had drawn all his preconceived ideas from Vidkun Quisling who had first whispered to Hitler that after the very first military defeats the unpopular Bolshevik regime would collapse. Hitler asked him what devil had possessed the Russians that they had signed that pact with the Putschist regime in Belgrade, was it an attempt to frighten Germany? The ambassador's opinion was that the Russians were just openly staking their claim on the Balkans, they were very uneasy about the rumors of a coming German attack as well. Hitler retorted that it was the Russians who had begun the mobilization race, but the ambassador suggested it was characteristic Russian overreaction to German moves. If Stalin had not allied himself with France and Britain when both were still strong and intact, he would hardly opt for them now. To Hitler this was a facile argument, in 1939 Stalin had wanted to encourage war between Germany and the West. How could he have foreseen that Hitler would emerge victorious so soon? Hitler decided now that Barbarossa would begin on June 22, a Sunday, with the onset of the final top capacity transport program one month earlier. The German armies in the south would be numerically inferior to the enemy. Army Group South could not mount the pincer movement originally planned to destroy the Russian forces south of the Pripyat marshes but had to attempt an almost impossible encirclement action with its northern wing. Nonetheless, Braukic was still confident that after four weeks of stiff fighting on the frontier the Russian resistance would melt away. Persistent rumors of Barbarossa were soon sweeping Moscow. The most substantial evidence came to Moscow from Romania and indirectly from Belgrade. Hitler had been most frank in his overtures to General Antonescu. 
When Goring had seen Antonsku in Vienna on March 5 he had explained that one day the other oil supplier might drop out. Goring had asked how many Romanians now lived on Russian territory, and he had made a scooping gesture by way of explanation. Evidently Hitler had also told Yugoslavia's Prince Regent about Barbarossa at the Berghof on March 4. British Foreign Secretary Eden told Sir Stafford Cripps as much. Eden identified his source as King George of Greece, the Prince Regent's brother. The Hungarian intelligence service learned of this in Moscow and passed the information back to Admiral Canaries on April 11. A few days later the German naval attaché in Moscow was cabling that Cripps was now predicting that Hitler would attack Russia on June 22, a canard so obviously absurd that he would do all he could to kill it. Stalin's reaction to the warnings was illuminating. At Cripps's suggestion the Yugoslav envoy in Moscow had at the beginning of April warned Stalin about Barbarossa. Stalin had cockily replied, let them come. We will be ready for them. Hitler's blitzkrieg victory in the Balkans had wiped the smile off Stalin's face. An extraordinary period ensued in which the Soviet government tried to appease Hitler, grain, petroleum, manganese, and other materials began flooding westward and the Soviet government even laid on a special goods train to rush rubber to Germany along the Trans-Siberian Railway. On the day the Japanese foreign minister departed for Tokyo, Stalin made a stunning personal appearance on the railroad platform, embraced the Japanese officials, and then searched out Ambassador Schulenberg and loudly pronounced in front of the assembled diplomatic corps, we must remain friends, you must do all you can for that. Hitler studied all the reports, including one submitted by the Fischhung Samt, on this puzzling Moscow scene. Equally remarkable was the politeness of the Soviet remonstrance over 80 German violations of Soviet airspace in the first half of April. After a conference with key ITEL on Abwehr operations planned inside Russia, Admiral Canaries noted, General Jodl disclosed to me, afterward, that they are greatly worried about the Russians soft and indulgent attitude toward us, and he added half in jest, in a reference to our number 800 special duties training regiment Brandenburg, if these chaps, meaning the Soviet Russians, keep on being so accommodating and take offense at nothing, then you will have to stage an incident to start the war. Throughout March, Russian troop movements close to the frontier had been so intense, with a heavy flow of reinforcements from Moscow towards Smolensk and Minsk, that General Halder became anxious that the Russians might launch a preventive action. The disposition of Russian forces gives food for thought, he wrote on April 7. If we discount the slogan that the Russians want peace and won't attack anybody themselves, then it has to be admitted that the Russian dispositions could allow them to go over very rapidly from defense into attack and this could prove highly embarrassing for us. The Führer himself was in no doubt. At the end of it all, in 1945, he was to say, I didn't take the decision to attack Moscow lightly, but because I knew from certain information that an alliance was being prepared between Britain and Russia. The big question was, should we hit out first or wait until we were overwhelmed at some time in the future? The naval attaché reported from Moscow that the Soviet naval construction program was in the process of building three battleships, 11 cruisers, 61 destroyers, and nearly 300 submarines, most of this fleet would be concentrated in the Baltic. After April 7, the German embassy in Moscow observed an increasing tide of conscription. On the 8th, the families of the Russian trade mission began leaving Berlin. On the 23rd there were fresh reports from Bucharest of Soviet reinforcements massing in Bukovina and Bessarabia. The next day the German military attaché in Bucharest reported that Soviet troops were arriving at Odessa and being transported by rail to the Bug and Niesta. On the 25th the naval decoders intercepted a dispatch from the British military attaché in Moscow to the war office in London, our military attaché in Budapest, this read who was traveling to Moscow a few days ago, saw at Lemberg, Lvov, at least one tank brigade. On the railway line between Lemberg and Kiev heading westward, 
he passed seven troop trains of which four were conveying tanks and mechanized equipment and three troops. The German attaches also saw many military transports heading west between Minsk and Baranovichi. By May 5, Antonsku was able to tip off the Germans that Soviet troops were massing between Kiev and Odessa and that reinforcements were still pouring westward from Siberia. The thing worth noting is that factories around Moscow have been ordered to transfer their equipment into the country's interior. A team of Goring's engineers had been allowed to tour eight or nine of the biggest Russian factories producing ball bearings, alloys, aircraft, and aero engines, and to see the advances made by Soviet research. It was clear that the Soviet Air Force was a far greater menace than Hitler had bargained for. The aircraft factories were the biggest and most modern in Europe. When the German experts attended a dinner party, the leading Soviet aircraft designer, Mikoyan, stated explicitly, We shall valiantly ward off any attack, whatever quarter it comes from. On Red Army orders foreign diplomats were prevented from traveling freely. On May 13 a German consul in the heart of China reported that six days before Moscow had instructed all missions to ascertain the probable attitude of other countries in the event of a German-Soviet conflict. On the 16th the Russian envoy in Stockholm was reported to have stated that at no time in Russian history had more powerful troop contingents been massed in the West which confirmed the estimate of the Swedish air attaché in Moscow that by mid-March alone 60% of the Red Army had been massed in western Russia, particularly confronting Romania. Stalin's trainloads of rubber, ores, oil, and grain kept trolling westward to Hitler's Germany even as June 22, the date for Barbarossa, approached but the date on which Stalin secretly proposed to resume the Soviet program of expansion, now temporarily halted by Hitler's obduracy, also came closer. On May 5, Stalin delivered two secret speeches at a Kremlin banquet to a thousand officers graduating from Moscow's staff colleges. Among the officials who passed through the Kremlin's Trinity Gate that evening were Molotov, Mikoyan, Voroshilov, Kalinin and Lavrenti Beria, there were also two generals and one major who later fell into German hands and independently described the speeches to German interrogators with a high degree of unanimity. Hatschulenberg, who heard merely that Stalin had delivered a 40-minute speech, been there, perhaps even his optimism about the Soviet Union's designs would have been dispelled. Stalin launched into a sober account of the need to prepare for war with Germany. New tank models, the Mark I and III, are on their way, these are excellent tanks, whose armor can withstand 76mm shells. In the near future there will also be a new tank graced with my own name. Our war plan is ready, we have built the airfields and landing grounds, and the frontline aircraft are already there. Everything has been done by way of clearing out the rear areas, all the foreign elements have been removed. It follows that over the next two months we can begin the fight with Germany. We have to take our revenge for Bulgaria and Finland. The partisan movement painstakingly built up throughout Europe, Stalin continued, would assume a vast scale and would paralyze the German army's supplies. By the end of the first year Germany would have exhausted her limited stockpiles of scarce raw materials. Germany may be able to build aircraft and tanks but she will lack the warriors themselves. Stalin emphasized, there is no such thing as an invincible army, whatever the country of its allegiance. A lavish banquet followed, with drinking far into the night. One of the generals, the director of the famous Franz Military Academy, was toasting Stalin's genius for preserving the peace of Europe when Stalin irritably waved for him to stop, tottered to his feet, and delivered a second speech of his own. During the years of the capitalist encirclement of the Soviet Union we were able to make good use of the, peace-loving, slogan while we expanded the Soviet Union's frontiers to the north and west. But now we must discard this slogan for the reactionary and narrow-minded slogan that it is, as it will not serve to win us one more square inch of territory. It is time to stop chewing that particular cud, comrade Chasin, stop being a simpleton. The era of forcible expansion has begun for the Soviet Union.
Raising his glass, Stalin announced a new and different toast, long live the active policy of aggression of the Soviet nation. Hessen Bormann. As a German and as a soldier I consider it beneath me ever to belittle a brave enemy, exclaimed Hitler to his assembled Reichstag deputies on May 4, 1941. But it seems necessary to me to do something to protect the truth from the boastful lies of a man who is as miserable a politician as he is a soldier, and is as wretched a soldier as he is a politician. Hitler was declaiming on the way Macht's fresh Balkan triumph. Just as he did after Norway and Dunkirk. Mr. Churchill, he also began this campaign, is trying to say something that he might yet be able to twist and distort into a British victory. Mr. Churchill may be able to lay down a smoke screen before his fellow countrymen, but he cannot eliminate the results of his disasters. Now the brave Greek people had paid for their pro-British monarch's folly. I regretted it from the start. For me as a German born and bred to revere and respect the art and culture of this country whence the first rays of mortal beauty and dignity emerged, it was a hard and bitter experience to see this happening and be able to do nothing to prevent it. From the French and British documents found in France, he said, he had realized how far the Greek government had drifted into Britain's arms. Rudolf Hess sat between Hitler and Ribbentrop throughout this Reichstag speech. Ribbentrop said later that Hesse's eyes looked completely abnormal all evening. Constitutionally deputy Führer of the party since April 1933 and second in line of succession after Goring, Hess was an eccentric, just how eccentric we now know, from the recently recovered Gestapo interrogations of his private staff. Criminal Rat Franz Lutz, his detective, would describe in detail the plethora of doctors, therapists, dowsers, magnetopaths, hypnotists, and masseurs with a distaste evidently born of his boss's requirement that each of these dubious medical practitioners first test their methods on his staff. Hess had been born in British Egypt and was unabashedly pro-British, a pacifist, and an idealist. According to his secretary, Hess spoke privately with him at the end of this Reichstag speech but merely inquired whether the Führer still stood by the program he had set forth in Mein Kampf, of marching side by side with Britain. Hitler had nodded. He claimed to have attached no importance to this inquiry. Very shortly after the speech, at 8.15 that evening, May 4, 1941, he left Berlin by train for the dockyard at Gotenhafen, on the Baltic, to inspect Reda's new ships, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz. The later Gestapo interrogations established that Hess's private audience with Hitler had occurred on May 3rd, the evening before the speech, and not on May 4th, and they put a rather different slant on it. Hess's adjutant Gunter Seroff related that on May 3rd Hess had gone to Munich's Ryum airport to fly up to Berlin by government plane, and that ten minutes before takeoff Professor Karl Hauschofer had come to speak with Hess that Haushofer had thereafter asked the adjutant to stay behind and await a phone message from him to forward to Hess in Berlin, and that on that evening, May 3rd, Haushofer had phoned this message to Seroff to pass to the deputy Führer, on a scale of 1 to 6, things stand at around 3 or 4, and more needs doing. His son Albrecht, he added, would report as soon as he got back from Portugal. Peinsch who had mistrusted the younger Haushofer as a spongy half-Jew and wondered why party headquarters allowed him to come and go the way he did, dutifully passed the cryptic message to Hess in Berlin. Hess had arrived in Berlin at 5.20 p.m. on May 3rd. He had ordered his staff to bring his brand new Luftwaffe Hauptmann's uniform with them, so he was certainly up to something. He knew that the younger Haushofer had left Germany to contact the anti-Churchill opposition. That evening, confirmed his detective later to Gestapo interrogators, Comrade Hess was with the Führer. The adjutant Peinsch confirmed that, upon receiving this important phone message from Haushofer, Hess had taken it straight over to the Führer, he added, I believe it was from Portugal. After talking with Hess, Hitler now made a crucial alteration to the text of his next day's speech to the Reichstag, what that was, we do not know. 
Hess's staff had been aware for some weeks that he was toying with the idea of flying to Scotland. Detective Lutz, torn by uncertainty over whether to report this to Himmler, asked Pinch next day, the 4th, whether Hess had told the Fuhrer of his intention. The adjutant replied that their boss had told him that yes, he had now spoken with the Fuhrer about his plan. The Fuhrer was not averse to it, he had said. The last time that Hitler had seen Tirpitz was at her launching at Wilhelm Shaven two years before, he still recalled the keen, honest features of the shipyard workers dash a real aristocracy of the working class, he reminisced. The two new battleships dominated the dockyard. The Bismarck, with her 28,000 miles of electrical circuits and her radar-controlled guns, was the most advanced warship afloat. Indeed, the Navy considered her unsinkable, and Admiral Gunter Lachtschens, the gaunt-faced fleet commander, emphasized this word to Hitler in his cabin. He reported on the brilliant marauding operation he had commanded with the battleships Scharnhorst and Neisenau, raiding Atlantic convoys bringing war supplies to Britain from the United States. When Hitler voiced qualms at Lutchens's proposal to risk the capital ships very soon against the Atlantic convoys the Admiral put his mind at rest. Mein Führer, he said, there is nothing that can go wrong for me, with a ship like this. The only danger that I can see is torpedo aircraft coming at us from aircraft carriers. Hitler returned to Berlin. He again commented unhappily to Dr. Goebbels on the ruin that Mr. Churchill was wreaking on the British Empire, and on Italy's series of military reverses. Without them, he remarked, scoffing at the Italians, Badain would have stayed at our side, Franco might have joined us after all, and Gibraltar would be in our hands. Then Turkey would have been wide open to offers too. It just did not bear thinking about, Goebbels lamented recording these remarks in his diary, as Hitler continued south to Berchtesgaden, where he was to meet Darlin on May 11. Briefly, Hitler turned his attention to Iraq. On April 2 a coup d'etat had brought the anti-British lawyer politician Rashid Ali al Gailani to power, when the British thereupon landed in strength at the port of Basra on the Persian Gulf. Rashid Ali's small army encircled the British airbase at Habaniya some 25 miles west of Baghdad and fighting broke out. The Iraqis appealed to Germany for aid. German military experts were flown out, followed by a diminutive force of Messerschmitt and Heinkel aircraft, which Dahlan allowed to land on the Vichy French airfields in Syria. That Saturday evening, May 10, a bulky packet was delivered to the Berghof. Told it was from Hess, Hitler pushed it aside. Towards noon the next day he was standing in the Berghof's Great Hall when there was a commotion. One of Hess's adjutants burst in. He handed Hitler a slim envelope. There were two pages inside. Hitler put on his eyeglasses and began to glance over them indifferently. Suddenly he slumped into a chair and bellowed in a voice that could be heard all over the house Oh my God, my God! He has flown to Britain. Hess's adjutant confirmed that his chief had taken off at Augsburg airfield at 5.40 p.m. the previous evening. Hitler rounded on Bodenschkatz. How is it, Herr General, that the Luftwaffe let Hess fly although I forbade it? Get Goring here. He now found that the bulky packet from Hess contained a long-winded account of his motives for flying and of his proposed peace plan, apparently written in October 1940. Hess promised not to betray Barbarossa to the British. Bodenschkatz telephoned Goring at his castle Veldenstein, near Nuremberg. The Reichsmarschall petulantly asked why he was required at the Berghof. Hitler snatched the telephone, shouted, Goring, you are to come at once! and slammed the instrument down. The deputy Führer's adjutant, the bearer of the ill tidings, was arrested and led away. A wave of hysterical speculation gripped the Berghof. Every possible construction, wrote Schmunt's wife in her diary. Hitler confided to Julius Schaub what he feared. If Hess really gets the just imagine, Churchill has Hess in his grasp. What lunacy on Hess's part. They will give Hess some drug or other to make him stand before a microphone and broadcast whatever Churchill wants.
Bodenschatz began immediate technical inquiries. Perhaps Hess might have crashed en route, or run into foul weather. Admiral Darlan, now Britain's Deputy Premier, Foreign Minister, Navy Minister, and Minister of the Interior in one, arrived after lunch with Ribbentrop. But now that Hitler had decided on Barbarossa, his interest in the Mediterranean had waned, and his inborn mistrust of the French was not easily overcome. In the Yugoslav files captured in Belgrade, a document had been found indicating that General Wagand was preparing to transfer his allegiance to de Gaulle. Canaries was to note at this time. When I turned to our Abwehr subversive operations in Syria and Iraq, the field marshal, Ki Itel, explained that the Fuhrer is inclined to be skeptical about the French attitude over this issue, as he is indeed about their whole attitude toward collaborating with Germany. The chief of the OKW mentioned in passing a discussion on the subject of de Gaulle in the course of which the Führer interrupted Ribbentrop, who had uttered a derogatory remark about de Gaulle, with the words, Now, now, my dear Ribbentrop, if you found yourself in the same situation you would be the first to become a Gaullist. Since February Ribbentrop had seriously flirted with the notion of winning over France to collaboration, the French should place their fleet at the Axis disposal for the fight against Britain, and concede bases to Germany in French Africa. Hitler, however, remained skeptical and cool toward Darlan. A break for tea was taken at 5.30, but you will notice that the Führer's mind was elsewhere. Small wonder, Hitler's mind was on Hess. The Reichsmarschall arrived at 9 p.m. Huell recorded that night, a long discussion with the Führer downstairs in the hall. The Führer, Foreign Minister, Goring, Bormann. Very irritable. Much speculation. Throughout this day and the next the argument raged back and forth as to whether Hess had arrived in Britain or was by now dead. A very upset day, wrote Huell on the 12th. Goring and Ute believe Hess could not have managed the difficult flight to Glasgow. Führer thinks Hess could have pulled it off. It was Ribbentrop who sagely pointed out that if they waited any longer, the British might announce the news at any moment, indeed, they could claim that Hess had brought an official offer for a separate peace. That would set the cat among the pigeons. Hitler was aghast. He ordered Ribbentrop to telephone reassurances to Cheno. The first investigations had meanwhile established that Hess had fallen under the sway of nature healers and astrologers. This facilitated the announcement that while Hess had evidently acted from idealistic motives he was in fact quite mad. The Führer decides to go ahead with the announcement, wrote Huell. He insists on including the passage about it being the action of a madman. By late afternoon the tenth redraft of the communique was complete. It was passed by Hitler and broadcast at 8 p.m. in it the party officially announced that Hess had taken off from Augsburg in an aircraft in a hallucinated state and not been seen since. It is to be feared that party member Hess has crashed or met with an accident somewhere. Hitler, noted Huell, was now somewhat less tense and more lively. Hours passed and then the BBC finally stirred, Rudolf Hess had landed by parachute in Scotland two nights before. The tension at the Berghof relaxed, indeed a mood of hilarity took its place. Führer wants to wait until the morrow, Kuehl ended that day's momentous entries. The party had already begun an anguished investigation into the deputy Führer's defection. On May 13 the party circulated a second communique papers left behind by Hess, who was more familiar with the Führer's genuine peace proposals than any other person, suggested that he suffered from the delusion that if he took some personal step, with Englishmen known to him from earlier times, he might yet manage to bring about an entente between Germany and Britain. In fact Hitler's anger was immense. Hans Frank, summoned post-haste to the Berghof along with all the other party leaders and Gauleiters, and who had been through many crises with Hitler as his personal lawyer, found him more upset than he had ever seen him since the death of his niece Chili Rauble. In time, Hitler's anger softened. Schaub later wrote, in later years Hitler seldom mentioned Hess, but when he did it was always to emphasize how highly he had esteemed him. He had always been an upright and honest man until he was led astray.
the Gestapo arrested the rest of Hess's private staff and questioned them. The dossier of interrogation reports, missing for over 50 years, surfaced in California in 1998. In January 1941, testified Gunter Seroff, Hess had once casually asked him to find out whether the British General Hamilton was still alive. He had already made one serious attempt to fly to Britain on January 10, taking off from Augsburg at 3 p.m. in the specially adapted Mi-110. Before leaving the administration building for his solo adventure, Hess had asked for paper to write something, and after his departure the valet had handed to Adjutant Pinch a bulky envelope. As he read the contents Pinch purpled, and announced that their chief had flown to England, but at that moment the control tower announced that the Mi-110 was back and circling overhead. Hess had then had to use up 90 minutes fuel before he could safely land. He explained that the rudder was faulty. Pinch swore the others to secrecy. His conscience troubled, his detective Lutz had asked Pinch if the Führer knew what was going on, as he would have to make some kind of report to Himmler. Two or three days later Pinch replied that Hess had assured him that he was calling off the flights for the time being. There were no more visits to Augsburg until March. Hess's staff had remained uneasy, his valet blurted out what he knew of their boss's plan to the startled adjutant Alfred Leitgen in mid-January and suggested they mention it to Martin Bormann, but nobody wanted to volunteer for this duty, as nobody was certain whether the Führer had ordered the secret mission or not. Lutz pressed Pinch several times about this. Pinch then told me, Lutz told the Gestapo interrogators on May 18, that Comrade Hess had apparently talked with the Führer about such a plan while in Berlin, on May 3, 4. There was accordingly no need for me to report to the Reichsführer SS. Lutz comfortably decided that Hess must have informed the Führer of his plan. It all hinged on that furtive meeting between Hitler and Hess on May 3, 1941, just before the Reichstag speech, which Hitler had amended in one crucial passage on the strength of the message the younger Haushofer had brought from Portugal. Afterward Hess had directed Peinsch to have the Hitler speech printed in English, and he packed several copies of the translation, freshly printed in a very small typeface, into his luggage. Driver Lippert testified that a few hours after the Reichstag session on May 4 Hess ordered his surprised staff to get ready for an immediate rail trip down to Augsburg. A special sleeping car was attached to the overnight Munich Express and at 5 past 10 p.m. Hess left Berlin. Over lunch in Munich the next day, on May 5, Hess had met the younger Haushofer at the Hotel Dramoren, obviously to weigh with him the latest message from Portugal. They spoke privately, and Hess had decided to fly to Scotland that same night. The Mi-110 was tanked up, and at 4 p.m. Hess drove over to the Messerschmitt field at Augsburg. For the first time, he was wearing the new Luftwaffe uniform under his leather flying suit, he allowed Detective Lutz to take a roll of liquor snapshots of him in this unusual garb, in a room of the Messerschmitt building. When his driver asked about the uniform, Hess had told him not to breath a word about it. I'm planning a little surprise, he explained to his staff. Taking a handful of the Hitler speeches, a picture of his baby boy, but no hand luggage in order to save weight, he climbed into the plane and took off at 5.15 p.m., heading north. The flight was again a fiasco. An hour later his Mi-110 reappeared over the airfield, circling to lose fuel. A radio fault had forced his return. On the drive back to Munich, his valet noticed that Hess was in a sour mood. On the morning of May 10, Hess directed Pinch to phone a meteorologist to get the cloud base levels over Scotland. The adjutant then phoned the Rye Air Ministry and asked them to switch on a certain radio beacon, Electra. Hess had meanwhile instructed his staff to keep their eyes open for a letter from his aunt in Zurich. Later that morning, May 10, our letter did arrive from her for Hess, she reminded him that he had phoned her to look out for a certain letter from the International Red Cross, but reported that none had yet come, by then however he had already left on his adventure. This time, Hess forbade Lutz to take photos, 
saying it was a flying superstition not to be photographed before a long flight, he slung his own liquor camera around his neck. Pinch handed him maps and the envelope containing the Hitler speeches, and at 5.42 p.m. the Mi-110 took off, again heading north. This time it did not reappear. At 9.45 p.m. Pinch revealed to his colleagues, no phone calls have come, so Comrade Hess's flight must have succeeded. He pulled out of his attaché case a package containing a route map, it ended somewhere in Scotland, where Hess intended to parachute into the Hamilton estate, and several letters, addressed either in Hess's handwriting or in typescript to the Führer, Himmler, a Messerschmitt director, and family members. Deciding that it was too late to disturb the Führer with all this now, Pinch waited overnight, then took the 7.35 a.m. slow train from Munich to Berchtesgaden. Upon leaving them, he told his colleagues that he hoped the Führer was not going to be too upset. This was the first alarming intimation that they had that Hitler might have been in the dark after all. All of that was now history. There were many who believed that Martin Bormann was morally to blame for Hesse's flight, that he had undermined Hesse's position so much that the minister had felt compelled to undertake this drastic act to restore his faded status with Hitler. When Goring asked Hitler whether he proposed to appoint Bormann as Hesse's successor, the Führer shook his head and said that he had earmarked Bormann to succeed the party treasurer Franz Xaver Schwartz. The Reichsmarschall replied succinctly that Hitler was wrong by a long shot if he thought that that would slake Bormann's ambition. I care nothing about his ambition, retorted Hitler. Bormann would continue as head of the party chancellery, Goring was to look for a suitably youthful candidate to be party minister. On May 13, 1941, the Berghof was packed with the party leaders and Gauleiters. From 4 until 6.30, Bormann and Hitler spoke to them about the Hess affair, it was now known, he said, that Hess had been manipulated by various astrologers, mind readers, and nature healers. Puel later described the scene in his diary, Bormann reads out the letters left by Hess. A dramatic assembly, heavy with emotion. The Führer comes, speaks very humanly, analyzes Hess's act for what it is and proves he was deranged from his lack of logic, the idea of landing near a castle he has never seen and whose owner, Hamilton, is not even there, etc., and Hoys in Madrid. Then from foreign affairs standpoint, and finally the domestic repercussions. A deeply moving demonstration. Sympathy. From the Gauleiters, nothing is spared our Führer. Afterward, lengthy discussions. Puel concluded that the Führer was relieved that he no longer had a formal deputy. After he had finished speaking, Hitler leaned back on the big marble table, while the sixty or seventy Gauleiters and others pressed around him in a silent semicircle. He caught sight of Gauleiter Ernst Boll, the Bradford-born Gauleiter of all Germans abroad, and asked him pointedly, Tell me what you knew of the affair. Boll guiltily replied that in October Rudolf Hess had sworn him to secrecy, and asked him to translate into English a letter he was writing to the Duke of Hamilton, on no account was he to tell Ribbentrop about it. At this point Hitler took Boll aside, showed him the letters Hess had left, and asked him to point out paragraph by paragraph which passages had been in the letter Hess carried to the Duke of Hamilton. Shown the same letters, with their occultist claptrap. Goebbels swooned with rage, that's the kind of men we have ruling Germany, he wrote. The whole business is explicable only in the light of his nature healing and herb munching foibles. Victor Lutz agreed, warning Goebbels as they drove to the local airfield afterward that the public were bound to start asking how sick men could have held sway at the highest level of government. Albrecht Haushofer, Hess's young fellow conspirator, joined Hess's two adjutants Peitsch and Liechen in a concentration camp. Hitler intervened on behalf of Frau Ilse Hess, but Bormann, now all-powerful, had his own children Rudolf and Ilse rechristened, and ordered his former superior's name to be expunged from the history books. Woe betide those who fell foul of Hess's dynamic successor. Precisely one year later, on May 13, 1942, 
Party headquarters in Munich telephoned Bormann that the obstreperous caller to Karl Rover of Oldenburg was going the way Hess had gone. Following visits by faith healers, and hallucinations, Rover had that day announced his intention of flying to see Churchill, after first calling at the Führer's headquarters dash as the whole world is mad. By that afternoon Bormann's agents were already on their way to him, armed with top-level instructions. Two days later Ove had died a timely death, Hitler could order a state funeral, and Goebbels could sigh in his diary, there goes one more member of the old guard. Euthanasia had its uses. On May 12, 1941, Hitler formally replaced Hess's old office of the deputy Führer with a party chancellery headed by Bormann. Bormann now gathered powers the like of which Hess had never had, but Hitler begrudged this hardworking, unobtrusive, ruthless manager none of them. Secretary Christer Schroeder overheard him command Bormann, just keep the gauliters off my back. And the 40-year-old Bormann, who in 1930 had founded the party's financial fortunes by an insurance scheme under which millions of SAR street fighters had paid 30 pfennigs monthly and stuck stamps onto a yellow card, did just that. In alliance with the crafty constitutional expert Dr. Hans Lammers, Bormann established a civilian bottleneck through which all state affairs now had to pass on their way up to Hitler. Hitler's whim, no sooner spoken, was noted down by Bormann, elaborated by the lawyers on his staff, and circulated by party channels and teleprinters almost instantly as a Führer command. From now on Bormann increasingly ran the Reich while Hitler directed his war. Bormann achieved that most dangerous of attributes, indispensability. Hitler ignored the man's boorishness, Bormann's one and only public speech, at a Gorlitzer conference, was a fiasco. Privately Hitler could never forgive him for what he and the party had done to his Ober Salzburg, the Berghof was ringed by more and more buildings and construction sites and bunkers. He even mentioned to Schaub that he was thinking of moving his permanent residence to Linz or Bayreuth because of this. Hitler also disagreed with Bormann's brutal approach to dealing with the church and Jews. Yet Bormann survived until the end, dreaming of the day when he might step into the Führer's shoes. Bormann clung to him like ivy around the oak, Robert Lee was to say, using him to get to the light, and to the very summit. For Hitler the Hess case was already closed, his eyes reverted to the east. The second air force had already begun uprooting its ground organization in the west, by the end of May only a large radio deception organization would remain to deceive the enemy. Barbarossa was to be disguised as a master deception plan, the closer the date of the attack approaches, directed the OKW, the cruder will be the means of deception we can employ, in the intelligence channels as well. The airborne invasion of Crete was to be referred to openly as a dress rehearsal for the invasion of Britain, and several ministries were instructed to start planning for the occupation of Britain immediately. It was also time to start putting out cautious feelers to Russia's other bruised western neighbours. There were military reasons why Finland must be approached now. In view of Finland's casualties in her recent war with the Soviet Union no heavy burden would be foisted on to her, it would be left to her to decide how to meet the German requests. The course of this putative war will definitely be as follows, Finland was to be told, after Russia has lost a certain area on account of the participation of many small nations, a crusade against Bolshevism, and in particular on account of the German Wehrmacht's superiority she will be unable to fight on. Hewell's Diary of May 15th Notes After lunch the chief, Ribbentrop, comes with, Dr. Julius, Schnur up the mountain. Schnur is given instructions on discussing Russian problem in Finland, and negotiating with, Risto, Wrighty, the Finnish president. He wants to return via Stockholm, but the Führer is very hostile towards Sweden says their ruling class is basically pro-British. If they did show any interest, in Barbarossa, then it would only be so they could immediately report what they heard to Britain. Even the Reichsmarschall, Goring, has been cured of his infatuation for Sweden. Sweden would willingly sacrifice Finland if Germany lost the war. She is afraid of losing her dominant position in Scandinavia. 
On May 19 Hitler was more relaxed, and even found words of approval for Italy. It is quite clear that the Duce is one of the greatest men in modern history, he told Huell. What he has extracted from the Italian people is quite marvelous. If he did not get any further, it was simply because he had reached the extreme limit of their capabilities. After him there will not be another with his energy and talents for a long time. On the following morning, May 20, as Goring's paratroops began their costly assault on the Isle of Crete, Hitler drove down to Munich for two days in the quiet seclusion of his apartment there. Anxieties gnawed within him as he pored over the charts of Europe. Early or in May he had feared the British might invade Portugal or Spain. He briefly received the Spanish ambassador and warned him of the British activities in Morocco and told him of Abwehr reports on British plans to invade the Iberian Peninsula. Later in May, his anxieties concern Barbarossa, was the Eastern Front not suspiciously quiet now? The OKW circulated to the operations staffs a succinct warning. The Führer again reminds you that over the coming weeks Russian preventive measures are possible. Grand Admiral Redder came to see him on May 22. He casually mentioned that Bismarck and Prince Eugen had just sailed for their first sweep into the North Atlantic. Hitler remembered all the premonitions that he had only half voiced in his private talk with Admiral Lutjens aboard the battleship Eitgotenhafen. According to Hitler's naval adjutant, Another factor in his anxiety was the wish to deprive Roosevelt of any justification for war, at any rate, as yet. He mentioned to Redder Lutjens his own reservations about enemy torpedo aircraft and asked Redder outright, Herr Gross Admiral, can't we fetch the ships back? Redder advised him that enormous preparations had been made for this sortie, to recall the warships now would have a catastrophic effect on naval morale. His policy of non-aggravation toward the United States did meantime bear fruit. The German Admiralty grudgingly conceded that his policy thus far seemed justified, but the restrictions that he continued to impose on the hard-pressed U-boat crews in the North and South Atlantic irk nonetheless. They were not permitted to attack American warships or merchant ships, nor to board those suspected of carrying war goods to the enemy nor to use their armament even if the Americans were flagrantly violating their neutrality, unless the Americans fired the first shot. Huell's diary of May 22 illustrates Hitler's dilemma over the United States. The Führer still vacillates in his attitude toward America, as you cannot peer into Roosevelt's mind. If he wants a war, he will always find the means, even if legally we are in the right. Japan holds the key. Even though he has still not made his mind up it is better to keep the USA out of the war than perhaps to sink a few hundred thousand more tons of shipping. Without the USA the war will be over this year, with the USA it will go on for long years to come. A warning is agreed on. T. Got a date for Kudui. John Kudui, Roosevelt's former ambassador in Brussels, was brought up to the Berghof next afternoon to interview Hitler for the American press. Hitler's responses were short-tempered and impatient. Right at the start he tried to put out of his visitor's mind the ludicrous notion that the Nazis might ever invade the Americas. This was just a wicked lie invented to convert American public opinion, said Hitler, indeed, he laughed out loud, dismissed it as a childish suggestion, and exclaimed, that is on a level with claiming that America plans to conquer the moon. Mindful of the propaganda designed to distract attention from Barbarossa, Hitler added that his OKW was not planning expeditions to the moon but was busy with projects of rather shorter range, like Crete, at a range of 60 miles, or Britain at a range of only 20. Huell wrote afterward, questions from another world, childish, like in the years of struggle 20 years ago. But positive. Cuda E deeply impressed. After Redder's visit Hitler had been distracted by a domestic incident from following Bismarck's steady progress toward the Americas too closely. A drunken remark made by one of Dr. Goebbels's senior officials, Professor Karl Bomer, at a Bulgarian legation reception in mid-May threatened to betray the Barbarossa operation. In four weeks the Russians will be finished, Bomer had said. Rosenberg's going to be Governor-General of Russia. 
From the intercepts that resulted, Hitler found out about the incident, and ordered an investigation. Hitler wanted Boma's blood and ordered him tried by the People's Court. From now on I will take ruthless action against everybody who can't hold his tongue. Late on May 24, Reda telephoned from Berlin with brilliant news. Bismarck had stumbled on two British battleships sent to intercept her. She had dispatched Hood, Churchill's most powerful battle cruiser, in less than five minutes. The British battleship Prince of Wales had suffered heavy damage and turned away. There was bad news too, Bismarck herself had been hit twice and she was bleeding oil, her speed was reduced, and Admiral Lutjens could not shake off the pursuing enemy warships. Lutjens had suggested that Dönitz marshal all available submarines in one area through which he would try to lure the enemy, but next day he announced that his oil was so low that he must steer directly for Saint Nazaire. That evening Lutjens reported the first air strikes, so the British aircraft carrier Ruck Royal was clearly now within range. At Hitler's bear goff, Huell noted, frightening hours on Bismarck's account. By noon of the 25th, Lutjens had at last managed to shake off his pursuers. But for how long? Goring ordered his commanders to push out air cover as far as possible toward the limping battleship. Hitler grimly radioed Lutjens greetings on his birthday. The mood at the Berghof was further soured by the presence of Heydrich and Goebbels, both loudly wrangling over the Bomer affair. When Hitler rose on the 26th the news awaiting him was that Bismarck had been found again by the enemy, shadowed by an enemy aircraft, she still had 600 miles to go to Brest. Soon after 9 p.m. Lutjens radioed that the British aircraft had scored torpedo hits amidships and astern, and at 9.50 came the dread news that the battleship's steering was out of action. The unsinkable Bismarck was afloat and her guns were primed, but at best she could only steer a slow and stately circle while the British battle fleet closed in. Shortly before midnight, Lutjens radioed, ship unmaneuverable. We are fighting to the last shell. Long live the Führer. To Hitler himself, he signaled, we shall fight to the end trusting in you, mein Führer, and with our faith in Germany's victory undestroyed. Hitler instructed the Admiralty to reply, all Germany is with you. What can be done shall be done. The way you do your duty will strengthen our nation in its fight for survival. Adolf Hitler. During the early hours of May 27 the Luftwaffe scoured the area. Ocean-going tugs put to sea. The Spanish government was asked to send out rescue ships. Lutjens's last radio message had come at 6.25 a.m. position unchanged. Wind strength 8 to 9. From then onward there was silence. A funereal gloom descended over the Berghof. At noon Hitler learned that the British government had announced the sinking of Bismarck an hour before. Disabled and her last ammunition spent, Bismarck had scuttled herself under the guns of the British Navy, she sank with her colours honourably flying and the loss of some 2100 lives. Hitler instructed that no battleship or cruiser was ever again to put to sea without his previous consent. Huell wrote on May 27. Furon melancholy beyond words. Uncontrollable fury at the naval staff. 1. The ship should never have been sent out trading. 2. After finishing off Hood she should have dealt with Prince of Wales too, and not run away. 3. She should have returned straight to Norway and not run straight into the lion's den. Red tape and obstinacy in the navy. Won't tolerate any man with a mind of his own. Right foreign minister comes in the afternoon. Führer speaks his mind to him, swears and curses and then calms down. A walk to the tea house. The Führer picks up again, talks about new types of ships and the airborne torpedo as a weapon. Redder answered Hitler's criticisms soberly when he next came to the Berghof. He particularly emphasized that for Bismarck to have returned through the northern passages to Norway would have been more risky than continuing into the Atlantic. Hitler asked the Admiralty to adopt a policy of conservation of strength until the effect of Barbarossa on Britain was known. Should Britain's collapse threaten to become imminent, 
some very important duties might present themselves to our surface warships. Bismarck's loss had not been in vain. She had drawn off five battleships, two aircraft carriers, three battle cruisers, eleven cruisers, and twenty-one destroyers, which ensured the successful conclusion of the invasion of Crete, and the capture of Crete in turn reduced Britain's naval influence in the Mediterranean and paved the way for Rommel's triumphs in North Africa. Hitler meanwhile had issued a belated OKW directive ordering support for the Arab liberation movement against Britain. Jodl's chief assistant, General Walter Warlemont, had been sent to Paris for a week to resume the military talks broken off in December, and a protocol had been signed granting the French certain concessions in return for assistance in Syria and Iraq, as well as the future use of the Tunisian port of Bizeta to supply Rommel's troops in North Africa. More reluctantly, the French agreed on principle to let Hitler operate their port at Dakar as a submarine and Luftwaffe base on the west coast of Africa. They also secretly agreed to remove General Weygand from his command, though this was not specifically mentioned in the protocol. It was signed in Paris on the 28th, and the next day Wallemont flew to the Berghof to report. Events in Iraq were overtaking Hitler, however. The British were already advancing on Baghdad, and the end could not be far off. He said, the Middle East by itself would have been no problem if our other plans dash meaning barbarous a dash were not irrevocable. When they succeed, we can open a door into the Middle East from there. Mussolini was opposed to abandoning the Iraqi rebels and sent word to Hitler thus, I, Mussolini, am in favor of active support as this is an opportunity to raise the entire population of the Middle East against Britain. But if Iraq collapses, they will all lose heart again. If the German High Command also decides on active support, then it seems to me necessary to occupy Cyprus as well, after the reduction of Crete and Rhodes, since it lies off the Syrian coastline and holds the key to the entire Middle East. Hitler's first reaction was an outburst. Mussolini thinks Cyprus should be taken now as well. And Hewell recorded, the Führer proposes to agree, and to tell him to do it himself. Hitler did nonetheless ask Goring and Jess Connick whether Cyprus would be possible. The Reichsmarschall winced, reported on the blood the Luftwaffe had lost over Crete, 150 Junkers 52 transports alone, and advised against invading Cyprus. Since war broke out the Luftwaffe has known no rest, said Goring. From Crete we shall now be fighting a pitched battle against the British fleet and Torbruck. Huell made a lengthy record of Hitler's worried conference with Ribbentrop and the OKW generals on May 29. The point under debate is how far to bring in France or to get her involved in a war with Britain. The Führer curses the Italians. He hates the Spanish. Of Italy he says that you can't keep making concessions to somebody who is always running around with his backside black and blue from beatings, nor will the German people stand for it. The Führer's view is that when Barbarossa is over, he won't need to pay any more attention to Italy. We shall then automatically be able to come together with the French. They are counting on kicking the Italians out of Tunisia after the war. He wants to have a talk with Mussolini shortly. Later that day the foreign ministry's Dr. Schnell briefed him fully on Finland and Sweden. The Finns had sent top generals to Germany to negotiate with the OKW and the general staff, they were asked to prepare two divisions to support Hitler's operations from northern Norway against North Russia. Apostrophe Barbarossa is a gamble like everything else, said Hitler to Hull after Schnell left. If it fails, then it will all be over anyway. If it succeeds, it will have created a situation that will probably force Britain to make peace. When the first shot is fired, the world will hold its breath. Pricking the bubble. The dazzling heat of high summer had come to the Berghof. It was now early June 1941. The last echelon of assault troops had set out from Germany for the Eastern Front. In less than three weeks Barbarossa would begin. It was time to start dropping hints to his prospective allies. 
Hitler asked the Duce to join him at the Brenner Pass on June 2 and talked alone with him for two hours before the two dictators were joined by their foreign ministers. When at four o'clock the train set out again for Berchtesgaden, Kuhl sat with the Führer. He is contented, says Mussolini is very confident and sure of victory. Has dropped a hint about Russia if the shipping losses alone do not suffice dash meaning suffice to knock Britain out of the war. He had also mentioned to Mussolini the possibility that David Lloyd George might succeed a defeated Churchill. Then we must see what possibility there is of settling our differences. To the Japanese ambassador, General Oshima, whom he urgently summoned to the Berg off the next day, Hitler put on the appropriate anti-British act. After being lectured by Ribbentrop as well, Oshima cabled Matsuka in strictest confidence. Both gentlemen gave me to understand that a German-Soviet war probably cannot be avoided. Hitler bluntly stated that he would always be the first to draw his sword if he detected any hostility in an opponent, and although he did not expressly say so, his remarks to Oshima implied that while the tripartite pact was expressis verbis not intended as an instrument against the Soviet Union, such was the obligation on Japan, and he would expect the Japanese to honor it. Ribbentrop assured Oshima that the Russian campaign would be over in two or three months, he could not say when it would begin, but if Japan should find it necessary to prepare for this eventuality, then he would advise her to do so in as short a time as possible. On June 4, Hitler received King Boris of Bulgaria for two hours. Kuhl took notes on the encounter, but they appear to have been lost. The Finns confirmed to German officers sent to Helsinki that they were aware of the historic hour that was dawning. Antonsku came to Munich and again offered to support the attack with all the military resources at Romania's disposal. The coalition was coming together well. Meanwhile Hitler authorized orders to his Wehrmacht which were so shocking that key Eitel later had all copies of them destroyed. All political commissars attached to Red Army units identifiable as such by the red star embroidered with a golden hammer and sickle on their sleeves, were to be executed on capture. Evidently at Hitler's dictation Jodl drafted an explanation of the decision to liquidate these commissars. They in particular, he said, would subject German prisoners to spiteful, cruel, and inhuman treatment, for they were the originators of these barbaric Asiatic fighting methods. Hitler ordered, if they are caught fighting or offering resistance, they are to be shot out of hand without exception and immediately. The role that the army general staff, not to mention the German military lawyers, played in drafting these orders was less than glorious. Braukic's staff had drafted two separate orders in weeks of tedious bureaucratic paperwork. The first was this commissar order and the second an order restricting the jurisdiction of courts martial on Russian soil. Hitler had always been irked by the ponderous procedures of the army courts, believing that only speedy conviction and execution was a true deterrent. It was Halder, however, who proposed the clause reading, immediate collective punishments will be enforced against towns and villages from which ambushes or treacherous attacks on the way Macd are made on the orders of an officer of not less than battalion commander's rank, if circumstances do not permit the rapid arrest of the individual perpetrators. In the formal order issued by Key Eitel on Hitler's behalf in May, the Wehrmacht was instructed that offenses against Russian civilians would not be punishable, and that Frank's tyres were to be wiped out in battle or trying to escape. To Hitler the Red Army was not an enemy to be handled with kid gloves. In a conference on June 5 he again warned his staff of the extensive use the Russians would make of tactics not sanctioned by international convention. Hitler anticipated that the Russians might, for example, contaminate their lines of retreat with poison gases, or use poisonous additives to spike the food stocks and freshwater supplies in the areas overrun by the Wehrmacht. Hitler had recently taken to gathering his friends, his adjutants, and their wives about him in the evenings and rambling on endlessly about Christianity and the Roman Empire. On June 8, Kuehl entered in his bare goff diary. Raining. The British are marching into Syria. A long conversation alone with the Führer about Russia. 
says it will be a tougher proposition but he trusts in the way MACT. Air Force, numerical superiority in fighters and bombers. He is a bit frightened of air raids on Berlin and Vienna. The area we are to occupy will not be much bigger than from Denmark to Bordeaux in size. Russians have massed their entire strength on their western frontier, the biggest concentration in history. If Barbarossa goes wrong now, we are all lost anyway. As soon as that is all over, Iraq and Syria will take care of themselves. Then I will have a free hand, and I will be able to thrust on down through Turkey as well. If the French lose Syria, and I am convinced that Syria is lost, then there is only the one danger left, that they will lose Algeria as well. If that happens, I will thrust straight down through Spain at once and barricade the Mediterranean against the British. It is just this wretched waiting that makes one so nervous. A few days later the OKW asked the Supreme Commanders for their views on a draft directive for the period after Barbarossa. Significantly, a contested invasion of Britain was not contemplated in this document. On the 11th, Hitler sent Schmunt to check if the headquarters being built for him near Arsenberg in East Prussia was ready. Something akin to hysteria was overtaking Moscow as the realization of Hitler's mobilization dawned. On June 9 the German embassy in Moscow smuggled a naval officer into a Communist Party indoctrination session at which a functionary delivered a violently anti-German talk, warning his audience to be on guard over the next few weeks. The speaker said that nobody in Moscow had expected Hitler to conquer the Balkans so rapidly, for Bolshevism, the advantage was that any war of attrition must lead to the annihilation of the middle classes. The Soviet Union's interests would best be served by staying out, while the rest of Europe bled white in war. Hitler arrived back in Berlin early on June 13 obsessed with the coming campaign. On that morning the police raided every newspaper outlet in the capital and seized the latest Volker Sibobukta, but enough copies escaped seizure and reached foreign correspondents and the embassies for the impression to be conveyed that in Goebbels's leading article, for example, Crete, he had unwittingly betrayed that within two months Britain would be invaded. Goebbels was said to be in disgrace, but he was glimpsed the next day in Hitler's residence, cackling out loud over the success of his rumor mongering. Hitler assured him this new campaign would be all over in a month, Goebbels guessed rather less, writing, if ever an operation was a walkover then this is. On June 15, the Reich Chancellery was packed with the Wehrmacht commanders for a top secret conference. Everybody was assigned different street entrances by which to arrive. Braukic would arrive through the Garden Gate in Hermann Göring's terrace, Göring through Wilhelm's terrace, and the Army Group commanders through the new Chancellery in Voss's terrace. After lunch, Hitler called for silence and spoke of his military reasons for attacking Russia. An unpublished note taken by a Luftwaffe general survives. Hitler's after luncheon speech. The main enemy is still Britain. Britain will fight on as long as the fight has any purpose, this is typical of the British, as we have seen from their individual soldiers' conduct in Flanders, and it was demonstrated again by Dunkirk, by Greece, and by Crete. But Britain's fight only makes sense as long as they can hope that American aid will take effect and that they may find support on the continent. This explains why they have high hopes that the Russians will intervene and tie down the Germans, wearing down our war economy while the balance of power is tilted by American aid. At present this is very meager, it will not become effective until the summer of 1942, assuming they have enough shipping tonnage to bring it over here and the shipping losses are increasing. The proof of, Britain's, overtures to Russia is the complete uniformity in their press treatment of Cripps's journey. Russia's attitude is perpetually obscure, she exploited every moment of political or military preoccupation elsewhere to raise immediate political demands. We can see this happening in Russia's intervention in the Polish campaign, and again against the Baltic states and Finland, and now in the Balkans, Bessarabia, and the Treaty of Friendship with Yugoslavia. Our attempt to clarify the position met with the following objections from Molotov. First question, what does our guarantee to Romania mean and would we object to a Russian military mission? 
second question concerning the Dardanelles, and the third about Finland. In other words continual efforts to muscle in somewhere. Since these efforts coincided chronologically with various temporary weaknesses in the German position, we would have to expect them to seize every chance they can in the future to act against Germany's interests. The Russian armed forces are strong enough to prevent us from demobilizing soldiers and feeding them into the arms and consumer goods industries so long as this latent Russian threat persists. Even if we made peace with Britain this would still be so. We want this conflict to come early, however, indeed it is absolutely vital if we are not to forfeit the favorable conditions that prevail. The bulk of the Russian forces are standing on the frontier, so we have a good chance of defeating them right there. Hitler rounded off his speech with a warning against underestimating the Red Army. Afterwards he took Goring by the arm and soberly stated, Goring, it will be our toughest struggle yet, by far the toughest. Goring asked why, and Hitler replied, because for the first time we shall be fighting an ideological enemy, and an ideological enemy of fanatical persistence at that. The familiar bouts of insomnia began to assail him. By night he lay awake and asked himself what loopholes in his grand design the British might yet exploit. He sent Field Marshal Milch on an extended tour of Germany's air raid defenses, suspecting that his successful paratroop operation against Crete might stimulate the British to undertake similar ventures against the Channel Islands as soon as his hands were tied in Russia. He had ordered the island garrisons increased and extensively reinforced, the more so as he intended to keep Guernsey and Jersey in German hands after the final peace treaty with Britain. On June 18, with the newspapers of every country but Germany openly asking when Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union would begin, the Soviet ambassador in Berlin asked for an interview. Kuehl, at Hitler's chancellery, wrote an agitated note in his diary, Big Problem. Vladimir Dikonosov has announced he is to see the state secretary, we eyes Saka. What is he bringing? Is Stalin going to bring off a major coup even now? A big offer to us, etc. etc. Führer has, a long discussion with Foreign Minister, Engel, Hitler's army adjutant, and myself going over every possible angle. The Führer and Foreign Minister will have to vanish, so they can't be reached. Much plotting. Sonnenberg, Karen Hall, or Bergoff, the train, Wild Park. Then one day lying low in the Reich Chancellery. Puel concluded the entry as follows, these last days before an operation are the most nerve-wracking. The next evening, as Hitler was in the middle of dictating his barbarous a proclamation dash to the troops of the Eastern Front. Dash Ribbentrop telephoned to report that Dikonosov had discussed purely routine affairs and had left after cracking a few jokes. Hitler's proclamation was a tour d'horizon of Germany's foreign policy since the war began, but in its four closely printed pages there were some lines worthy of attention. Here Hitler claimed that the German people had never wished ill to the inhabitants of Russia. But for two decades the Jewish Bolshevik rulers of Moscow have endeavored to set not only Germany but all Europe alight. He said too that he had never tried to export the Nazi ideology to Russia the way that the Kremlin had tried to subvert the rest of Europe to communism. In a cynical oversimplification, Hitler reminded his troops, you, my soldiers, know for yourselves that until a very few weeks ago there was not one German panzer or mechanized division on our eastern frontier. The historic proclamation ended. At this moment, soldiers of the eastern front, an assembly of strength the like of which in size and scale the world has never seen is now complete. In league with Finnish divisions, our comrades are standing with the victor of Narvik, Dietl, on the shores of the Arctic in the north. German soldiers under the command of the conqueror of Norway, Falkenhorst, and the Finnish heroes of freedom under their own marshal, Mannerheim, are protecting Finland. On the eastern front stand you. In Romania, on the banks of the Perot, and along the Danube right down to the beaches of the Black Sea are German and Romanian troops united under Antonescu, the head of state. When this, the greatest front line in history, now begins its advance it will do so not just to provide the means of ending this great war for all time, 
or to defend those countries currently involved, but for the salvation of our entire European civilization and culture. German soldiers, you are thus entering upon a harsh and demanding fight, because the fate of Europe, the future of the German Reich, the existence of our nation now rest on your hands alone. May the Lord God help us all in this struggle. Kuehl wrote, a long conversation with the Führer, wishes he were ten weeks on from now. After all there must always be a big element of risk. We are standing outside a locked door. Will we run into, secret weapons? The tenacity of the fanatic? He now has to take sleeping pills to fall asleep. He is still dictating. He told me that this morning, June 20th, he again pored over every minute detail, but found no possibility for the enemy to get the better of Germany. He thinks Britain will have to give in, and he hopes it will be before the year is over. As recently as September 1940 the propaganda ministry had learned that Hitler had given the go-ahead for the Madagascar plan, under which about three and a half million of the four million Jews currently living within his domain would be shipped to that island in the Indian Ocean a year or two after the war ended. Since that summer his experts had been studying the possibility of resettling Europe's 10 million Jews on this large island, a French colony. Madagascar was over twice as big as Britain, its pre-war population was 4 million. He did not want the Jews to remain in their present settlement region around Lublin, as historical experience showed that they would raise the danger of epidemics. On October 2, 1940, he had discussed this with Hans Frank and Baldur von Skirak, Gauleiter of Vienna. Skirak had pointed out that his 50,000 Viennese Jews were due for deportation to Poland, Frank had protested that he could not accommodate any fresh influx. At first Hitler had overridden his objections, but then the Madagascar solution had come under consideration. On June 2, 1941, Hitler told Mussolini, the island could find room for 15 million people. The problem with this plan, he told Bormann, was how to transport the Jews that far in wartime. I should dearly like to devote my entire fleet of Kraft Dirch Freud, strength through joy, ocean liners to it, he said, but I don't want my German crews being sunk by enemy torpedoes. In private, to Key I tell, Bormann, and Speer, Hitler described it as his ultimate ambition to eliminate all Jewish influence throughout the Axis domains. Their presence still caused countless bureaucratic vexations. On June 7, 1941 Dr. Hans Lammers wrote to Bormann, The main reason why the Führer has not approved the ruling proposed by the Ministry of the Interior is that in his opinion there won't be any Jews left in Germany after the war anyway. The coming occupation of new territories in the East suggested to Hitler an alternative solution of the Jewish problem. As Operation Barbarous approached, it suggested itself to him that the new Eastern Empire would enable him to overcome Hans Frank's loud objections to the dumping of Jews on his general government territory and Himmler's growing influence there. Three days before the Wehrmacht attacked Russia, Hitler announced this explicitly to Frank and the latter accordingly briefed his staff that no fresh ghettos were to be established, since the Führer expressly stated to me on June 19 that in due course the Jews will be removed from the general government, and that the general government is to be, so to speak, only a transit camp. In the view of Dr. Goebbels, who sat in on these discussions on June 19, this deportation to the East would be a fitting punishment for these troublemakers and one which the Führer himself had actually prophesied to them. Seven months later, the Madagascar plan died a natural death. A foreign ministry official would write, the war against the Soviet Union has meanwhile made it possible to provide other territories for the final solution. Accordingly, the Führer has decided that the Jews are not to be deported to Madagascar but to the east. Two days remained, and Russia was still an enigma behind a sealed door. During a coffee break snatched with his female secretaries in their stair cupboard in the chancellery, Hitler noted that there was something sinister about the Soviet Union, it reminded him of the ghost ship in the Flying Dutchman. We know absolutely nothing about Russia, he said. It might be one big soap bubble, but it might just as well turn out to be very different. 
at 9 p.m. on Friday, June 20, Colonel Schmunt, his way Mac adjutant, brought news from the Admiralty. A German submarine had proudly reported attacking the U.S. battleship Texas, since it was encountered 10 miles within the North Atlantic blockade zone proclaimed by Germany. As recently as June 6, Hitler had reiterated to Admiral Reda why he wanted to avoid incidents with the United States. Reda now argued that the U-boat had acted correctly, but proposed forbidding attacks on U.S. ships up to 20 miles inside the blockade zone. Hitler at first agreed. But during the night he had second thoughts and telephoned the Admiralty that there must be no incidents whatsoever involving the United States until the outcome of Barbarossa was clear. The same order was issued to the Luftwaffe. Less than twelve hours remained before the attack. He summoned Goebbels, and paced the long Chancellor redrawing room with him for three hours, examining from every angle the risks involved in Barbarossa and pondering on Britain's future, why for instance was Mr. Churchill still systematically playing down Hess and his peace mission. The foreign ministry telephoned that the Soviet ambassador was again urgently demanding to see Ribbentrop. Dikonosov was fobbed off with word that Ribbentrop was away until evening and that an appointment would be made on his return. In fact he was at the Chancellery, and paid several visits to Hitler. He cabled orders to Ambassador Schulenberg in Moscow to destroy the embassy's code books and to seek an immediate interview with Molotov. At this he was to read out a long rigmarole ending with the words the Führer has therefore ordered the German Wehrmacht to confront this menace with all the means of force at its disposal. At 9.30, Dikonosov was allowed to see Baron von Weizsäcker. To general relief, he was only delivering a formal Soviet Union complaint about repeated German violations of her airspace. The parallel complaint delivered simultaneously to Schulenberg in Moscow evoked much hilarity when it arrived in Hitler's chancellery in the small hours of the morning, a series of symptoms gives us the impression that the German government is dissatisfied with the Soviet government, grumbled Molotov. Hitler saw Goebbels off the premises at 2.30 a.m., it was now June 22, 1941, the anniversary of Napoleon's attack on Russia. He has been working on this since July, Goebbels observed in his diary. And now the hour has struck. One hour later, along a frontier extending from the Arctic Ocean to the Black Sea, three million German and coalition troops attacked Stalin's empire. Surprise was complete. Hitler briefly retired to bed, remarking to his adjutants, before three months have passed. We shall witness a collapse in Russia the like of which world history has never seen. What Huell described as a tranquil, self-possessed mood descended on the chancellery during the morning. It was like any other Sunday, except that Hitler and Ribbentrop fell fast asleep after lunch. Hitler's adjutants, wilting under the central European sun, went swimming. Italy had honored her obligations with notable speed cabling at 3 p.m. that she regarded herself as being at war with Russia. Romanian troops had crossed the Prut and were fighting in the provinces invaded by Russia 12 months before. Madrid telephoned that a volunteer legion was being recruited to join the crusade. An ecstatic Admiral Horthy exulted to the German ambassador in Budapest that he had dreamed of this day for 22 years, mankind would thank Hitler for centuries to come. He broke off diplomatic relations with Moscow, but this was as far as he would as yet go. At 6 p.m. a disappointed General Jodl telephoned his liaison officer in Budapest, but Horthy had gone off to play polo, his chief of army staff was unavailable, and the defense minister had gone fishing. Just as Hitler expected, the Hungarians, canny as ever, wanted to see the first results of Barbarossa. The bulk of the Russians' forward air force had been smashed on the ground on this first day, over 1200 Soviet aircraft had been destroyed. On June 23 Huell wrote, 11.30 am the Führer is in a brilliant mood on account of the huge successes in Russia, Luftwaffe. As so often before, Hitler and his staff drove through the sun-drenched streets of Berlin to his special train. At half-past noon he left for East Prussia the twin locomotives hauling him through those fields and cities so recently liberated from the Poles. 
Over tea he reminisced with Huell and the others. Russia, he conceded at one point, is still a big question mark. Long after midnight he was in a column of automobiles, being driven past cordons of sentries guarding a wood about ten miles outside Rosenberg, deep inside which was his new headquarters. During the train journey he had decided to call it the Wolf's Lair, Wolf's Chance. Why Wolf again? asked Christ to Schroeder, just like the other HQs. Hitler replied, that was my code name in the years of struggle. It was 1.30 am as he set foot inside the forbidding compound. From here he planned to command the defeat of the Soviet Union. Part 5, Crusade. Into Russia. Found in a private photo album belonging to the Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler. A snapshot entitled Visit to a Jewish Peasant Woman, Lublin, August 21, 1941. In the center is his adjutant Joachim Paper and, grinning in the rear, his liaison officer to Hitler, SS Gruppenfuhrer Karl Wolf, author's collection. The Country Poacher. Thus Adolf Hitler set out, aged 52, to conquer the empire of Joseph Stalin. In a terrible, Unceasing onslaught his grey legions of Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS troops fought forward across the drab and wind-swept plains, over the glowing yellow fields of Ukrainian sunflower crops, the swamps around Lake Ilmen, the barren steppe, and the rocky deserts and inhospitable tundra, humming with myriads of unseen mosquitoes, until the spent Nazi tide finally lapped the Caucasus Mountains. Within a few days Field Marshal Lieb's armored spearheads had reached Dvinsk, Dagapils, Field Marshal box tanks were encircling a long oval-shaped pocket from Bialystok to Minsk in which eventually 350,000 Russian prisoners would be taken. Within a month Smolensk itself would be in German hands and Ronstadt would be at the gates of Kiev. As the Germans advanced, they found Russian trains still laden with grain and raw materials destined for Germany. Yet there were disturbing auguries. Stalin had proclaimed a patriotic war, and this was a slogan of dangerous magnetism. Moreover, his tanks and aircraft were significantly more plentiful than Hitler had been told. Most ominous of all was the frightening tenacity of the Soviet soldier. He was willing to die, he was brave and dogged. Frederick the Great once said, You've got to shoot every Russian dead twice, and still turn him over to make sure. Chief of Staff Halder wrote on July 16, 1941, the Russians drive their men forward into counter-attacks without the least artillery support, as many as twelve waves one after another, often they are auric roots, who just link arms and, their muskets on their backs, charge our machine guns, driven by their terror of the commissars and their superiors. Sheer weight of numbers has always been Russia's forte and now the Russian command is forcing us to slay them, because stand aside they won't. A more fundamental obstacle to the invasion was the nature of the Russian terrain. Hitler had been undaunted by the distances involved, since unlike Napoleon he had the internal combustion engine and the airplane. In the months to come however he was to learn that horses did have certain advantages over mechanical transport. As General Guderian would write on the last day of October 1941, you might say that we're no longer fighting against the Russians but against the weather and the bottomless and uncultivated land, and this is a very tough fight indeed, costly in both men and time. The whole campaign was a gamble. Hitler was attacking Russia with only 10 or 15 divisions in reserve. Each day brought fresh revelations. When Ribbentrop came on June 27, Hitler exclaimed that he now felt like the horseman who having unwittingly ridden across the frozen lake Constance died of horror when he learned what he had done, if I had had the slightest inkling of this gigantic Red Army assemblage I would never have taken the decision to attack. But the gamble seemed to have come off. On the very next day Joseph Stalin is now known to have dictated a secret memorandum recommending that they contact the departing German ambassador at once, to sue for peace and offer Hitler a new Brest Litovsk, formally recognizing Germany's claim to the Baltic states and the Ukraine. The Ukrainians warmly greeted Hitler's invading troops, 
As Guderian wrote in a private letter on June 29, today there is a thanksgiving service in the local Orthodox churches, as we are regarded as liberators. I hope they don't get let down. Two days later he added, the first Russian villages, we were in Poland until now, make a pretty dismal impression. The inhabitants, white Ruthenians, are friendly enough and don't care much if the Soviets collapse. But there are some who think differently, especially among the troops, and they're putting up a stiff and courageous fight. Hitler's wolf slayer was just outside Rasenberg in East Prussia. The cluster of wooden barracks and single-story concrete blockhouses was invisible from the air, concealed by camouflage netting suspended from the treetops. A few hundred yards away, on the other side of the road, Jodl's operations staff occupied a similar encampment. Hitler predicted that this whole headquarters will one day become a historic monument, because here is where we founded a new world order. Jodl dryly replied that it would be better suited as a garrison detention center for Rosenberg. It had in fact been built in one of the marshiest places in Majuria. No doubt some government department found the land was cheapest here, sighed Hitler. Jodl's staff diarist complained in a private letter dated June 27, we are being plagued by the most awful mosquitoes. It would be hard to pick on a more senseless sight than this deciduous forest with marshy pools, sandy ground, and stagnant lakes, ideal for these loathsome creatures. Secretary Christa Schroeder wrote a worm's eye view. The blockhouses are scattered in the woods, grouped according to the work we do. Our sleeping bunker, as big as a railway compartment, is very comfortable looking, panelled with a beautiful light-coloured wood. As the air conditioning noise bothered us, we have it switched off at night with the result that we walk around with leaden limbs all next day. Despite all this it is wonderful except for an appalling plague of mosquitoes. The men are better protected by their long leather boots and thick uniforms, their only vulnerable point is the neck. Some of them go around all day with mosquito nets on. Wherever a mosquito turns up, it is hunted down. In the first few days this led to immediate problems of jurisdiction, as the chief, Hitler, says it should be the Luftwaffe's job only. They say the small mosquitoes are replaced by a far more unpleasant sort at the end of June. God help us. It is almost too cool indoors. The forest keeps out the heat, you don't notice how much until you go out into the street, where the heat clamps down on you. Shortly after 10 a.m. we too, Gerda Aronofsky and I, go to the canteen bunker, a long whitewashed room sunk half underground, so that the small gauze-covered windows are very high up. A table for 20 people takes up the entire length of the room, here the chief takes his lunch and supper with his generals, his general staff officers, adjutants, and doctors. At breakfast and afternoon coffee we two girls are also there. The chief sits facing the maps of Russia hanging on the opposite wall. Now he makes a clean breast of his apprehensions, again and again emphasizing the enormous danger Bolshevism is for Europe and saying that if he had waited just one more year it would probably have been too late. We wait in this number one dining room each morning until the chief arrives for breakfast from the map room, where meantime he has been briefed on the war situation. Breakfast for him, I might add is just a glass of milk and a mashed apple, somewhat modest and unpretentious. Afterward we go at 1 p.m. to the general situation conference in the map room. The statistics on enemy aircraft and tanks destroyed are announced, the Russians seem to have enormous numbers, as we have already annihilated over 3,500 aircraft and over 1,000 tanks including some heavy ones, 40 tonners. They have been told to fight to the end and to shoot themselves if need be. For example, at Kovno, Corners, this happened, our troops sent a Russian prisoner into a Russian bunker to tell the Russians there to surrender, but he seems to have been shot himself by the commissar in there. Then the entire bunker was blown up by its own occupants. In other words, perish rather than surrender. There is a GPU commissar attached to each unit and the commanding officer has to bow to him. 
away from their leadership, the troops are just a rabble, they are absolutely primitive, but they fight doggedly on, which is of course a danger of its own and will lead to many a hard struggle yet. The French, Belgians, and so on were intelligent and gave up the fight when they saw it was pointless, but the Russians fight on like lunatics, trembling with fear that something will happen to their families if they surrender. If there is nothing important to be done, we sleep a few hours after lunch so we are bright and breezy for the rest of the day, which usually drags on till the cows come home. Then, around 5 p.m., we are summoned to the chief and plied with cakes by him. The one who grabs the most cakes gets his commendation. This coffee break most often goes on to 7 p.m., frequently even longer. Then we walk back to number two dining room for supper. Finally we lie low in the vicinity until the chief summons us to his study where there is a small get together with coffee and cakes again in his more intimate circle. I often feel so feckless and superfluous here. If I consider what I actually do all day, the shattering answer is, absolutely nothing. We sleep, eat, drink, and let people talk to us, if we are too lazy to talk ourselves. This morning the chief said that if ever the German soldier deserved laurels it was for this campaign. Everything is going far, far better than he hoped. There have been many strokes of good fortune, for example, that the Russians met us on the frontier and did not first lure us far into their hinterland with all the enormous transport and supply problems that would certainly have involved. And again, that they did not manage to destroy their two bridges at Dvinsk. I believe that once we have occupied Minsk our advance will surge forward. If there are any isolated communists left among our own ranks, they will definitely be converted when they see the blessings of life on the other side. By June 30th the encirclement of Minsk was completed. Army Group Center had captured 290,000 prisoners, 2,500 tanks, and 1,400 guns. Holder reflected the optimism at General Staff Headquarters when he boasted on July 3rd, it's probably not overstating the case if I maintain that the campaign in Russia has been won in two weeks. Of course that doesn't mean it's over. In a private letter on June 29th, Jodl's war diarist showed that the OKW agreed that things were going better than expected. With the capture of Dvinsk and Minsk we have covered in one week one third of the way to Leningrad and Moscow, at this rate we would be in both cities in another 14 days, but we can assume it'll be even sooner. Hitler shared this view. Looking at the wall map in his dining room, he proclaimed to his secretaries, in a few weeks we'll be in Moscow. Then I'll raise it to the ground and build a reservoir there. The name Moscow must be expunged. Hitler had every reason to send victory throughout July 1941. On July 2 he was shown a decoded Turkish report quoting both Stalin and Marshal Timoshenko as privately conceding to foreign diplomats that they had already written off Leningrad, Minsk, Kiev, and even Moscow. A decoded morale report from the American embassy in Moscow described air aid precautions there and anxiously noted the food situation and rumors that the Russians were already evacuating their gold reserves to safety. Over lunch with Ribbentrop on July 4, Hitler was already enlarging on his plans for colonizing Russia. The next day, with the Russian campaign seemingly drawing to a close, Hitler explained to the same select lunchtime audience why he had attacked Russia without a formal declaration of war or even the pretext of an incident. Nobody is ever asked about his motives at the bar of history. Why did Alexander invade India? Why did the Romans fight their Punic Wars, or Frederick II his second Silesian campaign? In history it is success alone that counts. He, Hitler, was answerable only to his people. To sacrifice hundreds of thousands, of troops, just because of the theoretical responsibility issue, for starting the war, would be criminal. I will go down in history as the destroyer of Bolshevism regardless of whether there was a frontier incident or not. Only the result is judged. If I lose, I shall not be able to talk my way out with questions of protocol.
Hitler calculated that it would take until August to assemble his infantry for an attack on Moscow. Meanwhile, his tank formations could mop up in the north. He was noticeably uncertain about how high to rank Moscow itself on his list of objectives, to him it was just a place name, he said, while Leningrad was the very citadel of Bolshevism, the city from which that evil greed had first sprung in 1917. By this time the coalition was complete, Slovakia had declared war on June 23rd, Hungary and Finland had decorously waited a few more days until Russian aircraft attacked them, then they too declared war. The Vichy French government broke off diplomatic relations with the USSR, and thousands of Frenchmen responded to the Nazi call for volunteers to fight Bolshevism, 150 airmen also volunteered, among them 20 of France's foremost bomber pilots. From Denmark, Norway, Spain, France, Belgium and Croatia came word of legions being formed to fight in Russia. Hitler directed that those from Germanic countries were to be organized by the SS, while the Wehrmacht would attend to the rest. All must swear allegiance to him. Sweden and Switzerland remained the exceptions dash nations on furlough, as Hitler contemptuously called them. As he had prophesied, the battle against Bolshevism was proving a rallying point for all Europe. On July 10 Huell observed of Hitler, he predicted it. I was forced into this fight step by step, but Germany will emerge from it as the greatest national power on earth. He believes that Churchill will topple all at once, quite suddenly. Then in Britain an immense anti-Americanism will arise, and Britain will be the first country to join the ranks of Europe in the fight against America. And Huell added jubilantly, he is infinitely confident of victory. The tasks confronting him today are as nothing, he says, compared with those in the years of struggle, particularly since ours is the biggest and finest army in the world. The Vatican also let it be known that they welcomed the war with Russia. That Churchill had broadcast his offer of aid to Russia on the first day of Barbarossa did not surprise Hitler. In private he mocked the strange spectacle of Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt as fighters for freedom. Confident of victory, on July 8, 1941 Hitler instructed Braukic not to send any new tanks to the Eastern Front, the panzer divisions there were to be reduced in number, and idled tank crews were to be sent back to Germany to train fresh tank divisions. On the 13th, he confirmed this in an OKW order, in addition to the 20 existing panzer divisions. The army was to establish by May 1, 1942 12 more for the East and 24 for other tasks. The next day, Hitler ruled that after the Soviet Union's defeat, the Luftwaffe was to be expanded on a colossal scale. Of his real future aims at this time we are only meagerly informed. Hitler seems to have envisaged a future war, perhaps not in his lifetime, between the New World and the Old. Later in July, Gossiping one night about the Englishman's innate sense of authority, he remarked, I'm sure the end of this war's going to mark the start of a lasting friendship with Britain. But if we're to live in peace with her, we shall have to give her a knockout blow first. The British expect that from anybody, if they are to respect him properly. On July 15th Jess Connex deputy, touring the conquered territories, wrote in his diary, the Red Army's equipment staggers us again and again. They had laid out enormous fortifications, mostly still incomplete, to guard their Lemberg salient. In this region, 63 huge airfields alone, each with two runways and all still incomplete, bear witness to the Russian attack preparations. The next day Stalin's son Jacob, a lieutenant in a Soviet tank division, was captured near Vitebsk. Among other proof that the Russians were just waiting to get at the Germans was, according to the Luftwaffe's general Wolfram von Richthofen, the huge number of artillery and tanks captured at Dobromysl. In part they come from the young Stalin's tank division. He has admitted that they were standing by for the big offensive. Hitler learned that a letter had been found on Jacob Stalin from a friend, mentioning that before their outing to Berlin he was going to see his Einushka one more time. Interrogation of Stalin Jr. and the dictator's former secretary, 
also captured, revealed that Stalin planned to exploit the German intelligentsia to boost the Russian population's caliber. Europe and Asia would then become the invincible bastions of Bolshevism. Hitler was particularly awed by the new Soviet armored fighting vehicles. They crawled out of the forests like primeval monsters of whose existence his experts had breathed no word to him, here was one tank of 52 tons, its armor played so thick that only the Luftwaffe's 88mm anti-aircraft guns made any impression on it, and here, south of Dubno, were others, weighing a hundred tons. On July 4, OKW war diarist Helmut Groener confidently asserted, the Russians have lost so many aircraft and 4,600 tanks that there can't be many left. By mid-July however Hitler's gunners had knocked out 8,000 Russian tanks and still they came. At the end of July 12,000 tanks had been captured or destroyed. Visiting Army Group Center on August 4, Hitler admitted to his Panzer Commander General Guderian, had I known they had as many tanks as that. I'd have thought twice before invading. Unable Colonel apprehensively recorded on July 20th, Cianaris, has just returned from the Führer's headquarters and describes the mood there as very jittery, as it is increasingly evident that the Russian campaign is not going by the book. The signs are multiplying that this war will not bring about the expected internal collapse, so much as the invigoration of Bolshevism. C warns in particular that attempts are being made to brand the Abwehr as the culprits, for not properly informing people about the true strength and fighting power of the Russian army. For example the Führer is said to have remarked that had he known of the existence of the super-heavy Russian tanks he would not have waged this war. OKW war diarist Grinner wrote privately the next day, nobody discussed this at lunch with the Führer yesterday. At first he was very taciturn, and just brooded. Then he came to life and delivered a monologue of an hour or more on our brave and gallant Italian allies and the worries they are causing him. You can't help being astonished at his brilliant judgment and clear insights. He looks in the best of health and seems well, although he seldom gets to bed before 5 or 6 a.m. On July 3rd, Hitler had been brought the radio monitoring services transcript of Stalin's first public broadcast since Barbarossa began. Stalin had by now recovered from his first shock at the Nazi onslaught. In his speech, he referred to Hitler and Ribbentrop as monsters and cannibals, and claimed that Hitler's ambition was to bring back the Tsars, and to destroy the independent constituent republics of the Soviet Union. He will Germanize them and turn them into the slaves of German princes and barons. Stalin appealed to patriotic Russians everywhere to destroy everything of value in the path of the advancing Wehrmacht, railway rolling stock, crops, fuel, and raw materials. They were to form partisan units behind German lines, which were to blow up roads and bridges, destroy arms dumps and convoys and hunt down and wipe out the enemy and his accomplices. This war with fascist Germany must not be regarded as an ordinary war. The partisan war provided the SS task forces with a fresh rationale for their extermination drives, in which Russian Jews increasingly came to be regarded as partisan material. On July 10 we find Hitler telephoning Braukic about the pointlessness of committing panzer divisions to the assault on Kiev. 35% of the city's population were Jews, he pointed out, so the bridges across the Dnieper would not be found intact. Another factor now also weighed with Hitler, the vast, sprawling conurbations of Leningrad and Moscow would become death traps if his precious tanks entered them. Thus he eventually decided that both cities were to be destroyed by bomber aircraft and by mass starvation. Two days after Stalin's radio speech Hitler told his private staff that Moscow would disappear from the Earth's surface. On July 8 he told Braukich and Holder that its devastation was necessary to drive out its population, whom they would otherwise have to feed in the coming winter. He ordered the Luftwaffe to disrupt Moscow with a terror raid. Emotionally however Hitler was far more attracted to the destruction of Leningrad. On July 16, Bormann noted, the Leningrad area is being claimed by the Finns. 
the Führer wants to raise Leningrad to the ground, then he'll give it to the Finns. On July 21, Hitler visited Lieb's headquarters on the Northern Front. The army group swore diary records, the Führer emphasized that he expects a bitter enemy defense south of Leningrad, as Russia's leaders fully realize that Leningrad has been held up to the nation as a showpiece of the revolution these last 24 years, and that given the Slav mentality, which has already suffered from the fighting so far, the loss of Leningrad might result in a complete collapse. As to the fact that this concentration on Leningrad would leave only infantry armies for the assault on Moscow, the Führer is not concerned by this, since to him Moscow is only a geographical objective. It was a strategic decision hotly contested by the general staff. Halder wrote an irritable private letter on July 28th. He's playing warlord again and bothering us with such absurd ideas that he's risking everything our wonderful operations so far have won. Unlike the French, the Russians won't just run away when they've been tactically defeated, they have to be slain one at a time in a terrain that's half forest and marsh, all this takes time and his nerves won't stand it. Every other day now I have to go over to him. Hours of claptrap and the outcome is there's only one man who understands how to wage wars. On July 14, Hitler told Ambassador Hiroshima, we shall not lose our heads as we press onward, we shall not advance beyond what we can really hold on to. There seemed however no limit to his territorial ambitions. Rundstedt wrote in a letter on the 20th, today Halder was here with some very far-reaching plans, but one doesn't like to think too far ahead. Hitler was overheard to remark, I entered this war a nationalist, but I shall come out of it an imperialist. Once, he had been heard to brag, Mr. Chamberlain likes to take weekends in the country, I shall take countries in the weekend. In the relaxed company of his private secretary, walking in the pitch darkness one night among the blockhouses, he made a bantering remark that again illustrated this. She had left her flashlight on his desk and kept stumbling. An orderly sent to fetch the flashlight reported it missing. In mock righteous tones Hitler assured her, Look, I poach other people's countries, I don't pinch their flashlights. He added with the belly laugh, and that's just as well, because it is the small fry that gets strung up. The big fish get away with it. At a five-hour conference with his chief minions, Rosenberg, Lammers, Keitel, Goring, and Bormann, on July 16, Hitler hammered home the point that Germany alone was entitled to benefit from defeating the Soviet Union. As for their secret aims, while they must be concealed from the world at large they themselves must be in no doubt, just as Germany had adopted the pose of protector in Norway, Denmark, Holland, and Belgium, where Germany had already staked her territorial claims in secret, whatever she might publicly profess for tactical reasons so she must act in Russia. But let there be no doubt in our minds that we shall never depart from these territories. Never again must there be any military power west of the Urals, even if we have to fight a hundred years war to prevent it. It shall never be permitted that anybody other than a German carries weapons. Since the Ukraine would be Germany's granary for the next three years, Hitler wanted Gawler to Erich Koch appointed as Reich Kommissar Koch. Goring's protege, was a tough, cruel viceroy who had shown his mettle in the economic management of East Prussia. About 6 p.m. they had a break for coffee, wrote Otto Brautigam, Rosenberg's army liaison officer, who was waiting outside. In his diary, the Reichsmarschall was in a brilliant mood. The few revoiced harsh criticism of the Swedes for the very meager contingent they had provided for the struggle against Bolshevism, and even the Reichsmarschall described the Swedes as decadent. The Finns on the other hand earned broad praise for their pluck. After the break the negotiations were resumed. About 8.30 a final agreement was reached. The Reichsliter, Rosenberg, told us how the talks had gone. He had reached a compromise with the Reichsmarschall, who is directing the economy of the occupied Eastern Territories through the economics staff, Werkhaftstab, East, and with the Reichsfuhrer SS, Himmler, who equally intends to direct the operations of his SS police units from his desk in Berlin. 
Rosenberg, also told us that serious objections had been raised to each and every candidate for the various Reich Commissar posts, but that all candidates were now in, Gorlitter, Hinreich, Lochs for the Reich Commissariat, RK, Ostland, the Baltic countries, Jesanter, Siegfried, Kashk for the RK Russia, with his seat in Moscow, Gorlitter, Wilhelm, Cube for the RK Ukraine, and Stabslitter, Arno. Siki dance for the RK Caucasus together with Jess Anter, Dr. Herman, Nubegger as economic director. An addendum from the coffee talk is that the Führer described the Germanizing of the Crimea as vital, and expatiated at length on the strength of the Soviet armored forces. He said to Goring, as you know, with this campaign I had my first pronounced misgivings because of our uncertainty as to the enemy's strength and I don't know whether I would have taken the same decision if I had been fully informed as to the overall strength of the Soviet army and in particular its gigantic tank rearmament. In Russia, he said, he would encourage neither schooling nor religion, a position on which he met the opposition of the devout Catholic Franz von Papen. Papen had sent him a long study urging that now was the right moment to reintroduce Christianity into Russia, Hitler would not hear of it. In a private aside, he noted that he might eventually consider letting in all the Christian sects so they can beat each other's brains out with their crucifixes. In this new German empire, soldiers with 12 years of service would automatically inherit a farmstead complete with cattle and machinery. He asked only that some of this new peasant breed should marry girls from the countryside. They were to retain their weapons so that they could answer any fresh calls to arms against the Asiatic hordes. The NCOs were to manage the gasoline stations along the eastern autobahns. This soldier peasant would above all make a far better educator than the university trained elementary school teacher, who would always be dissatisfied, not that Hitler planned to educate the Russian masses. It is in our interest that the people know just enough to recognize the signs on the road, he said. On July 17 he signed the formal decrees putting these plans into effect, setting up an East Ministry under Alfred Rosenberg to handle the occupied territories. Heinrich Himmler was given sweeping, indeed sinister, powers to police and exploit these new domains. The Nazi final solution of the Jewish problem now took an unmistakable turn for the worse. In some regions, particularly the Baltic countries, the Jewish problem had solved itself. The natives had already taken primitive revenge for Jewish excesses after the Soviet invasion of Lithuania in 1940. Hitler was informed that the Red Army's Jewish commissars had rounded up the local businessmen one morning and shot them. Actively encouraged by Heydrich's units, the Latvians and Lithuanians had begun to liquidate every Jew they could lay hands on. Lieb's army group brought this to the attention of Hitler's HQ on July 5, Colonel Schmund replied that the German troops were not to intervene, it was a necessary mopping up operation. Visiting Kovno a few days later Otto Brautigam was sufficiently disturbed to write in his diary on July 11, while we turn a blind eye the Lithuanian auxiliary police are carrying out numerous pogroms against the Jews. The spirit inspiring Hitler in his war against the European Jews is clear from the entry in Huell's diary on July 10. He says, I feel like the Robert Koch of politics. It is I who have discovered the Jews as the bacillus and ferment that causes all decay in society. What I have proved is this, that nations can survive without Jews. And in fact better. That is the cruelest blow I have dealt the Jews. He reverted to this surgical imagery a few days later, explaining to the Croatian defense minister, if just one country tolerates one Jewish family in its midst, then this will become the seat of a fresh bacillus infection. Once there are no more Jews in Europe the unity of the European nations can no longer be disrupted. It is unimportant where the Jews are sent, whether to Siberia or to Madagascar. He planned, he said to confront each country with this demand. In 1939 Hitler had confided to a bemused General Friedrich von Boet teacher, the German military attaché in Washington, that he possessed documents proving Roosevelt's Jewish ancestry. 
It was to these unidentified Jewish Bolshevik influences that Hitler ascribed Roosevelt's attempts to provoke a shooting war with Germany. On July 13 the German diplomat Hasso von Netzdorf quoted Hitler as saying, so long as our eastern operations are still running, we won't let ourselves be provoked. Later the Americans can have their war, if they absolutely have to. He quoted Hitler as telling Reda he would do his utmost to prevent Roosevelt from entering the war for one or two more months, because the Luftwaffe was still committed to the Russian campaign. Besides, as Reda informed the naval staff, the Führer still presumes that a victorious Russian campaign will affect the posture of the United States. Hitler now forbade even the mining of Icelandic harbors. It was reported that the American Navy had been ordered to fire without warning or provocation on any German warship, American commanders concerned were instructed to deny responsibility and to suggest that a British unit was involved. Thus Roosevelt helped to provoke countermeasures. All these facts Hitler learned from intercepted U.S. naval code signals. On July 20 Kunner is reported, a certain disenchantment is to be discerned with the Reich Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop. Thus he himself now accepts America's entry into the war as imminent, and for the first time he spoke disparagingly of the journalistic reporting of Thompson and Boet teacher. Ribbentrop's stock with Hitler was currently at its lowest. Hitler sometimes even egged on his private staff to make fun of the foreign minister. In July the question arose as to whether Rosenberg or Ribbentrop should conduct propaganda in Russia, Hitler characteristically decided to allow both ministers a free hand. On the 28th Ribbentrop picked a quarrel with Hitler about this, and even heaped scorn on his decision to attack the Soviet Union. It was a stiflingly hot summer day. Hitler was so enraged that he clutched his heart, collapsed into a chair, and gasped at the petrified Ribbentrop that he must never again challenge his decisions. Ribbentrop, pale with fright, gave his word. Hitler then charged Lammers to inform the foreign minister that the diplomatic service had to stand aside until the guns had finished speaking. That summer, despite the heat and Hitler's growing signs of a mysterious malaise, his conversations were monologues, delivered in a rich Austrian dialect to a handful of cronies assembled in his bunker, or over lunch or dinner at the long oblong table with Jodl at his left, an outside guest like Speer or Goebbels at his right, and his headquarters staff, the liaison officers, the younger adjutants, and secretaries, at their allotted places. Sometimes Hitler would talk about the Nazi party and Christianity. We must not try to combat religion, he dictated, but let it with air away. Christus Schroeder, Hitler's devoted secretary, wrote in mid-July 1941. In our evening discussions with the chief, the church plays a big part. It is also convincing, what the chief says, when for example he explains how Christianity by its mendacity and hypocrisy has set back mankind in its development, culturally speaking by 2000 years. I really must start writing down what the chief says. It's just that these sessions go on for ages and afterward you are just too limp and lifeless to write anything. The night before last, when we left the chief's bunker, it was already light. We did not turn in even then, as ordinary people would have, but made for the kitchen, ate a few cakes, and then strolled for two hours toward the rising sun past farmyards and paddocks, past hillocks glowing with red and white clover in the morning sun, a fairy land on which you just could not feast your eyes enough, and then back to bed. We are incapable of getting up before 2 or 3 p.m. A crazy life. The like of our strange profession will probably never be seen again, we eat, we drink, we sleep, now and then we type a bit, and meantime keep him company for hours on end. Recently we did make ourselves a bit useful. We picked some flowers, so that his bunker does not look too bare. On August 4, Hitler visited Field Marshal von Bock at the headquarters of Army Group Center. The Battle of Smolensk was drawing to its end. Another 300,000 Russian captives were already being marched westward, but it was clear that the Führer had not yet made up his mind on what next. 
he was intoxicated by Bok's historic triumphs. Now, he had exclaimed on leaving his headquarters early that morning, we shall put things in order here for a thousand years. He was however falling ill. And for another thing, what precisely was Russia's military strength, which he had to destroy? Halder himself now only admitted that everybody had underestimated the Soviet colossus. When we attacked, we assumed there were 200 enemy divisions. To date, we have already counted 360. To Hitler, the key to victory lay in Russia's raw material centers and particularly the Dunitz region beyond Kharkov, that is the entire base of the Soviet economy. To a diplomat he explained, soon we shall occupy the richest Russian economic regions, which yield 61% of their iron and 35% of their molybdenum, and when we cut off their oil supplies from the south, the fate of Bolshevism will be sealed. Kiev. That summer of 1941 Hitler fell ill for the first time in five years. The stress of the Russian campaign, coupled with the hot, malarial climate in which the wolf slayer had been sighted, told severely on the dictator. Worse, the brackish waters of Majuria had infected him with dysentery, and as the crucial strategic controversy developed between Hitler and his generals, his ability to overrule them was impaired by his own physical weakness. His own grand strategy, which was to set up a vast encircling movement by army groups north and south, enveloping Moscow from the rear, was opposed and circumvented by Braukic and his staff, who favored a direct assault on Moscow by Field Marshal von Bock's army group center. Braukic stayed in Berlin and ignored Hitler's orders, Hitler was confined by circumstances to his field headquarters. When the army commander-in-chief did pay a rare visit to the wolf's lair, Hitler vainly warned that the way things were going the fronts would inevitably become static, as they had in World War I. At the wolf's lair Hitler began holding war conferences, they were theatrical performances dominated by his monologues. They lasted for hours on end, sapping the energy of his generals, who had more urgent business elsewhere. Individual generals hesitated to speak their minds in front of such a large audience. But a few found that in private Hitler could be frankly spoken to, among them were Unstedt, Reichenau, Guderian, Manstein, and later Melch, Zietzler, and Ferdinand Skorner. On August 6, visiting Rundstedt and General Anton Skuat Army Group South headquarters in the dreary Ukrainian town of Berdichev. Hitler's mind had seemed all but made up, Moscow would be left for last, Leningrad and the Southern Front would be dealt with first, the meteorologists had assured him that the current dry spell would last longer in the center than the south anyway. Before he could issue the necessary directive, however, Hitler was struck down. On August 7 Huell would write cryptically in his diary, Furasakit, ill. The diplomat Huell had been a rubber planter in Java, that morning, as Dr. Morrill's diary reveals, Hitler had been sitting down when he suddenly felt dizzy and began to throw up. Morrill noted, this bunker atmosphere has been getting him down for five or six weeks now. Then, Hans, Junge, an SS orderly, suddenly telephoned for me to come immediately to the Fuhrer. The doctor found Hitler deathly white. I feel very bad now gasped the Führer. Much worse than earlier. Up here, he added, pointing to his left temple, I feel so strange. A short while ago I had a terrific row, with Ribbentrop, I got immensely worked up and since that time I've been feeling rotten. Mural was baffled. He found that Hitler's eyebrows were tender, his hands trembled now when extended, panicking, the doctor bent the hypodermic needle as he frantically injected some multivitamins and carefully wrote down every word Hitler spoke to him, to be on the safe side he gave him a Yartran pill, a medication useful in fact only against amoebic dysentery, which is confined almost entirely to the tropics. Hitler's blood pressure was alarmingly high minus 170 millimeters, and there was a loud buzzing in his ears. Moral diagnosed vaguely, vascular spasms with rush of blood to temples for various reasons. He allowed Hitler a supper of one soft-boiled egg, mashed potato, and strawberries. 
it seemed a typical attack of basic dysentery. On the morning of the 8th Hitler sent his valet over to Dr. Mural to declare that he had never had a day in bed since being gassed in the World War. Proud of this record, he staggered out of bed at 11 a.m. I went over, recorded Mural in his pencil notes, without being sent for. Führer was very irritable, is feeling a lot worse than yesterday, hasn't slept a wink, but has no intention of lying in that confined space. He's got to get up and about. Hitler refused to allow any more injections for the time being. The places where Moral had spiked him the day before hurt so badly, he groaned, that they put all else in the shade. His ears still buzzing, he dressed and went over to the map room. Moral sent word that he should have only tea and a biscuit for lunch. He ordered spaghetti and strawberries, he recorded. The generals were delighted that the Führer had been laid low, although General Halder did record this day, despite his medical indisposition the Führer has given the commander-in-chief, von Braukitsch, the closest instructions on how he wants the Air Force squadrons used. The generals began to go their own way, disregarding Hitler's strategic intentions. I think it's okay again, Doctor, Hitler said to Morrill on August 9th. Let's keep the checkup short, shall we? Because I want to go over to the map room. During the war conference the buzzing suddenly returned in his ears. He sent for Mural to inquire about using leeches to lower his blood pressure. Mural was planning to use his multivitamins, tenophosphan, electric heating pads, and other panaceas, he saw no reason not to try leeches too. Heinz Lynch, the valet, later described. Hitler sat in front of a mirror and watched fascinated as the leeches quenched their thirst on his blood. First, wrote Morel in his diary on August 11th, I had made a small prick under the ear, but the skin was like leather. I had to push very hard to draw even the tiniest drops of blood. Führer himself shook the leeches out of the jar. I had to apply them with my fingers, as they slithered out of the forceps. The first one sucked much faster the rear one only slowly. The front one dropped off first, letting go at the bottom and dangling. The rear one continued sucking for another half hour then it too let go at the bottom, I had to rip it off at the top. Afterward Hitler's head bled for two hours, Moral applied bandages. Hitler decided not to show himself at supper on account of them, but he turned up for the usual war conference and tea session afterward, his ears had stopped buzzing noted Moral. Over the next days the Führer's blood pressure dropped to more normal levels. Some throbbing in left head, wrote Moral on the 12th. Has had a lot of arguments and tension. On the 14th, he persuaded Hitler to permit a white and red blood corpuscle count and a cardiogram. The blood serology results came back on the 16th, as was to be expected in a man getting so little fresh air and sunshine the red corpuscle count was low. Moreover, recorded Moral on the 18th, the bunker is damp and unhealthy, the temperature just right for growing fungi, once, my boots were moldy after being left two days, and my clothes got clammy in the bedroom. New bunker walls always sweat quantities of water at first. Then there are the colds caused by the draft of the extractor fans. I pointed out all that after just four days here in the bunker. People got chest constrictions, anemia, and general bunker psychosis. Reminded him that I had initially recommended more frequent motor journeys or five days in his special train, a change of scenery to somewhere at a greater altitude. At that time the Führer declared that this wasn't on because of the centralization of his signals equipment, etc. I also suggested he spend 14 days at the Berghof. Hitler told him that he had taken a mild sedative, but did not want to make a habit of it. He felt well, but Goebbels, visiting him that day, August 18th, wrote afterward that he looked somewhat strained and sickly. This is probably a result of his dysentery and perhaps also of the drain on his strength of these last few weeks. The cardiogram had immediately revealed a depression of the T-wave. Alarmed, Morel had sent the traces to a leading authority on heart conditions, Professor Karl Weber, 
director of the Heart Institute at Bad Norheim, instructing him only that they were of a very busy diplomat. Weber's report confirmed a considerable flattening of SDE and ST2 he added, if these are not the consequence of taking digitalis or an infection, we must assume primarily that the cause is coronary sclerosis. He recommended performing electrocardiograms at 14-day intervals. The ultimate diagnosis, rapid progressive coronary sclerosis, showed that Mural's illustrious patient was now suffering a virtually incurable heart disease. In a man of Hitler's age it was not abnormal, but from now on there would always be the danger of angina pectoris or of an embolism with possibly fatal consequences. For the present Moral kept the truth from him, apart from a brief reference on August 18, in the Führer's presence he insisted that his heart and other organs were working well. In private, however, Moral began to study textbooks on the heart, and additional medicines were added to Hitler's already overflowing cabinet. Hitler passively accepted his portly physician's explanations. Moral, he said to another doctor, told me my energy consumption is as high as in the tropics, because of my uninterrupted intensive work. On August 18, 1941, Field Marshal von Braukitsch submitted to him an obstinate written argument for the immediate resumption of the attack on Moscow, as the city's capture would take at least two months. Hitler rejected it outright. It was most urgent in his view to deprive Stalin of his raw materials and arms industry. Besides, a rapid advance southward would encourage Iran to resist the Anglo-Russian invasion which he already knew was in the cards, in any case. He wanted the Crimea in German hands, it was from Crimean airfields that Russian bombers had recently attacked Romania. He was plagued at night by a recurring nightmare, the petroleum fields of Ploesti, ablaze from end to end. His panzer generals, Hoth and Guderian were most unenthusiastic about his plans. They lamented that their tanks were in need of overhaul. Hitler did not believe them. He had heard the same story before Dunkirk. The two generals, he said, were obviously just trying to conceal their own arrogant disapproval of his grand strategy. The Army High Command continued stubbornly with its plans to attack Moscow. Only later was it realized that Hitler's strategy would have offered the better prospects. Box armies would still be stalled outside Moscow when winter set in, and Hitler's illness bore the blame. Today I still believe. Goring was to tell his captors, that had Hitler's original plan of genius not been diluted like that, the Eastern Campaign would have been decided by early 1942 at the latest. Life within Security Zone 1 revolved around Hitler. When he was away it was as though the dynamo had been wrenched bodily out of the powerhouse. Favored indeed were those with special passes to this holy compound. The presence of his women staff was frowned upon. It's a thorn in some people's side, wrote Christa Schroeder in one letter, that even in wartime the chief has his personal staff around him, and particularly of course that we two females are included. We aren't here on an outing but because the chief wants us and maintains that he can't work without us. More than once he has stressed in these gentlemen's presence that without us, he would be in a hopeless mess. It cannot have been a very pleasant situation when the chief asked his way Macht adjutant, Schmunt, whether a tent has been laid on for his ladies at the next headquarters. The reply was in the negative, so the Führer angrily ordered that accommodation was to be provided for us. Oh, they had imagined they were only going to stay there in a tent encampment a few days, so we would not be needed. All of these excuses show how much they want to get rid of us. Three weeks later the same secretary was complaining of the monotony. We have now been here nine weeks, and the rumor is we shall stay here until the end of October. I am so sick of inactivity that I recently tried to convince the chief he needs only one secretary. Her other writings unmistakably reflect Hitler's inner thoughts. Thus on August 20th we find her recording. A few days ago we saw here a British newsreel that reached us via America showing the horrifying devastation of entire streets in London, all the big department stores, parliament, and so on are in ruins. 
The camera showed the huge fires raging, as it panned across whole sections of the city, with warehouse after warehouse forming one sea of fire. The commentary says that the British are sticking it out in the knowledge that Berlin looks just the same. Oh, if the poor British could only guess. I long for nothing more fervently than that the British should come forward with peace proposals once we have dealt with Russia. This war with Britain can only result in us smashing each other's cities to smithereens. And Mr. Roosevelt chuckles in gleeful anticipation of the day he will inherit Britain's legacy. I really cannot understand why the British won't listen to the voice of reason. Now that we are expanding to the east, we have no need for their colonies. I find it all so much more practical that everything will be right on our doorstep, the Ukraine and Crimea are so fertile we can plant everything we need there, and the rest, coffee, tea, cocoa, etc., we can obtain by barter from South America. It is all so simple and obvious. Those in authority in London and Washington were, however, bent on Hitler's extinction. In the second week of August, Churchill and Roosevelt met off Newfoundland, and proclaimed the eight-point Atlantic Charter, affirming that they sought no territorial aggrandizement, that they frowned on all territorial changes that did not accord with the freely expressed wishes of the people concerned, and that all nations should enjoy equal access to the raw materials of the earth and to its oceans. Russia, which had lost the European territories it had annexed in 1940, subscribed to the Charter in 1942 along with some 20 nations that were then at war with Germany. On August 25, Britain and Russia invaded Iran, the United States took over the naval watch of the Denmark Straits, northwest of Iceland, and undertook escort duties on North Atlantic convoys. Clearly the distinction between neutrality and belligerency was being increasingly blurred. Hitler approved Goebbels's mischievous idea of immediately following Clement Attlee's broadcast on the Atlantic talks, as Churchill's deputy, with two special communiques, announcing that the Black Sea ports of Odessa and Nikolaev were now under siege and that the Soviet iron ore fields were in German hands. Hitler had asked Goebbels to come and see him on August 18. Apparently he was prompted by the growing Catholic clamor against the Nazi euthanasia program. This covert liquidation of the mentally ill, as Goebbels frankly termed it in his diary, had proceeded without friction until now. As its manager Philip Buller had told him on January 30, 1941, they had already quietly got rid of 80,000 and had only 60,000 more to go. Hard work, but necessary too, Goebbels commented in his diary. Early in July however the Bishop of Munster, Count von Galen, had blown the lid off the scandal in a pastoral letter, and on the 27th he had instituted private criminal proceedings against persons unknown. For the Nazi party and government alike it was acutely embarrassing. Hitler's arbitrary 1939 law authorizing euthanasia had never been published. Bormann submitted to Hitler a memorandum on the desirability of executing the bishop for sedition. Goebbels supported Bormann, arguing that Galen had spiced his sermon with wholly unfounded charges. Hitler sagely disregarded Goebbels' advice. But on August 24 he ordered the entire euthanasia operation shut down immediately. The latter continued nonetheless. Immersed in Barbarossa, Hitler remained unaware that Martin Bormann was already waging open war on the church. On one occasion Hitler said, if my mother were still alive, she'd definitely be a churchgoer and I wouldn't want to hinder her. On the contrary, you've got to respect the simple faith of the people. Hitler assured Goebbels and Rosenberg that he would not easily forgive the German church leaders their behavior during this emergency. But until the war was won the party must proceed slowly against the church. On July 30, 1941, Bormann personally circularized all the Gauletters, on Hitler's orders, instructing them to refrain from any persecution of the religious communities, since this would only divide the nation which Hitler had so arduously united. Nor was Hitler the mainspring behind the Jewish question. There is now no doubt that Dr. Goebbels was. In the Eastern Campaign, a Goebbels memorandum read, 
The German soldier has seen the Jew in all his cruelty and repulsiveness. Clearly when the soldier comes home from the wars, he must not find any Jews here waiting for him. Ever since the summer of 1940 Goebbels had prepared for the rapid deportation of Berlin's 70,000 Jews to Poland, but the war needs for transport overrode his ambitions. They could not begin the big round up until the war was over. Goebbels brought with him to Hitler's headquarters on August 18 a series of harsh measures designed to hound and intimidate the Jews. Afterward, he noted, one only needs to imagine what the Jews would do if they had us in their power, to know what we must do now that we are on top. I managed to get my way completely with the Führer on the Jewish matter. He agrees we can introduce a large, visible badge for all the Jews in the Reich, to be worn by all Jews in public, so as to obviate the danger that the Jews will act as grumblers and defeatists without being detected. And in future we will allocate to Jews who don't work smaller food rations than to Germans. Incidentally, the Führer agrees that as soon as the first transport possibilities arise, the Berlin Jews will be deported from Berlin to the east. Hitler may have reminded Goebbels of his January 1939 Reichstag speech. The Führer is convinced that the prophecy he uttered then in the Reichstag, that if the Jews once more succeeded in provoking a world war, it would end with the destruction of the Jews, is coming true. It is coming true these weeks and months with a dread of certainty that is almost uncanny. In the East the Jews will have to square accounts, they have already footed part of the bill in Germany. At any rate in the coming world the Jews will have little cause for mirth. August 18th was a beautiful summer day at the Führer's headquarters. Probably in response to Dr. Morrill's prompting, Hitler spent the four hours of his talk with Goebbels strolling in the woods, the first time he had done so in five weeks. He asked Goebbels about their mood in Berlin, which had recently undergone small-scale Russian air attacks. He had no worries about the morale of his people as a whole. The way Macht's big push southward would shortly begin. The Führer is not concerned with occupying particular regions or cities, wrote Goebbels. He wants to avoid casualties if at all possible. Therefore he does not intend to take Petersburg, Leningrad, or Kiev by force of arms, but to starve them into submission, once Petersburg has been cut off. His plan is to destroy the city's lifeline with his Luftwaffe and artillery. Our first Luftwaffe attacks will hit the water, power, and gas plants. Perhaps, mused Hitler wistfully to Goebbels, Stalin might even now sue for peace. He has of course little in common with the plutocrats in London. The moment he sees that the Bolshevik system itself is on the verge of collapse and can only be salvaged by surrender, then he will certainly be willing to do so. The Führer is convinced that Moscow and London were in the same line of business long before June, wrote Goebbels. Their aim had been identical, the destruction of the Reich. Stalin had been on the brink of attacking Germany, German division commanders found the enemy had better large-scale maps of Germany, Austria, and Silesia than they did themselves. Air reconnaissance revealed that Stalin had established a huge complex of arms factories beyond the Urals. The Russians had also built several completely unpublicized highways along which they advanced, while the Wehrmacht adhered to the only roads they were aware of. In Red Army barracks were found dummy German soldiers that had been manufactured for target practice long before June 1941. Most of Hitler's commanders, including Bock, Kludge, Halder, and Richard Drew, agreed that he had selected the proper time to strike. As he repeatedly remarked, he was not going to make the mistakes that a certain other famous man dash meaning Napoleon, had made. Aided by thousands of prisoners, his army engineers labored around the clock to repair the demolished Russian railroad tracks and relay them on the different German gauge. By mid-August a twin track extended as far as Smolensk. Once, on the 17th, he educated his private staff on the dangers of over-optimism. Always credit the enemy with doing just what you least want, he told Huell. For example, he tried to envisage what Stalin would do if the Pripyat marshes did not exist. 
On August 19 Martin Bormann quoted Hitler as remarking, through my activities so far the German nation has already gained over two and a half million people. Even if I ask 10% of this as a sacrifice, I shall still have given 90%. On that day Dr. Morrill had recorded, did not give the Führer a check up today as he felt fine. But the next day Hitler was still feeling low. After working a lot yesterday, noted Morrill, he was a bit jumpy. His hands were shaking and his head swimming. He was planning to invite Mussolini to the Eastern Front, but there was still a slight buzzing in his ears. On the 21st he burst out at Morrill, the meal repertoire, here, is very limited. Trouble is, recorded the doctor, he turns down so many things we suggest, and it's very difficult to make suggestions, what with his being a vegetarian, Hitler wanted that pleasant treatment with the leeches again but all but one of those used on him before had died, the Führer's blood evidently having been to their distaste. I was hoping, wrote Mural on August 22, to apply leeches once more before Mussolini gets here so his, Hitler's, head will be completely clear. But I can't find the time yet, said Hitler. Right now am I up to my eyes in work. Of course I wanted to. Set three leeches, recorded Morrill in his diary of August 23rd, two behind the ear, one in front the latter sucked well and strong. Head clearer and lighter. Says he found their sucking not at all unpleasant. Restored to health, Hitler began to fight back against the general staff. On August 21st he dictated a brusque letter to Braukic beginning with the words, the army's proposal for continuing the operations in the east does not accord with my intentions. I order the following dash and he restated the objectives he had been demanding since December 1940, in the north, the isolation of Leningrad, and in the south, the capture of the Crimea, the Dunitz industrial and coal regions, and the Caucasus oil fields. Field Marshal von Box Army Group Center, facing Moscow, was to remain on the defensive. This rude rebuff caused uproar in the army. Braukic suffered his first mild heart attack. Holder literally wept over Hitler's pamphleteering. Tortured days lie behind me, he wrote to his wife on August 23rd. Again I offered my resignation to stave off an act of folly. The outcome was completely unsatisfactory. The objective I set myself namely to finish off the Russians once for all before the year is out, will not be achieved. History will level it as the gravest accusation that can be made of a high command, namely that for fear of undue risk we did not exploit the attacking impetus of our troops. It was the same in the Western campaign. But there the enemy's internal collapse cast a merciful veil over our errors. Box diary bespoke an equally anguished heart. I don't want to capture Moscow. I want to destroy the enemy's army, and the bulk of that army is in front of me. He telephoned Colonel Schmunt asking that the Führer at least give a hearing to Guderian. Guderian was granted a midnight conference with Hitler on August 23rd. After hearing Hitler's case for the main thrust to continue now toward the south, Guderian decided that the Führer was right. I returned, he wrote afterward on the 24th, well satisfied and with high hopes. Boxroth and Holder's indignation at Guderian's sellout were immense. Holder confiscated his most powerful corps, the 46th Panzer, and assigned it to the 4th Army on the Moscow front. With only two corps, Guderian's offensive limped and stumbled. Since the 27th I've been fighting for reinforcements but they are granted me only in driblets and too late, he wrote in one letter. His chief of staff observed in his diary that Guderian has the impression that, Bock and Halder, are still hanging on to their old plan, the advance on Moscow. By early September it was clear, as bad weather arrived, that the Red Army north of the Disna River had eluded him. The Duce arrived at the Wolf's Lair on August 25th. Huell noted war conference, then a communal meal in the dining bunker and a talk with my chief, Ribbentrop. In the evening a cold buffet in the garden. Vittorio Mussolini is particularly unattractive and dumb.
The next day Hitler showed Mussolini over the battlefield at Brest-Litovsk, where the two-ton projectiles of his 620mm mortars had reduced the citadel to ruins. He admitted that his military intelligence had grossly misinformed him about the Soviet powers of resistance, but he predicted that final victory would he his by the spring of 1942. That evening both dictators left for the Führer's southern headquarters site in Galicia. Mussolini joined Hitler for a confidential talk, pouring his heart out for the first time about the very real difficulties his fascist revolution was in. In 1943 Hitler would recall him as lamenting, tell me, what can you do if you have got officers with reservations about the regime and about its ideologies? Who say, the moment you talk of your ideology or of raison d'etat, we are monarchists, we owe our allegiance to the king? This admission of impotence in face of the Italian monarchy was a shock to Hitler, and he never forgot Mussolini's words. The next day, August 28, both dictators flew across the fertile Ukrainian countryside for hours until they reached Rundstedt's command post at Oman. His face was sunburnt to a brilliant red, wrote Moral guiltily, and his forehead was very painful with large burnt patches, so he was very grumpy. Key Eitel had eyes only for the countryside. One could sense the virginity of the soil, he recalled. Three months later Hitler described his own vivid impressions. I must have seen thousands of women there, but not one of them was wearing even the cheapest ornaments. In their etched hovels there was neither cutlery nor other household goods. And this misery prevailed in a region whose soil was capable of the biggest harvest imaginable. Only when this terrified, scared mass of people saw with their own eyes the commissars being shot did they gradually turn back into human beings again. The summer would soon be over and still Russia had not been defeated. At the end of August, Christa Schroeder wrote. Our stay here at the headquarters gets longer and longer. First we thought we would be back in Berlin by the end of July, then they talked of mid-October, and now they are already saying we will not get away before the end of October, if even then. It is already quite cool here, like autumn, and if it occurs to the chief to spend the winter here we shall all be frozen. This protracted bunker existence can't be doing us any good. The chief does not look too well either, he gets too little fresh air and now he is oversensitive to sun and wine the moment he goes out in his car for a few hours. I would have loved to stay in Galicia, we were all in favor of it, but security there is not good enough. The whole countryside there is freer. Here in the forest it all crowds in on you after a while. Besides, you didn't have the feeling that you were locked in, you saw the peasants working in the fields and it made you feel free, while here we keep stumbling on sentries and are forever showing our identity cards. Well. I suppose that wherever we are we're always cut off from the world, in Berlin, at the Berghof, or on our travels. It is always the same sharply defined circle, always the same circuit inside the fence. Just what Hitler's new order would be in Europe was a secret that he closely kept. That Slavs and Bolsheviks, particularly if they were Jewish, would not prosper under it was obvious, but the positions of countries like Italy, France, Hungary, and even Russia were still undefined. Hitler's naval adjutant, Putkama, wrote revealingly on August 11. At lunch yesterday the Führer spoke about our relationship with France. This elicited for the first time the reason why he doesn't take up any of the proposals made about it. He said he thought that a man like Darlan is being perfectly honest and that it was quite possible to achieve a bearable relationship with France by progressing from armistice to a preliminary peace. This was absolutely possible, in his view, even if we made stiff demands, France expected them, would uphold them, and would join the war at our side. So, if we were alone, everything could be attained. The decisive obstacle is however Italy's claims, Tunis and Corsica. No French government could uphold these. But he couldn't persuade the Italians to drop them, he had to associate himself with these claims too. He couldn't barter our ally Italy against France, he said.
So that's the real reason, which was news to both me and Jodl, with whom I discussed it. On September 8, referring to Hungary, Hitler told Huell, these are all just alliances of expediency. For example, the German people know that our alliance with Italy is only an alliance between Mussolini and myself. We Germans have sympathies only with Finland, we could find some sympathy for Sweden, and of course with Britain. Here he must have sighed, for he added, a German-British alliance would be an alliance from people to people. The British would only have to keep their hands off the continent. They could keep their empire, and the world if they wanted. Hitler's conquest of the Ukraine would mean that he no longer needed the raw material regions of France. As he explained to his ambassador in France, Otto Abitz, on September 16, the Soviet iron ore fields at Krivoy Rog alone would yield a million tons of ore a month. Hitler would insist on retaining only Alsace and Lorraine, and the Channel Coast facing England. Given what he saw as such modest claims, Hitler assured Abitz that France would certainly have a share of the pickings from the new order. In his diary of September 15, 1941, Weizsäcker described Hitler's foreign policy in these words, the quasi-depression of four weeks ago has been cured, probably the physical malaise too. An autobahn is being planned to the Crimean Peninsula. There is speculation as to the probable manner of Stalin's departure. If he withdraws into Asia, he might even be granted a peace treaty. The next day, Papen also raised Stalin's future with Hitler, and the Fuhrer repeated what he had told Goebbels a month before, that once the Wehrmacht had occupied a certain forward line in Russia, it might be possible to find common ground with the Red Dictator, who was after all a man of enormous achievements. As another diplomat, Hasso von Etzdorf, commented, as to Stalin's fate, Hitler, sees two possibilities, either he gets bumped off by his own people, or he tries to make peace with us. Because, he says, Stalin as the greatest living statesman must realize that at 66 you can't begin your life's work all over again if it will take a lifetime to complete it, so he'll try to salvage what he can, with our acquiescence. And in this we should meet him halfway. If Stalin could only decide to seek expansion for Russia toward the south, the Persian Gulf, as he, Hitler, recommended to him once, November 1940, then peaceful coexistence between Russia and Germany would be conceivable. Papen for his part impressed on Hitler the need to promote a constructive peace plan after Russia's overthrow, a plan capable of inspiring all Europeans. The Führer then turned to his plans for the East, relates the only existing record of Hitler's conversation with Abitz on September 16. Petersburg, Leningrad, the poisonous nest from which for so long Asiatic venom has spewed forth into the Baltic, must vanish from the Earth's surface. The city is already cut off. The Asiatics and the Bolsheviks must be hounded out of Europe. This episode of 250 years of Asiatic pestilence is at an end. The Urals will be the frontier beyond which Stalin and his like can do as they please. But he, Hitler, by launching occasional expeditions across the Urals, will also ensure that Stalin gets no respite there either. After the expulsion of the Asiatics, Europe will never again be dependent on an outside power, nor need we care two hoots about America. Europe will meet its own raw material needs, and it will have its own export market in the Russian territories so we shall no longer need the rest of the world's trade. The new Russia this side of the Urals will be our India, but far more handily located than that of Britain. The new greater German Empire will embrace 135 million people, and it will rule 150 million more. The backbone of the new empire would be the Wehrmacht and above all the SS. In public Hitler talked with Himmler only of innocuous matters, architecture, the Salon of Frau Bruckmann, or the relative nutritive values of the potato and the soya bean. In private they elaborated ways of fighting the multiplying and hydra-headed partisan movements springing up throughout the Nazi-occupied territories. Hitler linked these movements with Stalin's July broadcast, and he condemned as far too mild the treatment so far meted out to captured offenders. 
On September 7, as Himmler was at the Wolf's Lair, he ordered that if the murderer of a German NCO in Paris was not found immediately, 50 hostages were to be shot, and in future the ratio was to be a hundred communists for each German life taken. The German military commander admittedly protested, and Hitler left the final scale of reprisals to his discretion. The siege of Leningrad symbolized the brutalization of this war. Over the horizon, Lieb's tank crews could see the glittering gold spires of the Admiralty building, so near and yet so far. In a formal directive, number 35, issued on September 6, Hitler roared at Leningrad to be so thoroughly isolated by his ground forces that by mid-September at the latest he could recover his tanks and Richthofen's air squadrons for the main assault on Moscow after all. On September 9 the Luftwaffe began around-the-clock bombing operations. Jess Connick's deputy wrote in his diary, food already appears to be short there. On the 10th, Rosenberg's liaison officer reported to him from Hitler's headquarters. The entire population has remained and actually been swollen by the evacuation of the surrounding suburbs. Already it's almost impossible to get bread, sugar, and meat in Leningrad. The Führer wants to avoid house-to-house -house fighting, which would cost our troops heavy casualties. The city is to be just shut in, shot to pieces by artillery and starved out. A few days or weeks here or there make no difference, as the besieging army won't have to be very big. The Finns have suggested diverting Lake Ladoga into the Gulf of Finland, which lies several meters lower, to wash away the city of Leningrad. On September 12th, General Halder emphasized to Lieb's army group that his tanks would shortly be pulled back from Leningrad for the attack on Moscow. General Hans Reinhardt protested at the effect this order to halt was having on his men. The city is spread out before them, and nobody is stopping them going right on in. Hitler agreed however that the tanks should not be committed, Leningrad should be destroyed by bombardment instead. Admiral Reder asked him to spare at least the dockyards, this too Hitler refused but as regards the tanks key I tell telephone Lieb to postpone their withdrawal by 48 hours. On the 12th the Luftwaffe commander, Richthofen, entered in his diary, Colonel Schmunt, talked about the problem of Finland and Leningrad. Over L. The Plauschel Pass. On September 16 the Nazi tanks were finally halted, and their withdrawal from Leningrad to the Moscow front began, Kiev at least was in German hands. The news broke at Hitler's headquarters late on September 19. For days afterward he spoke of his plans for Europe. Dr. Werner Köppen, Rosenberg's liaison officer, recorded these historic conversations. Lunchtime, September 19. Dr. Tott related his impressions of his latest journey to Oslo and Trondheim and of the first ground broken for the major traffic link between Germany and Denmark. The Führer talked about his plan to rebuild Trondheim afresh in terrace form, so that every house will be in the sun all day long. The Führer then spoke of the need to build one autobahn up to Trondheim, and another down to the Crimea. After the war the German citizen shall have the chance of taking his Volkswagen and looking over the captured territories in person, so that if need should arise he will also be willing to fight for them. We must never repeat the pre-war error of having the colonial idea the property of only a few capitalists or corporations. The railway traverses distances, but the road opens them up. Earlier, as he told Sasing Quart on the 26th, it was downright absurd that though a vast, only sparsely populated, empire lay in the east with almost inexhaustible resources and raw materials. Western Europe struggled to meet its needs by imports from colonies far overseas. Once we have securely occupied the vitally important European regions of the Soviet Union, the war east of the Urals can go on a hundred years, for all we care. Hitler learned that rubber was being grown near Kharkov, he had himself already seen excellent samples of it. The giant farms Stalin has introduced will probably be the best way to use the land in the future too as they are probably the only way of cultivating the land intensively. He felt that most Russians had become quite accustomed to being treated like animals. 
if the occupying authorities controlled the alcohol and tobacco supplies, he had said at lunch a few days earlier, they would have the population eating out of their hands. The frontier between Europe and Asia, reflected Hitler over dinner on the 23rd, is not the Ural Mountains but there where the settlements of Germanically inclined people end and unadulterated Slav settlements begin. It is our task to push this frontier as far east as possible, and if need be far beyond the Urals. It is the eternal law of nature that gives Germany as the stronger power the right before history to subjugate these peoples of inferior race, to dominate them and to coerce them into performing useful labors. This project of the ethnic cleansing of Berlin, Vienna, and Prague would also encompass the Jews, but not until the end of Barbarossa. They are all to be transported ultimately to regions adjacent to the Bolshevik rump territory. Dictated Goebbels on the 23rd, the microfiche is only partly decipherable. In the protectorate of Bohemia Moravia a wave of opposition had appeared since Barbarossa. There were slowdowns and stoppages and terror incidents. Rumor reached Hitler that a full-scale uprising was being plotted. Only now do they realize that there is no escape, he said. As long as the great Russia, mother of all Slavs, was there they could still hope. Copen reported Hitler's remarks at lunch a few days later. He keeps repeating that he knows the Czechs of old. To them, Rye Protector, Neurot was just a friendly old duffer whose blandness and good humor they rapidly mistook for weakness and stupidity. The Czechs are a nation of cyclists, they bow from the waist upward, but the legs still kick. One evening at the end of September Otto Brautigam recorded this remark by Hitler in his diary, we found out that the Czech government had issued orders for a boycott on arms production. Output efficiency had generally declined by about 20 or 30 percent, ammunition was being turned out with bad fuses and even the armor plate processed by Skoda was showing flaws that could only be explained by deliberate sabotage. On Bormann's advice Hitler appointed Heydrich acting protector. On September 24, Hitler told him his job would be a combat mission of limited duration and gave him carte blanche. Heydrich flew to Prague on September 27 and arrested the rebel ringleaders, among them General Alois Elias, the Prime Minister. The next day he phoned Himmler, Elias had confessed to being in contact with the Benz government in London. Elias was condemned to death, but Hitler decided he was of more value as a hostage for the Czech's good behavior, and he survived until May 1942. Hitler had briefed Heydrich fully on the future of his protectorate. Heydrich reported this to his local governors in Prague on October 2. One day, he said, the protectorate would be settled by Germans. This does not mean, said Heydrich, that we now have to try to Germanize all Czech rabble. For those of good race and good intentions the matter is simple, they will be Germanized. For the rest, those of inferior racial origin or with hostile intentions, I shall get rid of them, there is plenty of room in the East for them. Inferior but well-meaning Czechs would probably be sent to work in the Reich. The more difficult category, those of good racial characteristics but hostile intentions, would have to be liquidated. Hitler advised Heydrich to introduce the Czech workers to both the carrot and the stick. In any factory where sabotage occurred, ten hostages were to be shot, but in factories with a good output the workers were to get extra rations. Heydrich went much further, introducing the Czechs for the first time to the full Bismarckian social security program. The Czech workers have accepted the liquidation of the conspirators quite calmly, Copen noted when Heydrich first reported back from Prague, over dinner on October 2. The most important thing to them is to have enough food and work. One worker has even written to Heydrich, giving his full name, saying that Czech history has always been like this, each generation has to learn its lesson and then there is peace for a time. He added that nobody would object if another 2,000 of them were shot, either. The Nazis would rise to the occasion. Cold harvest. For Hitler, the last act of Barbarossa, as he thought, had now begun. At 5:30 on the morning of October 2, 1941, Field Marshal von Bock's army group, nearly 2,000 tanks commanded by Guderian, 
Eric Hopner, and Hoth, opened the first phase of Operation Typhoon, the attack on Moscow. Lunch that day at Hitler's headquarters started late as he listened to the early reports on this last battle, designed to destroy Marshal Timish and Go's armies. When the meal began, he was unusually quiet. He broke the silence only to ask about the weather prospects, and then again to reminisce about the Berghof, where even now Bormann's construction crews were carrying out still further architectural improvements to the mountainside. Russia's weather was in no way unpredictable. Indeed, as early as August 14, Jess Connex's deputy, Hoffman von Waldor, had privately written at Luftwaffe headquarters, It is all getting very late. At the end of October, the war will die out in the snow. And on September 9, three days after Hitler issued the directive for Typhoon, Waldor had gloomily predicted, We are heading for a winter campaign. The real trial of this war has begun. My belief in final victory remains. At 1.30 pm on October 3, 1941, Hitler's train arrived in Berlin. He drove to the Sportpalast, where he delivered one of the most stirring speeches of his life, wholly extempore and hence enormously devout, as Huell afterward reported. Hitler was exhilarated by the welcome the capital gave him. It was the same atmosphere as at the most wonderful of our meetings during the years of struggle. The reason was that no special tickets had been distributed. The audience really was a cross-section of the people. The ordinary people really do make the most appreciative audience, they are the people who deep down inside know they support me. They are marked by that kind of stability that can stand the heaviest burdens, while our intellectuals just flutter hither and thither. In his speech he outlined his unifying role in Europe, how Italy, Hungary, the Nordic countries, and then Japan had come closer to Germany. Unhappily, however, not the nation I have courted all my life, the British. Not that the British people as a whole alone bear the responsibility for this, no, but there are some people who in their pig-headed hatred and lunacy have sabotaged every such attempt at an understanding between us with the support of that international enemy known to us all, international jewelry. As in all the years I strove to achieve understanding whatever the cost, there was Mr. Churchill who kept on shouting, I want a war. Now he has it. Within an hour Hitler's train was bearing him back to headquarters. Victory in Russia seemed certain. Guderian was approaching or L. Like two fishermen's nets flung out over the sea. Box armies were hauling in their catches at Vyazma and Bryansk. Another 673,000 prisoners would be found inside. On the Sea of Azov, Rundstedt destroyed the Soviet 18th Army and took another 100,000 prisoners. A grim jocularity overcame Hitler, he began talking freely at mealtimes again, gossiping about the different kinds of caviar and oysters and the mysterious bacteria that had massacred the crabs some decades before. Russia? We are planning big things for our share of the territory, our India, canals and railroads, the latter with a new gauge of 10 feet. The population. Must vegetate. For Stalin's rump empire, beyond the Urals, Bolshevism will be a good thing, our guarantee of their permanent ignorance. Thus wrote we eyes sacker of Hitler's ambitions. At dinner on October 6 Hitler was again in an expansive mood. Major Engel, his ebullient army adjutant, had been bitten by a dog, so Hitler uncorked a stream of witticisms about the fearful consequences if rabies should take hold at his headquarters. Dinner was short, so that the latest newsreel films could be shown. Hitler saw for himself his troops battling forward under General von Manstein, now commanding the 11th Army in the assault on the Crimea, he also saw the Northern Armies frustrating the frantic Russian attempts to relieve Leningrad. By October 7, the Bryansk pocket was completely sealed, and the armored divisions were about to close the other huge ring around Vyazma. Gripped by this military drama, Hitler did not eat that day. Although Himmler was guest of honor, it being his 41st birthday. Huell marveled in his diary, Jodl says, the most crucial day of the whole Russian war, and compares it with Koenigratz. 
intercepted code messages from diplomats in Moscow suggested that the end there was not far off. The Turkish ambassador told of tens of thousands of casualties. For a time, Hitler considered throwing his SS lifeguards a hundred miles forward to Rostov on the Don, the gateway to the Caucasus oil fields. The fact that in the not too distant future we'll have used up every last drop of gasoline makes this a matter of the utmost urgency, Key Eitel told Canaries later in October. General Eduard Wagner, the army's quartermaster general, wrote privately, now the operation is rolling toward Moscow. Our impression is that the final great collapse is immediately ahead, and that tonight the Kremlin is packing its bags. What matters now is that the Panzer armies reach their objectives. Strategic objectives are being defined that would have stood a hair on end at one time. East of Moscow. Dot I keep having to marvel at the Führer's military judgment. This time he is intervening, and one can say, decisively, in the operations, and so far he has been right every time. The major victory in the South is his work alone. On October 8, Jodl repeated his triumphant verdict, we have finally and without any exaggeration won this war. Hitler signed an OKW order forbidding Bock to accept Moscow's surrender, if offered, no German troops were to set foot there the city was to be encircled and wiped out by fire and bombardment. Small gaps might be left on the far side of the Moscow ring, to allow the citizenry to flee eastward into the Soviet lines and increase the chaos there. On the eastern front it had now begun to rain. The coming victory over Russia promised to relieve Hitler of immense strategic burdens. Japan would be free to wade into the United States which would then hardly be in a position to come to Britain's aid in her final fight with Germany. Recognizing this, Roosevelt sent a Royal Harriman to assist Britain's Lord Beaverbrook at a Moscow conference on ways of rushing military support to Stalin. On October 6, Hitler had been handed the decoded text of Roosevelt's letter introducing Harriman to Stalin. Harry Hopkins has told me in great detail of his encouraging and satisfactory visits with you. I can't tell you how thrilled all of us are because of the gallant defense of the Soviet armies. I am confident that ways will be found to provide the material and supplies necessary to fight Hitler on all fronts, including your own. I want particularly to take this occasion to express my great confidence that your armies will ultimately prevail over Hitler and to assure you of our great determination to be of every possible material assistance. Hitler had the text of this letter released throughout the Americas, he also, to the intense irritation of Roosevelt, amended the President's salutation to my dear friend Stalin, and where Roosevelt had prudently concluded with yours very sincerely, the German propaganda text ended with an oily and cordial friendship. Roosevelt had long gone beyond strict neutrality. On September 11 he had ordered the Navy to shoot on sight any warships of the Axis powers encountered in seas the protection of which is necessary for American defense. Admiral Reder implored the Führer to permit German warships to meet force with force, but Hitler remained unconvinced that the military advantages would outweigh the political risks involved in firing back on any U.S. naval attackers. On October 7 the first snow drifted out of the sky onto Hitler's headquarters. The weather gods, wrote General Guderian privately four days later, have made monkeys out of us, first train, then blizzards yesterday morning, frost in the afternoon and at night, and thawing again today. The roads are bottomless and our progress is obviously suffering. On the 16th the fighter pilot arriving at the Führer's headquarters to receive the Knight's Cross announced that six inches of snow was covering the whole countryside. On the 17th the temperature at Leningrad fell to freezing, in the far north it was 27 f below. The next day for the first time the weather was so bad as to prevent any noticeable change in the front lines. Box Army Group was paralyzed by the snow, slush, and slime. Nothing could move except on foot or in the lightest of hand cuts, for the roads were few and far between and it was on these that the Russians now concentrated their defense. Each night the temperatures fell and froze the snow and mud, each morning the thaw set in, and the roads were again impassable. 
As the German troops struggled to advance through this filth and slush they encountered mournful columns of Russians trudging westward into captivity. The columns of Russian prisoners moving on the roads looked like half-witted herds of animals, one of Canaries's aides noted. Barely guarded and kept in order by the fist and whip, these wretched prisoners marched until they were exhausted by hunger or disease, they were then carried by their comrades or left at the roadside. The Sixth Army, Reichenau's, has ordered that all prisoners that break down are to be shot. Regrettably this is done at the roadside, even in the villages, so that the local population are eyewitnesses of these incidents. The population, the report continued, greet the German soldiers as liberators from the yoke of Bolshevism. But there is a danger that this extremely useful mood, which is displayed by their great hospitality and many gifts, will turn into the opposite if dealt with wrongly. The first big SS action against the Jews at Kiev had occurred at the end of September. The report to Canaries by the previously mentioned aide noted, orders are that the Jews are to be resettled. This takes place as follows. The Jews are ordered at short notice to report to specific collecting points with their best clothes and their jewelry on the following night. No distinctions are made as to class, sex, or age. They are then taken to a pre-selected and prepared site outside the town concerned, where they have to deposit their jewelry and clothes under the pretext of having to complete certain formalities. They are led away from the road and liquidated. The effects on the German squads are inevitable, the executions can usually only be carried out under the influence of alcohol. The native population react to this liquidation program of which they are fully aware, calmly and sometimes with satisfaction, and the Ukrainian militia actually take part. There were even protests that some Jews were escaping the net cast by the SS task forces. The origins of the Kiev pogrom are obscure. Whatever the origin, on the last two days of September, 33,771 Russian Jews were executed here. One month later the figure had risen to 75,000. Why was it happening? There are documents which strongly suggest that Hitler's responsibility, as distinct from Himmler's, was limited to the decision to deport all European Jews to the East, and that responsibility for what happened to Russian Jews and to European Jews after their arrival in the East rested with Himmler, Heydrich, and the local authorities there. On September 18, 1941, Himmler wrote to Arthur Grey Iser, the brutal Gauleiter of the Warland, that is, the Polish territories annexed in the German invasion two years earlier. The Führer wishes the Old Reich territory and the protectorate, of Bohemia Moravia, to be cleansed and rid of Jews, from west to east, as soon as possible. As a first step I am therefore endeavouring to transport, this year as far as possible, all the Jews of the old Reich and protectorate into the eastern territories annexed by the Reich in 1939 first of all, next spring they will then be deported still further eastward. The first 60,000, Himmler advised, would be sent to the Lord's ghetto soon to spend the winter there. Heydrich would be in charge of this migration of the Jews. Evidently the second phase, dumping them into Russia itself, could not be begun until the Russian campaign was finished and the military pressure on the railroads was relaxed. Hitler's own attitude is illuminated by an incident at this time. Learning that the Soviets were deporting about 400,000 Volga Germans, and even liquidating thousands of them, Reichsliter Rosenberg proposed transporting all the Jews from Central Europe into the newly occupied Eastern territories as a reprisal, and on September 14 he directed his liaison officer Otto Brauutigam to get Hitler's consent. General Bodenschkatz, according to Brauutigam's diary, believed that transport difficulties would prevent such an operation, finally, wrote Brauutigam, however, I ran into Colonel Schmunt and to my great surprise he, said, that it was a very important and urgent matter that the Führer would certainly take a great interest in. Hitler directed that Ribbentrop's opinion be sought. On the 20th Baron Adolf von Steingrucht, Ribbentrop's representative, submitted the Foreign Ministry's opinion on the Soviet deportation of the Volga Germans and countermeasures against Jews in the occupied Eastern territories. 
he had to record afterward, the Führer has not yet decided, and the next day Köppen recorded that Hitler had decided to reserve reprisals against the Jews for the eventuality of an American declaration of war. Seeing him two days later Dr. Goebbels wrote in his diary only, the Führer's opinion is that bit by bit the Jews must be got out of Germany altogether. Hitler's bald decision was documented in many memoranda over the next months, thus on February 10, 1942, Section D3 of the Foreign Ministry would state, the war against the Soviet Union has meanwhile made it possible to make other territories available for the final solution, that is, the deportation of all Jews from Europe. Accordingly the Führer has decided that the Jews are to be dumped, Abtskoban, not in Madagascar but in the East. Himmler himself would dictate these words to SS Gruppenführer Gottlerberger on July 28, 1942, the occupied eastern territories are being rid of the Jews, Judenfrei. The Führer has rested the execution of this very grave order upon my shoulders. Accordingly nobody can deprive me of the responsibility for this. Whatever Hitler himself had understood by Judenfrei, the endemic Russian Jews had few champions among his subordinates. There was almost no German army opposition to their summary liquidation, even Manstein regarded it as a salutary preventive measure, wiping out the reservoirs of possible partisans before they became active. Reichenau justified it as part of the German mission to rid Europe permanently of the Asiatic Jewish danger. In a message to his troops he proclaimed. In the East each soldier is not only a warrior abiding by the usual rules of war, but also the uncompromising bearer of a pure German ideal and the avenger of the bestialities committed against Germans and related races. This is why the soldier must understand why we have to exact a harsh but just retribution from the Jewish subhumans. This serves the added purpose of stifling at birth uprisings in the rear of the Wehrmacht, since experience shows that these are always conceived by Jews. Hitler considered the proclamation excellent, and Quartermaster General Eduard Wagner circulated it to other commands as an example. No direct report by Himmler or Heydrich to Hitler on the barbarous massacres of Russian Jews that they themselves had witnessed has ever come to light. At supper on October 5, for example, Himmler, who had just returned from an extended tour of the Ukraine during which he had visited Kiev, Nikolaev, and Chisholm, related to Hitler his impressions of Kiev. Werner Köppen, who was a guest at Hitler's table that evening, recorded Himmler's comments, in Kiev. The number of inhabitants is still very great. The people look poor and proletarian, so that we could easily dispense with 80 or 90 percent of them. All the Jews are to be removed, Hitler stated over lunch on the 5th, referring to those still within the Reich. And not just to the general government, Poland, but right on to the east. It is only our pressing need for war transport that stops us doing so right now. Köppen took the note. Himmler drew freely on this higher authority for his operations. To Friedrich Hebelha, the unhappy governor of the city of Lodz where the 60,000 Jews from the Reich were being dumped, Himmler wrote brusquely on the 10th that this was the Führer's will. Hitler's surviving adjutants, secretaries, and staff stenographers have all testified both under penetrating post-war interrogation and in interviews with this author, that never once was any extermination of either the Russian or European Jews mentioned, even confidentially, at his headquarters. Colonel Rudolf Schmund appears to have suspected what was going on, for when Hitler's movie cameraman Walter Frentz accompanied him to Minsk on an outing with stage designer Benno von Arendt. He found himself the horrified witness of a mass open-air execution on August 17, Schmund counseled him to destroy the one color photograph he took, and not to poke his nose into matters that did not concern him. By mid-October 1941, despite the foul weather, Hitler was still fired with optimism. On the 13th he began laying the foundations for a Nazi version of a united Europe. Kuehl wrote, Reich Foreign Minister visits the Führer, first thoughts on the European Manifesto. Probably in the economic sphere first of all, and probably at the beginning of the winter. Führer is in very best and relaxed mood. 
Over dinner he revealed that he had been thinking of calling together the economic experts of Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, Sweden, and Finland. All those who have a feeling for Europe can join in this work, he said, meaning the colonization of the East. When Tot and Gorlita Fritz Sorkel dined with Hitler on October 17, they were brimming with everything they had just seen in the East. Again Hitler dreamed aloud of the vast construction projects whereby he would open up the East. Above all we must lay roads, Copen wrote that night, describing the dinner conversation. He told Dr. Tot he must expand his original projects considerably. For this purpose he will be able to make use of the three million prisoners for the next twenty years. The major roads, the Führer spoke today not only of the highway to the Crimea but also of one to the Caucasus and of two or three through the more northern territories, must be laid across the areas of greatest scenic beauty. Where the big rivers are crossed, German cities must arise, as centers of the Wehrmacht, police, administration, and party authorities. Along these roads will lie the German farmsteads, and soon the monotonous steppe, with its Asiatic appearance, will look very different indeed. In ten years four million Germans will have settled there, and in twenty years at least ten million. They will come not only from the Reich but above all from America, and from Scandinavia, Holland, and Flanders too. And the rest of Europe shall play its part in this opening up of the Russian wastes as well. The Führer then reverted to the theme that contrary to what some people think no education or welfare is to be laid on for the native population. Knowledge of the road signs will suffice, there will be no call for German schoolmasters there. By freedom the Ukrainians understood that instead of twice they now had to wash only once a month, the Germans with their scrubbing brushes would soon make themselves unpopular there. He as Führer would set up his new administration there after ice cool calculations, what the Slavs might think about it would not put him out one bit. Nobody who ate German bread today got worked up about the fact that in the 12th century the granaries east of the Elbe were regained by the sword. Here in the east we were repeating a process for a second time not unlike the conquest of America. For climatic reasons alone we could not venture further south than the Crimea. He did not mention the Caucasus at this point, even now hundreds of our mountain troops on greeted malaria. The Führer kept repeating that he wished he was 10 or 15 years younger so he could live through the rest of this process. At the same time, the next phase of the deportation of Europe's Jews began. The evidence is that Hitler's intention was twofold, to establish a Jewish labor force for his grandiose plans in the East, and to hold them hostage. The Jewish hostage motif appears again late in 1943, there was still no word of massacring them. Hitherto Adolf Eichmann, one of Himmler's leading experts on Jewish affairs, had held regular conferences on the various problems associated with the Madagascar Plan Dash for example, the re-education of professional Jews into the laborers, farmers, and artisans that would be needed in the new island state. On October 18 however Himmler scribbled on his telephone pad the message he had just dictated to Heydrich, no emigration by Jews to overseas. On the 15th the big exodus from Central Europe to the territories farther east had begun. In daily transports of a thousand people, twenty thousand Jews and five thousand gypsies are being sent to the Lord's Ghetto between October 15 and November 8, Heydrich confirmed to him on the 19th. Five train loads of Jews were herded out of Berlin, initially into the Lodz ghetto. Albert Speer was pleased, as he wanted their empty apartments to house the city's slum clearance families. For the time being Himmler kept the Jews alive for the work they could perform, but farther east the Gauleiters had no intention of preserving the unemployable Jews. Our letter dated October 25th in SS files states that Eichmann had now approved Gorlita Loch's proposal that those arriving at Riga should be killed by mobile gas trucks. This initially ad hoc operation gathered momentum. Soon the Jews from the Lord's Ghetto and Greizer's territories were being deported farther east, to the camp at Chelmo. There were 152,000 Jews involved in all and Chelmo began liquidating them on December 8. 
It is possible to be specific about the instigators, because on May 1, 1942 Gray Iser himself would mention in a letter to Himmler that the current special treatment program of the 100,000 Jews in his own Gore had been authorized by Himmler with the agreement of Heydrich. Hitler was not mentioned. Meanwhile, from mid-November 1941 onward, the Reich Spain sent trainloads of Jews, rounded up in Vienna, Brunn, Brno, Bremen, and Berlin, direct to Minsk, while others went to Warsaw, Kovno, and Riga. At Kovno and Riga the Jews were shot soon after. At Minsk the German Jews survived at first, but not for long, the Nazis liquidated 35,000 of the native Russian Jews at Minsk to make space for the newcomers, who were housed in a separate ghetto. The Hamburg ghetto dash indicating the city that the first consignment had come from. A degree of misplaced smugness prevailed among the newcomers, according to Hirsch Smiller, the Jewish communist resistance leader. Abishafu Rasidel, the ghetto's SS overseer, boasted to them. I made room for you by getting rid of 35,000 Russian Jews. The original intention was that unlike the Ostjuden, the German Jews were to start new lives here in the East. Intercepted police messages confirm that each train was well provisioned with food, money, and appliances, Gerat, both for the journey and for the first weeks after their arrival. Wilhelm Kube, Rosenberg's general commissioner of Weitrothenia, would record on July 31, 1942, that 10,000 had been liquidated since the 28th, of which 6,500 were Russian Jews, old folk, women and children, with the rest unemployable Jews largely sent to Minsk from Vienna, Brunn, Bremen, and Berlin in November last year on the Führer's order. Himmler's handwritten telephone notes mention one talk with Heydrich on November 17, 1941 about getting rid of the Jews, twelve days later Heydrich circulated invitations to an interministerial conference on the final solution of the Jewish problem, delayed until January 1942, it became notorious as the 1C conference. No documentary evidence exists that Hitler was aware of what was befalling the deported Jews. His remarks, noted by Bormann's adjutant Heinrich Heimelate on October 25, 1941, indicate that he did not, from the rostrum of the Reichstag I prophesied to Jewry that if war could not be avoided, the Jews would disappear from Europe. That race of criminals already had on its conscience the two million dead of the Great War, and now it has hundreds of thousands more. Let nobody tell me that despite that we cannot park them in the marshy parts of Russia. Our troops are there as well, and who worries about them? By the way, it's not a bad thing that the panic precedes us that we're planning to exterminate Jews. Hitler added however that, just as he was postponing the final reckoning with the turbulent Bishop von Galen until later, with the Jews too I have found myself remaining inactive. There's no point adding to one's difficulties at a time like this. Hans Slammers testified later that this was undoubtedly Hitler's policy, Hitler had confirmed this to him, saying, I don't want to be bothered with the Jewish problem again until the war is over. In most circumstances Hitler was a pragmatist. It would have been unlike him to sanction the use of scarce transport space to move millions of Jews east for no other purpose than liquidating them there, nor would he willingly destroy manpower, for which his industry was crying out. Heinrich Heim recalls one exasperated comment by Hitler told that Allied Radio had broadcast an announcement that the Jews were being exterminated, really, the Jews should be grateful to me for wanting nothing more than a bit of hard work from them. Be that as it may, after Dr. Goebbels published a singularly heartless leading article in Das Reich in mid-November entitled The Jews Are to Blame, Hitler, in Berlin for the funeral of Luftwaffe General Ernst Hüt again urged Dr. Goebbels to modify his policy toward the Jews into one that, as Goebbels noted his words, does not cause us endless difficulties, and he instructed the propaganda minister to show greater humanity toward mixed marriages. Goebbels characteristically began this entry, dated November 22, with the words, on the Jewish problem too the Führer is totally in agreement with my opinions. But clearly he was not.
It was Heydrich and the fanatical Gauleiters in the East who were interpreting with murderous thoroughness Hitler's brutal decree that the Jews must finally disappear from Europe. Himmler's personal role is ambivalent. On November 30, 1941 he took his train over to the Wolf's Lair for a secret bunker conference with Hitler, at which the fate of a train load of 1,035 Berlin Jews was evidently on the agenda. A page from the Himmler file in the Moscow archives lists the Reichsfuhrer's appointments for that day. He received SS Sturmbahn Führer Gunter Dalkn, a Goebbels journalist, from midday to 1 p.m. to report on trip to SS Police Division and Death's Head Division. He worked for an hour, Gearbetet, received General Dietl for a half-hour conference about an SS brigade on the Murmansk front, and lunched until 4 p.m. with Hitler, Mittiges and B. Führer. Himmler's all-important telephone notes, recorded on a different sheet, show that at 1.30 p.m. he spoke by telephone from the bunker dash that is, Hitler's bunker, to Heydrich and dictated the explicit order that the Berlin train load of Jews was not to be liquidated. The extermination program had however gained a momentum of its own. The Goebbels article had been taken as a sign from the highest level. In fact, Nobody needed any orders or written authority. There could be no clearer proof that the former Führer state had become a state without a Führer. 5,000 Jews, including the trainload which had left Berlin three days before, the seventh to leave the capital city, had already been plundered of their valuables and shot to death in pits at Skyrat Orwa, a few miles outside Riga, by 9 a.m. that same morning, November 30th. The different roles of the SS, the army, and Hitler's headquarters in this massacre are now well documented. The 1,035 German Jews, expelled from Berlin by train, had arrived outside Riga that morning in sub-zero temperatures, and they were shot out of hand even before the trucks loaded with 4,000 Jews from Riga arrived and met the same fate. When Colonel Waller Bruns, a local army engineer officer, learned a few hours earlier that he was about to lose his Jewish workforce he weakly protested to the city's German mayor Hugo Wittrock and to his SS stabs litter, Werner Altemeyer, a baby-faced young SS officer with ash blonde hair and grey-blue eyes, then drove out to witness the liquidations in progress for himself. Four years later he still recalled the coarse yelling of the gunman. He could still see in his mind's eye one of the victims, a raving beauty in a flame red blouse. British code intercepts reveal that well provisioned trainloads of Jews are being sent to the east from German cities. But something goes awry, from Hitler's bunker Himmler tells Heydrich, see right, to halt one massacre, and the next day, below, he orders the chief SS murderer at Riga to see him, public record office. I sent two officers out there, one still alive today, Bruns whispered secretly to fellow prisoners in April 1945, because I wanted witnesses. I didn't tell them what was going on. Go to the forest of Skyr at Orwa, I said, take a good look at what's going on, and write it up for me. Bruns protested to his superior, General Alfred Jacob, Chief of the Army Engineers, at Army HQ at Angerberg, I attached an official letter, to the officer's report and took it over to Jacob myself. He said, we've already received a couple of protests from engineer battalions in the Ukraine. The same kind of liquidations had started there. Jacob added, we couldn't really figure out how to bring it to the Führer's attention. Let's do it via Canaries. Vice Admiral Canaries, recalled Bruns, had the rotten job of hanging around for the right moment to drop gentle hints to the Führer, Inescapable for an independent historian in this sordid tale is the cowardice of Bruns and his army superiors, none of whom was eager to sign his own name to the report to the Führer. Hitler's headquarters, far from having issued the order, as Altimeyer had claimed, at once intervened to order a halt to these mass shootings. Two weeks later, Bruns visited the mayor on another matter. Altimeyer was the two and bragged that an order had now come down that there were to be no more such mass shootings, adding the snide comment, Das soll vor sich tigerji macht word and dash it's to be done more circumspectly. On the day after the shootings, December 1st, 
Himmler again telephoned Heydrich at about 1 p.m., this time explicitly about the executions at Riga. Somebody, and this can only have been Hitler himself, had reprimanded Himmler, because that same day, the Reichsfuhrer sent not one but two radio messages to his SS police commander at Riga, SS Obergruppenfuhrer Friedrich Jekeln, warning of punishments for any further arbitrary and disobedient acts. Eigen Mcteigkitten und sie wider hand lungen, which contravened the guidelines laid down by myself or by the Reichsische Heitschorptamt on my orders on how to deal with the Jews who were being outplaced to the Ostland, Baltic provinces. Himmler ordered Jekeln, the recalcitrant mass murderer, to report to his headquarters forthwith. Their interview took place on the 4th, and for many months the multiple shootings of German Jews halted. The significance of this appalling episode can hardly be underestimated. The killings on this scale had simply begun, without orders from the highest level. There were never any such orders. Young the German historians, still groping for the truth at the end of this ghastly century, willingly declare that Hitler must have announced his decision to put to death all Jews within his reach in a secret two-hour address to the fifty-odd Gauleiters and Reichsliters in Berlin on December 12, 1941, the day after he declared war on the United States. If he did, it did not occur to any of the Gauleiters to report the historic fact either at the time, in private papers, or afterwards, in captivity. Even Goebbels, who had urged Hitler to address the party leaders while in Berlin, noted only that as regards the Jewish problem the Führer is determined to make a clean sweep. For the NTH time the vicious little propaganda minister recalled in his diary that 1939 speech in which Hitler had prophesied that Europe's Jews would be destroyed if they brought about another world war. That was not just an empty phrase, dictated Goebbels. The world war is upon us and the destruction of the Jews, de Judentums, must be the inevitable consequence. Let's look at the problem without any sentimentality. Germany's older historians, less fearful than their younger colleagues of their country's modern and repugnant penal measures against divergent historical research, ridicule the idea that Hitler's speech was anything more than a tiresome and hackneyed routine. The lackadaisical tone of these events in Berlin is accurately conveyed by Reichsminister Hans Frank's private papers. Announcing to his general government cabinet on December 16 that Heydrich was calling an important conference in January, on the expulsion of Europe's Jews to the east, Frank irritably exclaimed, Do you imagine they're going to be housed in neat estates in the Baltic provinces? In Berlin Dash and with Hitler back in East Prussia this can only be taken as a reference to Heydrich's agencies Dash they tell us, why the cavilling? We've got no use for them either. Liquidate them yourselves. At about this time, Dr. Goebbels issued a secret directive to editors forbidding them to use the word liquidation in connection with the Nazis' summary executions in the East. The word was to be reserved, he defined for the crimes committed by the Soviets. Historians have searched, and will search, in vain for a clear directive for what has been called since the early 1970s the Holocaust. Taken in the context of the increasingly savage guerrilla war raging behind the Eastern Front, even the topic which Himmler jotted down on his recently discovered agenda for a further meeting with Hitler in East Prussia on December 18, 1941, Jewish problem cannot be safely interpreted as referring to the European context, particularly given what was quite possibly Hitler's decision as recorded by the Reichsfuhrer at the time, als partisan aus Zürotten dash root out, or wipe out, like partisans. By mid-October 1941, Moscow's fate seemed sealed. Guderian had written home optimistically on the 11th, we think we've now destroyed the bulk of the Russian army. What's left can't be much good. But, he added cautiously, we mustn't count our chickens, war often produces ugly surprises. A few days later the first such surprise hit them, an unusually early winter. The natives say it's never come this early in thirty years, Guderian complained on October 15, and added, our troops don't have winter clothing yet, and there's no antifreeze for the motor transport. 
The horses have no stables. Bad weather hit the southern sector too. I'm none too happy with our operations, wrote Field Marshal von Rundstedt to his family on the 14th. The weather's put a stop to everything. In the center box army group founded in an unprecedented autumn morass of mud, rain, and slush. Trucks sank up to their axles and had to be winched out. Of half a million vehicles, suddenly the German army lost 150,000. The enemy was fighting only a few miles from his arms factories and arsenals. As they had withdrawn, they had methodically ripped up every railway track in Thai. The Luftwaffe's deputy chief of staff General Hoffmann von Waldor, who had confidently predicted on October 10, as long as the weather does not continue to deteriorate the enemy will not be able to prevent us from encircling Moscow, followed this with a frustrated entry six days later, our wildest dreams have been washed out by rain and snow. Everything is bogged down in a bottomless quagmire. The temperature drops to 11 degrees, a foot of snow falls, and then it rains on top of the snow. Thus Hitler's bold hopes for the rapid overthrow of Stalin's regime were thwarted by the weather. Over lunch on October 26, he asked to what extent the army's quartermaster had provisioned the eastern armies with winter gear. During the summer Hitler had continually reminded Wagner to see to the army's winter needs. Wagner's private letters indicate that he had only addressed himself to the problem on October 19, but now he assured Hitler that by October 30 both Lieb and Rundstedt would have received half their winter equipment, while the numerically far bigger army group center would have received one-third. He mentioned that the Russians' destruction of the one railway along the Sea of Azov would delay supplies to the south. The Führer was extremely nice and friendly to me, wrote Wagner. In fact, the general staff were more optimistic than Hitler. On October 29th, Wagner noted that an enemy pipeline had been captured, still spewing forth gasoline, and this would enable the tanks to press on into Rostov. Everything else is also moving again, and we're convinced we'll shortly finish off Moscow. Winter however was unmistakably closing in, on October 30th, Admiral Canaries flew into Rosenberg, his plane almost colliding with another in the fog. Hitler ran into him on the way to the map room and asked what weather Canaries had seen at the front. Canaries told him bad. And Hitler gestured with annoyance. The next day snow settled on the wolf's lair too. On November 1st, Hitler spent an hour at General Staff Headquarters, inspecting for himself the winter equipment. Wagner noted, he looked at and listened closely to everything, he appeared fresh and lively and was in a good mood. A mood of restlessness and annoyance beset the Führer however. Already 150,000 men had died since Barbarossa began, a war like this was bound to disrupt the national metabolism. He knew, from radio intercepts, that Churchill was moving heaven and earth to start shipments of arms to Archangel. Hitler hoped that one day the British people's opposition to Churchill's war policies would cause his undoing. This was the reason he gave Colonel Wilhelm Spidel for rejecting the French offers of collaboration, that it would stand in the way of the later concord with Britain. When Redder's chief of staff, Admiral Frick, argued with compelling logic that Britain's military defeat was necessary for any new order in Europe, and that this defeat could only be achieved by concentrating on the submarine war in the Atlantic, Hitler explained that he was even now ready to make peace with Britain as the territory Germany had already won in Europe was adequate for the German people's future needs. Evidently, the Admiral reported, the Führer would be glad for Britain, once the Eastern campaign is over, to show signs of common sense, not that the Führer expects it of Churchill, even if it meant that Germany could not win further ground than she already occupies. The Mediterranean had quietly become one of the most vulnerable areas of Axis operations particularly now that Mussolini's position was threatened by domestic unrest. Hitler sadly reflected that if he could capture Gibraltar it would solve the whole problem with one blow, but without Spain's consent this was impossible. As Rommel's supply predicament worsened, 
Hitler angrily complained that the Wehrmacht commanders had not kept him informed of the worsening situation in the Mediterranean, but this was not true, for Reda had predicted this since early July and had demanded that Goring divert Luftwaffe units to safeguard the Suppoli line to Tripoli. In mid-October Hitler promised Mussolini in a letter that Goring would furnish Luftwaffe support. He explained to Admiral Frick on the 27th, any change of government in Italy would spell the end of the fascist regime, and Italy would unquestionably cross into the enemy camp. Large sections of the Italian public were pro-British. The defection of Italy would moreover lead to the loss of France as well, and hence the defection of Spain. The safeguarding of our continental territory is now our first strategic commandment for the time being, Hitler ordered. Because of this, the active war against Britain must be abandoned, the Schwerpunkt, focus, of U-boat operations must be moved from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. In vain Frick argued that now, with Russia on the verge of collapse, was no time to remove the noose from Britain's neck, and that Italy must do more to escort the supple convoys to Tripoli herself either by sealing off the Straits of Sicily with minefields or by eliminating Malta. In Hitler's view the risk to Italy, to the soft underbelly of Europe, was too real to let the rot in the Mediterranean go on. A test of endurance. In Stalin, Hitler unquestionably now knew, he had met his match. As the Soviet Union's resistance hardened, despite each fresh catastrophe inflicted on its armies, Hitler's admiration for his Bolshevik adversary grew. This Stalin is obviously also a great man, he told his baffled generals. To claim anything else would not make sense. Historians of the future will have to set out from the fact that today's events are governed by the collision or collusion of great, towering personalities whose paths cross like this only once in many centuries. The Wehrmacht had captured over three million Russian prisoners. The Soviet Union had lost most of its aluminium, manganese, pig iron, and coal resources. As soon as Hitler's armies could penetrate beyond Rostov into the Caucasus, Stalin would lose 90% of his oil as well. In Moscow tens of thousands of people were being evacuated. Some of those who had to stay in the capital tried to obtain swastika flags and German dictionaries in anticipation of the city's capture. But for the first two weeks of November the German armies were held mobile by the mud and moor. There were those generals, Erich Helpner among them, who bitterly criticized their army superiors for not giving the Panzer on their head in the October offensive. This overcautiousness, bordering on defeatism, had deprived Hopner of the chance of destroying all the Russian reserve forces as well. Now these reserves augmented by workers from the Moscow factories and freshly arrived Siberian divisions, magnificently equipped with winter gear, were pouring into the capital's defenses. Germany had still suffered no military reverses, and this was a position of strength from which Hitler was willing to envisage offering peace terms to the enemy. In early November, Ribbentrop's diplomatic seismographs detected signs that the Führer wanted peace. Eitzdorf Ribbentrop's liaison officer to the general staff, listed them thus, Ambassador von Bergen is to be replaced at the Vatican by a more active personality, one better able to monitor the peace possibilities coming through there. Everything relating to peace in their, foreign, press is to be carefully collected and immediately submitted. The same procedure is to be followed with regard to Russia's domestic situation. We Isaac held out no hope of peace, however. He told Holder that there was no evidence that Britain was inclined toward a cessation of hostilities, he felt that any moves initiated by Germany would be rebuffed. By the end of the month Hitler knew we eyes Sacker was right. British Foreign Office instructions to ridicule any peace offensive by Hitler reached German hands. The present peace offensive, this document emphasized, comes not, as it was intended to do, at a moment of victory over Russia but when Germany is further away from victory than at any previous time. Hitler reminded one minister arriving in Berlin for the fifth anniversary of the anti comintern pact that Lord Halifax had once bragged of being a strong enough man to ignore the countless letters from all over England demanding peace in 1940. This was proof, said Hitler, 
that the Jewish Bolshevik suicidal forces still had the upper hand in London. Wistfully he added that what irritated him most was that that cretin Churchill was interrupting him in his mighty task of cultural reconstruction. For Hitler, the thrills of war making had long palled, but not for the generals. Holder's private letters home proudly reveled in the advances his army had achieved. Holder commanded Box Army Group to delay its Moscow offensive until the logistics build-up would support a far more ambitious offensive, the Ninth Army would lunge far beyond Moscow toward Kalinin, the Volga Reservoir, and Selizarovo, the Third and Fourth Panzergruppen would make for Vologda, and Guderian's Second Panzer Army was even assigned Gorky as its final objective for the winter. Hitler pocketed his doubts and approved the plans. On November 11th Jodl signed a directive to the army groups setting out these far-flung ambitions to be achieved before the heavy snowfalls began. Holder stoutly defended these aims at a staff conference in Orshaw on November 13th, optimistically counting on six weeks campaigning before winter really closed in. Neither Bock nor Unstedt would hear of such distant objectives, thus a limited advance on Moscow only was finally approved. Had Holder's grand strategy been adopted, Hitler would undoubtedly have lost his entire Eastern army in the catastrophe that shortly unfolded. In fact Hitler was on the horns of a dilemma. He had postponed his assault on the main Caucasus oil fields until 1942, by that time they would probably have been destroyed. But he still showed a curious optimism. Holder wrote, all in all he gave an impression of anticipating that when both warring parties realize that they are incapable of destroying each other there will result a negotiated peace. It was the vision of a second Verdun that kept recurring to Hitler, and the condescending notion that since Stalin had fought well and fearlessly, he should be spared the fate he no doubt otherwise deserved. There was an odd echo of this attitude in Hitler's remarks to his munitions minister, Fritz Tott who returned from a tour of the Russian front on November 29, 1941 and summed up his prognosis thus, given the arms and industrial supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon powers, we can no longer militarily win this war. Hitler calmly inquired, how am I supposed to end it, then? I can't see much possibility of ending it politically. Even before Barbarossa, Hitler had realized that German aircraft and tank production was inefficient. The aircraft industry was beset by prima donna personalities and producing a plethora of outdated aircraft. General Ernst Hudt, the director of air armament, recognized his share of the blame and shot himself in November. To succeed Hudt, Hitler appointed Field Marshal Erhard Milch, Goring's bustling deputy, but it would be 1943 before Milch's appointment could have any real effect. Tank design was different. Here Hitler considered himself an expert. By November 1941 he feared that the tank's useful offensive life would soon be over, this meant that the panzer divisions would have to complete Hitler's program of territorial conquests quickly, which in turn meant building bigger tanks, and in greater quantity, than the British or Russians could. The huge Russian tank output had shaken him badly, when Tot now, on November 29, 1941, told him of two more Russian types that he had examined at Orel, Hitler exclaimed in exasperation, how can such a primitive people manage such technical achievements in such a short time? Nine months had passed since Hitler had called his own first tank design symposium at the Berghof on February 18, 1941. Then he had demanded the modification of their tanks to mount much heavier caliber long-barreled guns. 50 and 75 mm, respectively. On May 26 Hitler had demanded an even heavier gun in future tanks and instructed both the Henschel tank works and Professor Ferdinand Porsche to produce prototypes mounting the 88 mm heavy gun. The orthodox tank designers were aghast, but Hitler pictured to them the morale and physical effect of a direct hit by such a shell on a cast steel tank turret, it would burst asunder, he said. At their conference on November 29, Hitler again warned Tott and Braukich that the age of the tank would soon be passed, he asked them to concentrate on three basic tank designs, a light tank for reconnaissance, like the present Mark III, a medium tank, 
the Mark IV, and a heavy tank, the later Panther, to outclass the Russian T-34. In mid-November 1941 Field Marshal von Bock had resumed his drive toward Moscow. His northern wing began to move on the 15th, followed by the southern wing two days later. All Hitler's commanders had assured him that the Red Army lacked depth, but the enemy's resistance before Moscow was ominously vehement, and he began to suspect that he had again been wrongly advised. He bluntly told the ailing Field Marshal von Braukitsch that it was a question of the army's will to victory. Meanwhile, General von Klist's first Panzer army had managed to seize Rostov on the Don. Sub-zero temperatures gripped the front. The tank engines refused to start, and Reichenau's Sixth Army had found comfortable winter quarters which they were very loath to leave. Ribbentrop came on the 22nd, no doubt to discuss the big demonstration of European solidarity he was about to stage in Berlin. Hitler listened to Ribbentrop's speech on the radio. It was an important address to the ambassadors and foreign ministers of Germany's allies and friendly neutrals. Had the Soviet Union been on the brink of defeat it would have been timely and well chosen, but Ribbentrop made the British government the butt of his leaden witticisms, goaded by the constant and effective British propaganda charge that he as Hitler's foreign minister was to blame for this war. Soon after, Ribbentrop himself phoned, asking if Hitler had liked his speech. The Führer had not, and he was still fulminating against the foreign ministry when his train left headquarters to take him to Berlin at 7 p.m. that evening. In Berlin a round of receptions for the new signatories of the anti comintern pact began. They made a curious bunch. The Hungarians had to be kept apart from the Romanians. Chen O was accorded the same frozen politeness as had been his lot on his recent visit to the Wolf's Lair. The Turks, who had also been invited to join the pact, had refused point blank, from decoded British Admiralty telegrams Hitler knew that Turkey was again playing a double role. Vichy France was not invited to join the pact, as Hitler still evidently hoped to treat with Britain someday at France's expense. A French volunteer legion was now fighting under box command and from decoded American cables the Germans knew that Badain had commended Germany for adhering to the armistice conditions. Hitler had kept his promises, and Badain accordingly supported his plans for a new order, from which he felt that France could only profit. But Hitler's latent resentment had its psychological roots too deep in recent history to be easily overcome, as his surly reply to a letter from the French Marshal showed. Hitler said that Germany's recent execution of French communists in reprisal for the assassination of German officers doing their lawful duty was fully justified. The Führer drew a passionate comparison between what he presented as Germany's restrained presence now in France and the French troops' unruly behavior in the Rhineland between the wars, when they had driven German citizens from the sidewalks with their riding crops, and the rape of more than 16,000 German women had gone unpunished. A major source of discontent in France was that Germany, like France after World War I, was still detaining over a million French prisoners of war. Hitler could not dispense with this labor force, for the German agricultural and armament economy relied heavily on prisoners. Albert Speer, Hitler's chief architect, asked him to provide Russian forced labor for his work in building a new Berlin. Speer lunched with him and showed him the latest scale models of Berlin's new buildings, the vast Great Hall, the office of the Reichsmarschall, and the new stadium. Hitler granted Speer's request for 30,000 Russian prisoners to help in the construction work. The Führer assured Speer that no war was going to keep him from putting these plans into effect. While he was in Berlin, on November 27, Hitler learned that the talks between Japan and the United States had broken down. He now had a private meeting with the Japanese ambassador, General Oshima, who tried unsuccessfully to warn him of the war that was coming. Two weeks later Hitler admitted to his staff that he should have paid closer attention to the cautious hints that Oshima dropped. The United States was evidently having second thoughts about fighting a war in Europe. Several American destroyers had recently been sunk by U-boats, but Roosevelt had shown little firm reaction. As late as December 6, 
Hitler would be shown dispatches from Hans Thompson, his charge Daffy in Washington, listing the reasons why the United States would not declare war yet. This firm evidence that Roosevelt now wanted to avoid armed conflict until his rearmament was ready, persuaded Hitler that war between the United States and Japan might serve his purposes after all, it would tie this powerful enemy down in the Pacific at least throughout 1942, the German attaches in Tokyo warned Berlin that Japan would enter the war before the year was out and that Tokyo would shortly approach Germany for a pact binding each country not to make a separate peace with the United States so long as the other was still fighting. Sure enough, such a request was received by Ribbentrop on the 18th, he agreed in principle, fearing that otherwise Japan might reach a compromise with the United States. For the next week the reports reaching Hitler were conflicting. Then on November 28 he received a telegram from Hans Thompson reporting that Cordell Hull had handed to the Japanese what amounted to an ultimatum which is bound to result in the immediate breakdown of the talks. Hitler discussed the implications of this with his staff, then sent Ribbentrop to inform General Oshima that if Japan did reach a decision to fight Britain and the United States, they must not hesitate, as it would be in the Axis interests. Oshima inquired in puzzlement whether he was to infer that Germany and the United States would soon be at war, and Ribbentrop replied, Roosevelt is a fanatic. There's no telling what he'll do. Ribbentrop then gave the Japanese the assurance they had wanted, if Japan becomes engaged in war against the United States, Germany will of course join the war immediately. The Führer is adamant on that point. Ribbentrop does seem to have had doubts. On the train carrying them both back to East Prussia the next day, November 29, he asked Hitler what Germany's posture would be if Japan attacked the United States. Hitler cast diplomatic niceties aside, if Germany welched on Japan in the event of Japan's attacking the United States, it would be the end of the tripartite pact. The Americans are already shooting at us, so we are already at war with them. Some days passed before Hitler's attention was again called to Japan, for he was virtually incommunicado, touring his army headquarters on the tottering Eastern Front. Only then was he shown the latest telegram from Tokyo. The Japanese had again asked for Germany and Italy to stand at her side. Tokyo's secret instructions to Ambassador Hiroshima in Berlin were couched in even plainer terms. He was to inform Hitler and Ribbentrop confidentially that war between Japan and Anglo-Saxon powers might be ignited quicker than anybody dreams, Oshima saw Ribbentrop forthwith, on December 2nd, and again the next day, but the foreign minister had to prevaricate because he could not reach the Führer. He evidently managed this late on December 4th. That night he asked Rome to approve the German counter-proposal for an agreement and at 4 a.m. he handed to Oshima the agreed text of a German-Italian-Japanese treaty. This more than met Japan's requirements. Our view, Ribbentrop cabled to his man in Tokyo, is that the Axis powers and Japan regard themselves as locked in one historic struggle. Hitler's eyes were of course elsewhere. As winter closed in, barbarous fighting erupted everywhere on the Russian front, where the army's all-out assault on Moscow was beginning. The fighting was of unexampled savagery on both sides. A captured Russian battalion commander related what happened to three Waffen-SS soldiers in his area, when the regiment's commissar, Zyukanin, of the 508th Infantry Regiment, asked an officer what he was fighting for, he replied, for Hitler. So the commissar kicked him in the groin and shot him. Autopsy reports revealed that Russian troops defending the beleaguered Leningrad had resorted to cannibalism. German corpses found behind Russian lines lacked parts of their bodies, although the uniforms nearby were undamaged. The harsh winter took its toll. While the Luftwaffe and SS were adequately provided with clothing for winter warfare, the German army's meager winter supplies were still bottled up by the chaotic railroad system at Minsk and Smolensk far to the rear. German locomotives external gossamer of plumbing and pipe work made them easy prey for the sub-zero winters. Instead of 17 supply trains a day, each army on the Leningrad front was lucky to get one, instead of 18. 
Guderian's second panzer army was getting only three. When at last winter clothing did reach the fighting troops, it was useless against the Russian winter. Many weeks earlier Braukich had paraded before Hitler a dozen soldiers outfitted with the army's special new winter gear. Only now did Hitler learn that those dozen outfits were all the army had. Meanwhile his armies were trapped in blizzards outside Moscow, and were slowly freezing to death. The reverse suffered by the first Panzer army at Rostov on the Don was a bitter pill for Hitler to swallow. An intelligence report confirmed that his own original strategy was what the Soviets had feared most. Marshal Tymoshenko had just delivered a secret speech to the Supreme Defense Council in Moscow. If Germany succeeds in taking Moscow, that is obviously a grave disappointment for us, but it by no means disrupts our grand strategy. The only thing that matters is oil. As we remember, Germany kept harping on her own urgent oil problems in her economic bargaining with us from 1939 to 1941. So we have to do all we can, a, to make Germany increase her oil consumption, and, b, to keep the German armies out of the Caucasus. The Red Army's task now, he said was to throw the Germans back just far enough to destroy the caches of tanks and ammunition it had built up for the Caucasus offensive. How Hitler must have cursed the general staff for having foisted its Moscow campaign onto him. With winter upon him, he had no option but to see it through although the army's reserves were at an end and the physical conditions were brutal in the extreme. How far the army faithfully called his attention to these adverse conditions is controversial even now. The two army group commanders, Bock and Rundstedt, believed that Hitler was not being told the blunt facts. We must face the melancholy fact, Guderian wrote privately, that our superior command has overreached itself, it didn't want to believe our reports on the dwindling combat strength of our troops. It made one fresh demand after another, it made no provision for the harsh winter, and now it's been taken by surprise by the Russian temperatures of minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. We in the army have to put up with horrifying bungling and aimlessness. This lack of civil courage was first brought home to Hitler by the immediate sequel to the loss of Rostov. Klist's frantic warnings about his long exposed left flank and the severe icing conditions were withheld from Hitler. When Klist was forced to withdraw his spearhead, intending to fall back on the Meuse, Hitler had on November 30 vetoed this, Rundstedt, the army group commander, was told to order Klist to defend a line five miles forward of the Meuse. In the course of the evening, Braukic received Rundstedt's uncompromising refusal, if my superiors have no faith in my leadership, I must ask to be replaced as commander-in-chief. Hitler sacked Rundstedt that same night. Hitler backed this order with a personal visit to Klist's battle headquarters at Mariupol, Zdunov, on the Sea of Azov. He took no general staff officers with him, just his adjutants. He had intended sacking Klist, but SS General Sepp Diedrich, whose SS lifeguards division had been in the thick of the fighting, pluckily defended his superiors. Schmunt told Hitler that Klist's chief of staff had now shown him copies of the Panzer Army's frantic signals before the Rostov operation. These messages had accurately predicted this very outcome. Hitler was astonished that they had been withheld from him. He exclaimed, so the Panzer Army saw it all coming and reported to that effect. It bears none of the blame, then. He telephoned Jodl's staff in this vein on December 3rd. Klist's Panzer Army bore none of the blame for the Rostov crisis. Clearly his messages had been suppressed by the general staff. Thus Hitler's confidence in Rundstedt was restored, though characteristically of Hitler the dismissal remained in force. The Rostov setback paled into insignificance against what now occurred at Moscow. General Kluge's powerful 4th Army had begun its big push on December 1st through the forests and swamps west of the capital. On December 2nd, fighting through snowstorms and blizzards, a reconnaissance battalion reached Kimki, on the very outskirts of Moscow, but it was driven back by armed Russian workers. This was the German Army's trauma. Moscow was being evacuated, its streets and public buildings were being mined for demolition. 
Yet by December 4, with temperatures 6 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, both Hopner's tanks and Kludge's infantry were at a standstill. Guderian, visiting the battlefield, found his tank crews still optimistic. But Field Marshal von Bock warned the OKW that his troops would soon be able to proceed no farther. If the attack is not called off, he warned Jodl, it will be almost impossible to go over to the defensive. On the 5th, Guderian, up at the forefront of his army with the 296th Infantry Division, realized that his own attack was hopeless too. His chief of staff recorded in his diary, 25 degrees below zero this morning. Tank turrets frozen solid, frostbite taking heavy toll, artillery fire has become irregular as gunpowder evidently burns differently. As the hours passed, the temperature sagged to 35 degrees below zero. On December 5th four Soviet armies opened their counter-attack north of Moscow. Next day ten more armies fell upon box exhausted and frozen troops. Thus the real emergency began. The Luftwaffe was grounded. Gasoline fires had to be lit in pits under the tanks to thaw out the engines. The telescopic gun sights were useless, and every caliber of gun and cannon jammed. The Russians used special winter oils and lubrication techniques, and now their formidable T-34 tank appeared en masse with its armor impregnable to the standard German 37mm anti-tank shell. From the depths of Russia, undreamed of masses of humanity were hurled against us, recalled an OKW staff officer. I can still see the situation maps of the next days and weeks, where until now the blue of our own forces had dominated the picture, with the enemy's red only sparsely sketched in. Now from Leningrad right down to the sea of Azov thick red arrows had sprung up on every sector of the front, pointing at the heart of Germany. Meanwhile the paraphernalia of modern war congealed into frozen impotence. If battle casualties were not dragged under cover, they were dead within half an hour from exposure. On the 9th, one corps reported 1500 cases of frostbite, 350 men had had to have limbs amputated. 1100 army horses perished every day. In wave after wave of densely packed soldiers, the enemy offensive rolled across the snowscape toward us. Our machine guns hammered away at them without let up, you could not hear yourself speak. Like a dark and somber carpet a layer of dead and dying stretched across the snow in front of us, but still the masses of humanity came on at us, closer and closer, seemingly inexhaustible. Only when they came within hand grenade range of us did the last of these attacking Russians fall to our machine guns. And then, as our gunners began to breathe again, there was a fresh stir in the distance, a broad dark line on the horizon, and it all began again. Thus a German officer described the rearguard actions north of Moscow. Even a healthy commander would have quailed inwardly before such an onslaught but Field Marshal von Braukic was already a sick man. On December 6 he tendered his resignation. Hitler replied that he could not agree to any change at this moment. Braukic left the room without a word. Who could replace him? Colonel Rudolf Schmunt urged Hitler to become his own army commander-in-chief. Hitler said he would think it over. In fact he had already begun to act the role, or rehearse it. By early December 7 it was obvious that the corps holding the embattled salient at Teichwin was in danger of being encircled. Hitler decided to abandon the city, which was ruined anyway, he did not consult Braukic at all. Holder sorrowfully wrote in his diary, the commander-in-chief, Braukic, is barely even used as postman now. The Führer deals over his head with the army group commanders direct. The terrible thing is, however, that the high command does not grasp the condition our troops are in, and is relying on patchwork operations where only bold decisions can be of use. Toward midnight that Sunday evening, December 7, 1941, the buzz of conversation was stilled as Hitler's press chief, Otto Diedrich, burst in. Hitler asked irritably at him, but saw that Diedrich was waving a paper. The British press agency Reuters had just announced that the Japanese had launched an airstrike at the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Hitler joyously proclaimed, 
the turning point. He bounced out of the bunker and ran through the darkness, hatless and unescorted, to show the news bulletin to Ki Itel and Jodl. To all their hue he rejoiced, now it is impossible for us to lose the war, we now have an ally who has never been vanquished in three thousand years, and another ally, referring to the Italians, who has constantly been vanquished but has always ended up on the right side. Even without formally declaring war, Hitler issued to the Admiralty orders that German submarines and warships might forthwith open fire on American ships as and where they met them. He phoned Goebbels to announce that he was coming to Berlin. Before he left for the capital, on the evening of the 8th, he discussed at length with his staff how best to declare war on the United States so as to make a good impression on his own people. In Washington the mood was reported to be grave. Late on the 8th, the west coast of the United States was panicked by a false air raid warning, followed the next noon by an alert on the Atlantic seaboard. Hitler scoffed some weeks later, Roosevelt declares war, sick. He drives Belmel out of Washington because of air raid dangers, onto his estate, then back to Washington. He makes his whole country hysterical, the way he goes on. The Führer arrived in Berlin at 11 a.m. He is filled with joy at this fortunate turn of events, recorded Goebbels after visiting him, meaning Japan's surprise attack on America. He was taken completely by surprise and, like myself, at first didn't dare to believe it. The Japanese had adopted precisely the right tactics, the Führer is rightly of the opinion that in modern warfare it is wholly out of date, even medieval, to issue an ultimatum. Once you make up your mind to defeat an enemy, you should wade right in and not hang around until he's braced himself to take your blows. To Hitler this was the delicious moment when he could deliver to that Laut Roosevelt the public smack in the eye he deserved. Late on the 9th Germany instructed her Washington embassy to burn its secret files and code books. The foreign ministry furnished Hitler with a list of all Roosevelt's violations of neutrality. Shortly after 2 p.m. on the 11th Ribbentrop read out Germany's declaration of war to the American charge in Berlin, now President Roosevelt had the war he had been asking for, he concluded. Yet deep within, misgivings were gnawing at the Führer. Major von Below, who had met him at the railroad station, found him uneasy about the long-term consequences of Pearl Harbor. Ribbentrop also professed, later, to have been distraught at the manner in which the tripartite pact, which had been drafted to keep the United States out of the war, had now brought her into direct confrontation with the Reich. Speaking to the Gauleiters on December 12, Hitler admitted that he had spent several sleepless nights chewing over the decision whether to declare war on Roosevelt or not. He dismissed the German army's difficulties on the Eastern Front as an unavoidable hitch and he hoped that the Western plutocracies, reluctant to lose their possessions in the Far East, would now fritter away their forces around the globe. Despite the strategic benefits Hitler was heard to mutter, I never wanted things to turn out like this. Now they dash meaning the British dash will lose Singapore. After he had returned to the wolf's lair, with the Barbarossa campaign on the brink of its first winter crisis, he made to all the Hule this remark, how strange that with Japan's aid we are destroying the positions of the white race in the Far East, and that Britain is fighting against Europe with those swine the Bolsheviks. Far from Hitler's war, the Japanese suddenly attack on the US Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor. It comes as a bittersweet surprise to him, National Archives. Hitler takes command. In the dark months of that win too Hitler showed his iron determination where his generals saw an ignominious withdrawal as their only salvation, he told them to stand firm until the spring thaw arrived to halt the enemy offensive. When they demurred, argued, and disobeyed, Hitler dismissed and disgraced them, and himself took command of the German army, until a new spirit gradually prevailed along the Eastern Front. Hitler's powers to influence were remarkable. Soon hardened commanders were swearing they had seen Hitler in the thick of battle dash we thought it was all over, but then the Führer toured our sector calling for one last ounce of effort from us, and we pulled through. But many more months would pass before he risked leaving his headquarters. 
I had to act ruthlessly. I had to send even my closest generals packing, two army generals, for example, whose strength was gone and who were at the end of their tether. In winter one of them came and announced, Mein Führer, we can't hold on any longer, we've got to retreat. I asked him, Sir, where in God's name are you thinking of retreating to? How far? Well, he answered, I don't really know. Dash do you plan to drop back thirty miles? Do you think it isn't all that cold there, then? And do you imagine your transport and supply problems will be any better there? And if you retreat, do you intend to take your heavy weapons with you, can you take them? This man answered, no, it can't be done. Dash so you're planning to leave them to the Russians. And how do you think you're going to fight further back if you haven't got any heavy weapons? He responded, Mein Führer, save at least the army, whatever happens to its guns. So I inquired, are you planning just to retreat to the Reich frontier, or what? Where do you plan to call a halt? Well, Mein Führer, he rejoined, we probably won't get any choice. I could only tell these gentlemen, get yourself back to Germany as rapidly as you can, but leave the army in my charge. And the army is staying at the front. The Soviet counter-offensive had torn open a 30-mile wide gap between Kludge's and Guderian's armies. More and more Russian troops and tanks poured through the breach. The most effective anti-tank weapon, the redhead shell with a hollow charge warhead, which Hitler had first seen demonstrated on November 25th, had immediately been embargoed by him to keep it secret from the enemy. The fear of Russian captivity, and the lack of weapons, fuel, fodder for the horses, and reserves, produced in his troops a crushing sense of inferiority. We have seriously underestimated the enemy, the size of his country and the vagaries of the climate, Guderian gloomily wrote on December 10, and now we're paying for it. Hitler sent the army's ailing commander-in-chief von Braukic to the Moscow front to see the situation for himself. Guderian met him on December 14 at Roslevel, he wrote afterward, it took a 22 hours drive through the blizzard to reach him. Braukic ordered Guderian to hold the line forward of Husk, but like Bock and Kludge the tank commander knew only one solution, retreat while the going was still good. Hitler turned a deaf ear on them all. I can't send everybody home just because army group center is beginning to leak, he argued, and he was encouraged by anguished appeals from the other sector commanders not to let a wholesale rout begin. Army group center's most urgent need was for reserves. Late on December 14 Hitler ordered Jodl to find out how much could be scraped together in the Reich. General Friedrich Fromm explained that his replacement army had a number of divisions under training. Half an hour after midnight Hitler ordered Fromm to come to the Chancellery. The general undertook to raise four and a half divisions at once, equipped with winter clothing and skis. At 1 p.m. the next day Hitler telephoned Field Marshal Lieb, who was now asking permission to pull back his army group, north, to the Volkhoff River. Hitler pointed out that this would enable the Russians to pour more troops and supplies into Leningrad. As his special train left Berlin that evening, Hitler drafted his first halt order to the Eastern Front. Any large-scale retreat by major sections of the army in midwinter, given only limited mobility, insufficient winter equipment, and no prepared positions in the rear, must inevitably have the gravest consequences. The Fourth Army was ordered not to fall back one foot. This controversial order was hotly debated during the night. Losberg argued that it was time for strategic command of the war to be delegated to an acknowledged expert like General von Manstein. Jodl, emerging from Hitler's conference car, revealed quietly, the Führer has already decided on a different way of resolving the command problem. It was 11 a.m., December 16, when Hitler arrived back at the Wolf's Lair. His halt order was dictated to Bock over the telephone by Halder at 12.10 p.m. to the visiting Dr. Goebbels he confided that day that he had decided to replace all three army group commanders, they all had stomach ailments, he scoffed. Perhaps he was using the term Magine Crank sarcastically. 
Hitler no longer trusted Braukic's judgment. He had his chief adjutant, Rudolf Schmundt, flown to the Moscow front, Schmundt returned with an accurate account of Guderian's litany of worries, told him in an hour-long conference on Orel airfield. At last the truth was reaching Hitler. Waiting for the Führer to telephone him about reinforcements that evening, Guderian wrote to his wife, Heaven knows how we're going to extricate ourselves. I'm just glad that the Führer at least knows what's happening, and I hope he'll come to grips with his customary verve with the bureaucratic wheels of the War Department, Railroad, and other machinery. I lie awake at night tracking my brains about how I can help my poor men, who have no protection against this fierce winter weather. Toward midnight Bock telephoned Schmund with the text of his own three-day-old reports to Braukic. It read, the Führer must decide for himself whether my army group must stand and fight, thereby risking its total destruction, or retreat, entailing precisely the same risk. If he decides on retreat, then he must realize that it is unlikely that enough troops will ever get back to the new line to hold it, and that it will be unprepared for them and not all that much shorter. Braukic had suppressed this report rather than show it to Hitler. Over the phone Bock now added that his 267th Infantry Division had that very day been forced to abandon its entire artillery in the retreat. Hitler telephoned him in person. In this situation there is only one answer, and that is not to yield one inch, to plug the gaps and hold on. Bock grimly replied that his front might cave in any moment. Hitler responded clearly, that is a risk I must just take. There is only one thing that ails our front, he explained to Braukic and Halder a few moments later. The enemy just has more soldiers than us. This was why they must rush the simplest reinforcements, riflemen, each provisioned with eight or ten days canned food, alcohol, and chocolate, by train to the Russian front. A thousand trucks must be supplied to Bok as well, and two thousand SS troops must be flown east from Krakow. At 3 a.m. he telephoned Guderian with details of the reinforcements. Later that day, December 17, General von Richthofen came to the Wolf's Lair with Goring. The Luftwaffe Corps commander wrote in his diary. Jess Connick and I went in to see the Führer. He's a bundle of nerves, but clear-headed and confident. I kept emphasizing that what matters now is keeping our troops alive and fighting where they are. What the front lacks is riflemen, winter gear, and food, but above all the will to stand fast. I emphasized the need for him to appeal to each soldier in person, then it will be all right. The Führer listened with enormous interest and concentration. He's planning a major proclamation. Reichsmarschall, Goring, and I were very persuasive. Führer swears loudly about the army commanders responsible for many of the foul-ups is grappling with big reshuffle. Hitler himself signed the order that now went out to the Eastern Front. Major withdrawal movements cannot be made. They will result in the complete loss of heavy weapons and equipment. Under the personal leadership of commanders and officers alike, the troops are to be forced to put up a fanatical resistance in their lines, regardless of any enemy breakthrough in their flanks and rear. Only this kind of fighting will win the time we need to move up the reinforcements I have ordered from the home country and the West. This was no time to respect personal feelings. Hitler ordered Field Marshal von Kludge to take over Army Group Center. Hitler attached no blame to Bock and asked Schmunt to make this plain to the Field Marshal. Less cordial was his parting with Field Marshal von Braukic, the Army's Commander-in-Chief. The impression he had gained on his visit to Rundstedt's army group two weeks earlier, that facts were being withheld from him, was confirmed by the inexplicable suppression of Bock's alarming message of the 13th. Later in December, Hitler issued a basic order to all Wehrmacht commands, reminding them of the need to respect such reports as an indispensable instrument of leadership. It is the duty of every soldier to report unfulfilled orders and his own errors truthfully and to report without exaggeration or dangerous embellishment. More serious were the recent indications of Braukic's inability or reluctance to execute Hitler's orders. By December 19, 
his mind was made up, he would follow Schmunt's advice and take command of the army himself. He knew of no general capable of instilling the National Socialist spirit into the army, he explained to Braukic in a loud voice that day, and he added almost inaudibly, we shall remain friends. Halder would have to carry on as before, while Keitel assumed the ministerial functions of the war ministry. It surprised many that Halder had not shared the fate of Braukic, but Hitler needed the chief of general staff for his ability and experience and the ambitious general learned to swallow his aversion as a professional to the upstart dictator. Meanwhile, Hitler and Schmund composed an order of the day to the soldiers of the army and the Waffen SS, our country's struggle for freedom is approaching its climax. We are faced by world-shaking decisions. The prime bearer of the struggle is the army. As of today I have therefore taken command of the army myself. As a soldier in many battles of World War I, I share deeply with you the determination to win through. Adolf Hitler General Guderian was the next to go. It had slowly dawned on his superiors that he was preparing his second Panzer Army's retreat, this was clear to Halder from the way the tanks were being regrouped around Orl and the army was being echeloned in depth. Kludge, who had succeeded Bock, was no friend of Guderian, and when the latter arrived at Hitler's headquarters on December 20 Kludge telephoned Halder and Schmunt to warn them that Guderian had lost his nerve. Guderian dramatically set out to the Führer the condition of the Second Panzer Army. His troops were exhausted and outnumbered, it was impossible to dig in, as the ground was frozen solid. Hitler reported, then use your heavy artillery or mortars to blast out craters and install trench heaters in them. At one stage he caustically inquired of Guderian, do you believe that Frederick the Great's grenadiers enjoyed dying for their country I there? Guderian for his part hinted that it was high time for Hitler to rid himself of chair-bound experts like Keitel, Jodl, and Halder, who had never seen the front line. He flew back to Orl the next day and briefed his commanders on Hitler's renewed halt order. But his tank's stealthy withdrawal still continued. Finally, on December 25, Kludge refused to work with Guderian any longer, one or the other of them must leave. Shortly before midnight Hitler telephoned Kludge back, Guderian was being relieved of his command forthwith. Having assumed command of the German army, Hitler was buried by an avalanche of work. For weeks on end he knew no regular routine. The tea party in his bunker now never started before midnight. Once that winter it started after 2 a.m., which meant that his weary partners were unable to retire to bed before 4 or 5. Hitler slept in his bunker, with the ventilation system humming all night and the draft blowing on his head. Christmas at his headquarters was always a cheerless affair, very different from that celebrated at the Berlin ministries, for example. Hitler received his staff in turn, handed them an envelope containing a small sum of Reichsmarks, and sometimes sent them a packet of coffee with a typed note of good wishes. Huell wrote in his diary on the 24th, a dispirited Christmas. Führer's thoughts are elsewhere. No candles lit. Two days before, Hitler had learned from Kludge that the general staff were sending hundreds of half-frozen troops by air to Smolensk without weapons or winter gear. He had shouted into the telephone, another Schwinnerei. Kludge warned him, I have a feeling we shall be facing a major decision tomorrow. Hitler lifted the embargo on the redhead hollow charge anti-tank shells. A fragment of another famous diary, that of Kinneries, graphically portrays the atmosphere. December 24, 1941 General Schmunt is drawing comparisons with 1812 and talks of the moment of truth for National Socialism. The equipment losses are horrifying, trucks, guns, and aircraft have to be destroyed or abandoned because we lack the fuel to bring them back. All this has a grim effect on our soldiers' fighting morale, as they suddenly realize that they are being badly led. The Führer's actions, retiring von B. Raukic, and a number of commanders, are quite right and have befallen those who are by no means blameless, whatever people may say about them.
Our own treatment of Russian prisoners is having awful consequences. In the retreat from Moscow we had to abandon German field hospitals as well. The Russians dragged out the sick and injured, hanged them upside down, poured gasoline over them, and set them on fire. On another occasion German prisoners were beheaded and their heads laid out to form the SS symbol. When the International Red Cross now proposed that both sides return to the accepted conventions, Hitler refused, telling Key Eitel and Jodl that he did not want his troops to get the idea that the Russians would treat them decently in captivity. The year's end had come. The dam on the Eastern Front might break at any moment. Kludge was again asking for withdrawals, and Hitler was grimly observing that they might just as well fall back on the Dnieper or even the Polish frontier. Hitler related to the field marshal how as a simple infantryman in Flanders he and his comrades had withstood ten days of ceaseless bombardment and nevertheless had held the line. Kludge rejoined that Hitler had not been fighting at minus 25 degrees. My corps commander has told me that if the 15th Infantry Division is ordered to stand fast, the troops are so exhausted they will not obey. Hitler angrily said, if that is so, then it is the end of the German army and he ended the conversation. None of Hitler's staff would forget the New Year's Eve that followed. Throughout the day Kludge had been on the phone to General Halder, begging for permission to withdraw, Hitler flatly refused. Any strategic retreat was bound to touch off a general collapse, he demanded a fight to the finish in order to win time until the reinforcements arrived. Supper was again served late. Hitler dozed off afterward, exhausted while the last minutes of the old year ticked away. His staff gathered expectantly in the mess and waited for him. But at 11.30 Kludge phoned urgently from the front, and for the next three hours, the time is graven in the diaries of Bormann, Kuehl, and the army group itself, Hitler wrangled with the field marshal, arguing and cajoling on the need to stand fast. Hitler refused outright to grant Kludge freedom to withdraw what amounted to a 90-mile section of the front over 20 miles. Not until 2.30 a.m. did Hitler arrive for tea with his intimate staff. I am glad I know how to overcome even the greatest difficulties, he said. Let's hope 1942 brings me as much good fortune as 1941. The worries can stay. So far the pattern has always been this. The hardest times come first, as a kind of preparation for the really great events. In the corner the phonograph was playing Bruckner's seventh, but nobody was in the mood for it. Hitler's private secretary, Christa Schroeder, wrote two weeks later. On New Year's Eve we were all in a cheerful enough mood at supper in the number two mess. After that we were ordered over to the regular tea session, where we found a very weary chief, who nodded off after a while. So we accordingly kept very quiet, which completely stifled what high spirits we had been able to summon up. After that the chief was away for three hours in conference, while the menfolk who had been mustered to offer New Year greetings hung around with doom-laden faces not daring to allow a smile to pass their lips. I just can't describe it, at any rate it was so ghastly that I broke down in tears in my bunker and when I went back to the mess I ran into a couple of the lads of the escort command, who of course saw at once that I had been crying, which set me off all over again, whereupon they tried to comfort me with words and alcohol, successfully. We all sang a sea shanty at the tops of our voices dash at anchor off Madagascar, and we've got the plague aboard. Hitler's rigid leadership stabilized the front for long enough. In mid-January 1942 he could authorize Kludge to withdraw the more exposed sections of his army group. By now a new defensive line had been prepared, reserves were arriving, warm clothing had been contributed by the German public, and most of the heavy equipment could be salvaged in time. The winter crisis had been mastered. But the cost in officers was high, ousted by Hitler poor encourager lay orders. General Otto Forster the engineer general who had already incurred Hitler's displeasure once in a 1938 dispute over fortifications, was dismissed for withdrawing his corps, Field Marshal von Reichenau died of a stroke, Bock, miraculously recovered, was appointed to replace him at Army Group South, General Hans von Sponeck, 
who had abandoned Kirch, was sentenced to be shot, though Hitler commuted this sentence. General Hopner, who prematurely withdrew his Panzergrupp to the winter line on January 8, was dismissed from the army in disgrace. Outraged at the loss of his well-earned pension rights, Hopner instituted a lawsuit against the Reich in the Berlin courts and won. Hitler declared himself above the law and summoned the Reichstag on April 26 to endorse a decree to that effect. The decree gave him powers over every person in the Reich regardless of their so-called well-earned rights. It puzzled many Germans that an absolute dictator should need to arrogate seemingly superfluous powers to himself, but as Goebbels learned, Hitler's aim was to legalize in advance the radical steps he planned against reactionaries, civil servants, lawyers, and certain sections of the officer corps. Throughout December and January 1942, Intelligence reports had trickled into Hitler's headquarters indicating an Anglo-American plan to invade northern Norway in the spring. The sources were ominously similar to those proven accurate in the anxious spring of 1940. He suspected that the enemy had secretly promised Narvik to Sweden. With this in mind Hitler ordered the reinforcement of his fleet in Norway. The battleships Scharnhorst and Neisnau had been bottled up at Brest on France's Atlantic coast since the spring, and had been regularly crippled by bomb damage ever since. Hitler was impatient at their enforced idleness. On December 26 his naval adjutant put to him the Admiralty's request for extra air support for their next exercises. This was the last straw. I was always a champion of big ships before, Hitler announced. My heart was in them. But they've had their day. The danger of air attack is too great. He sent for Reda to discuss withdrawing the battleships, to Norway, where they would have a new lease on life. On December 29 he told Reda to bring them back from Brest. Since routing them around the British Isles would invite certain disaster, Hitler suggested taking the warships back through the English Channel. Hitler explained to his naval adjutant on January 4 that surprise was of the essence. Any steps which might somehow alert the British are to be avoided, the adjutant noted. If the withdrawal comes off he would like to see every possible ship transferred to Norway. This is the only step likely to have a deterrent effect on the British. Since Churchill has stated that the British still have the bloodiest sacrifices to bear, he considers an invasion of Norway quite likely. Vice Admiral Otto Siliax insisted on reaching the 17 mile wide Dover Straits at high noon, this was inevitable if the warships were to slip out of Brest under cover of dusk. Red Air was unhappy about the whole venture, but the alternative, scrapping the big ships altogether, did not bear thinking about. The attempt would be made in one month's time. It was probably not until February 1942 that Hitler could form a realistic picture of the Moloch of defeat from which he had snatched his army. The army had counted 112,627 frost victims by February 20, of which no fewer than 14,357 were amputees. Barbarossa had now cost the German forces close to 1 million casualties, including 200,000 dead. The bitterness within the army's ranks was directed however not at Hitler but at his generals. One vivid narrative by an ordinary soldier filtered up through SS channels to Bormann. His battalion had marched about aimlessly for some 300 miles before being hurled into action on the Dunnitz. Too late and without any heavy guns, without even a single anti-tank gun our battalion was thrown into the breach as a so-called stopgap force. The Russians came at us of course, with heavy tanks and enormous masses of infantry and pushed us back. Our machine guns wouldn't fire because of the bitter cold, and our ammunition ran out. Meantime the entire front was beginning to cave in, about 60 miles across. Everywhere troops were flooding back in disorder, losing their heads. In vain officers confronted them at pistol point trying to restore order in this chaos, panic had broken out everywhere. You saw scenes we had never witnessed even with the Russians, and only rarely with the French in France, columns of troops streaming back, often several abreast on one road, steel helmets, guns, gas masks, and equipment littered the whole area. 
hundreds of trucks set on fire by our own troops because they could not move them for lack of gasoline or because of the frost and snow drifts, blazing ammunition dumps, clothing stores, food depots. The roads of retreat were strewn with dead horses and broken down vehicles. Upon this scene of chaos the pounced German dive bombers, adding the final touches of perfection to the destruction. Shapeless huddles of misery, swathed in blankets, their legs wrapped in rags and bandages, hobbled along the roads looking like something from scenes of Napoleon's retreat. For four days our battalion fought on, screening this hideous retreat. By the fifth day the Russian tanks had overtaken us, shot us to pieces, and wiped out the rest of our battalion. I myself escaped the tanks, which took a fiendish pleasure in hounding down each of our men until he was flattened beneath its tracks, by running into a deep pit where the snowdrifts barred the tank's pursuit. We, the survivors of this catastrophe, concluded this soldier, have only one wish, that the Führer wreak a terrible judgment on the guilty ones. Hitler's thoughts were already with the coming spring offensive. He hoped to begin advancing army group south into the Caucasus late in April. As he explained to the Japanese, from whom he concealed few of his true ambitions, a southern thrust rather than the capture of Moscow offered many advantages, it would cure the oil problem, it would keep Turkey neutral, and if all went well the autumn might see the way Macht advancing on Baghdad. He disclosed his plan to von Bock on January 18 before he flew out to take command of his army group south at Poltava, 700 miles away. Hitler already realized that the war would continue into 1943, on February 9, Goring conferred with him on responsibility for the prompt provision of locomotives for the winter of 1942-43, the equipment was to be of a kind capable of surviving the Russian winter. Germany's allies were initially unenthusiastic about a spring offensive. Field Marshal Key Eitel in an undoubted feat of diplomacy however persuaded both Romania and Hungary to increase their contingents on the Eastern Front. Italy also agreed to send more divisions east. Bulgaria, strongly sympathetic to Russia, remained non-aligned. Her king, although an admirer of Hitler's, was pleased that he asked nothing more of Bulgaria's army than that it dissuade Turkey from foolish undertakings. Turkey's feelings were evidently warming toward Hitler anyway, even as the spring thaws melted northward across Russia, the Turkish president privately assured Franz von Papen that he was as convinced as ever of Germany's ultimate victory. Learning from Vorschung samt intercepts that a disgruntled Britain was discontinuing her arms supplies to Turkey, in April Hitler agreed that Germany would supply the Turks with tanks, guns, submarines, and aircraft. Neutral nations and Germany's allies were not the only ones demanding the products of the German arms industry. Seated in his private plane on December 3, while flying to the Eastern Front, Hitler had dictated to munitions minister Fritz Tott a three-page decree ordering the simplification and expansion of arms production. Basically, future arms manufacture was to be concentrated in the most efficient factories, turning out standardized and unsophisticated weapons by mass production means. Tot initiated a radical reform of the arms industry's structure. On January 10, 1942 Hitler ordered the industry to revert to its earlier preferential treatment of the army's needs at the expense of the Luftwaffe and Navy, although the long-term objectives remain unaltered, that is. The focus of the fighting effort of the latter two services was to be directed against the Western Allies. Later in January, Tot outlined his proposed reforms to Hitler, the arms combines would supervise their own projects, and a fixed contract price system would be introduced. On February 7 Tot dined with him, by 9.45 am next morning he was dead. His child remains lying in the wreckage of his Heinkel which had crashed on takeoff at Rosenberg. Hitler was desolate at the loss. He ordered the air ministry to design a cockpit recorder, to install in future planes, to register the cause of any accidents. Hitler returned to Berlin to bury Tot. These were momentous hours. As his train pulled into the Rye capital, his battleships were in the English Channel. 
at noon they would be passing through the Straits of Dover. In the Far East, the final Japanese assault on Singapore, bastion of the British Empire, had just begun. It looked like the end of India, too. By the early hours of February 13, the German fleet's strategic withdrawal from the Atlantic to northern waters had been successfully completed. The Schkarnhorst had reached Wilhelmshaven, despite damage from two mines. The Neisnau had reached Kiel, also dented by a mine. The Prince Eugen had got through unscathed. In the air battles the British had lost 20 bombers, 16 fighters, and 6 torpedo planes, Adolf Galland had lost only 7 fighters. The London Times commented, Nothing more mortifying to the pride of sea power has happened in home waters since the 17th century. Hitler, who had trembled for the safety of our ships, as Goebbels witnessed, now breathed again. Next day Hitler spoke to 10,000 newly commissioned lieutenants assembled in Berlin's Sportpalast. The photographs show him, looking stern, and flanked by Key Eitel, Milch, and Himmler, gripping the lectern. As he left the platform a thunderous cheering broke out, and out of the clamor swelled 10,000 young voices united in the national anthem. The next evening his train bore him back toward his headquarters in East Prussia. Toward midnight, Joachim von Ribbentrop came along the swaying corridor with news that Churchill had just broadcast the announcement of the fall of Singapore. To Fräulein Schroeder the Nazi foreign minister dictated a gloating draft communique for the press to publish next morning. Hitler shook his head, and advised Ribbentrop, we have to think in terms of centuries. Who knows, in the future the yellow peril may well be the biggest one for us. He tore the document in half. Hitler's word is law. The first half of 1942 was again to bring the Soviet Union to the brink of defeat. The German soldiers' self-confidence had been restored, with the Führers prodding they had mastered the terrors of the Russian winter, where even a Napoleon had failed. At the end of February the foreign diplomats in Berlin were informed that the Führer had now decided to fight to the bitter end. Initially, as Hitler's secretary vividly described, the mood at his headquarters upon his return from Berlin was bleak. After two days of warmer weather the temperature suddenly dropped again, she wrote on February 27, 1942. The chief is always dog-tired, but he won't go to bed, and this is often a torment for the rest of us. We used to play records most evenings, and then you could fall back on your own thoughts, but since Tot's unfortunate and the music evenings have been few and far between, and as his D-circle always consists of the same faces, there is no stimulus from outside and nobody has any personal experiences to relate, so the conversation is often tedious and indifferent to say the least. There is also a Scotch terrier, but he is not all that popular as he is obstinate and capricious besides which the chief says he looks like a scrubbing brush and he'd never let himself be photographed with it. Hitler's health had suffered from the winter, but he allowed himself no respite. In December he had jibed to Halder, you find generals only play ball so long as everything's going well. The moment the going gets tough you report sick or tender your resignations. He ordered a string of rests. On March 8 his army adjutant Engel notified the Reichsfuhrer SS. The Führer has ordained the Tri-Railroad Obrat, Senior Councillor, Landenberger and Councillor Hahn. Are to be taken into custody forthwith. Both officials are charged with serious incompetence in the positions they held during the Eastern Campaign, as the responsible directors of Army Railroad Directorates Centre and South. Morel added an ever-increasing variety of medicines to the Führer's medicine chest. Despite all his endeavors, visitors to Rassenberg that spring found Hitler gray, drawn, and ailing. He confided to Goebbels that he suffered attacks of giddiness. The Führer describes to me, wrote Goebbels of a conversation on March 19, how close we were these past few months to a Napoleonic winter. Most of the blame for this is Braukic's. The Führer has only words of contempt for him, a vain, cowardly wretch, unable even to grasp what was happening, much less master it.
By his constant interference and disobedience he completely wrecked the entire plan of campaign in the East, which had been devised in crystal clarity by the Führer. The Führer had no intention whatever of aiming for Moscow, he wanted to cut off the Caucasus, from the rest of Russia, thus hitting the Soviet system at its most vulnerable point. But Braukic and his general staff knew better, Braukic kept hammering on about Moscow. He wanted prestige victories instead of real ones. For the coming German offensive in the East, Hitler had again established a clear list of priorities. This time General Halder accepted them, as Hitler set them out in a conference on March 28, 1942. The main summer offensive, Blue, would open with the capture of Voronezh on the Don, then the armies would roll southeastward down the Don towards Stalingrad digging in along the river for winter quarters. By early September he hoped they would have reached the Caucasus Mountains. Depending on the summer victories, he would decide later what operations to undertake in the center and against Leningrad. After the defeat of Stalin's main armies, Hitler planned to construct an immense east wall beyond which there might well rage a hundred years war against the scattered remnants of the Bolshevik forces. Russia will then be to us what India is to the British, he told Goebbels. Already the Soviet Union had lost the iron ore of Kravoyrog and the manganese of Nikopol, the armor plate of their latest tanks was consequently of poor quality. But if Blue succeeded, Stalin would have no coking coal, or oil either. When the naval staffer persisted in arguing for the capture by Rommel of the Suez Canal, Holder impatiently replied, the Caucasus operation is still absolutely vital for our oil supply position. He held that only victory in the Caucasus would ensure the Reich's ultimate survival in the war. Halder's words are quoted by his naval liaison officer in a document in German Admiralty archives. After the war, he and departmental heads like General Adolf Husinger claimed to have been unanimous in opposing the Caucasus campaign. The British aided Russia by intensifying the war in the air in March 1942. On the night of March 3, RAF planes dropped over 450 tons of bombs on a Paris arms factory, killing 800 French civilians. Hitler ordered the Luftwaffe to execute an immediate reprisal on a British target, but a few days later he cancelled the order, explaining to Jess Connick that he wanted to avoid provoking air raids on German cities. Besides, the Luftwaffe was incapable of meeting out appropriate annihilation raids on English cities. A week later, a force of 200 RAF bombers laden primarily with incendiaries all but destroyed the medieval Baltic town of Lübeck, leaving 320 dead in the ruins. This time Hitler did order reprisal attacks on English towns, to be chosen for their defenselessness and cultural value, the same criteria as Churchill had applied. London was explicitly embargoed from attack. It was an unedifying sight, the two opposing leaders, well bunkered in their respective capitals, trading blows at each other's innocent citizenry. How Stalin, who had long learned to think in terms of centuries, must have relished it. The British had no alternative as yet. However, Hitler's intuitive sense of strategy warned him late in March that the Cherbourg and Brest peninsulas might be the target of an Allied invasion. On March 27 he ordered all available reserves immediately moved into the region west of Knan saint nazaire and he gave instructions that the U-boat base at saint nazaire itself was to be closely reinforced. The very next morning the British launched a commando raid on the base. The aging destroyer Campbell Town, accompanied by torpedo boats and motor launches laden with commandos, entered the base before dawn, rammed the lock gates of the huge dry dock, and was abandoned. French dockyard workers and sightseers were still clustered curiously around her at 11.45 a.m., when her hidden cargo of time-fused explosives blew up, killing 60 of them. Over 140 British prisoners had been taken. The interrogation reports submitted to Hitler showed them to be the cream of Churchill's forces, most of them no longer believed Britain could win, but felt that the war would just fizzle out. Goebbels's English language propaganda was said by these prisoners to have a big listening public. We all like the Germans, 
said one British major. It's just that we are certain that Hitler is planning to conquer the world. Told that Hitler had no designs on Britain at all, the major is said to have exclaimed, then why not tell our government and people that? I would be willing to go to the British government and tell them what your peace terms are, and I give my word of honor to return to captivity here. But for God's sake do it now, before the hundreds of thousands who will die on both sides in this summer's fighting are sacrificed. Hitler was now 53. On his birthday there were letters from Eva Braun and her mother, and from his sisters Angela and Paula. He wrote back, sending them ham he had just received from a Spanish admirer, with a warning to them to cook it thoroughly before eating. Redder, Goring, Milch, Ribbentrop, and a host of lesser dignitaries attended the birthday luncheon held in a dining room decked out with tablecloths and flowers. The headquarters officers and staff were given a glass of Psport a gold drop gin and cups of real coffee. After lunch came the real birthday treat, the first two Tiger tanks were demonstrated to Hitler. In the east the roads and fields were drying out, the snow had vanished almost everywhere. Never in his life had he yearned so painfully for the onset of spring. He never wanted to see snow again. It had cost him six months of these his precious last years. The strenuous bunker life in East Prussia had sapped his strength. The first white hairs were appearing on his head. Since Hitler's doctors prescribed the solitude of the Berghof, he asked Ribbentrop to arrange an early meeting with Mussolini. Hitler's train left the Wolf's Lair late on April 24 on the first leg of the long journey to Bavaria, it was followed by Ribbentrop's equally impressive train. A wonder that the foreign minister allows anybody to take precedence over him. Joked Hitler. In Berlin he was to address the Reichstag, asking for powers that would neutralize the meddling lawyers of the Ministry of Justice for all time. He showed the necessary decree to Hans Lammers four hours before the speech began on April 26. Lammers suggested that it would suffice for the Reichstag to pass the law by acclamation. Goring would follow Hitler's speech with a formal approval of the law as president of the Reichstag. The Reichstag records show Hitler thundering. I do however expect one thing, that the nation give me the right to take immediate action in any way I see fit, wherever I do not find the obedience unconditionally called for by service of the greater cause. This is a matter of life and death to us. Loud applause, at the front and at home, in transport, civil service and the judiciary there must be obedience to only one idea, namely the fight for victory. Stormy applause, let nobody now preach about his well-earned rights. Let each man clearly understand, from now on there are only duties. At 4.24 p.m., when the session ended, the last time the Reichstag would ever meet, Adolf Hitler was himself the law. In the first meeting with Mussolini at Klesheim, Near Salzburg, Hitler painted the German position in Russia in optimistic terms. He promised that in 1943 the Ukrainian harvest would yield at least 7 million tons. Both agreed that a watchful eye was needed on France, but at the other end of the Mediterranean, Turkey was slowly but surely edging around to the Axis camp, if only in consequence of her hatred of the Russians. There was ample proof of this. Turkey had recently imposed a crippling fine on the British envoy in Bulgaria, whose luggage had mysteriously and undiplomatically blown up in an Istanbul hotel. The second meeting between the dictators was up at the Berghof. The Italians pressed their case for an early capture of Malta. Hitler viewed the operation with distaste, not only because it was to be an Italian operation, and hence in his eyes predestined to ignominious failure but because he still argued that the war could only be won in the East. The Mediterranean theatre was a sideshow of value only for tying down enemy forces. In deference to the alliance, Hitler paid lip service to the needs of Hercules, since April 2, German and Italian bomber forces had been mercilessly softening up Malta for invasion. In mid-April, he had also agreed to supply German parachute troops for the eventual assault, provided the British did not in the meanwhile spring surprises on him in Norway or France. He wanted Rommel's offensive in North Africa to begin before the British could start theirs, 
given the limited Axis air strength in the Mediterranean, Hercules would have to be postponed at least until after that. Early in May, therefore, the OKW laid down that Rommel should launch his offensive at the end of the month, with Hercules postponed until mid-July or mid-August. The actual objectives of Rommel's offensive were themselves a matter of disagreement, the Italians wanted him to halt on the line between Solom and the half Ire Pass, but Hitler wanted Egypt. A Finnish report had claimed that 90% of the Egyptian population was anti-British, so it must be ripe for revolution in Hitler's view. Hitler's intake of information was phenomenal, but this was a necessity if the Führer principle was to be maintained. Ambassador Huell had logged over 1100 different diplomatic papers passing through his hands to Hitler in 1941, by early April 1942 he had already submitted over 800 more. Now as commander-in-chief of the army Hitler assumed a workload that would have crushed many men. We shall probably never know all the intelligence data on which Hitler based his decisions. A few weeks earlier his post office had begun listening in on the enemy's scrambled radio telephone link between London and Washington, and a regular flow of transcripts had reached Hitler through Himmler ever since March 1942. The transcripts included the top secret conversations between Roosevelt and Churchill. Unfortunately these transcripts later vanished, either during or after the war. Decoded confidential Turkish and Yugoslav dispatches from the Soviet capital enabled Hitler to follow Stalin's guesswork over Germany's coming offensive, Hitler's intent was to feign preparations for a renewed offensive against Moscow. The decoded American telegrams from Cairo to Washington were even better, in February, the Italians deciphered one in which Washington inquired about the possibility of invading northwest Africa. At the end of April, Cairo was heard advising Washington of the crucial position in Malta, anti-aircraft ammunition was running out, and there was no gasoline for the motor transport. Other American messages betrayed the strength and dispositions of the forces opposing Rommel. From more orthodox diplomatic sources, Hitler heard the first rumors of an amphibious invasion of France by Admiral Mountbatten's forces. Probably one of the more damaging items was the confirmation blurted out by Churchill, who evidently forgot the wartime slogan walls have ears dash that the mounting shipping losses were bringing Britain to the brink of her most critical moment since war broke out. This quotation reached Hitler through Spain and encouraged him to step up his U-boat and Luftwaffe offensive on the Atlantic and Arctic convoys. In the last week of May, Convoy PQ.16 to North Russia was attacked, seven ships were sunk, with 32,400 tons of war supplies including 147 tanks, 77 aircraft, and 770 motor vehicles. Every Allied vessel sunk reduced the threat of a second front. During May 1942 Hitler's armies regained the military initiative in the east. Only the growing menace of the partisans fighting in the rear of Kludge's army group center gave cause for concern. In the eyes of many Germans a great opportunity had been lost, that of winning at least the traditionally anti-Soviet Ukrainians to their cause. This had been Reichenau's last message to Hitler before he died in January 1942. It was the advice of Goebbels, and particularly of Rosenberg as well. Rosenberg bitterly told Hitler on May 8 that with great attack the Russian workers could have been procured voluntarily, by rounding them up like slaves, Sorkel, as Hitler's manpower dictator, was merely driving hordes of Russians before him into the forests, thus supplying new recruits for the partisan armies. Gorlitter Eric Koch, the Reich Commissar of the Ukraine, was even worse than Sorkel and quite out of Rosenberg's control. I know that we always used to say the Slav liked a good whipping, said Rosenberg, but he went on to complain that some Germans in the Ukraine were taking this literally and strutting around with whip in hand, this was a bitter blow to the Ukrainians' self-esteem. Hitler welcomed the idea of using Russian prisoners themselves to help fight the partisans, but nobody, certainly not Rosenberg could persuade him to appoint at least puppet Russian governments in the conquered regions. 
the general staff suggested that Hitler allow the use of poison gas to combat the partisans, thereby countering illegal warfare with illegal weapons. Hitler would not hear of it. Similarly, he forbade the general staff to study the problems of biological warfare, except in a purely defensive light. What may have been a hangover from his own gassing experience in the First World War kept him adamant to the end. Although the British, illegally, employed phosphorus in their bombs, Hitler forbade its use in the Luftwaffe's, as its fumes too were poisonous. Since German scientists had developed nerve gases, sarin and tabun, to a degree of sophistication unknown to the enemy, his otherwise inexplicable inhibitions were not without effect on the war effort. In mid-April Hitler summoned Colonel Lehausen, Conrezi's chief of Abwehr subversive and sabotage operations, to discuss German partisan operations. The Russian prisoners who had volunteered for these proved surprisingly effective, filtering in their own uniforms or plain clothes through Russian lines to execute clandestine missions against their former comrades furnished with the necessary passwords. They were able to return through the German lines unscathed. Army Group South, and particularly the 17th Army, had high praise for them. During April, single pairs of Abwehr agents had already parachuted into Voronezh, Stalingrad, and Krasnoda to sabotage key railway lines, power stations, and pipeline installations. Special task forces had also been trained, one to defend the makeup oil fields, another to cut the railway line from Moscow through Rostov to Baku, and a third to organize an uprising in Georgia. The biggest force was the Bergman Battalion, 200 German language experts and 550 reducated Russian prisoners from the North Caucasus and Caucasia. When the hour struck, their task would be to infiltrate into the Caucasus Mountains to clear and hold key passes and to arm the anti-Soviet sections of the population. These were operations in which neither Germans nor Russians could expect any mercy if captured. Armed with overwhelming air superiority, the German spring offensives were opened by General von Manstein's 11th Army in the Crimea on May 8, 1942. By May 15, some 170,000 Russians were his prisoners. The remaining Soviet forces in the area were dead or had committed themselves on rafts to the Black Sea. The second offensive, Friedrichus, was scheduled to begin on the 18th, with Klist's army Grupp and the 6th Army pinching off the Izum salient east of Kharkov. But the Russians launched a spoiling attack first, throwing an unprecedented weight of tanks into the salient on the 12th in a drive for Kharkov. By evening they were less than 15 miles from the town. Field Marshal von Bock telephoned Halder that evening that Friedrichus would have to be abandoned in favor of a frontal defense of Kharkov, but the Chief of General Staff replied that Hitler thought differently. Bock warned, this is no blemish, it's a matter of life and death. He saw their only salvation in withdrawing three or four of the infantry and armored divisions to stall the Russian onslaught south of Kharkov. He telephoned this suggestion to General Holder urgently on May 14, the most crucial day of the battle. Hitler would not hear of it. On the contrary he ordered that Friedrichus was to commence as planned in the south. He telephoned Bock himself explaining to the harassed field marshal that at a time like this a counter-attack was the very best solution possible. To ensure that there was no misunderstanding, Hitler ordered Halder to confirm the instructions to Bock's army group in writing. For two days there was crisis. Hitler insisted that his generals keep their nerve. By the 22nd, Klist had linked up with the 6th Army and encircled the enemy. Within the next week 239,000 prisoners and over 1,240 captured or destroyed tanks were counted on the bloody battlefield, and Hitler had regained the Dunitz River. Hitler's ebullient mood during this victorious battle emerges from the diary of Richthofen, who lunched with him on May 21, at lunch he held forth to our immense amusement with an endless flood of easy arguments as to the special privileges of smokers. For example, the right to drive off mosquitoes from all non-smokers, and on the idiocy of winter sports. On hunting and the raising of deer in order to shoot them, 
on deer themselves as foodstuffs, after they've eaten five times their own weight in foodstuffs first, and on trophy hunting, why don't soldiers mount the jawbones of dead Russians in their rooms, then? And so on. Victor of the Battle of Kharkov, Hitler returned briefly to Berlin. He told Goebbels on the 29th that the grand objective of Blue would be the Caucasus. Then we'll strangle the Soviet system at its Adam's apple, so to speak. Holder persistently assured him that Stalin's reserves were drying up. Rumors that Stalin was mobilizing a reserve of over 100 divisions beyond the Urals for the coming winter, not to be tapped even if Moscow itself was endangered, were discounted. More than once in private Hitler commended Stalin's harsh leadership, for this alone had saved the Red Army from extinction. If we cannot emulate their toughness and ruthlessness, he said, we might as well give up the fight. He drew comparisons between a beleaguered garrison which had just withstood a Russian siege of four months, and the American troops who surrendered the fortress of Corregidor in the Philippines, even though they still had food for another two months. Thought provoking though the captured Russian newsreels of the nightmare battle for Moscow were, with the abandoned German tanks, guns, and trucks heaped black against the snow and the thousands of ill clad, hungry German prisoners being herded away to an uncertain fate, it was the faces of these unknown, unsung soldiers that gave Hitler hope, for he was convinced that they betrayed no trace of fear or personal surrender. The cloak and dagger war of agents and assassins was by no means confined to the East. By May 1942, Allied Secret Service activity in Norway was increasing. Joseph Turboven, Reich Kommissar for Norway, was summoned to confer with Hitler, and Himmler reported the results to Heydrich soon after. On the 27th, Heydrich was mortally wounded as he drove into Prague in his open Mercedes. The underlying purpose was to set Europe ablaze by provoking Nazi countermeasures against the indigenous Czech population. In revenge for Heydrich's death the Germans liquidated Lidis, the village found to have harbored the Czech-born assassins. Undoubtedly, according to SS General Karl Wolf, it was the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich that inspired Himmler to attack the Jewish problem with renewed urgency. Eyewitnesses have described the traumatic effect on the Reichsfuhrer, he appeared for dinner that day with Hitler ration faced and barely able to speak. Since the Jewish Congress meeting in Moscow had, according to Goebbels's diary, just broadcast directives to world Jewry to launch a war of assassination, the Nazis assumed that Heydrich was the first victim. Assassinations can set a bad example if we don't act ruthlessly against them, wrote Goebbels. He ordered the arrest of 500 Berlin Jews as hostages, as he put it in a telling turn of phrase, there were still 40,000 Jews at large in Berlin with nothing more to lose. The fate of many of the deportees was evidently swift and final. The archives of the Berlin Revenue Authorities reveal that the Gestapo wrote them just 10 days after one swoop on May 27, enclosing a list of those who have since died and the assets they had declared before being deported. Dr. Goebbels again pleaded with Hitler over lunch on May 29 to allow him to expel every last Jew from the city forthwith. Hitler still had a geographical solution in mind however, while agreeing with Goebbels that it would be counterproductive to settle this troublesome people, the Jews, in a harsh and character-building region like Siberia, he indicated a preference for settling them somewhere in Central Africa, though they'll be living in a climate which definitely won't make them tough and resilient. At any rate, recorded Goebbels, with something of a shrug. It's the Führer's aim to rid Western Europe of the Jews entirely. It is hard to reconcile such passages, dictated as the summer of 1942 approached, with the now fashionable belief that his chief had ordered an extermination program. As Hitler's train bore him back to East Prussia on May 30, after speaking to officer candidates in Berlin, alarming reports reached him of a British air raid on Cologne. The local Gauleiter reported that the damage was vast. Goring insisted that only 70 or 80 planes had attacked the city, but Churchill announced that a thousand bombers had taken part. Even Churchill, reasoned Hitler, could hardly get away with a tenfold exaggeration. 
he was prepared to accept that the RAF had sent over perhaps 300, no doubt as a sop to the Kremlin. When General Jess Connick insisted on the Luftwaffe's less credible version, Hitler retorted, I have never yet capitulated to an unpalatable truth. But I must see straight, if I am to draw the right conclusions. Goring made no secret of the Luftwaffe's inability to exact retribution. The people of Europe were now breathing a new climate of brutality. Hitler's contribution to this new climate was the forcible eviction of the Jews from Europe. He felt that in time all Europe would understand his hatred. Somehow, reasoned Goebbels too, we must eliminate them, if they are not to eliminate us. The precise mode of elimination met with varying interpretations. Hitler's was unquestionably the authority behind the expulsion operations, but on precisely whose initiative the grim procedures at the terminal stations of this inhuman exodus were adopted is arguable. Goebbels never lost an opportunity of keeping Hitler in line. Visiting the Wolf's Lair on January 19 he had touched again on the Jewish problem, and noted afterwards, on this the Führer holds without qualification to the existing and proper hardline views. This is hardly evidence of any initiative coming from Hitler. A few days later the expulsions from Berlin actually halted for several months. What is known for certain is that at an interministerial conference on the logistics of solving the Jewish problem which was held in Berlin's Wannsee suburb on the following day, January 20, 1942, Himmler's lieutenant, Reinhard Heydrich, briefed government officials thus, the Führer had sanctioned the evacuation of all Jews to the Eastern Territories, substituting this for the overseas deportation originally planned, Madagascar. In the East the Jews would build roads until they dropped. This, and no more, is all that the much-mentioned Wannsee Conference protocols reveal, there was no talk of murder, and later interrogations of the participants confirmed this, we can disregard Eichmann's version. Himmler's handwritten notes show that he spoke with Heydrich by telephone the next day about the Wannsee meeting, Jewish problem. Conference in Berlin after telephoning again with Heydrich from the Wolf's Lair four days later, the Reichsfuhrer noted, Jews into the KZ stash the concentration camps. On the 27th and 28th he again phoned Heydrich about arresting Jews. Over these few days Himmler was often a guest at Hitler's table, for instance on January 25th when, according to Heinrich Heim's record, Hitler reflected out loud. If I extract the Jew today our citizens get uneasy, what's happening to him, then? But did these same people care one who to what happened to the Germans who had to emigrate? We've got to get it over fast, it's no better to pull a tooth a bit at a time over three months, once it's out, the agony is over. The Jews got to get out of Europe. Otherwise we'll never reach a European consensus. He's the worst troublemaker, everywhere. And really, am I not in fact terrifically humane? During the papal tyranny in Rome the Jews were maltreated. Up to 1830 they hounded eight Jews through the city on asses every year. All I say is, he's got to get out. If he goes for a Burton, kaput jet, in the process, I can't help it. I do see one thing, however, their absolute elimination, absolute osrotung, if they won't leave willingly. Given his table company, Himmler himself, Lammers, and Colonel Hans Zietzel are on this occasion, this was surely a significant private discourse by the Führer. On January 27 he repeated the same arguments over dinner to a different audience, the Jew has got to get out of Europe. Best thing would be for them to go to Russia. I've no sympathy with the Jews. Three days later, speaking in the Berlin Sport Palast, he reminded his audience of his prophetic warning to the world's Jews in 1939. The Führer, dictated Goebbels after lunching with him on February 17, once again expresses his ruthless resolve to make a clean sweep of the Jews out of Europe. The only hint at uglier methods being employed might be read into Goebbels's diary claim that Hitler recognized in this context the major prospects opened up by war. In all their significance, in a paper circulated early in March 1942, 
Evidently the report on the conference at once C. Heydrich's office advised the ministries that Europe's 11 million Jews were to be concentrated in the East for the time being, after the war they might be allocated a remote territory like Madagascar as a national home. At the same time, on March 6, Heydrich held a second interministerial conference to examine the awkward problem posed by half and quarter Jews. If allowed to remain, they might perhaps be sterilized. A top-level opinion, that is, Hitler's, was quoted to the effect that they must draw a clear distinction between Jews and non-Jews, as it would not be acceptable for a mini race of semi-Jews to be perpetuated in law. But this classification process would call for a colossal administrative effort, so the idea was shelved. Besides, even the lawyers did not like what underlay it. On March 12 Dr. Franz Schlegelberger, of the Reich Justice Ministry, wrote in some alarm to Dr. Hans Lammers, head of the Reich Chancellery, commenting on what he had learned of the recent conference. Decisions seem to be afoot, he wrote, which I have to consider for the most part quite untenable. Stressing the need to brief the Fuhrer in good time, meaning, if the worst was to be prevented, he proposed they meet urgently. Lammers replied on the 18th that he would be in Berlin at the end of March. A subsequent aid memo I on Schlegelberger's file, circulated among his top ministerial officials, reads in full. Mr. Reich Minister Lammers informed me that the Führer has repeatedly declared to him that he wants to hear that the solution of the Jewish problem has been postponed until after the war is over. That being so, the current discussions are of purely theoretical value, in Mr. Reich Minister Lammers' opinion. He will moreover take pains to ensure that, whatever else happens, no fundamental decisions are taken without his knowledge in consequence of a surprise briefing, of Hitler by any third party. Dr. Goebbels, agitating from Berlin, clearly hoped for a more speedy and ruthless solution, although he held his tongue when meeting his Führer. On March 19 he dictated for his diary only this remark by Hitler, the Jews must get out of Europe. If need be, we must resort to the most brutal methods. That Goebbels privately knew somewhat more is plain from his diary entry on the 27th, beginning with Lublin, he recorded, the Jews are now being deported eastward from the general government. The procedure is pretty barbaric, and one that beggars description, and there's not much left of the Jews. By and large, he speculated, one can probably say that 60% of them will have to be liquidated, while only 40% can be put to work. Dr. Goebbels recorded further that the Triestborn SS Brigade Führer Odilo Globocknik, the former Gauleiter of Vienna who was now the SS and police chief of the Lublin district, was performing this task carefully and unobtrusively. As fast as the ghettos of the general government were being emptied, they were being refilled with the Jews deported from the Reich, and the cycle started over again. The Jews have nothing to laugh about now, commented Goebbels, but there is no evidence that he discussed these realities with Hitler. Thus this two-faced minister dictated, after a further visit to Hitler on April 26, I have once again talked over the Jewish question with the Führer. His position on this problem is merciless. He wants to force the Jews right out of Europe. At this moment Himmler is handling the major transfer of Jews from the German cities into the eastern ghettos. Not just from the cities of Germany, either, the Jews were being rounded up in France, Holland, Belgium, and the Nazi satellite Slovakia. From Hans Frank's general government too, beginning with the ghettos of Lublin, the Jews were being shipped eastward under Globochnik's direction. Upon arrival at their destinations further east, thousands were evidently simply being murdered. The available documents shed only oblique rays of light on the level of blame for this atrocity. At a general government cabinet meeting in Krakow on April 9, 1942, Hans Frank disclaimed responsibility. It is obvious, he said, that the work process will be disrupted if in the midst of this labor program the order comes to turn over all Jews for liquidation. The directive, he explained, comes from higher up. 
from a letter signed by SS Obafura Victor Brack to Himmler on June 23, it becomes clear that Himmler was anxious to conceal the operation, because Brack quoted Globochnik as being eager to get it all over as quickly as possible in case one day force majeure should prevent them from completing it, you yourself, Reichsfuhrer, once mentioned that you felt the job should be done as quickly as possible if only for reasons of concealment. The gulf between the actual atrocities in the East, and what Hitler knew or said about them, widened. Over lunch on May 15 he again merely spoke to his staff about transporting the Jews eastward, he referred indignantly to the misplaced sympathies of the bourgeoisie. How well the Jews were faring, he remarked, compared with the German emigrants of the 19th century, many of whom had even died en route to Australia. Goebbels unhappy that 40,000 Jews still remained in his Berlin, raised the subject at lunch with Hitler on the 29th. I once again inform the Führer on my plan to evacuate every single Jew from Berlin. In response, Hitler merely expatiated on the best post-war homeland for the Jews. Siberia was out, that would just produce an even tougher strain of Jewish bacillus, Palestine was out too, the Arabs did not want them perhaps Central Africa? At any rate, he summed up, Western Europe must be liberated of its Jews, there could be no homeland for them there. As late as July 24, 1942 Hitler was still referring a table to his plan to transport the Jews to Madagascar, by now already in British and Gaulist hands, or some other Jewish national home after the war was over. Himmler kept his own counsels. From his papers it emerges that on July 9 his SS police chiefs Kruger, East, and Globochnik, Lublin, orally briefed him on the solution of the Jewish problem. On the 16th he visited Hitler. Photos in the modern Polish archives show Himmler visiting the immense synthetic rubber plant being erected by slave labor at Auschwitz on the 17th, and touring the concentration camp itself on the 18th in the company of his chief engineer SS Gruppenfuhrer Hans Kammler and Fritz Brucht, the Gauliter of Upper Silesia. The first train load of Jews bound for Auschwitz had left Berlin on the 11th, in the insanitary conditions prevailing at the camp, an epidemic of typhus was now killing hundreds of prisoners every day, but still the transports rolled in through the gates. On September 4th, in reply to a request for a thousand prisoners for construction work on the Danube Railway, Auschwitz informed Berlin that they could not provide them until the ban on the camp, Legespa, had been lifted. It was an odd, one-way kind of quarantine, it appears that although typhus is still rife at Auschwitz, pointed out the British codebreakers who immediately decipher this SS document, new arrivals continue to come in. Whatever later tribunals would claim, Hitler himself never visited any concentration camp, let alone Auschwitz. Nor for that matter did he ever visit a bombed city. Scholars have also claimed that Himmler witnessed the liquidation of a trainload of Jews on the occasion of his visit. This is devoid of any documentary substance. Under British post war interrogation, Brecht's 34 year old deputy, Albert Hoffman, would recall this day and describe how he accompanied Himmler around Auschwitz conditions were, he volunteered, considerably worse than those he had seen at Dachau camp in 1938. Maltreatment did occur, noted his British post-war interrogator, and, he, has actually seen their, crematorium, ovens where bodies were being burned. But the interrogation report added, he totally disbelieves the accounts of atrocities as published in the press. On July 19 Himmler wrote this order to Kruger, the transfer of the entire Jewish population of the general government is to be carried out and completed by December 31, 1942. Hitler might be dreaming of Madagascar, his men were disposing differently. The Eastern Railroad at Krakow reported, since July 22 one train load of 5,000 Jews has been running from Warsaw via Malkinia to Treblinka every day and in addition a trainload of 5,000 Jews leaves Przemysl twice a week for Belzec. The transport ministry passed these data on to Karl Wolf, Himmler's chief of staff, with the postscript, Globochnik has been told. 
Wolf thanked the ministry in fulsome terms for this information, namely that for 14 days now one train load a day of 5,000 members of the chosen people is going to Treblinka. On July 28, as we have seen, Himmler issued this gentle rebuke to his chief aide, SS Gruppenfuhrer Gottler Berger. The occupied eastern territories are being rid of the Jews, Judenfrey. The Führer has rested the execution of this very grave order upon my shoulders. In August 1942 the Germans made the first approach to Hungary about deporting her one million Jews. Domstoj, Hungarian envoy in Berlin, reported this as a radical departure from Hitler's previous ruling that Hungary's Jewish problem could be left until after the war. The Germans, Count J reported, are determined to rid Europe of the Jewish elements without further delay, and intend, regardless of the nationality of these Jews and provided that transport facilities exist, to deport them to the occupied territories in the east, where they will be settled in ghettos or labor camps and put to work. According to absolutely reliable information. Reichsführer Himmler has informed a meeting of SS leaders that the German government desires to complete the deportations within a year. Himmler continued to deceive his Führer. On September 17 he calmly noted for that day's conference, 1. Jewish emigration, Oswindu Ung, dash how is it to be handled in future? 2. Settlement of Lublin, and, as a result of these points, conditions in general government, and Globus, Globoknek's nickname? Goebbels spoke six days later in more unmistakable terms to 60 government journalists. Pleading for greater security consciousness, he pointed out that there were still 48,000 Jews in Berlin dash they know with deadly certainty, he said, that in the course of this war they will be deported to the east and left to their murderous fate. These Jews, he added, could already sense the inexorable dread of physical annihilation and this was why they were inflicting as much damage on Hitler's Reich as they could, so long as they live. Blue In mid-1942 Hitler launched his rebuilt armies into Operation Blue-the summer campaign that he hoped would leave him master of all Europe as far as Astrakhan, Stalingrad, and Baku. Yet great though the advances the Wehrmacht now made were, strategically the Soviet command remained the victor, after Kharkov which Hitler considered one of Stalin's most costly errors, the Red Army was never again to allow the Germans to encircle them. Each successive phase of Blue netted a smaller haul of prisoners and booty than the last. When the Red Army did stand and fight, it was on its own terms, with winter drawing on, and at the extreme limit of the German lines of supply. Emboldened by the victory at Kharkov, Hitler switched his attention to the two Russian armies orphaned by the disaster. He decided on a short postponement of Blue, while two preliminary battles, Friedrichus II Apostrophe and Wilhelm, respectively, were fought to wipe out these enemy concentrations. He flew to Field Marshal von Bock's headquarters at Poltava on June 1 and won his general's support, explaining that this was an opportunity they would be foolish to miss. What we defeat now can't interfere with our later Blue offensive, he said. Wilhelm began nine days afterward, followed by Friedrichus II apostrophe on the 22nd. Meanwhile General von Manstein had begun the long-drawn-out final bombardment and assault on the Crimean fortress of Sebastopol. Blue itself, originally scheduled for mid-June, was provisionally set down for the 22nd. On June 4, 1942, Hitler made one of his very rare flights outside the Reich frontiers to honor Finland's Marshal Mannerheim on his 75th birthday. In the dining car of Mannerheim's special train, its broad windows overlooking the sunlit Lake Seima, Hitler was tempted by the polished speech of President Reiter to rise in reply himself. While the local German envoy looked on disapprovingly and the Marshal, perhaps unaware of his visitor's aversion to tobacco, affably puffed clouds of cigar smoke, he delivered extempore a tactful speech on his awkward position during Finland's winter war with Russia. After the Führer's four-engine Fock Wolf 200 took off, a flattered Mannerheim commented, he is phenomenal. Flying back from Finland, Hitler heard that Reinhard Heydrich had died of his wounds. After that, 
his attention was again attracted to the Jews by reports that German political emigres were fighting in the ranks of the French Foreign Legion against Rommel in North Africa. On June 9 he had a signal radio to Rommel's headquarters, ordering that all such emigres were to be mercilessly finished off in battle, any who were taken prisoner were to be shot at once and without further ado on the orders of the nearest German officer. That was the day of the state funeral of Heydrich, held in the Chancellery. Czech President Emil Hacker and his government attended. Six hundred of Germany's leading men gathered behind Hitler to pay homage to the Gestapo chief. Hitler used to call him the man with iron nerves. According to his historical officer Wilhelmst, Hitler had even been grooming him to become his successor. In Prague, Heydrich had modeled himself on Hitler winning the workers over. By the time of his assassination the first twenty convalescent homes had already been built for Czech workers. On the day he died, fifty thousand such workers demonstrated in Prague in a remarkable manifestation against the British-inspired act. As Siegfried's funeral march died away, Himmler spoke, recalling the day Heydrich had taken up the reins in Bohemia and Moravia, there were many in Germany, and many more among the Czechs who thought the dreaded Heydrich was going to rule by blood and terror. But he had not, Himmler explained. He had merely acted radically against the unruly dissidents, restoring respect for German rule and beginning his internal social reforms soon after. Before President Hacker left Berlin, Hitler advised him to keep the Czechs in reign. If there was any repetition of the anti-German outbreaks that had caused him to appoint Heydrich in September, he said he would seriously consider deporting all the Czechs from Bohemia and Moravia. Hako asked permission to warn his people. Hitler recommended that he do so. At 11.10 pm he left for Bavaria. There, on June 15, Admiral Reda drove up to the Berghof to press the case for the attack on Malta. In May, parachute General Kurt Student had briefed Hitler on the British fortifications and defences but to Hitler it seemed that more was known of the probable British tactics than the Italian. Jodl's naval staff officer had told the Admiralty, the Führer has little confidence in the operation's success, as the Italian's assault strength is wholly inadequate and the Italians don't have the least idea of secrecy. It seems to be a particularly difficult task, far tougher than Crete, which was difficult enough as it was. Hitler offered a string of specious arguments against invading Malta, even if they succeeded, the Italians could not keep the island garrison supplied, to which the Admiralty acidly pointed out that at present the far more difficult supply line to Rommel's army in North Africa was still open. Even more far-fetched was Hitler's claim that Malta served their strategy better in British hands, as its supple convoys then offered sitting targets in the anti-shipping war. Hitler had allowed the theoretical planning for Malta to continue during May, but now, on June 15, he offered the Admiral little hope that the assault would ever take place. Over 200 submarines were now in or entering German service, a fruit of the prudent policy of conservation that Hitler had enforced in 1940. Hitler regretted not having devoted more shipyard capacity to submarine construction rather than to big warships. The latter did however have a deterrent value. For this reason he had at first been averse to the Admiralty's plan for the night's move, in which the entire German battle fleet in Norway was to attempt to wipe out the next Allied convoy bearing supplies to North Russia, PQ.17. Reda's liaison officer had assured Hitler early in June that no risk would be involved at all, provided that the Reichsmarschall was ordered to give them Luftwaffe support. When the Admiral left the Berghof on June 15, he had Hitler's cautious permission to proceed, provided that any Allied aircraft carriers in the vicinity had first been precisely located and bombed to a standstill. On the Russian front, the enemy was tensely awaiting Hitler's next move. It seemed clear that the Russians were no longer deceived by Kludge's noisy preparations west of Moscow, indeed. On June 16 an Allied press agency in Moscow quoted German strategic designs for the summer at such length that it was obvious there was a leak in German security somewhere. Hitler was perplexed and furious. Halt as general staff must be the culprit, 
he suspected. Hitler was infuriated to learn that the senior general staff officer of a panzer division had crash landed in no man's land with the complete secret plans for the first stage of Blue Dash the tank thrust to the Don at Voronezh, just as had happened in the notorious Mechelen affair in 1940. He himself signed a new order expanding the security rules he had laid down then, security during the preparation of major operations is of particular importance because of the prime risk that operational orders falling into enemy hands might be exploited in time. As it was, he coolly ordered the strategic plan for Blue to be left unchanged. Toward midnight on June 21, his train left Munich for Berlin. His thoughts must have gone back to that night twelve months earlier, when he had spent agonizing hours waiting for the onset of Barbarossa. If it had not been for his stubborn army generals last summer, Russia would have long been defeated. During the night, his train pulled into a station for twenty minutes. The telephones were linked up, and there was joyous and totally unexpected news from North Africa, the British stronghold of Torbuk had fallen. Already General Rommel was preparing to sweep eastward into Egypt. Hitler cabled him immediately, promoting him to field marshal. When Goebbels now referred over lunch to Rommel's irrepressible popularity, Hitler enthusiastically agreed. He told his staff that he would telephone Mussolini advising him to give Rommel a free hand. The message he telegraphed to Rome closed with his familiar argument, the battle's goddess of fortune draws nigh upon the commanders only once, he who does not grasp her at that moment will seldom come to grips with her again. Mussolini allowed himself to be persuaded. Hercules was postponed until early September. Within a week Rommel hoped to be in Cairo. The Italian command and Field Marshal Kesselring, Hitler's commander-in-chief South, watched the Panzer Army's eastward progress into Egypt with mounting apprehension. Hitler remained optimistic. Although Rommel had received barely 3,000 tons of supplies for the entire army during June, Hitler saw Egypt already in his hands. Rommel must be given all the supplies he needs. He announced at supper on June 28, after the news arrived that four enemy divisions were now encircled in the fortress of Marsa Matru. He agreed with Key Eitel's prediction that when the Germans captured Alexandria the entire British public would be thrown into a far greater rage than at the surrender of Singapore. Let's hope that the American legation in Cairo continues to keep us so excellently informed of British military plans with its badly enciphered cables, he said. After Blue was over in the autumn, an Anglo-German settlement seemed certain. The British Army however was preparing to hold out some 60 miles west of Alexandria, at El Alam, and Field Marshal Rommel now had only 70 tanks and armoured cars at his disposal. Operation Blue had begun early on June 28, 1942. German and Hungarian divisions commanded by General Maximilian von Weich swept eastward toward the Don city of Voronezh. Two days later General Paulus's Sixth Army began an advance that was eventually to take it southward along the Don. Hitler, encouraged by the evidence presented to him by Halder, believed the Russian reserves were all but exhausted, he began thinking of taking two armored divisions from Blue for a later assault on Moscow. Hitler anticipated an elastic strategy from Marshal Tymoshenko, his Russian adversary in the south but he hoped to thwart this by moving his tanks down the Don fast enough to prevent the enemy's withdrawal beyond it. Remembering Dunkirk in 1940 and Leningrad in 1941, Hitler feared that Voronezh in particular would swallow up his precious armor for days on end. Key Eitel recognized the familiar omens of trouble and begged him to fly out in person and order Bock to leave the city alone. Hitler made the three-hour flight to Poltava, Arriving at 7 a.m. on July 3rd, confronted by the granite-faced field marshal however he lost his tongue. Far from flatly forbidding Bock to take the city of Voronezh, Hitler wrapped up his directives in a double negative so vague that as he was leaving Bock queried, Am I right in understanding you as follows, I am to capture Voronezh if it can be done easily or without bloodshed. But I am not to get involved in heavy fighting for the city. Hitler confirmed this with a silent nod. 
back at the wolf slayer his courage returned to him. He watched the developing battle impatiently, the city was captured easily enough on July 6, but the two armored divisions there were immediately subjected to a fierce Russian counterattack. As the unwanted battle for the city developed, precious time was wasted. Not until the 8th could the divisions disengage themselves from Voronezh, and after one day's southward progress their fuel ran out. Boiling with anger, Hitler could see the Russian forces slipping away. Bock was having a run of bad luck, Hitler sacked him. He told Schmunt he still admired the man, but in the present crisis he could work only with generals who followed his directives to the letter. The consequences were serious. When the first phase of Blue ended on July 8, Weichs had rounded up only 28,000 prisoners and 1,000 tanks, and the 6th Army had accounted for only 45,000 prisoners and 200 tanks. A week later, the second phase, an attempted encirclement of the enemy north of the Dunitz River, ended with the capture of Malarovo, this time there were only 14,000 prisoners. In retrospect, it should have been clear that the majority of the Red Army had escaped. Hitler, ill-advised by his general staff, evidently considered these low halls further proof that the Red Army was on its last legs. Meanwhile, on June 21, the Third Air Force had brought back photographic reconnaissance of southern England revealing nearly 3,000 small craft assembled between Portsmouth and Portland and numbers of unfamiliar craft drawn ashore at Southampton and Poole. Churchill was brewing something. Holder suggested sending an armoured division to the west, Hitler agreed and ordered that three others already in reserve there should remain, together with the SS Division das Reich and the 7th Air Division of paratroops. On June 26 he decided that if the Russian resistance during the coming operations should be less than expected, the two SS divisions Adolf Hitler lifeguards and death's head would also be transferred to the west. He predicted in a directive of July 9 that the Allies would most probably invade either somewhere between Dieppe and Louavre or in Normandy, as these coastal areas were within Allied fighter range and suitable for small craft crossings. He believed that Churchill's recent visit to Washington had had only one purpose, to advise against launching a full-scale second front invasion until 1943. He may have deduced this from intercepted radio telephone traffic between London and Washington. Hitler certainly mentioned Churchill himself as proof. But he accepted that Churchill was now desperate to help the Russians. In the Arctic German submarines and bombers sank 24 of the 36 Allied merchant ships bound for North Russia in convoy PQ.17, Tirpitz and the battle fleet did not even have to go into action. At the daily war conferences, Hitler's advisers were confident of victory in Russia. In his eyes the East was already a German empire. On July 9 he discussed with Himmler the final plans for settling the South Tyrolians in the Crimea. On the 16th he told Himmler he had no intention of overtly annexing Transcaucasia to the German Empire, it would suffice to put a guard on the oil fields and frontiers and leave a resident general to protect German interests in the free Caucasian protectorates, as they would be known. On the 23rd he instructed Bormann to issue to Reichslit Rosenberg broad guidelines for population control in the East. German standards of sanitation and public health would not be enforced. When Hitler learned that his troops had fathered over a million offspring with Russian women, he instructed Himmler to identify all the children concerned, select those that were racially promising, and recover them for Germany, if the mothers were also sound and racially acceptable, they could come too. Still uneasy at the prospect that in later generations even the rejected offspring might improve the Russian bloodstock, Hitler ordered the widest distribution of contraceptives to his troops in the East forthwith. As for education, Himmler told his police officials, I can only repeat what the Fuhrer has asked. It is enough if, firstly, the children are taught the traffic signs at school so that they won't run under our cars, secondly, they learn to count to 25, and thirdly, they can write their names as well. No more is necessary. For the final heave on the Eastern Front Hitler transferred to a forward headquarters in the Ukraine, 
codenamed Werewolf, at Vinitsa. At 8.15 a.m. on July 16, 1942 his entire staff flew in 16 planes to the new site. Three hours later they touched down at Vinitsa. In these headquarters Hitler's commandant feared only a paratroop attack, perhaps disguised in German uniforms, so the Führer found none of the concrete bunkers characterizing the wolf's lair at Rassenburg. But the cabins were damp. The climate was humid, and each evening everybody had to swallow at Habreen, a bitter anti-malaria concoction against which the tongue rebelled. Hitler detested the camp. At night it was icy cold. By day Vinitsa sweltered in the Ukrainian high summer. He suffered splitting headaches and easily found fault with everybody. OKW OK, diarist Helmut Grinner noted privately, the climate and heat here get the Führer down. He longs for his old bunker, at Rasenberg, which is a sure sign of where we'll be quartered this winter. By then our operations in the Caucasus will be virtually completed anyway. With that, Hitler hoped, his oil nightmare would be banished. Once he said, if I cannot capture at least Makop, I cannot fight on. If he could get the oil fields at both Makop and Grozny, producing 5 million tons a year, and even more if his armies captured the Baku oil fields south of the Caucasus, then Stalin would have to concede defeat. In front of Paulus's 6th Army the enemy was in full flight towards Stalingrad. The Russian command seemed to be losing control. In a string of directives issued late in July, Hitler confidently asserted that the three-week campaign had thus far attained virtually all the targets he had set for the Southern Front. The operations against Marshal Timish and K had gone far better and faster than expected. Hitler claimed, only puny elements of Timish and Co's armies have managed to escape encirclement and get south of the Don. Already he had divided Army Group South into two new army groups, A and B, to the former he had appointed Field Marshal List, and to the latter, General von Weichs. These two groups would now diverge across the Don. List's group to encircle the escaping Russians south of Rostov and then conquer the Caucasus and the Black Sea coast, and Weichs striking southeastward toward Stalingrad and the Volga, as Hitler was convinced that the river was Stalin's main waterway. After Stalingrad, the armored divisions would roll down the Volga to Astrakhan on the Caspian Sea. For the capture of Stalingrad, he had assigned only one of the four German armies on hand here. The 6th. Rostov was captured after fierce fighting on July 23, but the enemy escaped, blowing up the bridges behind him. Two days later the entire west bank of the Don was in German hands. Again however the German army's supply organization broke down. For days the 6th army's tanks were stranded without gasoline. Worse still, on July 25th. Quartermaster General Wagner diverted all logistics effort from Stalingrad to the Caucasus operation. Weichs phoned, pleading for the decision to be reversed, Hitler overruled Wagner, but for ten days the 6th Army was emasculated by this lack of supplies, while the Russian commanders had time to build a line of defense far to the west of Stalingrad. At Werewolf violent arguments broke out in the thin-walled wooden conference hut, Halder raged in private at this layman's grotesque ignorance. Hitler snarled that Halder had repeatedly ignored his orders to transfer a Panzer Corps from the Rostov Group to support the 6th Army. On July 26, List's army group swept across the Don for the attack on the Caucasus, it was supported by Richthofen's 4th Air Force. Halder wrote the next day, July 30, at the Führer's conference General Jodl took the floor and bombastically pronounced that the fate of the Caucasus will be decided at Stalingrad. This was what Halder had been arguing for a week himself. It was decided to transfer the 4th Panzer Army from a list to Weichs at once. In vain List protested, when Halder phoned him that evening, that his group too was suffering fuel delays and he underlined the gamble they were taking by driving southward into the Caucasus with such a weak force, unprotected on its flank. When he asked that at least the Gross Deutschland division should not be transferred to France, Holder was equally adamant. Thus two German armies, each with less dependable allied forces in train, 
were assigned to each of Hitler's southern strategic targets, Stalingrad and the Caucasus. If the enemy's reserves were finished, this was an adequate disposition, if they were not, it was not. From the documents available it is clear that Hitler did not fear any serious assault on Western Europe until 1943, but there were persistent rumors that something was in the air. An Abware agent in embassy circles in Madrid reported that Britain was assembling 2,400 craft for an invasion attempt on the Channel or French Atlantic coast toward the end of August. On July 18 the week of talks between Churchill and Roosevelt's confidant, Harry Hopkins, began in London. Two days later a batch of intercepted transatlantic telephone conversations was sent to Himmler, and no doubt Hitler, with an SS general's comments, although only code words are employed in these intercepted telephone conversations, I deduce the following. Today and tomorrow there must be a highly important meeting between the British and Americans. This conference will probably determine where the Second Front is to be established and when. The main people speaking are general staff officers, ambassadors, and ministers. On August 13 a highly trusted Abware agent in southern England reported that the invasion target would be the channel port of Dieppe. Hitler had 29 divisions in the west. But the more he studied the bulky military atlases that his experts had compiled, the more apprehensive he became. He sent out Walter Frentz, his staff movie cameraman, to tour the coastline and photograph what he could find. The color photographs revealed that the whole coast would be wide open to a determined Allied assault, he resolved to build an impregnable fortress line along the entire Atlantic coastline facing Britain. On August 13 he summoned Albert Speer and the military experts to his werewolf headquarters and lectured them on his requirements for this Atlantic Wall, it must be such that with an armed force of half a million troops the entire coastline could be defended. Cost was no obstacle. Our most costly substance is the German man. The blood these fortifications will spare is worth the billions. The wall was to be completed by the end of April 1943. The submarine bases and naval gun sites were to get special treatment. Heavy machine guns, tanks, and anti-tank guns must all come under cover, for Hitler predicted that any invasion would begin with the saturation bombardment of the entire area. It is wisest to consider our own Luftwaffe so weak in the West as to be non-existent, Hitler warned. All bunkers must be gas-proof, he ordered and have oxygen supplies on hand, the Allies might use napalm bombs, so the bunkers must have steps and ledges to check the flow of blazing oil. The enemy must think twice about even testing this wall, and when an invasion did begin, it would have to be in such strength that it would be no problem for Hitler to distinguish the real Schwerpunkt from many diversionary feints. He predicted in August 1942 that the invasion would be preceded during the night by waves of airborne troops with orders to disrupt the transport and signals systems and disable headquarters units, the invasion proper would follow at dawn, with three or four thousand landing craft and total enemy air superiority. Of course, as he told a Balkan diplomat on August 14, those mad British might try something even before 1943. As lunatics like that drunkard Churchill and McGabeans and numbskulls like that brilliant in Dan Eden are at the helm we've to be prepared for just about anything. We've steeled ourselves for surprises, Rundstedt wrote privately on August 15, particularly now that Churchill has visited Moscow. Well, let him come. What occurred four days later was a baffling coup de theatre by the British. Two brigades of Canadian troops were landed with 30 tanks and commandos on either side of Dieppe. The raid ended in debacle. The British lost a destroyer, 33 landing craft, over 100 planes, and 4,000 troops, of whom 1,179 lay dead on the beaches and along the promenade. Rundstedt radioed at 6.15 pm that no armed Englishman was left ashore. The message provoked in Hitler the bare flicker of a smile. Rundstedt noted on the 21st, Schmunt said that he was very grateful and happy about Dieppe. Zietzler, Rundstedt's chief of staff, 
who was over there yesterday said it looked crazy, heaps of dead Englishmen, sunken shipping, etc. Hitler sent his interpreter, Paul Schmidt, to question the prisoners. One prisoner bluntly told him, the men who ordered this raid and those who organized it are criminals and deserve to be shot for mass murder. Politically, Churchill's DIEP decision was inept. The Nazis learned that this entire military effort had been mounted merely in order to destroy DIEP harbor and some guns and radar sites. Hitler was nonplussed that Churchill had even dispensed with paratroops, had these landed in the rear and fought off the reserves, the day might have ended very differently. In September, secretly addressing his Western commanders, he predicted that in the real invasion the enemy would rely far more on air power. We must realize that we are not alone in learning a lesson from Diepi. The British have also learned. We must reckon with a totally different mode of attack, and at quite a different place. The Atlantic Wall would now have a vital role. If nothing happens in the West next year, we have won the war. The black spot for Halder. Between Hitler's armies and Baku stood the Caucasus, 700 miles of untamed, jagged mountains capped by an 18,000 foot extinct volcano, El Boris. Flanked at one end by the Black Sea and at the other by the Caspian Sea, these mountains had throughout history proved a sure barrier to military ambitions. The Mongol invaders, Timur, the Seljuks, and Osmans, had all skirted around its eastern end, Islam had to take to the Caspian in its northward crusade, so did Peter the Great when he invaded northern Persia. The Caucasus itself was impregnable. Hitler decided to set a historic precedent. Unimpressed by the obstacles, he directed Field Marshal von List's army group to cross the mountains to the Black Sea coast so that the Russian navy there would be finally eliminated. Ill-advised by Halder and army intelligence throughout the summer on Stalin's remaining reserves, Hitler had however committed his armies to too many campaigns on too many fronts, leaving the uncertain divisions of his allies to guard the flanks. These allies, Romanian, Hungarian, and Italian, were low in morale and inadequately equipped, and out of thin air the enemy was producing fresh divisions all along the front. Hitler had no reserves to meet this unexpected situation. Russian generals captured in the fighting just smiled faintly when interrogated about the forces still at Stalin's disposal, you are in for the surprise of your lives. Hitler was determined not to be surprised. The Russians would unquestionably first strike at the Hungarian and Italian armies on the Don. On August 16 he shrewdly prophesied that Stalin would repeat the 1920 ploy used against the White Russian Army, attacking across the Don at Serafimovich and striking toward Rostov. The entire southern front would then be threatened. Repeatedly throughout August Hitler ordered Halder to shift the 22nd Panzer Division from the Stalingrad fighting to an area behind the Italian army. Halder paid no heed. There is no reference to Hitler's order in Holder's diary or in the records of the army group concerned. History was to show that Hitler's fears were well founded. Russia's strength was anything but exhausted. On August 2, the army's chief of Eastern Intelligence, Colonel Jalen, had indicated that in July alone Stalin had produced 54 new infantry divisions and 56 new armored divisions. Holder sent all Jalen's figures to Hitler the next day, frankly admitting that earlier intelligence figures had been underestimates, but he added that the enemy had achieved this feat only by employing far more female labor than had Germany, and he suggested that since Stalin could now fall back only on 18 year olds for recruits they need expect only 30 more divisions to be raised at most. In July the Red Army had lost 3,800 tanks and since they were importing only 400 and manufacturing less than 1,000 a month, sooner or later their tank supply would be exhausted. But even Holder's forced optimism evaporated two weeks later. Jalen's new figures now gave Stalin the equivalent of 593 divisions, of which an awe-inspiring number was being held in reserve. Hitler pathetically clung to his earlier information, his entire strategy in Russia had been based on it. He insisted that Jalen must have been duped by the Russians. According to Halder, Hitler foamed, I, 
the head of the greatest industrial nation, I, assisted by the greatest genius of all time, referring to Albert Speer, I, whose drive makes the whole world tremble, I sweat and toil to produce just 600 tanks a month. And you are telling me that Stalin makes a thousand. Hitler's only hope lay in depriving the Russians of the economic basis for continued defense. That basis lay in the Caucasus. On August 9, General Ewer's command had captured Krasnodar, and Klist's tanks rolled through Makop, but the oil fields were in ruins. Hitler called on Field Marshal List to strike through the mountains to the ports of Tuaps and Sukhumi as rapidly as possible, thus depriving the Russian fleet of its last sanctuaries and enabling the German army to ferry supplies to the Caucasus by sea. But only one road crossed the mountains, that from Armavir through Makop to Tuaps. The 4th Air Force were optimistic still. But on August 11th the OKW intelligence chief, Canaries, visiting Hitler's headquarters, wrote in his diary, Guy I tell. Does not share Ichthofen's optimism. He does not doubt that the Russians will try to hold the Western Caucasus and in particular block the road from Armavir to Tuaps. Six days later Klist's armor reached the eastern end of the mountain ridge, where it was stalled by stiffening enemy resistance and air attacks. The Russians had marshaled over 3,000 planes in this theater, including trainers and lend-lease aircraft. Time was running out for Hitler. By the end of August, List's offensive had petered out, defeated by impassable roads, wrecked suspension bridges, dense fog, and driving rain and snow. To the northeast, Weich's Stalingrad offensive was faring better, despite the oppressive heat of high summer in the arid steppes. General Hoth's 4th Panzer Army halted just south of the city. But on August 23rd, Paulus's 6th Army reached the Volga at a point just north of the city. With 88mm guns the first Soviet ships were sent to the bottom of the Volga before night fell but here too the Red Army's resistance was stiffening. Hitler had no reserves left. Since early August fierce Russian attacks had gnawed at the marrow of Army Group Center. He had ordered Field Marshal von Kludge to erase a Russian salient at Tsukinichi, 150 miles southwest of Moscow, left over from the Winter Crisis, this attack, whirlwind, would create the platform for a possible later attack on Moscow itself. Russian spoiling attacks on General Wall the model's 9th Army at Zephyr and Subtsov left Hitler unconcerned. Perhaps he hoped to repeat his Kharkov victory. When Kludge appealed for permission to cancel Whirlwind and use the 500 tanks to save the 9th Army instead, Hitler would not hear of it. Kludge stomped out of Werewolf saying, Then you, mein Führer, must take the responsibility. The attack began on August 11th in difficult terrain, heavily fortified, marshy forests alternating with treacherous minefields. The attack failed. Again summoned to Werewolf on August 22, Kludge was rebuked and instructed to recast Whirlwind as a holding operation. Four months later he complained, our worst mistake this year was that attack on Sukinichi. It was a copybook example of how not to stage an attack. They attacked in just about every direction that they could, instead of holding it tightly and narrowly together and thrusting rapidly through with the five armored divisions. Models 9th Army at Zeph began bleeding to death. On August 24, Halder demanded permission for Model to retreat. One regiment had lost eight commanders in a week. Hitler's hatred of the general staff boiled over. You always seem to make the same suggestion, retreat. He rebuked Halder. I must demand the same toughness from my commanders as from my troops. For the first time, Halder lost his temper. Out there are fine riflemen and lieutenants are dying by the thousand just because their commanders are denied the only possible decision. Hitler interrupted him with a calculated injury, What, Herr Halder, do you think you can teach me about the troops? You were as chairbound in the Great War as in this. You haven't even got a wound stripe on your uniform. Field Marshal von Manstein, the conqueror of Sebastopol, witnessed Hitler's outburst against Halder. Manstein had arrived from the Crimea, 
en route to the north where his 11th army was preparing to launch the final assault on Leningrad in September. Until this city was destroyed, Hitler could not release his divisions from there to strengthen General Dietl's army in Lapland, where the enemy might at any time seize the only nickel mines under German control. Were he Stalin or Churchill, he said, he would risk anything to knock out those nickel mines, within a few months no more German tanks or shells could be produced. For this operation, Northern Lights, he promised Field Marshal Georg von Kutschler, the commander of Army Group North, a weight of artillery unparalleled since Verdun. Kutschler had told Hitler that he hoped to finish off Leningrad by the end of October, but Jodl interjected that this was too long. On August 23, Hitler told Kutschler he was putting Manstein in charge of the assault on Leningrad. Together they pored over the air photographs of the city. Hitler was apprehensive about house-to-house -house fighting breaking out in this endless maze of streets and buildings. As Kutschler pointed out, when the assault began, hundreds of thousands of workers would down tools, reach for their rifles, and stream into the trench fortifications. Only days of terror bombardment, directed against the factories, munitions works, party buildings, and control posts would prevent this. Manstein later told Kutschler he did not believe, from his experiences with Sebastopol, that the Russians could be terrorized by bombardment. Hitler feared a more fundamental danger, that Stalin would attack the bottleneck first. He knew that the first nine Tiger tanks were on their way from Germany. I would set up the first Tigers behind the front line there, he told Kutschler. Hitler decided that Manstein should launch Northern Lights on September 14, after Richthofen had spent three days softening up the city with his bomber squadrons. Before any of this could happen, on August 27 the Russians struck just where Hitler had feared, at the vulnerable bottleneck. Deep wounds were riven in General Georg Lindmann's 18th Army here, and the 11th Army had to divert its strength to his support. The attack on Leningrad receded ever further into the future. And all the time the thermometer at Hitler's headquarters camp continued to rise as the Ukrainian sun beat down. The ground was rock hard, the grass had turned brown and dry, the trees and shrubs were grimy with dust, and clouds of dust hung in choking layers over every road. Much though we long for rain and cool weather, wrote the OKW diarist Grinner from Werewolf on August 31st, we dread them too because the humidity here is said to be particularly grim. In the forest camp we can just about bear the heat but we mustn't try to leave the forest shade. As he ended the letter the first rain began to beat down on the wooden roof, and steam rose from the undergrowth. With the revival of Malta, after a British convoy had reached the island in June, the supplies getting to Rommel had dwindled to a trickle. Hitler's instinctive dropping of the Hercules plan to invade the island now cost the Germans dear. As the water drought had tormented the free French defenders at Berhachiaim in June, now in July and August the lack of gasoline tortured Rommel. In June and July his aircraft had flown 12,000 sorties. But by early August he was down to his last few hundred tons of gasoline. The Germans had to regroup and every mile of desert cost Rommel more precious gasoline. The enemy's fighter bombers roamed the desert almost unimpeded. Jodl's deputy, Warlamont, flew out to North Africa at the end of July to see for himself, he reported vividly to Hitler on the plight of Rommel, who was confronting an enemy growing stronger each day on the ground and in the air. Hitler impatiently swung around on Goring, do you hear that, Goring? Saturation bombing raids in mid-desert. When Rommel launched his long-prepared assault at El Alam on August 30th, the enemy knew his precise plans from code breaking. They outnumbered him so heavily, and his oil reserves were so low, that by September 3 his Panzer Army Africa was back where it had started. Reda and the naval staff warned that this was a turning point in the war. The army refused to agree. Jodl persuaded Hitler that the Egyptian offensive had not failed, as the enemy would scarcely succeed in penetrating Rommel's Alam position. 
therefore no steps were taken to restore Germany's lost air supremacy in Africa. Hitler was convinced that no harm could come to the Axis there, and certainly not in 1942. It was autumn. In the fine oak forests around Hitler's headquarters the scent was unmistakable. The fields had been harvested, the sunflowers had been laid out to dry on the roofs, and bulging watermelons, used here only as cattle fodder, lay everywhere, the poppies were blackening, the ears of corn yellowing, and summer was truly over. Hitler did not know it, but ahead of him lay only a succession of defeats and disappointments. Tantalizing and provocative, Stalingrad seemed to Hitler and his field commanders as good as theirs. Hitler told Holder he wanted the virulently communist city's entire male population disposed of and the women transported away. Each day, Richthofen's bombers were pouring a thousand tons of bombs into the Russian positions. A two-mile-high pall of choking dust lay over the battlefields. Progress was slow. Richthofen voiced biting criticism of the field commanders Paulus and Hoth, claiming that with more spirit they could have taken Stalingrad in two days. In the Caucasus, Field Marshal Wilhelm List fared little better. His mountain divisions were at a virtual standstill in the narrow passes, still twenty miles and more from the Black Sea coast. Hitler was impatient at List's slow progress. Jodl courageously defended the army group's achievements and pointed out that it was a consequence of the Führer's own orders for Barbarossa that the mountain divisions had neglected their specialized equipment and were thus now little more than glorified infantry divisions. Hitler claimed he had ordered their proper fitting out as mountain divisions before Blue began in July, but Jodl replied that Hitler's memory was at fault. It was symptomatic of the deteriorating situation that even these two men were falling out with each other. At the end of August, Hitler summoned List to headquarters. Faced with the conservative, powerfully religious field marshal, Hitler's tongue again clove to the roof of his mouth. He engaged List in affable conversation, lunched privately with him, then sent him back to the Caucasus. Once List had left, Hitler criticized the way he had arrived armed only with a one-to-one -one million map of southern Russia without any of his forces shown on it. Hitler's antipathy toward General Halder, the chief of general staff, was also still smoldering. To Hitler's staff it was plain that the general had been past the black spot. In his absence, there were debates at the war conferences on who ought to succeed him. Jodl spoke out on Halder's behalf in the days that followed. He drafted a memorandum proving that Halder's staff had only been following Hitler's own orders in the weeks before the impasse in the Caucasus. But Hitler, tormented by the heat, the rose, and the realization that victory in Russia was finally slipping from his grasp, was already beyond reason. The storm broke on September 7. Jodl himself had flown out to Stalina to confer with List. He returned to Vinitsa that evening and reported to Hitler in private, giving a horrendous picture of the conditions in the Caucasus. The 4th Mountain Division was being asked to advance on the Georgian coastal towns of Gadatu and Sukhumi along a mountain path over 60 miles long. All its supplies would have to be carried by mule, of which nearly 2,000 were still needed. The simultaneous advance onto Apps, the port farther west would be incomplete before winter set in. The generals felt there was no alternative to withdrawing from these Caucasus passes and concentrating on the road to two apps. Jodl courageously quoted these views to Hitler. It provoked a furious scene. Hitler ranted that Jodl had been sent down to get the offensive moving again, instead, he had allowed his Bavarian comrades to hoodwink him. He stalked out refusing for the first time to shake hands with key Eitel and Jodl as he went, a snob he persisted in until the end of January 1943. He announced that he proposed to lunch and dine alone in his own quarters from now on. After supper Hitler sent for Bormann and asked him to provide teams of stenographers to record every word spoken at the war conferences. Over the next days Hitler contemplated replacing key Eitel with Kesselring, he told Jodl he could not work with him any longer either and proposed replacing him with Paulus as soon as the latter had taken Stalingrad. On September 9, 
the day the first Reichstag stenographers flew in from Berlin, he repeated his intention of ridding himself of Holder, as the general's nerves were evidently not equal to the strain. That afternoon he sent Key Eitel to drop the necessary hint to Holder. Key Eitel was also to tell Holder that Field Marshal List's resignation was required. For the time being he, Hitler, would command Army Group in the Caucasus. The ultimate in anomalies, for he was after all Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Supreme Commander of the Wehrmacht as well. List resigned that same evening, but Holder seems to have believed the axe would not fall on him as well. After all, Jodl continued in office and so did Key Eitel. But with Jodl the situation was different, Hitler still warmed toward him, his balding pate was a familiar sight across the map table, and above all he was loyal. Jodl commented to his own deputy, the Führer will have to cast around a long time to find a better army general than me, and a more convinced national socialist. So he stayed on, while Hitler treated him with silent contempt for many weeks. Under Martin Bormann's supervision the first three stenographers were sworn in on September 12th and a second batch two days later. The verbatim record of proceedings came to some 500 pages a day, every page checked and double-checked by Hitler's adjutants and then locked away. When we win a battle, my field marshals take the credit, Hitler explained. When there's a failure, they point at me. Two years later, in conversation with a medical specialist, Hitler revealed a further motive for introducing the stenographers. The doctor inquired whether the Führer had ever read the British author J. D. Chamier's biography of Kaiser Wilhelm II. The doctor's note of this conversation continues. Hitler said that a foreigner probably finds it easier to pass judgment on a statesman, provided that he is familiar with the country, its people, language, and archives. Presumably Chamier didn't know the Kaiser personally, as he was still relatively young, I said. However, his book not only shows a precise knowledge of the archives and papers, but relies on what are after all many personal items like the Kaiser's letters and written memoranda of conversations with friends and enemies. Hitler then said that for some time now he has gone over to having all important discussions and military conferences recorded for posterity by shorthand writers. And perhaps one day after he is dead and buried an objective Englishman will come and give him the same kind of impartial treatment. The present generation neither can nor will. By mid-September 1942 the general staff had reverted to its familiar, comforting theme that the Russians were finished. Hitler optimistically spoke to Weichs and Paulus of future campaigns and of the capture of Astrakhan on the Caspian Sea. On September 13 the systematic assault on Stalingrad began. The next day even Richthofen believed the Russians were flagging. In his private diary Baron von Weizsäcker reported a talk with his friend General Halder thus, he says that above all he's leaving his post without worries for the army. The Russians are too far weakened to be the danger to us they will last winter. The weak spot is Africa. Hauled a loathed Rommel, largely because Rommel had never gone through the general staff. Now however the Russians began a heroic struggle for Stalingrad, contesting every yard of the battered city. Halder had still not executed Hitler's order for the 22nd Panzer Division to be placed in reserve behind the vulnerable Italian 8th Army on the Don. On September 16, Hitler again ordered the transfer. Was it inertia or pig-headedness on Halder's part? Hitler, seething over the gradual stagnation of the summer offensive, suspected the former. On September 17, he finally resolved to appoint the bustling General Zietzler in Halder's place. He turned down Key Eitel's suggestion that either Manstein nor Paulus would be better, and he sent Schmunt, his chief adjutant, to Paris the next day accompanied by General Gunter Blumentritt, who was to replace Zietzler as Rundstedt's chief of staff. It was late on September 23 before Schmunt arrived back at Hitler's Ukrainian headquarters, bringing a puzzled, and still unenlightened, Zietzler with him. An hour after midnight Hitler had the 47-year-old general fetched from the guest house, and launched into an impassioned monologue on List and Halder, the latter was more of a professor than a soldier. 
when the red-faced Zietzler tried uncomfortably to defend his chief Hitler cut him short, rose to his feet, and announced that Zietzler was to replace Holder forthwith. I hereby promote you to full general. Holder attended his last war conference the next midday. Afterward Hitler took leave of him, while Key Eitel and the stenographers stood by, he rebuked the general for lacking the kind of fanatical idealism that Moltke had displayed in serving the monarchy. As Holder left, a victory mood reigned among the OKW officials, who rejoiced at the disgrace Hitler had inflicted on the general staff. Schmann proclaimed that the last barrier had fallen, the spirit of Zossen would now be stamped out, and the German army steeped through and through in the true spirit of National Socialism. The new chief of staff was certainly more closely aligned with the party than Holder, but he was by no means complacent. Field Marshal Key Eitel felt it advisable to warn him, never contradict the Fuhrer. Never remind him that once he may have thought differently about something. Never tell him that subsequent events have proved you right and him wrong. Never report on casualties to him, you have to spare the nerves of this man. Hitler hoped that Zietzler would succeed in remolding the general staff, and he drafted two orders for Zietzler to deal with, one dispensing with the older army commanders, some of them were over sixty, and the other scrapping the traditional red striped trousers and insignia of the general staff. Zietzler refused to inaugurate his office with such radical decrees. In a third decree, Hitler subjected the personnel decisions of the general staff to the army personnel branch, he made his own chief adjutant, General Schmunt, head of that branch, thus for the first time acquiring absolute control over all senior army appointments. The brazen Freemasonry of general staff officers must lose its monopoly within the army. Hitler ordered. A. There is only one officer corps. The best officers are to be given additional training to equip them for early entry to high frontline commands. B. There is to be no limit on the number selected for training. In this way a tidal wave of youthful, active frontline commanders, equipped with the skills of the general staff, promoted in leaps and bounds while still at the peak of their mental and physical abilities, would flood new life into the weary outer reaches of the German army. Halter's replacement by a general eleven years his junior was therefore just the forerunner of a much more fundamental revolution. As Hitler flew back to Berlin on September 27, 1942, the first autumn thunderstorms were drenching the capital. A mood of melancholy gripped the people, tired of waiting for the word that Stalingrad had fallen. Domestic morale was sagging. The British night bombing raids on city centers were proving more than the fighter and anti-aircraft defenses could handle. He ordered the Luftwaffe to build flak towers in Munich, Vienna, Linz, and Nuremberg. The fear that these beautiful cities might be laid waste was a constant nightmare, he told his staff. During September heavy raids had been made on Bremen, Duisburg, Dusseldorf, and Munich. The Luftwaffe, itself in a period of technical innovation, had neither long-range strategic bombers nor high-speed fighter bombers comparable with those of the enemy. The four-engined Heinkel 177 was plagued by engine failures and the much-vaunted Messerschmitt 210 fighter bomber had had to be scrapped outright earlier in 1942. Hitler understood nothing about aircraft and had confidently left the Luftwaffe's future in Goring's hands. He began to suspect that his confidence had been misplaced. In Holland, as Hitler knew, the British Secret Service was parachuting tons of sabotage material to its agents. Himmler's Gestapo had penetrated the spy net and was ambushing each successive shipment of agents and equipment, a self-perpetuating England game on which the Führer was kept constantly informed. Even Denmark, the crucial link with Scandinavia, was growing restive. On King Christian's birthday, September 25, Hitler had sent the customary greetings. He received a reply that could only be regarded as a deliberate snub. Hitler recalled his envoy and military commander from Copenhagen, sent the Danish diplomats in Berlin packing, and delegated the former Gestapo official Dr. Werner Best to act as his strongman in Copenhagen. 
What Hitler now began to fear most, however, was an enemy invasion of France. The Diepe raid might have lasted only nine hours, but it had shown that this was not impossible. As you all know, he reminded Goring, Speer, Rundstedt, and a handful of selected generals in the Chancellery's cabinet room on September 29th, I have never capitulated. But let us be quite plain about one point, a major enemy landing in the West could precipitate a real crisis. The enemy would have absolute air supremacy. Only the strongest bunkers and anti-tank defenses could ward off an invasion. The army's transcript of his three-hour speech quoted his further remarks. At present he saw his main job as being to spare his country from being turned into a battlefield, which would be the immediate result of an invasion in the West. If we can stave that off until the spring, nothing can happen to us any longer. We have got over the worst foodstuffs shortage. By increased production of anti-aircraft guns and ammunition the home base will be protected against air raids. In the spring we shall march with our finest divisions down into Mesopotamia, and then one day we shall force our enemies to make peace where and how we want it. Once before the German Reich suffered from its own excessive modesty. The new German Reich will not make the same mistake in its war aims. The next day he spoke to the German people, for the first time for many months, he apologized as he had less time for speech making than a prime minister who could cruise around the world in a silk blouse and floppy sombrero. It is of course impossible to talk with these people about beliefs. If somebody believes that Namso's was a victory, or Andalson's, if somebody describes even Dunkirk as the biggest victory in history or sees in some nine-hour expedition a flabbergasting sign of national triumph, Obviously we cannot even begin to compare our own modest successes with them. If we advance to the Don, finally reach the Volga, overrun Stalingrad and capture it, and of that they can be certain, in their eyes this is nothing. If we advance to the Caucasus, that is as unimportant as that we occupy the Ukraine, have the Don its coal in our domain, have 65 or 70 percent of Russia's iron ore, open up the biggest grain region in the world for the German people and thus for Europe, and also take over the Caucasian oil wells. All that is nothing. But if Canadian troops, wagged by a tiny English tail, come over to Diepe and just manage to hang on there for nine hours before they are wiped out, then that is an encouraging, astounding proof of the inexhaustible, triumphant energy typical of the British Empire. If Mr. Churchill now says, we want to leave the Germans to fret and ponder on where and when we will open the second front, then I can only say, Mr. Churchill, you never gave me cause to worry yet. But that we must ponder, you've got a point there, because if my enemy was a man of stature I could deduce fairly accurately where he would strike, but if one is confronted by military nincompoops, obviously one hasn't the faintest idea, for it might be the most lunatic undertaking imaginable. And that is the only unattractive feature, that with paralytics and drunkards you can never tell what they'll be up to next. Africa and Stalingrad. Hitler believed he had good reason to face the coming winter with optimism. The harvest had been better than expected. Speer was harnessing Germany's latent industrial might to the mass production of tanks and guns. Under Field Marshal Milch the Luftwaffe's production lines were being reorganized. The Atlantic coast was being fortified. The Navy was in Norway, the submarines were blocking the Allied convoy routes in the Arctic. On October 1, 1942, Field Marshal Rommel visited him at the Berlin Chancellery. He explained why he had had to abandon his offensive against the British El Alam position in August, attributing it to their air supremacy. Hitler showed him the prototypes of new self-propelled assault guns that Speer had collected at the Chancellery that morning, formidable low-chassis armored vehicles mounting the well-proven 105mm guns. He told Rommel of the new Tiger tanks. He promised to send 40 of them across to Africa, and spoke of a weapon of such appalling power it would blast a man off his horse two miles away. Speer had briefed him on Germany's atomic research effort some months before. Before leaving for a rest cure in Austria, Rommel wrote to General Georg Stumm, deputizing for him at El Alam. 
the Führer has assured me, he wrote, that he will have all possible reinforcements sent down to the army. Above all the newest and heaviest tanks, mortars, and anti-tank guns including the 75mm, 88mm, newest type, and 76 too. For our later attack operation I think it will be important to be equipped with large numbers of 15 cm, 28 cm, and 30 cm rockets and the necessary launchers, as well as a huge number of smoke screen generators, 500. Hitler returned to his headquarters in the Ukraine on October 4. Holder was finally gone. Zietzilla took control of the Eastern Front, while Jodland the OKW controlled the other theaters, a division of responsibility reflected in the war conferences at headquarters. Zietzilla toured the Southern Front at once, returned to Vinitsa, and issued over Hitler's name a string of realistic orders designed to increase the army's fighting strength. On one occasion Zietzler warned that unless a certain salient was withdrawn, the troops would lose confidence in their leadership. Hitler thundered at him, you're just a staff officer. What do you know about the troops? Zietzler sharply reminded the Führer that in August 1914 he had gone to war as an infantry ensign, his knapsack on his back and his rifle on his shoulder, to fight in Belgium. For bravery in the face of the enemy I was promoted to lieutenant. I was wounded twice. I think my combat experience is as good as yours. Hitler instructed the general to proceed, and avoided attacking him personally after that. Thus Zietzler's position became entrenched. Key Eitel, by way of contrast, had long forfeited Hitler's esteem. Hitler took to making good-humored fun of his absent commanders. The horizon of my field marshals, he would mock is the size of a lavatory lid. Field Marshal Key Eitel did not move a muscle as the others laughed. The next day however an adjutant informed Hitler that Zietzilla wanted a brief private word with him. He cordially shook the general's hand. Mein Führer, said Zietzler. As an army general I take exception to the language you used about our field marshals. May I ask you not to use expressions like that in my presence again? Hitler gave him his hand. I thank you. When Antonsko visited him three months later, Hitler introduced Zietzilla to him with the words, This is my new chief of general staff. A man of iron nerves and great war experience. The war had taken on many new dimensions since 1939. In the West the Allies had initiated commando warfare. These peripheral successes struck a raw nerve in Hitler whether the target was a radar site in France or a German oil dump. He showed little inclination to mercy when the commandos were caught, in August, six Britons were captured in North Africa behind the lines, two of them were wearing German uniforms. Hitler ordered their execution. One saboteur could paralyze a power plant and deprive the Luftwaffe of thousands of tons of aluminium. A commander training manual fell into German hands with diagrams on how to slit human throats and how to truss prisoners so that a noose around their neck would strangle them if they moved. In September Hitler was told that the British had machine gunned the survivors of a sinking German mine layer. On his return to Vinitsa on October 4 news reached him of a British commando raid on the tiny Channel Island of Sark the night before. The island was guarded only by a rifle company. The commandos had seized five army engineers sleeping in a hotel, manacled them, and then shot and stabbed them to death. Hitler immediately ordered all the prisoners taken at Diepe manacled as a reprisal. The British proclaimed they would retaliate against the same number of Axis prisoners in their own camps. Hitler drafted a text for the daily OKW communique broadcast on the 7th, the terror and sabotage squads of the British and their accomplices act more like bandits than soldiers. In the future they will be treated as such by the German troops and ruthlessly put down in battle, wheresoever they may appear. General Jod urged Hitler to leave it at that. The warning words would alone deter, no need actually to put them into practice. Hitler disagreed. He justified it by referring to the commandos' methods as being outlawed by the Geneva Conventions. 
captured papers show that they are ordered not only to manacle their prisoners, but to kill their defenseless prisoners out of hand the moment they feel such prisoners might become a burden or hindrance to them in the prosecution of their purposes. Jodl, unhappily distributing Hitler's order to the commanders on October 19, urgently warned them not to let it fall into enemy hands. A thirst for revenge also played its part. For example, the record of Hitler's war conference on October 23 began, in reprisal for the fresh British air raid on a casualty clearing station in Africa the Führer has ordered the immediate execution of the Britain captured during the sabotage attack on the power station at Glomfjord. A week later an attempt by six British sailors to destroy the battleship Tirpitz, wintering in a Norwegian fjord, came to grief when their two-man torpedoes were lost in foul weather. Himmler reported to Hitler that all were in plain clothes, Norwegian frontier guards had captured them, but the six had opened fire with concealed weapons, and five had escaped into Sweden, Hitler ordered the sixth, a twenty-year-old seaman, to be executed. Three weeks later the same fate met fourteen British commandos sent in a glider to attack a hydroelectric power station in Norway. The target, the Vermork power plant at Jiken, had been selected because of its importance for the German atomic research program, the Norwegian police rounded up the survivors. In accordance with the new Führer order, all were shot before darkness fell. In the Balkans a partisan war of unexampled ferocity was raging, thanks to the devious policies of the Italians and the ineptness of the puppet governments that Hitler had established. The Italians had occupied Montenegro and annexed large stretches of the Croatian coastline. In Serbia the partisans were ruthlessly suppressed by the Germans, but in Croatia rival armies of guerrillas and bandits roamed the land, robbing, plundering, and murdering. The Setniks, led by Draza Mihailovic, were fighting for the restoration of the monarchy in Yugoslavia, the partisans, led by Tito were fighting an ineffective campaign against them all, hampered by a lack of adequate weapons. Mussolini's second army, commanded by the controversial general Mario Rota, sided not with the Eustacia but with the Setniks, even to the extent of arming them against Tito's partisans. The Italians were weaving a tangled web indeed. For Hitler, Croatia was of great strategic importance across the country passed the German supply lines to North Africa, and it exported 200,000 tons of bauxite to Germany annually. Order was imperative to the Nazis. But the Italians were suppressing the Croat population and actively shielding the Jews, the very subversive elements against whom the Croatian head of state, Poklavnik, anti-Pavlik was struggling to apply repressive laws similar to those enforced in Germany. Hitler thrashed out this explosive situation with the Poklavnik in September. He had two divisions in Croatia, and a Croat battalion was already fighting before Stalingrad, more were being trained, an entire foreign legion, by the Waffen SS. But now the Poklavnik would need them to restore order in Croatia. All this was the result of Rota's strange dealings, but Hitler was loath to embarrass Mussolini and the papers sent down to Rome were stripped of any references that might offend Italian susceptibilities. In private Hitler regretted the Italians' kid-glove treatment of the Serbs. Only brought force bereft of inhibitions would work. On principle, when combating illegals, anything that works is right, and I want that hammered into everybody, he laid down. This gives everybody the freedom of action they need. If the illegals use women and children as shields, then our officer or NCO must be able to open fear on them without hesitation. What matters is that he gets through and wipes out the illegals. In August, September, October, and November Himmler's security forces counted 1,337 dead Russian partisans and executed a further 8,564 taken prisoner. 